Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 121 If you are having problems seeing the chapter list on the indexes and front page, please delete your entire browser cache. Unfortunately, that is currently the only way to fix the issue at the moment. Thank you. This week's extra chapter is brought to you by the Anon Ranger. Yeah, okay, I tried. Anyways, thanks for your support. Means a lot. The origin of this tale was a post uploaded to the Dawn's forums by a knight who just happened to be around to witness the final moments of Jean Sehan. The post itself was nothing but pure guesswork about the unrealistic love between an elf and the fallen knight. And to make the matters a bit more worse than before, several knights poured more oil to the flames, saying such things as an elf frequenting Jean Sehan's home, etc., etc. And then. A gossip-loving female knight decided to sort out all those little snippets of posts and ended up compiling a romance novel in the process. And so, the two protagonists in this story morphed into full-blown lovers who were planning to get married soon. This pure work of fiction was even being recommended by over 640 members of the Dawn Order, which was crazy, considering there were only around 800 knights affiliated with it. In other words, it seemed like it was only a matter of time before this novel would find its way to the hands of the public. This, were you aware of this? S.A.E. Jean. Inside the coffee shop owned by T.M. S.A.E. Jean got bored while waiting for that Ball High Society party U.S.A.E. Young was supposed to attend. Which he planned to sneak in and sightsee later, or, more correctly, to spy on her, so, called up Hazeline who was living nearby to kill some time. Mm. -hmm. Kind of. Has a line. She calmly replied with a smile. She was as pleased as Punch at being called by him out of the blue, but S.A.E. Jean's brows were deeply furrowed in a show of his unhappiness. Ah. Actually, I couldn't really deny it, and you'll see why I couldn't. S.A.E. Young was asking me with such an ardent fervor. How can I deny it when she texted me I didn't know, Uni? I'm so... Sorry with this crying emoji. She pulled out her phone and showed the text in question to S.A.E. Jean. Hmm. For sure, it seemed that U.S.A.E. Young sent the text while under the heavy clouds of emotions. Did she send it right after reading those fictitious posts? However, there were a lot of typos. She must have sent it after having a stiff glass or two. Maybe more. But still, we shouldn't say Jean Sehan and Miss Hazeline were having a relationship, you know. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean said half-jokingly, but Hazeline nodded her head somewhat unexpectedly. No wait. That doesn't sound so bad. Hazeline. Eh. No, hang on a minute. Please don't joke around. When reporters come around asking questions, please say it's all a misunderstanding. S.A.E. Jean. A question mark floated on top of her head as she tilted it in confusion. But why? It doesn't matter since Jean Sehan is dead, right? Has a line. Actually, it does matter, since I gotta tell S.A.E. Young that I'm Jean Sehan sooner or later. You can probably imagine how awkward that conversation is going to be, right? S.A.E. Jean. Why would you tell her that? Has a line. Of course I have to tell her. She's my girlfriend. S.A.E. Jean. Hearing his words, Hazeline quietly bit down on her lips. She remained silent after that, just tapping on the coffee table with the tip of her finger. Five minutes, ten, then fifteen. Some length of time had passed by, yet all she did was to continuously let out several heavy sighs. Miss Hazeline. Yes, yes. How nice it is to be S.A.E. Young. After all, you're her boyfriend. She finally said something, then loudly slammed her palm down on the table's surface, before roughly standing up. S.A.E. Jean Shu. Deared a little, but since she still hadn't given him a definite answer yet, he too got up and chased after her. Where are you going now? S.A.E. Jean. I'm going to a place for dinner. Has a line. With who? S.A.E. Jean. With you. Has a line. In a show of confidence, she jabbed her forefinger at his chest as if she had already called dibs on eating out with him or something. 
What are you ta? Didn't you say there's still plenty of time left until that party begins? Then, why not spend it with me? Has a line. No, wait a second here. Then, I'll give it a more serious thought, whether I'll deny the rumor or not. S.A.E. Jean took a sneaky glance at his wristwatch after deliberating it for a bit. Thankfully, the clock hands still hovered around five. But Hazeline powerfully snatched his wrist, and glared at him with a pair of chilly eyes covered by her hood. Are you coming or not? Hazeline. Ah, well, since there is still some time left, so. Then, follow me. Quang, quang, quang. While still tightly gripping S.A.E. Jean's wrist, she stomped her way in a hurry. Arriving next to his car before long, she grabbed the door handle and began an epic struggle to open it. But it didn't budge an inch, so she drummed on the door and spoke in irritation. Please unlock the door. Has a line. Bleep. S.A.E. Jean chuckled slightly as he pressed a button on the car's key. That caused the car's door to open not sideways, but rise up to the sky. Looks like you changed the car again. You must be loaded with money now. Hazeline. Hazeline complained audibly as she climbed into the passenger seat. S.A.E. Jean expertly slid into the driver's. Are we going to that place, the one we go to all the time? S.A.E. Jean. Nope. Not that one. Let's go somewhere else. There is this place I know. Hazeline. She suddenly accessed the car's satnav. The destination was only about ten minutes away, pretty close by. By the way. S.A.E. Jean. It's going to be fine. There aren't too many people there. It opens a bit later than usual, and as I frequent the place, I know it quite well. Even S.A.E. Young's been there a few times before, too. Has a line. Oh. Well, in that case. Wait, what? S.A. Young was there too. Why would she be there, in the middle of the night? She probably wanted to unwind and relax. For now, please get going already. Has a line. Cume. Frown. When he pressed down on the accelerator, a throaty exhaust note filled the cabin. And the sports car only needed three minutes to arrive at the restaurant. No. He thought it was a restaurant, but. Isn't this a bar? S.A.E. Jean. Yes, it is. I told you already, yes. That it opens its doors a bit late. This was no bloody restaurant, instead, it was a stylish and luxurious bar. They also serve food. In fact, I'll make it for you. She entered the bar first. S.A.E. Jean followed her footsteps with a slightly uneasy expression. He wasn't too worried, though, as long as mana circulated within his body, he'd never get drunk anyways. Actually, this is the magic-infused liquor. Hazeline. The moment he heard Hazeline's words, all his confidence shattered into bits and pieces, only to be replaced by the feelings of uncertainty. You should have told me sooner. S.A.E. Jean. The motto here is, drinks that can even get knights drunk. That's why, the bar's been named You Will Get Drunk. Hiccup. Thankfully, S.A.E. Jean was only at the level of feeling a bit tipsy, but in Hazeline's case, it was turning into a potentially serious problem. She had discarded her robe a long time ago and now it was nowhere to be seen, and her face was flushed crimson red. Ah, damn. Would you look at the time already? Looks like I must get going. S.A.E. Jean. To be perfectly honest, he had no confidence when it came to alcohol. All the dangerous mistakes happened under its influences, after all. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. There is something I must seriously talk to you about. However, Hazeline grabbed his wrist again as he tried to get up. Her own hands were trembling, and her downcast eyes were moist. He had no choice but to sit back down. He consoled himself by thinking. All he had to do was avoid getting drunk. What? Is it? S.A.E. Jean. He sighed out and asked her. Hazeline took another sip of her drink, and then, slowly moved her mouth. From between her wet lips, her trembling voice leaked out. It sure was her trademarked beautiful voice no matter where it was heard, 
but S.A.E. Jean's expression was getting stiffer and stiffer as he listened. The time now was late, late afternoon, the last lights of sun fading over the western horizon. An ultra-luxurious cruise liner operated by TM was anchored off the coast of the now calm East Sea. The sight of countless lights that glittered on deck, as well as many waiters kicked out in neat tuxedos, imparted the atmosphere with the air of great importance and high class even when viewed from afar. As this was a party held biennially, the names on the guest list were indeed quite varied, to say the least. Some who hadn't been invited before had come, while some who had been invited before, were disqualified from attending this year. We welcome you aboard. As the time for the ball drew closer, and the waiters busily greeted the newly arriving guests, S.A.E. Jean in the Leviathan form was swimming around the cruise liner under the water's surface. Actually, this wasn't his original plan. No, he was going to attend this party as a human and surprise U.S.A.E. Young in the process. After all, his TM had entered the ranks of top 100 companies so he was more than qualified to do so. However, after listening to the drunk Hazeline's words earlier today, his mind was in somewhat of a turmoil. She definitely did not confess to him. But he wasn't a completely hopeless half-wit who could not recognize the depths of her feelings contained within her voice, either. A pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss U.S.A.E. Young. It was then, he heard someone mention U.S.A.E. Young's name. S.A.E. Jean slowly opened his eyes and carefully swam closer to the surface. He spotted U.S.A. Young on deck. It hadn't even been three minutes since she arrived, but hell, she was surrounded by quite a hefty crowd already. They were all rather good-looking men and women from the families of the top 100 companies. They were trying very hard to appeal to her sensibilities, but unfortunately, she only flashed a polite smile to deal with them. Even then, not long after, she pulled the time-worn excuse of making a prior engagement with someone else and swiftly evacuated from there. S.A.E. Jean slowly tailed her underwater. She seemed to be quite used to walking in high heels now. She made her way towards the railings overlooking the silent ocean and deeply gazed at it in contemplation. She looked rather lonesome, standing there. So, S.A.E. Jean created a weak ripple on the surface for her. U.S.A.E. Young quietly closed her eyes as the salty scent of the sea and the gentle sway of the waves entered her mind. But even that respite didn't last long. An unknown older gentleman was slowly approaching her. S.A.E. Jean wasn't worried, at least not initially. He thought that, here comes yet another fool who will end up tasting the bitterness of embarrassment courtesy of U.S.A.E. Young. However, out of the blue, she formed an affectionate smile as if she was waiting for this man's arrival while turning around to greet him. What the hell? Momentarily, the sea swayed noticeably the result of his unconscious reaction after losing his calm at this new development. She was greeting this unknown man with as much affection as she would show him. Before he could lose his mind, though, S.A.E. Jean did his best to remain cool, and pushed both his sight and hearing to absolute maximum. The previously dark view brightened up, and he could hear the conversation of the two on deck. And how goes your painting lately, uncle? U.S.A.E. Young. The moment S.A.E. Jean heard these words, he truly felt grateful for that persistent slim strand of patience he held on to, if he had lost his cool and jumped aboard to intervene, then he'd been seen as a proper idiot by everyone by now. It's going well. You should come visit my gallery opening later on. Foot. Of course. U.S.A.E. Young. This man's face kind of resembled the calm ocean, vivid creases on his face and the deep, dark navy blue hair seemed to be the reason for that. By the way, S.A.E. Young. I've heard from the rumors doing the rounds that you've been dating Kim S.A.E. Jean. Yes. We've been going out for a while now. U.S.A.E. Young. U.S.A.E. Young replied with a strangely lonely expression, which made S.A.E. Jean feel guilty, his body trembling slightly under the water's surface. But I didn't hear anything from the media. No one would be daring enough to publish that story, without receiving our blessings in the first place. I mean, if you happen to cross both the dawn and the monster, then you wouldn't be able to set foot back in Korea, after all. The man smiled slightly and nodded his head. Then, he turned his gaze back towards the ocean, as if to commit to memory whatever he saw lurking underneath the water's surface. I honestly never imagined that you'd actually start dating someone. I was really conceited back then, that's why. 
I've grown up a lot after meeting Appa. USA Young. No, no. Not that. That's not what I meant, you know. Didn't you say you'd only marry me and no one else? USA Young let out a short chuckle as if she found his suggestion unbelievable. Just how long ago did I say that? Seriously, uncle. You're making me laugh. USA Young. Ha ha ha. It's my sense of humor that attracted my wife. Probably. No way. There's no way, methinks. USA Young. Two of them shared a warm laughter together. But the smiles only lasted for a short moment. His face hardened slightly and studied USA Young's side on appearance. He seemed worried for her. However, are you guys definitely in love? Well, yes. I do love him. I've never felt like this before in my entire life, and I don't think I'll ever feel this way, ever again. USA Young. USA Young replied right away. SAE Jean should have been happy hearing those words, yet. They felt like needles pricking his skin. But. Appa's feelings, I think, aren't as clear as mine. Maybe, I love him a lot more than he does me. I mean, I'm just thankful for being able to have him by my side, you see. Is that so? Yes. Therefore, I'm different from you, uncle. So, please do not worry about me. USAE Young. I'd like to do exactly that, as well. The man answered her in a calm manner. There were no other words exchanged after that. Within this silence, the two of them enjoyed this sense of comfortable familiarity shared between them. With a good timing, a gentle wave swept by. They stood there quietly and appreciated the beautiful reflections off the rippling surface of the ocean. Four days later, Thursday. There was a huge throng of knights as well as reporters filling up the main auditorium of the Raven Knights Order. All these people had gathered for a small event that would only last five, ten minutes tops. But this event was important enough to tug at their interest really hard, a weapon conferment ceremony. Normally, such a ceremony only happened when a famous knight bought something from a famous master blacksmith. The knight's order would hold it in order to advertise boast that one of their knights had purchased such a wonderful weapon. However, the Raven Order had never held one until now, saying something or rather about their reputation and stuff. The reason such a famous order would voluntarily break out of their own tradition, was all because the master blacksmith involved here was Kim Sae Jean, as well as the rumor mill indicating that the rank of this new weapon could be a treasure. Congratulations! Inside the waiting room behind the auditorium stage, the Raven Order's master Kim Hyun Suk congratulated Kim Yu Rin while looking rather dispirited. What the? Your subordinate is acquiring a good weapon by getting into a heavy debt, yet you're getting jealous of her. Kim Yu Rin. Kim Yu Rin jokingly replied to him while smiling slyly. Kim Hyun Suk shook his head, his expression slightly showing his guilt. No, not true. I am truly happy for you. By the way, what's the name of this weapon? Kim Hyun Suk. According to Guild Master Kim Sae Jin, it's going to be Gungnir. Kim Yu Rin. Gungnir, huh? The legendary Gungnir, the weapon of the leader of all the gods residing in Asgard, Odin. It seemed that Kim Sae Jin dared to pilfer yet another name of a legendary weapon. But, isn't your main weapon a sword? Although I don't know the legend all that well, I'm sure, Gungnir, is a spear of some kind. Ah, uh, that is. Apparently, it's a sword that can substitute a spear easily. He said that it can fire several highly accurate light arrows that will work well along with my trait. Kim Yurin. Is that right? Hmph. So, it was tailor made for you. Kim Hyun Suk scratched his chin and mumbled in slight dissatisfaction. Kim Yurin looked at that and giggled to herself. Her father could be the most stern looking man if he wanted to, but sometimes, he did kinda look like a little boy and that sure was adorable. By the way. If we are talking about legendary weapons, which one is superior, Gungnir, or Gram? Kim Hyun Suk. Uh, well, that is. Ah, uh, it's going to start now. Shall we go? Kim Yu Rin. Of course, it's Gungnir, thought Kim Yu Rin as she chuckled inwardly, 
while leading Kim Hyun Suk out the waiting room. Uh. Oh, yes. Let us. Two of them opened the door and stepped onto the stage. At the same time, claps of the proud Raven Knights resounded within the auditorium. As she waved her hands towards the audience, she found a literal treasure chest sitting pretty in the middle of the stage. Although her weapon was still hidden within that chest, she couldn't help but feel deeply affected by the overwhelming aura oozing off from it. That's mine, all mine. Totally entranced, Kim Yurin floated like a butterfly towards the chest, figuratively speaking, of course. Chapter 122 From this way and that, Kim Yurin began studying the treasure chest covered in black sheet. No matter which direction she observed it from, she was certain of the fact that the powerful aura oozing out of the box was definitely coming off from a bona fide treasure hidden within. Finally, I'm going to be the second person in here ever to own a treasure-grade weapon. As she basked in the feeling of an endless contentment, suddenly the sword hanging by her hips entered into her thought process. This high-ranked sword had been by her side for a very, very long time the White Knight dot. It was a reward bestowed unto her by the Raven Order when she became the youngest upper mid-tier knight in the history many years ago. She survived many deadly crises since then with it by her side, and saved just as many lives along the way as well. In other words, this sword truly had a priceless sentimental value to her, the one that shared her history of sweat, blood and tears, as well as all those good and bad memories she experienced as a knight. I'm sure you'll prefer to spend the rest of your days in comfort inside a good museum. She slowly patted her white sword and swallowed her saliva down, feeling the complicated emotions sweep over her. All those days she'd been fighting with the white knight in hand flashed by her mind like a roll of a film. Oh, oh. He's here. A man stepped onto the stage while Kim Yu Rin was busy sorting through her mixed feelings that was born out of her separation from the white knight. That man was naturally Kim Sae Jean, wearing a smart suit that looked expensive but not too extrovert and eye-catching. Several ladies' knights, no less in the audience began blushing noticeably at his entrance, while the male counterparts were busy dreaming up of ways to get close to him as they noisily cheered on. Although he was met by all this wonderful reception, Sae Jean was actually under quite a bit of stress lately, thanks to several worrisome developments of last couple of days. He forced himself to assume a stiff smile, as he approached the waiting father and daughter pair of Kim Yurin and Kim Hyun Suk. Nice to meet you. Kim Hyun Suk. Kim Hyun Suk reached out with his hand extended first. Kim Sae Jin lowered his head in a show of respect and shook the older man's hand. It's my honor to meet the Korea's greatest knight. Sae Jin. No, actually, it's my honor. After all, there is no one who is more accomplished than you in your age group, the twenties. Kim Hyun Suk. Not at all. With Miss Kim Yurin standing right besides me, I'm not deserving of such a praise. Sae Jean. Mm -hmm. Ah. Knight Kim Yurin has already entered her thirties now. She's not in her twenties anymore, haven't for a long time. Kim Hyun Suk. Kim Yurin's shoulders shook in visible shock at this unexpectedly fatal low blow that was aimed squarely at her heart. Fearing that other knights might have heard this completely thoughtless and unnecessary remark of Kim Hyun Suk, she quickly surveyed the surroundings with a horrified expression clearly etched on her face. Several knights knew enough to tactfully lower their gazes when her eyes landed on them. Why would you say such a thing in public? Kim Yurin. She angrily confronted her father boss with a really pissed off face. It seemed that she was ready to kill him if it came down to that. The sensitive topics of age and weight were incredibly prickly subjects to talk about for ladies, indeed. Haha <laughs> Kim Hyun Suk. I'm asking you, why did you say that out aloud? Would you feel good if I called you a 50-something geezer in front of everyone? Kim Yurin. Ahahaha <laughs> Kim Hyun Suk. Kim Hyun Suk glossed over the teeth gritting Kim Yu Rin's angry mutterings and walked towards the treasure chest along with Sae Jin. Because, now was the time for the photo op. Say cheese. Cameraman. Sae Jin forced out another smile towards the camera lens as he stood next to Kim Hyun Suk. With a soft click, a flash went off. We're going to take a couple more pictures, but will you be alright with that? Kim Hyun Suk. Pardon. Uh, sure. 
I'm fine with that. SAE Jean. SAE Jean inwardly thought, just how many can they possibly take? Can't be that many anyways. Unfortunately for SAE Jean, it didn't take too long for him to realize the errors in his lackadaisical judgment. In order to show off the fact that the raven possessed two treasures crafted by the world's best blacksmith, Kim Sae Jean, he had to take literally countless photos with many people. It began with taking a couple with only Kim Hyun Suk. Next, with Kim Hyun Suk and Kim Yoo Rin, then followed by Hyun Suk, Yoo Rin, as well as other high ranking officials of the order. Next, with those same officials, Sans Hyun Suk and Yoo Rin. Finally, ones with all the respective captains of each of the night teams. If it was the raven of the past, they would have never raised a fuss to such an extent. All this show of prestige wasn't simply because the dawn had been chasing them down hard. Due to the frequent breakout of the monster-related incidents throughout the world and the subsequent dispatching of knights to literally everywhere. The national borders that normally demarcated the operational jurisdictions of the knights' orders became rather blurred. The competition, in other words, now included the rest of the world. Whatever the case was, SAE Jean was feeling really terrible after taking so many pictures. And to compound his misery even further, his photo shoot partners simply had way too many things to say to him. To see them forcibly shoving their business cards to him for the umpteenth time, hoping to receive SAE Jean's famed platinum card in return, it was becoming so. Hell, we haven't even opened the DN chest yet. SAE Jean. Inwardly feeling rather worried about this circus continuing on even after the unveiling of the weapon, SAE Jean took the last photo and also, pocketed the 30th business card he received. And we shall begin the ceremony now. Announcer. As the conferment ceremony finally got underway, Kim Hyun Suk and other unrelated parties climbed off the stage, leaving SAE Jean and Kim Yoo Rin behind, as well as the lone treasure chest. I'd like to thank you for this incredible treasure Kim Yoo Rin. I haven't even opened the lid yet, you know. You can lavish it praises a bit later, Miss Yoo Rin. SAE Jean smirked a little as he replied to Kim Yoo Rin. Before this, she said she preferred dolls over weapons, but hell, it seemed that a mere weapon was incomparable to a true treasure even to her. Then, shall we take a look? SAE Jean. SFX for covers being pulled off. SAE Jean lifted the veil off the chest. Immediately, the blinding light came out from the chest itself. Kim Yurin nervously swallowed her saliva, wondering if the chest's price tag was just as eye-poppingly expensive as well. Ah, I'm asking this just in case have you gotten over your crush, Miss Yurin? SAE Jean. Excuse me. Kim Yurin woke up from her dazed staring of the chest and asked out in a shocked surprise. He smiled wryly and whispered to her. The orc. The hero orc. You've gotten over it. W what on earth are you talking about? It's not gotten over it, since there was nothing to get over with in the first place. Kim Yurin. When Kim Yurin suddenly cried out at the top of her lungs on the stage, it naturally drew the attention of the audience. It never was like that. Really. Kim Yurin. Feeling ashamed by that sudden outburst, she lowered her voice and whispered to him. Of course, the orc sometimes still appeared within her dreams his unorc like handsome face, his charming baritone voice, his broad and dependable back, and his perfect muscles, all of it. Such a thing never happened. Never. Kim Yurin. It had been over three months since she last saw the orc, so a certain sense of longing, a desire, to see him occasionally reared its head, but now, she was completely fine with it. Well, in that case, I am genuinely relieved to hear that. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean muttered so, as he opened the chest. And residing within its cavity, there was a mystical, dignified weapon exuding a brilliantly blinding light that was hundreds of times purer than what the chest emitted just now. Seeing that smooth, perfectly formed shape from the scabbard all the way down to its hilt, Kim Yurin was in a total daze until, she spotted a peculiar little detail. That insignia. It was a certain tiny mark, a small engraving of sorts, that SAE Jean would unconsciously leave behind when he was completely focused or immersed in the crafting process of a treasure, or a branded goods graded first or second. She looked at that mark and recalled the hero orc's mace. 
she remembered seeing a very similar mark somewhere on the roundish hitting surface of his scary mace. She was dead sure of it. After all, she dueled with him hundreds of time already. You like it that much? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean asked her with a satisfied smile after mistaking her dazed state for something else. Kim Yurin quickly swallowed down her saliva and turned her gaze towards him. S.A.E. Jean's smile remained etched on his lips, even when her questioning stare firmly landed on him. With this weapon conferment ceremony, the general feelings of the populace is that Knight Kim Yurin has received the figurative sky piercer halberd and the only thing she now lacks is the red hair dot. But what are your thoughts regarding this? TL, this is some obscure reference to the romance of the three kingdoms not sure what the relevance here is, but there you go. If anyone reading this out there is a proper Roti K expert, do comment below. By the way, red hair is a horse. Go figure. Also, this horse and the halberd were both owned by Lu Bu. Haha <laughs> that is a rather apt description. However, in case of the red hair, or more correctly, a griffin the first here that the Raven Knight's Order is also trying to lease one for the period of ten years but in all honesty. It all depends on Kim Sae Jean's decision, so it's not certain at the moment. Is that so? Currently, if I'm not mistaken, it's only the Dawn Order who have successfully leased the griffins? Correct. Well, the Dawn have enjoyed the most friendly relationship with Kim Sae Jean, so I fear, no matter how much other Knight's Orders try to win over his attention. They will be unable to surpass that unbreakable bond formed from the very beginning, when he was still struggling at the very bottom. On top of this, he had given a treasure-grade sword to the Dawn's most recognized knight, USAE Young, for free. It's a whole different relationship to the Raven, whom he asked for money. Oh ho! I wasn't aware of that. Anyhow, it is truly a surprising thing to think, that one single man can somehow influence the prestige of an order as well as the status of a knight. I mean, the Daybeak Order, who used to be a bit underwhelming to be called an important player, have grown in status and now they are threatening Goryeo's position in the rankings solely by maximizing their relationship with Kim Sae Jean, aren't they? Indeed. It's not for nothing many civilians are calling that man the savior. For sure, that nickname did start off as a sort of attempt to ridicule him because of his wonderful trait, but now now, without Kim Sae Jean and the Monster Guild, the nation of Korea would find itself in a very difficult situation. After all, TM has taken over 50% of the artifact, weapons, and potion markets by themselves now. Hazeline was currently lying on a jet black bed like a corpse. For almost the whole week, the only activities she forced herself to perform were sleeping, waking up, check up on her phone, watch TV, and when she felt hungry, eat something she was living like a zombie. It couldn't be helped, since she could recall that huge mistake she made under the influence of alcohol, whenever she tried to do something, causing her to regret it with all of her being. She was always like this, failing to rein in her wild emotions and then, regretting like crazy over the resulting spilt milk. Besides, although she tried her best to not to think about it, it proved to be an impossible task. Turning on the TV and there it was, Kim Sae Jean's face, every single DN day. And when she heard about him giving Kim Yurin a sword, that sort of made her feel disappointed as well. He hadn't even made a wizard's wand for her yet. Wow, I'm such an incorrigible idiot. She shook her head hard and turned the TV off. Her feelings towards Kim Sae Jean, she had decided it would stay as nothing more than a favorable impression. But it was much more than that now. And the biggest reason for that was her spending three, four times a week with S.A.E. Jean disguised as Jean Sehan. She was such an idiot to actively go and see him. She knew very well things would turn out this way, yet her reasoning got suppressed by her emotions and therefore, she couldn't stop. And so, her feelings that had ballooned into something far more dangerous, ended up doing something terribly idiotic. Thankfully, it wasn't a direct confession or anything, but still. By the way, why did you have to kill off Jean Sehan? If he hadn't died, then I'd be able to stay with him, you know. I wonder, doesn't it get a bit stale seeing only one girl all the time? I hear all men feel that way. It's not too late now, you know. You can resurrect Jean Sehan with a poof, and then, and then. Kayak. Too embarrassed to recall the final bits of her drunken utterance, 
Hazeline instead screamed her lungs out. She still couldn't believe the fact that she had blurted out a total bull dust containing her legit desires during the moment when her reasoning and logic had fled from her brain. What an idiot, a nutcase, a ds the enemy of all alcohol kind. Hazeline started kicking and punching her bed until it was nearly broken, out of sheer frustration and regret, but before long, she was sneakily lifting up her phone. She accessed the app for private chatting and began spying on one of the profile pics there. TL, not mentioned specifically in the Raw Witch app, but it's probably Kakao Talk. Seems to be everywhere in Korea. However, she tossed the phone away on top of the bed after a short time had passed by. On the screen of the phone lying on the corner of her bed, was the profile pic of USAE Young. It was a selfie of her smiling happily while leaning against SAE Jean's shoulder. I'm so envious. Hazeline was totally envious of USAE Young. She also felt angry. For sure, she met SAE Jean before anyone else. If she was more proactive back then then, the person next to him would have been her, instead. She felt regret, anger, wronged, and disappointed. I wanna see him. She crawled on the bed towards the phone and pulled up someone else's profile image, enlarging it on the screen. This time, a flawless image of SAE Jean filled up the entire screen. It was now spring. Kim SAE Jean went to speak to Kim Yusun. Nesferatu, you say? Kim Sun Ho. Yes. I think I need to go and meet them, at least once. SAE Jean. By yourself only. Kim Sun Ho. But it wasn't the old man, but his son. SAE Jean nodded his head, and although Kim Sun Ho was rather worried about this, after seeing his boss's determination, he couldn't do anything but to nod his head along as well. Well, in that case, I'll send a couple of operatives out and look for their whereabouts. Kim Sun Ho. No, wait. I don't think that's necessary there should be an information provided to us by an anonymous source not too long ago. You should ask Mr. Yu Son about it. SAE Jean. In the past, there was that time when an anonymous source sent in a bunch of photos and coordinates of an underground village located within a mountainside, saying it was Vampire's hideout. However, seeing that Bathory and her cahoots were busy slumming it out in a hotel located inside the city limits, this hidden village was more than likely the sanctuary of Nesferatu's, instead. I understand. Kim Sun Ho. Very good. Sae Jin nodded his head once more and got up to leave before he could, though, Kim Sun Ho exhorted Sae Jin with a certain grave matter. Ah, right. Guildmaster, I've been receiving reports of Bathory Woman being seen on the coasts of the East Sea quite frequently now. It seems that she hasn't given up, yet. There is a good possibility that she might personally get involved here, so it might be prudent to stop swimming in the ocean as the Azure Dragon for now. SAE Jean let off an unhappy air at that moment. After all, he was planning to head straight to the sea and swim in order to relieve all the accumulated stress. Oh, well. I'll do that, then. S.A.E. Jean. But what could he possibly do? That Bathory woman was supposed to be incredibly powerful so, all he could do for now was to appropriately avoid her. Chapter, 123. If you are having problems seeing the chapter list on the indexes and front page, please delete your entire browser cache. Unfortunately, that is currently, the only way to fix the issue at the moment. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean felt like he was stuck in a rut of late. His growth had slowed down to a crawl. No, more correctly, he lost his reason to grow. The very first goal he set for himself was to live like a human being. To eat three meals a day, to be able to smile and be happy, and at minimum, sleep with a roof over his head, that sort of a simple life. In the past, he fought hard in order to attain this simple goal. He slept for less than six hours a day. He had no time for fun and games nor did he for love and relationships. And as he failed to get a good enough education, he lived like an idiot and was treated as one. Also, got cheated plenty of times as well. But now, that was all but distant history. This world, which at one point seemed to have abandoned him for good, was now warmly embracing S.A.E. Jean. Unlike in the past, people were very much mindful of his presence, 
and the number of those who cared about him and sang his praises had increased by so much. It was truly an enjoyable life. However, he began to feel slight doubt in his heart as well. All those things he craved for, he was able to earn them, all the fame, prestige, influence, and financial muscle. There was not one soul who hadn't heard of the three words Kim, S.A.E., and Jean in Korea. And the company representing his guild, TM, jumped to the 33th spot in the rankings of Korean companies the moment it opened its doors for business. The Monster Entertainment Agency had now over 200 entertainers, knights, and singers affiliated with it, despite it only being in operation for a few short years. And these guys were the best of the best in their professions, too. Plus, the rumors of a good treatment and great ability to do business had spread throughout the industry, making his agency an object of envy. Once, one of the managers in the agency told him that there was no need to scout for talents anymore, that people were calling them now, instead. And, after SAE Gene created many different versions, the Athene doll had become the artifact of the century. The Korean government passed a special law governing all matters related to Athene dolls, called Athene Special Law, and blocked the sale of the dolls to overseas recipients by SAE Gene's guild. They then took over the process for themselves. Of course, the monster still retained the rights to sell the dolls within the country's borders. Although it was indeed a questionable move when seen from the viewpoint of the Monster Guild, even SAE Gene and company couldn't fight against the government's concerted efforts to regulate and keep big corporations in line. In the end, they acquiesced after receiving promises of reduction in taxes and such. Now, the Athene dolls were being used as a trump card in foreign affairs related negotiations. From what SAE Gene heard, Currently the dolls were being leased to those countries enjoying a friendly relation with Korea, or to those governments who they wished to be in one with. If the relationship soured for some reason, then the doll was promptly taken away. He also heard that there were quite a few countries that feared the above example from happening and, although somewhat cowardly, were groveling in front of the Korean government. Well, a couple of the Athene dolls had an attribute imbued that could decrease the chances of monsters attacking, so there was that. Just like that, the name, Kim Sae Jin, had transcended the borders of his native nation and spread out to the rest of the world. However, the more his public persona grew larger and larger, his own sense of self was slowly getting lost. He was like a tiny little boat floating aimlessly. Why on a windless open sea? His one true aim was to uncover the truth of his parents' deaths and to avenge their murders. But the truth about his father being a Mayan, and his mother being in cahoots with vampires. Dot. Well, the more he thought about it, the more doubtful he became, enough to even douse the flames of his anger towards vampires with cold water. He pushed away all these distracting worms of thoughts and took a glance to his side. USAE Young was gently and rather adorably snoring within his arms, but seeing her like this, Hazeline's face popped up in his mind, making him feel guilty as hell. Just why did she say all those things back then? S.A.E. Jean closed his eyes, while trying his damnedest to ignore that feeling, the one he had understood to some extent already. He couldn't sleep. Only dark thoughts continued to creep up into his head. On a certain day, as the spring was coming to an end, S.A.E. Jean decided to focus wholly on training once more. Well, it was because there was only one method left right now that could help him alleviate his stress. Currently, it was deemed inadvisable to swim in the East Sea, Kim sun -ho personally went there and took photos of a woman who seemed to be that Bathory, busy playing around near the beach and sent it over to him. And he couldn't be bothered to head to the Yellow Sea or to the South Sea, he sure as hell didn't feel like fighting all those dumb sea monsters who would definitely try their luck with him. And so, he decided to focus on wielding mana body more proficiently. After all, it was better to forcefully train and do something, rather than sitting around doing nothing because he had lost this goal, and let useless thoughts make him even more stressed, instead. Plus, mana body was certainly the most awesome skill he possessed at the moment as well, so he should really power it up somewhat. I heard that you wish to learn how to use magic. Johansson. The person assigned to help him train SAE Jean's mana body, albeit unknowingly, of course, was a dude named Johansson. A second gen elf wizard, he was nominally a Korean by birth but he more or less looked like a demigod from the Greek pantheon or some such. That's correct. 
I thought it might be helpful if I learned it. S.A.E. Jean. Ha. Really now. Johansson. However, Johansson looked quite dissatisfied by something. The wizard tower had sent in a famous wizard as a tutor since it was Kim S.A.E. Jean who requested for one, but Johansson was not liking this situation one bit. The existence of a wizard and an elf combined together possessed biggest pride and stubbornness than anyone else. But he had to teach a complete noob about magic. If it weren't for the wizard tower insisting on it, Johansson would have never came here. No, magic isn't a, helpful if you learn it, kind of thing, like learning how to drive. If you're thinking of learning it as a hobby, I advise you to give up right now. Besides, you can't learn magic anyway. You see, wielding magic is a noble endeavor, a privilege only granted to those who have dedicated their entire lives to the pursuit of wizardry. Johansson. Johansson didn't shrink away from S.A.E. Jean. His tone of voice was confrontational, and the look of dissatisfaction in his eyes was heavy enough to crush a person. However, from S.A.E. Jean's point of view, he actually preferred a tutor to be like this. No, well, uh. There's a possibility it won't be like that. I could have the aptitude like one of those unrivaled genius, am I right? I've got this trait, you see. S.A.E. Jean. Wanting to tease the guy a bit, S.A.E. Jean became overtly chatty. At that moment, Johansson's face crumpled like a discarded newspaper in a trash can, and the color of red began rising up from his white neck to the rest of his head. Ha, ha, ha. You, you're just too much. See, the thing is, traits related to wielding magic are incredibly rare. You need to repeatedly study, train, and temper your cell. Johansson. I got it, I got it. For now, just fire a magic spell at me. S.A.E. Jean. What? S.A.E. Jean needed to get hit, in other words, be in contact with, for the Leviathan's innate skill to activate and accumulate, the spell. Of course, that meant activating the Leviathan scales as well, but if he just activated it over the area of impact and then quickly disabled it, no one would notice it. What are you doing? Please fire one. I'd like to test the abilities of the instructor with this. S.A.E. Jean. Johansson genuinely got pissed off from S.A.E. Jean's provocation, his white skin now dyed in the deep shades of crimson. On top of this, his shoulders were quaking from rough breathing, a clear sign of him barely suppressing his rage. Please do hurry up. Are you worried about not meeting my standards? You don't have to fret over such a thing, you know. S.A.E. Jean. These words finally shattered the pride of a wizard and an elf, and the sharp debris from the resulting destruction even managed to severe the lines of reasoning as well. Aurea. Johansson let out a strange cry as flames formed on his hand. A coagulation of mana, and billowing with hot winds, this ball of flame looked rather simple on the outside but was a different story altogether inside. That thing was the so-called white flame, where flames were compressed tightly, causing its temperature to rise up to an extreme level. Oh. S.A.E. Jean let out a gasp of admiration at this wondrous display. Unfortunately, Johansson even found this leisurely attitude of S.A.E. Jean unacceptable, so he threw the ball of flames with a full-on killing intent. SFX for a fireball rapidly flying. Causing shimmering heat haze as it flew, the white ball of flame slammed into the chest of S.A.E. Jean, and then with a loud boom. It caused a huge explosion that shook the air. That was the white flames, the most powerful of all fireballs. Johansson's anger had cooled a bit after this, and he explained it out loudly in a satisfied voice. However, there was no reaction beyond the dense smoke. E, excuse me. Johansson. He cautiously called out. There was still no reply. Scared silly now, Johansson hurriedly used magic to blow away the smoke as cold sweat drops poured down all over his body. After his view had cleared up, he spotted S.A.E. Jean lying on the floor. Johansson got so shocked, his eyeballs nearly popped out. He quickly ran towards S.A.E. Jean's location and knelt down next to him. The huge wound on S.A.E. Jean's chest resembled a melted candle. M. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Wake up, please. Johansson shook S.A.E. Jean continuously but there was no reaction. 
In that critical moment, his life flashed by his mind. Was all the hard work and effort he put in the past as an elf wizard all going down the drain because of one moment's blinding rage? SFX for uncontrollable giggle. Fortunately enough, SAE Jean couldn't hold back his giggles anymore. Johansson stared at him in a dumbfounded silence, before his face became crimson and. I shall be leaving now. He angrily screamed at the top of his lungs and stomped out of the training facility. It took full thirty minutes before Johansson could calm down from the furious rage that was caused by SAE Jean's prank and begin the tutoring session properly. Foo. This is what you call a grimoire, a book where a magic spell has been recorded. Johansson pulled out a certain book and spoke at the same time. This book was shaped rather strangely, however. Its size was as big as an encyclopedia, and its covers were equally thick as well, yet there were only five, six pages in total, making it a rather slim book. These grimoires are truly valuable treasures that can fetch upwards of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars. In this book, the magic I used earlier, the white flames, is recorded. Now normally, civilians aren't allowed to look at it, but. Johansson muttered that S.A.E. Jean would never learn it while he opened the book's cover. Mm -hmm. Betraying S.A.E. Jean's expectations quite nicely, he was expecting to see pages upon pages filled with equations and complicated words, the only thing he could see on the pages were large illustrations showing parts of the human anatomy and various blood vessels. There were strange arrows pointing to different directions within these drawings of blood vessels, as well. What is this? SAE Gene. This is a diagram for mana circulation path. A magic spell is formed when mana is fused in a particular way, and you must circulate mana according to this diagram in order to successfully fuse mana and ignite the spell into life. Johansson. Aha. SAE Gene smiled and let out an exclamation. This was beyond his expectations. If this was the case, then there was no need for him to get hit by magic spells, was there? All he had to was to circulate mana in his body according to the book to use magic. However, it is not a cakewalk to move mana within your blood vessels. That is where the chanting comes into equation. With it, we're manipulating mana, telling it to move this way, move that way, just like that. Not to forget, it's important to make sure a magic spell doesn't harm the caster. It's possible to lose one's life from his or her own spells. Johansson. So, that's how it is. SAE Gene ignored the mana circulation path diagram and moved mana around according to his own methods to recreate that white flame spell. For real, mana began circulating similar to what the diagram was showing on the pages of the grimoire. However, as time passed, Small differences crept up, and the end result became completely different. Since a leviathan circulated mana in the most natural manner, he couldn't be in the wrong, which meant that the grimoire's method was wrong. If he followed the diagram, then the circulation of mana would end up tangled in a mess, and leak out unnecessarily, to boot. Um, by the way, this. Isn't this a bit strange? Doesn't it feel like mana is getting all tangled up? It feels so unnatural, you know. S.A.E. Jean. Ha. What are you talking about? Johansson. Johansson let out a hollow chuckle. The coldness in his eyes took a step further from being confrontational, to someone who was looking down on a disgusting insect. This grimoire is one of the greatest works ever written by the honored high elf wizard, Torike von Rehe M.S., but you're telling me it's wrong. Ha. Ha ha ha. Egu. You're making me laugh here. Johansson. Oh. Ah. Uh. Did the greatest wizard ever write this grimoire? S.A.E. Jean. For sure, a leviathan and a human were obviously not the same. A leviathan was the so-called omniscient creature of mana, that could store and understand all things mana, while humans could only artificially force mana into their bodies. So, it was a given that humans couldn't imitate a leviathan's way of wielding magic. Oh, in that case, many of the world's grimoires must contain quite a few errors and incorrect bits, then. No, hang on. Most of them must be plainly wrong. S.A.E. Gene. However, he was currently in the human appearance while storing mana and understanding magic. 
In other words, not only the elves but other people could very well follow his methods, the one which was far more naturally suited for the human's physiology. Now wait a damn second here. Johansson. Of course, Johansson shouted out in rage, thinking that SAE Jean's declaration was tantamount to dismissing the entirety of the wizarding profession. Who the hell do you think you are, to dismiss all our? Johansson. Kim S.A.E. Jean decided that, instead of words, it'd be better to speak with actions to Johansson who was about to burst a blood vessel or two from pure rage. For starters, he demonstrated the white flames as written in the grimoire. Well. S.A.E. Jean. Seeing a sphere of white flames suddenly pop up over S.A.E. Jean's hand, Johansson's jaw dropped to the floor. His mouth opened wide enough to shove two fists inside. Ah. Uh. However, this is too complicated and bothersome. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean snatched the grimoire off Johansson's hands, as well as a pen stuck on the chest pocket of his robe. And then, proceeded to scribble on the pages of a two. Seven million book. Johansson quickly snapped out of his speechless daze and realized the graveness of this situation. He then shouted out at the very top of his lungs. What the F.C.K.? No oh. Johansson rushed in like a wild animal, but too bad, S.A.E. Jean only needed less than two minutes to complete his corrections, thanks to his wonderful dexterity. Ah. Ah. My. Three years worth of salary is. Johansson. Johansson looked at the grimoire, now full of chicken scratches, and despaired on the spot. However, S.A.E. Jean simply chuckled on the side. Why don't you try it out? It should be much easier now. S.A.E. Jean. You crazy motherfucker. Johansson. Johansson sprang up like a loaded gun and clutched S.A.E. Jean's collars while spitting out expletives. You. Compensate me, right now. Now. Johansson. Johansson's reasoning had crumbled to bits a long time ago. He cried out desperately but S.A.E. Jean simply carried on smiling while summoning forth yet another ball of white flames. And this one was on a completely different level to the previous ball of flames. If the previous flame was akin to a bonfire, then this one's pure white, ultra-high temperature was as if someone poured a barrel of jet fuel on top. At this blinding white light, Johansson was pushed back and he tumbled down to the floor. W.H. What the hell? Johansson. What do you think? If you follow what I've scribbled there, your own white flame spell will be like this as well. S.A.E. Jean. Johansson silently studied the ball of flames crazily burning up above S.A.E. Jean's palm. This. Was completely impossible. But Johansson of now couldn't even think of this. As the words implied, he was in a total daze. You can come closer to take a look, you know. I've made sure it can distinguish enemies and allies. Chapter, 124 The expression on Johansson's face as he looked at S.A.E. Jean's ball of white flames was quite something else. But his reaction was understandable. Moving mana around the body according to one's will was a highly specialized skill set that one only acquired after repeatedly going through arduous training. It was not for nothing the wizards were seen as true professionals. But now, a man who had never ever received training nor education on how to wield mana was, after taking one single look at a grimoire. Somehow went beyond simply replicating it, he also corrected the apparent errors and advanced its grade, all at the same time. No matter how much his trait helped him out here, this was just too. I told you, try it out at least once. Like this. S.A.E. Jean. As Johansson stood there, Busy escaping from the reality of the situation, a voice entered his ear canals. After waking up from his daze, he lowered his gaze downwards and saw a grimoire full of chicken scratches no, rather, pages of content corrected with a red pen. Try it according to this diagram. The effect should be same as mine. Mr. Johansson is a great wizard, after all. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, yes please, wait for a moment. Persuaded somewhat by S.A.E. Jean's words, the still dazed Johansson began circulating mana according to the corrected grimoire. Originally, White Flames was a spell that appeared on the caster's palm after circulating mana a few times through one's heart. 
shockingly enough, mana circulated far more efficiently and smoothly than before. Most of all, though the density of magical energy formed at the end of the process was it was a lot more explosive than before. Well, what do you think? SAE Gene. Magic had two standards to judge its merits, grades of the spells used, and strength of the aura emitted when the spell activated. Higher grade spells were obviously seen as high class magic to perform, while the skill and proficiency of the caster was judged by the strength and the vividness of the hue released by the aura emitted from the spell. To explain, the difference in magic spells was the difference in their grades, while the difference between the same magic cast was the difference in the deeper hue of its emitted aura. Every wizard was taught that the biggest factor in determining the aura was the magic strength of its caster, the ability to control mana at will. That was why, Johansson was even more speechless. He could not form one line of coherent thought inside his head, as he silently looked on at the hotly burning ball of flame above his palm. Hell, he wasn't even feeling the elation and satisfaction of advancing magic by another step forward. No, only questions bubbled up in his head. Without a doubt, his magic strength stat did not grow an inch. Yet, why was this ball of flames burning up so much hotter than before? Ah. Uh, didn't I tell you? My trade is quite exceptional. S.A.E. Jean. Johansson dazedly stared at S.A.E. Jean, the perpetrator of this unimaginable situation. All S.A.E. Jean could do was to scratch that itch behind his neck. For now let's postpone the rest of the tutoring to a later date. I have some unfinished work to attend to S.A.E. Jean. As S.A.E. Jean stealthily turned around to leave, Johansson took a large stride forward. Excuse me, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Johansson. At his loud call, S.A.E. Jean's footsteps came to a halt. Johansson alternated his gaze between the grimoire in his hands and S.A.E. Jean while carrying a determined expression, and then, handed the book over to him. Please, take this. This white flames is no longer the white flames, and so, it's not the property of our wizard tower anymore. Johansson. No, thanks. I don't need it S.A.E. Jean. Take it. Johansson forcibly shoved the grimoire in S.A.E. Jean's arms then, he stared at S.A.E. Jean who was feeling rightfully awkward at that moment, with a pair of passionate eyes and spoke fervently. And if it's at all possible can you lend us your power, to our wizard tower? No, it's fine if it's not just our wizard tower. The world of magic probably hasn't seen a genius like Y. Kiam. No, the world has been waiting for the entrance of an extraordinary trait like yours. Plus, the number of wizards specializing on attack spells have seen a noticeable decrease of late as well, because the difficulty of mastering such spells. And thanks to that, during the recent monster incidents, S.A.E. Jean found it a bit difficult to understand everything Johansson was firing out of his mouth. But he was sure of a couple of things. This guy wanted him to become a wizard, and also, I, I would like to be your S, spokesperson, or a middleman. I may look like this, but actually, I am one of the most promising wizards affiliated with the Souls Wizard Tower Johansson. He wanted to gain some benefits along the way. Hmm. S.A.E. Jean scratched his chin as he fell deep into a thought. He wasn't too keen on hiding behind the veil of anonymity, at least not at this very moment. Well, he got a lot of flack for that fiasco as the orc blacksmith, after all. But as he stood there, looking at Johansson busy yapping on and on about big contributions towards the world of magic, S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but think this guy was quite adorable in his own way. Plus, leaving behind a tangible footprint for others to follow, in order to combat the upcoming calamity seemed like a. Mr. Johansson. May I ask you where you live at the moment? Excuse me. Oh, I, uh, live in Bangbaedong. But why? Johansson. Nah, it's nothing. Well, I'll sleep on it first. For now, have a nice day. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean smirked slightly as he saw Johansson to the door. And in the hands of the leaving elf, he was holding the Grimoire of the White Flames the Wizard of Bangbaedong edition. Grimoires were the most important assets for wizard towers. They played such an important role, the rankings of a wizard tower and its reputation among its peers were determined by the number of grimoires in possession of the said tower. 
So, it was obvious that wizard towers would be especially strict on the upkeep of these grimoires, as well as on who gets to read them. Restrictions were placed on renting the books out according to a wizard's grade, and once successfully renting one, the wizard was forbidden from leaving the tower with it until he or she returned the book. However, those low-grade magic spells, such as fireball, ice arrow, haste, etc., etc., were deemed unnecessary to store in secrecy by the towers and so, were available to the public and were even used as teaching materials in schools. Although these people would rush in like a bunch of wild, crazed animals if a grimoire got leaked out of a tower whether by mistake or through deliberate means, they still made an exception to these low-grade spells. The truth was, any learner wishing to become a wizard would have mastered these spells by the age of 14 already. Senior Saman, have you seen this? TL, yes, really. That's the name written by the author. Funnily enough, though the spells that were garnering attention from various wizard towers at the moment were these low-graded ones. What is it? Here. It's a blog run by a wizard who's not affiliated with anyone there are corrected versions of fireballs and ice arrows grimoires uploaded on it. Ha. Huh. The place here was the middle floors of the Korea's best wizard tower, Seoul Tower. This was an area where mid-ranked wizards stayed while studying various magic as recorded within grimoires, or invented a new spell, or even researched new methods to utilize artifacts efficiently during many different circumstances. And why are the grimoires being corrected? No, wait. Which crazy idiot did that in the first place? The lowest graded grimoires almost never saw any corrections. Not only was it a waste of effort to correct the errors of such spells, but from a long, long time ago, these weak sauce spells were pretty much set in stone for the rest of the wizarding community anyways. I was thinking the same thing, but it's a weird thing, this. When the junior wizard projected the blog in the air as a hologram, messy pages of a grimoire floated up. With several words carelessly written alongside the path of mana's circulation, now it resembled more of a graffiti rather than an actual grimoire. What the hell is this rubbish? Normal grimoires simply recorded the paths where mana was to be circulated. And the individual wizards were tasked with figuring out the correct chanting that personally suited them to get the mana's flow right. It was a poor reasoning without a doubt, one of many inconvenient things found in the closed-off world of wizardry and magic. This wizard wrote that this is a better way to circulate mana apparently, it's become quite famous among the cliques of the newbie wizards. I hear the F-grade fireball can display, at minimum, an E, and at maximum, a D-, worth of power. Ha! What the hell is this scam now? The elf wizard named Saman slowly shook his head. But, dude! I don't care about noobs and civilians, but why the hell are you believing in this SHT? Don't you know there are a lot of these quacks popping out everywhere lately? Besides, did you say he's unaffiliated? Can't you see that he's busy showing off, trying to get a little bit of fame so he can enter a good wizard tower? Ah, uh, the thing is, though I tried it out just now. What? You did? Yes. I was thinking the same as you, senior. But there was just way too many controversies surrounding this in our wizarding community, so. Okay, fine. So. Did it work as advertised? Yes. As I said before it seemed that the spell's power increased by several grades. Hearing this somewhat shocking admission from his junior, Saman crossed his arms and studied the hologram projection. Reading the recommendations such as be more mindful here since mana can spin around non-stop if you make a mistake, his nerves were slightly pricked, but still, he calmed his mind and then tried to spell out as it was shown on the diagram. A ball of flames came to life. However, the powerful aura it was emitting was nothing to laugh about. Panicking at the ferocious flames that were busy licking the ceiling's paint, Saman hurriedly controlled his mana and decreased the size of the fireball. And this flame became a perfect round sphere that emitted a brilliant light as if it was a miniature sun or something. A as expected of senior. The junior wizard let out a gasp of admiration at that beautiful light. Meanwhile, Saman gulped visibly before shifting his eyes back to the hologram of that blog page. His lips moved up and down silently. He must have been trying to memorize the address of the blog, unbeknownst to the junior wizard by his side. Yeah, it is quite strange. 
B, by the way, you know who this wizard is? He's got a nickname. It's the Wizard of Bangbaedong. But no one knows his real identity. It has been only a week since he made his debut. Oh, is that so? Anyways is, is there a higher grade spell than this one on the blog? Saman asked in a voice that said I don't need it, but I shall ask since that'll be rude to you, who have gone out of your way to introduce me to it. No. Only ice arrow and fireball, and nothing else. But really. Will he reveal the others for free like this? I mean, he'll probably sell it for good money to a wizard tower or monopolize it for himself. Hmm, you think so? Saman took a deeper glance at the blog, and then sent a signal with his eyes to the junior wizard as if he had come to a decision. What should I write here? The junior was quick on the uptake, so he clicked on the comment box. Ask if he's got other spells. No wait. That's too obvious. Right, what a truly wonderful original method you have, sir. I can only admire you for having the bravery to express your thoughts on the matter which coincidentally, I had been dreaming of all along as well. By any chance, would you like to work alongside our wizard tower? Okay, make sure you send it as a private message. Hey, dude. I said, PM him, PM. Oh, my, my bad. I'll erase it and start over. Still clueless about the smallish waves created by the two rectified grimoires he had uploaded as a sort of trial run, currently SAE Jean was holding a serious meeting with Kim Yusone. As you have suggested, that hidden village could very well be the sanctuary of Nisferatus. They are the only vampire types that don't hunt humans, after all. Kim Yusone. Are you planning to go there? Kim Yusone. SAE Jean was in a dilemma. If he wanted to find out why his mother was cooperating with with these vampires, he had to go and talk to them. But he was rather fearful of the prospect just what kind of shocking truth will he get to hear from them. SFX for a mobile phone buzzing. The alarm on SAE Jean's phone went off. When he took a glance, it was something like a new comment has been uploaded on the Wizard of Bangbaedong's blog. Ignoring it for now, SAE Jean concentrated on the documents Kim Yusone handed over to him. The Nisferatu's sanctuary was located right on the boundaries of the monster field, but there didn't seem to be any serious danger. Still. His phone went off again. Furrowing his brows, SAE Jean simply chose to switch the phone into silent mode as soon as he saw the words The Wizard of Bangbaedong. What is it? A blog? Kim Yusone. Ah, uh, yes. Not too long ago, I started a blog about magic out of curiosity. But it seems like most of the wizards do not like what I've uploaded on it. SAE Jean. SAE Jean chuckled slightly as he turned the phone screen off, while thinking, is it because I've made corrections willy-nilly? Well, they are famous for their stubborn pride, aren't they? Kim Yusone. Ha <laughs> ha. SAE Jean just laughed it off and concentrated on the documents again. It should be better to arrive at the entrance with mercenaries as escorts, right? SAE Jean. Yes, sir. That's the point I'd like to talk to you about. More than likely Kim Yusone. The meeting between the two continued on. All the while, the name of the Wizard of Bangbaedong was slowly spreading within the communities of wizards. Chapter, 125 On an early morning of a certain day in April, Hazeline was walking towards the monster's HQ for the first time in a long, long while. She convinced herself that she was simply out on a stroll, but the truth was, she couldn't muster up the courage and give that man a call, so she was hoping to borrow the power of divine intervention. Hmm. Now that she was here, though, she noticed that not just the HQ building but the entirety of the guild's grounds seemed to have changed a great deal. The vast side of the guild already boasted a stunning scenic view, but there were five or six brand new monolithic megastructures that she hadn't seen before, and so, she didn't know which one she was supposed to enter. And there were lots of employees surrounding her, all of them arriving for work as this was still an early morning. She hesitantly stood there amidst the busily moving bodies of the employees, before slowly approaching one of the buildings where the most of the crowd was headed off to. She could sense a dizzy spell trying to trip her up just now, what with being surrounded by so many people like this, but somehow endured it as she walked up to the entry gate. 
It looked like she needed to use an employee's card here wondering for a bit, Hazeline carefully fished out her guild membership card and pressed it onto the sensor. It was then, a loud, automated voice of a woman came out of the speakers, saying, Miss Shenarine, the guild member. The guild member. Those three DN words. Almost immediately, noisy and lively entrance hall became dead silent, and the eyes of the surrounding people gathered towards her. Hazeline froze up like a statue in the very posture of pressing the card to the censor. Although their gazes contained the feelings and emotions of envy as well as admiration, she was still very much frightened by the fact that their attention was focused solely on her. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to call this a severe case of agoraphobia. Miss Shenarine. A female employee approached Hazeline, whose head had simply blanked out. Ye, yes. I'm Shenarine. P, please save me. Hazeline. Even her tongue had frozen stiff. The female employee tilted her head at this sight. Ah, this is TM's HQ building, ma'am. You can still enter it if you wish, but by any chance, are you looking for the guild's HQ, instead? Yes, yes, yes. Right, that place. Hazeline. Hazeline pulled the hood down much lower and stuck right next to this employee. It couldn't be helped, since there was no one else to rely on except this woman. The employee seemed to be a bit flustered, but still, she made some calls and then brought Hazeline outside the building. It's over there. After walking for about five more minutes, they could see the guild's building. Thankfully, it was rather quiet around here. Letting out a huge sigh of relief, Hazeline finally released the iron vice-like grip on the female employee and lowered her head. Thank you so much. I did come here before, but everything had changed a great deal. Hazeline. Oh, no. It's all right. If you need a guide again, please don't hesitate and give me a call. Hazeline hurriedly pocketed the business card of the female employee and entered the guild's HQ. There was only one person present, a receptionist, behind the counter in the spacious lobby. Gee. Hazeline immediately glared at the receptionist. Seeing the pointy tips of the ears, she seemed to be an elf as well. She seems way younger than me, so she should appropriately show some respect without me telling her, right? As she continued to shoot the glare filled with her own little delusional thoughts. Wah, today's training was so tough. But still, this much is on the easy side, you know. From the passage to her side, accompanied by noisy chattering, a group of knights walked out, their hairs still moist. It was a group of five women, and besides USAE Young and E. Hai Rin, the other three were new guild members. Uh. Uni. What are you doing here? USAE Young. Hazeline was turning around to escape the moment she saw USAE Young's face, but too bad, S.A. Young recognized her first and greeted her. Ah, Hazeline. She is one of the founding members, Wizard Shenarine. U.S.A.E. Young. U.S.A.E. Young made introductions to everyone as Hazeline began panicking inwardly. Then, with a brilliant smile, U.S.A.E. Young took Hazeline's hand. Shall we go and eat together? The cafeteria here makes great food, you see. U.S.A.E. Young. After she was dragged into the cafeteria in a daze, Hazeline found it difficult to acclimatize to this noisy atmosphere. Just how could they be this chatty with one another? Her ears might bleed the following day from all this yapping. Ah, that's right. Miss Shenarine, by any chance, do you know who this wizard of Bangbaidong is? I've never seen a commotion quite like that one before. I hear that scouts from overseas wizard towers are scouring Bangbaidong, trying to find him. Ah, uh, I also have no idea who that could be. It feels like a famous wizard pulling a fast one, but but I've turned my back on the wizarding world some time ago. Has a line. The wizard of Bangbaidong was one of the hottest wizards currently in the Korean peninsula. And the reason for that was simply because as a Korean wizard, he got mentioned by the international media. It was like, grimoires that are perfectly corrected just like how it was with the world of alchemy, Will there be another Korean wave in the world of magic as well? That's how it was but it's okay for you to speak less formally, you know. It's fine for you to not use honorifics, since you're so much older than us. Hazeline. Hazeline really wanted to tell this girl to shut the hell up. 
Ah, uh, right. Um, by the way, Uni is it really no? With Jean Sehan. USAE Young. However, USAE Young, who was definitely not a wizard, had something else in her mind. Jean Sehan. Although more than a month had passed, he was still a big topic of discussion among the populace. Hell, it seemed that people would still talk about him even after a year later, what with the martial arts school that took after his name. Jean Mudo, now having over 10,000 disciples, as well as the UN creating a special award called Jean Sehan, the hero of the world. Dot. No, really, it wasn't like that. We were just close. Has a line. Ah, really? Ing. But, still has a line. Seeing USAE Young looking disappointed for some reason, Hazeline decided to add in a couple more unnecessary words. But I still liked him, a lot. Hazeline. Suddenly, the lively atmosphere cooled down rapidly. Since this wasn't what she wanted, Hazeline quickly waved her hands around while smiling awkwardly. No, no, I'm just kidding. Besides that, S.A.E. Young, did you get a ring already? Hazeline. Hazeline was busy searching for another topic to talk about, but even she realized her own mistake as soon as the words left her mouth. She shouldn't have asked this, for her own sake. Oh. Yes, Appa gave it to me. USAE Young. Wow. Really? It looks so expensive. How much was it? E. Hai Rin. While Hazeline was swallowing down the bitterness in her mouth on the side, E. Hai Rin was busy raising a fuss. Actually he personally made it for me. There's only one like this in the whole world. USAE Young. Seriously? Oh, my, gosh. So envious of you right now. That's an artifact, though, right? What kind of effects does it have? Well, it improves the skin and smooths out the wrinkles. USAE Young. Heek. This artifact ring certainly possessed one of the most fatal effects for the women folk. Hazeline quietly bit down on her lips while listening to the conversation. She wasn't being overwhelmed by negative thoughts, such as I also want one like that. But I'm the oldest here, though. Well, some part of her felt like that, but it wasn't everything. Something was rising up inside her. Could it be frustration, anger, jealousy, or envy? Or maybe, all of the above. Oh, really? Mm so that's how it was. But, did you know? Hazeline. Hazeline put the spoon down on the table with an audible tap. The one who met Mr. S.A.E. Jean first was probably me. When he literally had nothing, it was me who borrowed him five million. Back then, he pretty much relied only on my help all the time Hazeline. No one asked her to say this, yet Hazeline really, really wanted to let this one out of her chest. Other knights nodded their heads and went, oh, so it was like that, and thought nothing much of it, but USAE Young was different. She furrowed her brows and then spat out her reply. When? It was probably before Mr. S.A.E. Jean became a hunter. Hazeline. It was way before USAE Young's time. Biting her lips, she desperately rolled her brain into gear. And finally, something did come up. I also met someone who resembled Appa back when I was really, really young, you see. I think I was seven or eight. It was fourteen years ago, in terms of Ye USAE Young. But that was someone just resembling him, though. Please, stop demeaning yourself. Hazeline. Two of them glared at each other with hotly burning eyes. Well, still. It doesn't matter who met who first. USAE Young. What matters the most is, who's standing beside him now. USAE Young. Hazeline's eyes began twitching, out of the blue. The newbie members cautiously studied this rapidly worsening mood between the two of them, and decided to quietly vacate their seats. However, E. Hai Rin stopped them. Her reasoning was that, it was always better to share such a fun development with other people. At the same time when Hazeline and USAE Young were waging a psychological warfare against each other. Kim S.A.E. Jean stepped into the lush, verdant mountainside with two mercenaries by his side. Breezes caressed the still mountains, causing the leaves to rustle every now and then, sounds of wild animals growling could be heard. 
And within this pristine land where there were no traces of humanity, vampires were in hiding. S.A.E. Jean turned his gaze towards the mercenaries, feeling slightly worried. Since he wanted absolute secrecy, he only brought two mercenaries along. A man and a woman, they were the best of the best from the company, personally selected by Kim Yusong for this job. They were more than qualified enough to act as his guides. I'll leave the guiding to you guys. S.A.E. Jean At S.A.E. Jean's command, the female mercenary called Regent took a large stride forward. Please follow me. S.A.E. Jean followed behind her large, confident footsteps, while the male mercenary guarded their rear. And the place beyond the still forest, where S.A.E. Jean stopped after ten minutes of travel, was SFX for chilly winds blowing across. It was a seriously scary-looking precipitous cliff. What the heck is going on here S.A.E. Jean? Suddenly, S.A.E. Jean recalled a certain urban legend about satnavs inadvertently leading people towards deadly cliffs. When he glared at the two escorts with questioning eyes, they hurriedly shook their heads. All you have to do is to get to the bottom of this cliff. It might be difficult for regular civilians, but it should be perfectly doable for you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Region Region made her excuse and stood on the cliff's edge. I'll stand guard here. The male mercenary spoke out this time. Thinking that only this guy got the easy job, S.A.E. Jean shot him a look of discomfort. However, the male mercenary feigned ignorance and cautiously avoided making eye contact. So, I must really jump down from here. S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean peered over the edge while voicing out his doubts. It sure was steep, this cliff. It was so deep that he couldn't tell whether there was a solid ground at the bottom, an ocean, or even a pit of flames down there. Will you be able to make it? Do you need any assistance? Region Region asked in a worried voice. No, uh, it's fine. I can make it alone. I think. S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean breathed in deeply and peered over the precipice once more. But, it still was a steep cliff, still giving him a strong case of vertigo. Plus, there was a powerful wind blowing up from the bottom, too. Should I help? Regent asked him again. H, how will you help me? S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean reluctantly decided to concede to the reality of the situation. Hold on tight. Region. Region wrapped her arms around S.A.E. Jean's waist without a single change to her expression. Only then, S.A.E. Jean spotted a pair of animal ears hidden under her hood. Oh, she was a Suin. Unfortunately, all unnecessary thoughts regarding her race was cut short. Well, even before S.A.E. Jean could get ready, she jumped like a cute kitten over the cliff, while still holding on to him. Kya! A somewhat pathetic scream of a guy echoed around the cliffside. The male mercenary slowly approached the cliff and peered over the edge, before he Phew! Rubbed his chest down while breathing out a healthy sigh of relief. Foo! Holding his still dizzy head, S.A.E. Jean got up on his unsteady legs. Thanks to calling forth his reserve of mana before it got too late, he didn't suffer any external injuries. So, where are we going next? S.A.E. Jean. Over there. Region. At the place Region pointed at, there was a plentiful suspicious-looking piece of weird but huge boulder blocking a small corner of the cliff's face. There was no need to accuse them for being way too relaxed with their security, though. After all, even the condition of the entranceway was rather scary dangerous already. S.A.E. Jean gulped down on his saliva and approached the boulder. That's all he did. However, even though he didn't do a thing, with a noisy grumbling, the boulder slid inside the cliff and revealed a passage. He took a glance at his back and saw Region without her hood studying the interior of the passageway with lots of interest. Let's go together. S.A.E. Jean. But can I? Yes. But, please don't interfere while I talk to them. Well, seeing that they opened the door without asking, it meant they were probably willing to have a chat with him. Regen nodded her head and with light, airy steps, entered the passage first. Inside the passage was dark and surprisingly lengthy. And the further they walked in, the stronger the smell of blood got. But, rather mysteriously enough, 
this smell was somewhat different from every other vampire SAE gene encountered before. It was a bit hard to explain why. Someone's coming. Regen. Regen was leading the way, but she stopped in her tracks with her ears standing stiff, then she raised her arm and blocked his progress. Who's there? Regen. A cry like a wild cat from her, and the shape of a person covered in a thick robe rose up from the darkness. And it was a vampire. Unbeknownst to him, S.A.E. Jean began gritting his teeth. However, this vampire leisurely studied the two and slowly began speaking. It has been a while. A while. S.A.E. Jean tilted his head. What do you mean by that? S.A.E. Jean. Oh. Ah, my apologies. I mistook you for someone else. Someone else. Probably meaning S.A.E. Jean's father. In any case. We have been waiting for you. Are you willing to follow me in? S.A.E. Jean quietly glared at this figure, and then. Sure. S.A.E. Jean. He slowly nodded his head. Chapter, 126. It turned out, only the entry requirements were strange, and the place this unknown vampire led S.A.E. Jean and Regent into was a warm and normal house found in any typical countryside village. There was a comfortable couch set and a nice little coffee table in the living room in the kitchen, a pot was quietly simmering away while a delicious aroma wafted out from it. Please, take a seat, said the vampire while taking off the robe. And S.A.E. Jean was surprised slightly. The gloomy and vague voice coming out from the robed figure definitely belonged to an old man, but the revealed face was that of a stunningly beautiful woman. When the ash-gray colored hair and pale white skin were added to that gorgeous facial features, he even felt a certain mysterious attractive charm that was uniquely a part of this non-human being. It's an enchanted robe. It's possible to manipulate body types, voices, as well as wrinkles on the lower part of the face with this robe. His questions got answered pretty quickly. The vampire leaked out a small grin before heading off to the kitchen to serve the guests. Would you like some tea? Nesferata vampire. S.A.E. Jean took a glance towards Regen. She hadn't said anything until now, but it was enough to understand her intentions after seeing her ears twitching and her nostrils flaring involuntarily. She was saying, give me that nice smelling tea already. We would. S.A.E. Jean. He had to ever so slightly wonder whether it was smart to have a nice, relaxing cup of tea in this place, but then again, he thought it should be fine since he didn't sense any type of hostility coming from this vampire. All right, please wait for a moment or two. Three minutes later, the female vampire returned with a tray carrying three cups of tea. This is a type of tea that doesn't exist in our society, so we very rarely drink it. Almost immediately, S.A.E. Jean stopped just short of taking the first sip. If it's something that didn't exist among this particular vampire society, that could only mean. It's not blood, so you can relax and drink it. Cume. Somewhat embarrassed now, S.A.E. Jean quickly took a sip. It was unexpectedly delicious. It was perhaps even more so for Regen, since her tail began to sway side to side ever so gently, as if a mountain breeze was blowing around here. S.A.E. Jean had the urge to reach out and pat that thing. However, he knew well enough this wasn't the right time to enjoy such a relaxing tea time. He put the cup down and hardened his expression. By the way. Don't we have something else to discuss first? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Actually, we've been waiting for you. Nesferata Vampire. S.A.E. Jean took a glance at the calendar placed on top of the coffee table. There was a cute little circle drawn over today's date, 4th of May. Did they know beforehand I am coming here today? Allow me to introduce myself first. My name is Lilia von Nesferatu. I am in charge of this sanctuary, said Lilia, as she met S.A.E. Jean's gaze head-on. Her eyes were the colors of blood, just like every other vampire. But, unlike them, there was overflowing vitality present within those eyes which made him think of a pair of vivid rubies instead. We, the tribe of Nisferatu, wish to cooperate with you, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Lilia. Her attitude while saying these words out aloud was quite relaxed and laid back. Since this was something S.A.E. Jean had been expecting, he didn't show a big reaction, either. Your reasons are. S.A.E. Jean. 
It's simple. Unlike other vampires, we're quite satisfied with living on this planet. Lilia. Did you coax my mother like this, as well? S.A.E. Jean. A really faint smile stealthily crept up on her lips. Not really. She personally saw the future. Lilia. What do you mean by that? S.A.E. Jean. You'll learn its meaning later on, by yourself. Lilia. What a puzzling thing to say. He couldn't understand what she was trying to imply there. I've no idea what the heck you mean by that, but you sure about cooperating with me? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Then, spit it out. Tell me everything about what vampires are planning to do. Also, what types of underhanded methods they are going to use. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean crossed his legs and leaned back on the couch in a slight display of arrogance. However, Lilia didn't seem to be offended by this and she simply continued on. Firstly, I hope you know what a fissure is. Lilia. The gap, a space, between two worlds. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, correct. However, when a fissure opens past to a certain extent, it changes into a portal of sorts. This portal is a separate, unstable miniature world, created when two planes of existence meet and intermingle. Inside this portal, the fabric of space and time loses all meaning, and is completely tangled up in a mess. Other vampires are planning to use this portal to return to their former world or, more correctly, return to the past version of their former world. Lilia. But what are they hoping to achieve by doing that? Even if they do return to the past, isn't that world still facing the destruction of S.A.E. Jean? A light bulb went off inside S.A.E. Jean's head. Lilia lightly nodded her head. Yes. They are hoping to return to the past and stop the end of the world from occurring in the first place. But, the odds of their success are simply far too low. Too long a time has passed by, and that plan won't succeed anymore. It's nothing more than a perverse obsession of the foolish vampires who are in denial about their rapidly fading chances of success. Lilia. Lilia stopped talking and sipped her tea. However, we, the Nisferatus, are different from them. We have already come to accept the reality of the situation. Already, we Lilia. She stared at S.A.E. Jean with her eyes wide open. It was as if she was trying to recall the fading memories of her past through him. We have seen many things, heard many things, and crucially have met the Savior, too. Lilia. Even before Lilia could finish her sentence, S.A.E. Jean activated the eyes of the wolf. Her shoulders quaked visibly when she saw his eye reeds suddenly narrow to a slit. She instinctively sensed a specific, species-unique terror in that moment. You aren't lying, that's for sure. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean couldn't spot any hostile intentions from her. All he could spy on, was her desire to continue living in this current world. All right. In that case, what should we do to bring about the end to their schemes? S.A.E. Jean. Lilia produced a worn-out notebook from her inner pocket. There were fading letters visible on the corner of this book that read. Diary. It's not possible to stop the portal from opening up with what this world possesses in terms of battle power. That is why, we need to increase the military strength of the world, and prepare to match what the incoming situation will potentially bring. Lilia. She pulled out a crooked piece of a scale from the pages of the notebook. Seeing this, S.A.E. Jean's eyes widened in shock. Hey, that thing is S.A.E. Jean. But before all that, there is something we need to do now to get rid of the biggest stumbling block in our immediate future to kill Bathory. Lilia. Lilia placed the scale on the coffee table. He was right. Although it was dried up and didn't look too impressive now, seeing that color of the ocean still reflecting off of it, without a doubt, this was the scale of a leviathan. Please, take this with you. If you swallow this when you encounter Bathory, you will attain enough power to defeat her. Lilia. S.A.E. Jean forgot to say something. If they knew about this scale, then that meant she, or maybe even the other Nisferatus, knew about his trait as well. However, there is a chance that this one alone won't be enough, so Lilia. Lilia then produced a crystallized stone of some kind. 
It was a marble-shaped item, and strange mana could be felt undulating from both inside and outside. Please, allow us to aid you when you're going to restrain her. Lilia. There was a thin line curving upwards drawn on her lips. The body length, two. Three meters. The body weight, undeterminable, due to the scales that were harder than the finest mithril densely covering his body. Normally, resembling a puppy dog with ears pressed back, but when frowning, rather scary to look at. Currently, referred to as the Azure Dragon, or as the Guardian of the East Sea. Also, the object of worship after a new cult called the Blue Dragon of the Endless Oceans was created not too long ago. This was the resume of Kim Sae Jean the Leviathan. The world was deeply interested in the rapid, daily growth of the Leviathan. It was to the extent that when the Azure Dragon hid itself from the world for a bit, the government formed a special investigation team called Azure Dragon Observation Team, to find out why. Splash, splash, splash. At this very moment, Sae Jean was swimming in the sea after what seemed like ages. And right by his tail, a lone bat was busy flapping its wings and openly followed him. It seemed that, this little thing was either the Bathory woman's tool, or some sort of a pet. That Bathory girl wishes to make the Azure Dragon her pet. However, since her lackeys failed the last time, there is a big possibility that she won't entrust the capture to her people and personally take action. You need to seize that chance. After recalling Lilia's words, Sae Jean deliberately shook his tail and splashed around as if he was playing around. He even tried to shake his as a bit since, that seemed like a sure-fire way to make Bathory do something, anything, even if it's her swallowing down her saliva or some such. She's not coming, though. But as if she was exercising caution, or maybe even her subordinates desperately stopping her, unexpectedly Bathory did not show up. Only people he ran into, were a bunch of cameras from a cruise full of tourists, and a couple of deep-sea fishing yachts. Hmm. It seemed that today wasn't the fated day. Sae Jean winked at a certain blonde elf lady who was busy taking his pictures and dived underwater. At the same time. Ah. Look, look. It's gone. Bathory. Stomping on her feet repeatedly, Perlani Bathory couldn't endure it anymore and let out an exasperated shout. The scene reflected on the surface of a crystal ball in front of her showed a calm surface of the ocean. I should have gone there. Bathory. There are just too many witnesses in the East Sea, my lady. That is why. In that case, you should have carried out your job properly back then. Bathory. As a monster enthusiast, Bathory found it very tough to get a hold of herself after seeing the much more cute and coquettish Yong Yong which hadn't been seen for almost the whole month. That name was personally created by Bathory herself. She so desperately wanted to bring Yong Yong home and pat that chubby rear immediately. My apologies. Do you think I'm trying to fulfill some selfish wish of mine or something, huh? I'm only doing this, because when we tame Yong Yong, our plans will become so much smoother to carry out, you know. Seriously, Yong Yong is hundred times better than those useless boss monsters that get killed as soon as they appear. Afterwards, Bathory continued to grill her underlings for another hour or so. No matter how many times the hapless goons cowed out and groveled before her, her hysteria didn't want to die down. However, without this lone hobby of hers, there would be nothing left to appease her boredom, other than wanton destruction and sadistic torture. The Wizard of Bangbaedong has declared on his blog that he will publish the corrected versions of the grimoires containing the Sea Great Spell's Shadow Conversion and Reflection Glass very soon. He initially said he will favor the Wizard Towers based in Korea when he's going to sell the grimoires, but now, it is understood that several overseas Wizard Towers are fiercely opposing this. Also, the son of the High Elf Wizard Forden who are credited with inventing the original spells, Crystal Forden is enraged by the fact the spells created by his ancestors are being changed without the family's approval and thus is seeking appropriate compensation. As soon as Sae Jean stepped into his house, he heard these words from a news program, coming from the TV. He groaned slightly as he entered the living room. Oh, Appa, you are home. USAE Young. USAE Young was focusing on the news probably because, it was about the wizard that was making a lot of waves of late. Why would a lady knight pay so much attention to a measly wizard, I wonder? 
S.A.E. Jean. He spoke leisurely and pulled U.S.A.E. Young into an embrace. Well, I might be a knight, but I'm also the only child of the dawn, you know. I can't afford to miss news stories like this. U.S.A.E. Young. But, doesn't the dawn's intelligence guys know all of this already? S.A.E. Jean. But that's from the dawn's perspective. With news programs, you can find out what the public thinks. U.S.A.E. Young. It was then, a graceful middle-aged elf lady showed up on the TV screen. It seemed that it was time to interview the expert on the matter. Colleen Rex, professor of the School of Wizardry, a class wizard affiliated with the Soul Wizard Tower. He's a genius. It might sound like an easy notion to weed out inconsistencies and enhance an existing spell's effects, but in reality, it's just as hard as inventing brand new spells. Well, knights and wizards who have circulated mana at least once before will know what I'm talking about. Taking in that point, although we don't know who this wizard of Bang Beidong is, he is definitely one of the most outstanding geniuses in the world. Then, in your considered opinion, just how far will this wizard reach in the near future? Hmm as you may well know, the world of wizardry is separated into field application and theoretical studies. In the school of theory, he might easily exceed A class. But, exceeding A-class, isn't that the territory of the Grand Wizards? Ho ho ho, is that right? What do you think, Appa? USAE Young. USAE Young suddenly asked him. A, about what? SAE Jean. No, well. About that wizard of Bang Beidong. I heard that magic spells he corrected now number 10 and that it's almost like new spells have been invented, since the spell's powers increased by the maximum of double the original. That's a huge deal, almost as big as business transactions of a single quarter for a wizard tower. Oh, really? But still, isn't this a bit too much brouhaha over nothing? S.A.E. Jean. U.S.A.E. Young's eyes sharply narrowed as if she couldn't believe what she just heard. What the, what do you mean by that, a brouhaha? A few. Appa, seriously now you gotta educate yourself a bit more. Seeing her shake her head like that, he suddenly didn't feel all that nice. Before he hit the books, it seemed that he needed to punish her first. Just because you go to the Korea University, that doesn't make looking down on people a cool thing to do. S.A.E. Jean. No, it's not like that. It's common sense kayak. S.A.E. Jean turned the TV off and pushed her down on the couch. And then, as she tried to utter the words of apology with a crimson face, he blocked her mouth with his lips. Wait, I've got a ton of things to do no, I need to go ah. Uh. Aang Hugh. Aang. T.L. Aang. Need to smirk spend some stuff. Oh, alright. I'll stop. She tried to escape from his grasp by throwing a tantrum, but every time she did that, S.A.E. Jean found a way to conquer each of her erogenous zones in brilliant strategic maneuvers. Before long, the lights were off, and their clothes formed a small heap on the floor. Creak, creak, creak. And also accompanied by the constant creaking of the couch's frame, the pleasured, blurred moans filled up the living room. Chapter, 127 the Nisferatu woman said that since there wasn't much time left until the fissure widened up enough to become a portal, the batteries had to be eliminated as soon as possible. She also added that the world needed to acknowledge the upcoming calamity and concentrate on increasing their military might as well. But, in all honesty, S.A.E. Jean just couldn't really grasp the level of danger that might appear when the portal opened up for good. No matter what it was, without having a personal experience on the subject, a person wouldn't be able to understand it. Still, he planned to do his very best in the meantime. SFX for mana buzzing about. Currently, inside a closed-off arena, where the space was being illuminated in vivid blue and the only sound accompanying it was the buzzing of the mana's emission. Kim S.A.E. Jean was in the middle of trying to find original ways to utilize the mana body, dot. Heavy grown. And the new method he came up with, was to extract mana out from his body and to coagulate it into a stone or a crystal. It was no different than trying to create mana stones artificially. Plus, mana stones created through this method were completely different from the monster's mana stone. First of all, the properties of these stones could be altered to suit S.A.E. Jean's tastes. 
He could freely control the degree of hardness and strength of each stone as if it was metal ore, and create weapons and armors made purely of mana. And not only that, a person could even swallow one of these stones, too. Seeing that regular monsters' mana stones weren't hard enough to craft into armaments, and that they also possess harmful elements thus making it impossible to eat them, these new stones could be called revolutionary. God Dien. I might really die at this rate. S.A.E. Jean. However, it did prove exceptionally difficult to squeeze out mana and force them into a blank canvas of a mana stone. It was to the point where, only after making three such stones, he was this close to passing out from the dizziness. Hmm. After gulping down lots of cold water, S.A.E. Jean shifted his gaze towards the three mana stones emitting brilliant blue shine that he had made. There was not one speck of imperfection visible on or within them. He felt that there were literally endless applications for these stones. He could make a few more and use them in crafting various armaments, or he could sell them at astronomical sums to knights and wizards by advertising these stones as mana supplements. After all, those guys were the types to go absolutely mad when it came to all things mana-related. Ha! Suddenly, a wry chuckle escaped his lips as he thought about this and that. Whenever he browsed internet, he read lots of people busy writing that S.A.E. Jean's trait was a cheat, a biggest cheat no less. But without a doubt, he couldn't deny that they were all 100% right on the money. Well, it was indeed beyond the realm of common sense he was currently in the middle of making a mana stone artificially, an item that most normal people would shout out Eureka. When picking one up off the ground. SFX for a mobile phone vibrating. While Riley praising himself inwardly, his phone vibrated. He took a glance, and saw that the call was from Yubek Song. Hello. Yeah, it's me. How are you? Although, I'm surprised by this sudden call. I heard you're really busy nowadays. One of the few people who proudly boasted the title of Kim S.A.E. Jean's close associates, Yubek Song was being seen as the most promising person currently serving in the government. And accordingly, she was really busy with receiving lots of great treatment from nearly everyone. Hell, one could probably buy twenty-odd skyscrapers with all the bribes she had refused so far. Hey, you forgot about the favor you asked me before. Mm. -hmm. S.A.E. Jean's head tilted in confusion. He could hear the groan of disappointment from the receiver of the phone. You told me to get you a certain mana stone, didn't you? A mutated ebony wolf's. I just got it, sent in from India. Aha. He then remembered. There was one skill he hadn't been utilizing until now. It was a skill where he could recall and control monsters by using either their carcasses or their mana stones. However, he could only control three monsters, so he was very carefully choosing which monsters he'd like to control and then, predictably, the whole thing slipped out of his mind completely. This is a great timing. Let's meet up right now. Now. Yes. Are you busy with something? Not really. There's an appointment, but I can cancel that one. But the thing is I just got out of the shower. She probably said that without thinking too much at all. Plus, he even had a lover. However, those were the words that held the scary power to shake a man's heart. I'll be there. Right now. Hanging up immediately, S.A.E. Jean departed and arrived at Yubeksong's house seemingly in one single breath. And no, it was definitely not because he wanted to see her moist hair. Not at all. The mutated ebony wolf, known as Lakkorn. This monster made its base in the Himalayan mountain range and was infamous for its might and intelligence that didn't fit regular wolves. It even fought off and safely escaped the hunting parties of upper mid-tier knights and high-tier hunters. S.A.E. Jean had chosen this creature to be his pet dog. But it had been over six months and he completely forgot about it. Wow. Even my mercenary company couldn't do it. How did you pull this one off? S.A.E. Jean. The mana stone wasn't the only thing that Yubek Song had procured. Below the mana stone, the carcass of the monster was on the floor, its remains still a bit warm to the touch. We did the Athene diplomacy with India not too long ago, you see. I sneaked in a couple of conditions during the negotiation, if they were willing to hunt the lakcorn for me. Yubek Song. Oh, really? Yup. 
I'm sure a nationwide hunting operation took place over there. They probably called in 1,000 knights to hunt this monster. Yu Bek Song. Seeing her brightly smiling face, adorably implying that he should praise her good work, Sae Jean ended up inadvertently patting her head. Her white hair was still moist and soft to his touch. Thank you. As expected, there is no one that comes close to taking care of things better than Miss Yu Bek Song. Sae Jean. Ku, Kiem. I'm not a great white tiger for nothing. As if she got embarrassed, she slowly pushed away his hand but still couldn't hide her reddened face. Also, her nostrils continued to flare up while she smelled his scent and her ears carried on twitching as if to capture one more word of praise. Well, in that case, I'll see you again later. S.A.E. Jean Unfortunately for her, though S.A.E. Jean didn't praise her anymore. Because he quickly exited her house while grabbing both the Lakcorn's mana stone and its carcass, utterly unable to control his excitement at the thoughts of riding on a wolf's back. SFX for the door slamming shut. And so left alone by herself, Yu Song glared beyond the now slammed shut door and pouted unhappily. Was it so difficult for him to praise me some more? As soon as leaving Yu Song's house, Sae Jean immediately headed off towards the monster field. After changing to the hero orc form, the mere thoughts of riding on the real lacorn that he only saw on TV screens caused his heart to boil in anticipation even harder. Hmm, hmph. After taking a couple of deep breaths, Sae Jean carefully picked up the mana stone and activated the skill. Both the stone and the carcass of the monster lacorn suddenly scattered like fog, and then, turned into a stream of energy and entered his chest. The ebony wolf mutated version has been absorbed into the warrior's heart. The ebony wolf mutated version has been added to the list of summonable monsters. The ebony wolf stats has been increased accordingly to match the new owner's current stats. The current grade for the ebony wolf's combat ability is, high grade. The alert window informed him of the smooth integration with the mana stone. Sae Jean the orc closed his eyes and activated the skill. And it was oh so simple. All he had to do was whisper, summon in his mind. Soon enough, murky mana flowed out from his heart in a form made up of swirling blue and black colors, rapidly took shape. It was like a hologram display drawing on air. When the two different colored mana streams combined, the giant wolf, Lackcorn regained its life once more. Even though it was just a measly wolf, its body was big enough to stand shoulder to shoulder with Sae Jean's hero orc form. And those brilliantly sparkling eyes surveying the world displayed the valor of a warrior quite clearly. Feeling utterly satisfied, he stroked the wolf's back. SFX for a repeated low growl of a canine. Lackcorn recognized its new master and growled in satisfaction as well. Sae Jean the orc smirked and then, placed the prepared saddle on the creature's back. Giddy up. After climbing up the saddle, Sae Jean lightly drummed on the back of the wolf. He didn't have to point it to a direction. The wolf still understood his intentions perfectly and kicked the ground hard, rushing towards where he wanted to go. SFX for air blowing past. This was truly a wondrous turn of speed, fast enough to effortlessly leave behind the surrounding scenery in a blur. And the sonic booms left behind their wake uprooted trees and caused maelstrom of dusty storm clouds. They were so dominating, even the monsters in the high-tier hunting ground scurried away in fright by their approach. However, as Sae Jean was deeply admiring this speed that was several times faster than what he imagined. Everyone, take a step back. From somewhere, a resolute yet harried voice came to him. Was someone out hunting right now? When he took a glance over yonder, a head of a huge white bird rose up among the tops of tall trees, and then. Fayek. Out of the blue moon, it screeched out one of the most unpleasant cries anyone had the misfortune to hear. It was so terrible that it was definitely two thousand, no, four thousand times more ear-bleeding than fingernails scraping on a blackboard. Sae Jean's anger shot up through the proverbial roof after hearing that terrible noise. It was the kind of sound that could pretty much enrage anyone, so both Lackcorn and the orc couldn't control their tempers anymore. He grabbed the reins tightly, and Lackcorn quickly changed the direction, heading towards the origin of that noise. After handing over the mana stone and the carcass of a rare monster donated by India to Yu Song. 
Kim Yurin received an urgent message from the government that said, a highly dangerous monster has appeared within the high-tier hunting ground. The monster was called the giant swan. As the name indicated, it was a huge white bird and it was one of those growth-type monsters that grew stronger with the passage of time. So, she quickly formed a subjugation team and came here. She figured everything would be okay. Although the giant swan was a high-tier monster, her team was made up of twelve high-tier knights as well. Unfortunately, none of them could have imagined that the condition for its growth was getting damaged. What the FCK is this SHT what should we do now, Captain? After it got sliced up by the knight's swords, it began clawing madly all around it and started getting ready to evolve. And the terrifying energy the DN thing was emitting easily exceeded that of a regular high-tier monster. Everyone, take a step back. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin ordered the other knights to retreat, and then changed the shape of her gunnier from a sword to a spear. She quickly compared the amount of mana left in her and the types of effects her trait could imbue her attack with. It seemed that knocking the monster out was not possible. In that case, at a minimum, she'd have to take a limb from. Faiyik. She was grasping the spear tightly, when the giant swan let out an explosive and unpleasant roar. This unexpected cry easily penetrated past the mana barrier and attacked the ear canals, disrupting the flow of everyone's mana. And as a result, the ears of the knights began bleeding. However, the giant swan did not stop its sonic attack. That son of A.K., Ku. Kiek. Kim Yurin forced her body to stand up, even if she was stumbling about. Her aim was that huge opening of the mouth. Her eyesight was blurring away, but she just had to. SFX for a loud roar of the orc. It was then, another ultra-loud roar blanketed the shrill cry of the giant swan. And right after that, Puren. The sound of powerful impact resounded out. Following that sound, a mace flew towards the wide-open beak of the giant swan. It all happened in a blink of an eye, but as Kim Yurin was focusing hard at that moment, she witnessed it all in slow motion. That slowly flying mace and the roar definitely belonged to. SFX for a shorter but angrier roar of an orc. From her left, exploding out of the tall bush, a lone orc jumped out. He was, without a doubt, the hero orc that proudly boasted a powerful physique, and now, it was even riding on an overwhelmingly frightening wolf monster. SAE Jean was slightly taken aback by the sight of Kim Yurin staring back at him. However, taking care of his anger took precedence, first of all. That ugly screech from the crazy as white bird was more unpleasant than any other provocations he'd ever heard before. Feek. Even though it got hit in the face by a mace, the giant swan didn't give up and continued to screech out. SFX for the loud barkings of a wolf. SFX for a loud roar of an orc. Both SAE Jean and Lackcorn responded with enraged roars. Feek. But still, the swan didn't want to back down not even by an inch. In the end, the anger reached the top of his head, and with his entire body becoming crimson, the orc madly dashed towards the large white bird. Chapter, 128 With its eyes completely frenzied, the big wolf carrying the orc madly pounced on the giant swan. Kim Yurin didn't even have enough time to get shocked. Even if it was the hero orc, this was going to be seriously dangerous as soon as she thought of this her legs moved towards the orc all by themselves. Quack. The mace thrown by the orc smacked the swan's beak and caused a big wound before returning back to his hands like a boomerang. Now that was one truly crazy sight to behold. Puff. After its beak got attacked, the giant swan finally stopped its terrible screech, but its whole body started glowing in intense red. That was the very bad sign of it getting ready to grow, or to evolve further, as it were. However, both the orc and wolf didn't really care about such small details. Ta'at. The wolf lackcorn leaped high, which put the orc right by the swan's nose. The mace overflowing with mana swung right in front of the monster. A powerful impact noise exploded out, and the shock wave shook the surroundings. Unfortunately, though it seemed that the giant swan used the damage to actually push itself to evolve one step further. SFX for steam rising. The quickly reddening body of the monster began decreasing in size and emitted incredibly high temperature. 
Opaque white steam carrying intense heat blocked the sky, melted nearby trees, and burned the ground around it. This heat wave was so intense, even Kim Yurin's mana barrier was quaking beyond her control, getting really close to shattering into bits. She quickly turned around and shouted out at her teammates. Run! Her shout echoed within the mountainside like a lone scream. The knights hesitating at the rear finally stepped back a bit more. Seeing this, Kim Yurin gulped down a large dollop of her own saliva. Was it possible to withstand what was about to come? Not her, but the orc. She couldn't remain undecided for long. She ran towards the orc. She did this not because of some unnecessary emotions deeply rooted in her heart, no. She convinced herself this was the case, that it was because of the curiosity in questions towards the orc circling inside her head. She ran towards the orc and grabbed his hand. And at the same time, the orc looked at her. She too, looked at him. The wolf between them barked. And, from the body of the swan, a massive boom exploded out. Quahahang. An explosion so violent, it seemingly crushed the world in its wake a jet black cloud shaped like a horrifying mushroom rose up from the site of explosion. In that moment when the explosion descended on them, the orc pulled Kim Yurin in his arms and activated the scales of Leviathan. Well, he still had to save this crazy woman regardless of her reasons for walking into the blast radius all by herself. Whoever he was acting out as in that moment Kim Sae Jean or the hero orc both of his personalities didn't want her to die, after all. The explosion of the ground became smoke and rose up to the air. Following the apocalyptic chaos that shook the entire mountainside, a heavy, choking silence descended. However, the land upon where the two of them stood no longer existed. The site of the mind-numbing explosion was caved in like the mouth of a volcano, the end of the pit not visible to the naked eye. Swish swish. Hazy dust particles settled down on the ground like nuclear fallout. There were a handful of the giant white bird's feathers mixed in among this fog. Sae Jean the orc slowly opened his eyes within the still darkness. Only now he felt that his head, lost among the burning rage and gnawing instincts, had cooled down for him to think properly. Gradually, his blurry vision sharpened up. He saw a beautiful woman, right in front of his nose her comfortably closed eyes, perfectly shaped nose, lips slightly wet from blood. And he brushed those lips with his thick finger unconsciously. You, M.M. Kim Yurin showed some reaction, which caused the orc to stiffen up a little. For now, he thought it would be a good idea to extricate himself from this awkward position, where it kind of looked like they were hugging each other. But she was using his arm like a pillow. He wondered whether to simply yank his arm loose, but in the end, he just let out a long sigh, instead. Fuwu. However, if there was one thing Sae Jean didn't count on, it was that the sigh of an orc was incomparably powerful to that of a human's. The storm winds escaping from the orc's lips arrived at her eyes, blowing her hair back and shook her eyelashes in the process. And so, she woke up from her slumber, just like that. Two of them blinked and continued to stare at each other. From Kim Yurin's point of view, this was way too fast a change of pace for her. Well, the thing was, from the moment when the orc suddenly appeared, and when she got mixed in the explosion while chasing after the orc, and then after he grabbed her into his arms. And finally, to this very moment where his face was completely filling up her view, all of these happened in just over a minute for her as far as time frame was concerned. You, should stand now. Sae Jean. After staring at each other like this for who knows how long, the baritone voice of the orc tickled her ears. Ah, uh, yes. Right Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin quickly got up. The orc also stood up. W, where do you think we are now? Kim Yurin. With a slightly reddened face, Kim Yurin asked him while stealing a quick glance at the orc. Don't know. Possible, we fell deep underground, because of explosion. Sae Jean. You could be right. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin couldn't help but feel a distinct sense of deja vu right now. There was a situation like this one in the past, although there were quite a few more people back then. This place, not a cave like last time. Sae Jean. The orc said, as he lifted his head to look at the ceiling. 
No visible light rays permeated from up there, but it sure was very high. Ah, in that case Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin pulled her mobile phone out from the pocket. But there was no way an electronic device would survive such a shocking explosion. It's not working. The orc shook his head while thinking, obviously it wouldn't and then he surveyed his surroundings a little more closely. He didn't sense any particular funny flow of mana, and he could hear the sound of underground stream flowing by not too far from his position. So, this place could be. Could this be, nothing more than a simple accident? This was different from back then, when he got caught in the isolation barrier trap. He simply fell underground after getting sucked into that large explosion. You, you. You, yuk. But quite literally out of the blue, Kim Yurin began struggling for some reason, like a person trying her very best to finish her business in a toilet. The lashes on her tightly closed eyes trembled while both of her fists were clenched real tightly. It was kind of a funny scene to look at, but at the same time, he had seen something similar to that before. I, I can't wield mana. Kim Yurin. After ten minutes of struggle later. With a face of someone who just lost her country, Kim Yurin looked at the orc while being on the verge of tears. Inside this dark space, deep beneath the surface of the planet, a bonfire was burning and spreading warmth, with two people basking in it while idly spending time there. They were thinking that, since this was an accident, there should be a rescue team coming for them soon enough and that they should stay there for now. I think it's the giant swan's ability. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin suddenly opened her mouth while she stared into the fire. There's a wound on my back that could have been caused by the explosion. That monster's mana must have invaded my body. Kim Yurin. The orc didn't say anything. She took a glance at the orc and continued. I think I'll be fine in a week's time. Kim Yurin. Fu. Then, the orc let out a lengthy sigh and stood up. Is he going to hit me? Kim Yurin stiffened up noticeably. As if to confirm her worst fears, the orc did reach out towards her, and then. Kwajik. He broke off a big chunk of rock protruding from the ground. WH, what are you planning to do with that? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin somehow regained her calm from her shuddering and asked him. The orc didn't say anything and simply used the orc smithing technique. Then, the uneven surface smoothed out, and its shape lengthened into a pole-like form. Wah! Orcs, make weapons like this. S.A.E. Jean. Feeling slightly awkward by Kim Yurin's way too shocked reaction, S.A.E. Jean the orc said something and then broke off another piece of rock. Afterwards, the orc continued to break off rocks from the ground and then, grinded them, combined them, and reshaped them for the next thirty minutes or so. Initially, Kim Yurin watched on with an interest at what he was trying to achieve, then couldn't help but be deeply impressed by the end results. SFX for sounds of hammering. At the place where the orc's hands went past, a small but remarkable stone hut stood proudly. Although there was a big penalty in the orc form, the usefulness of the A-level goblin's craftsmanship displayed here was still quite amazing, indeed. Wowzers, just how did you Kim Yurin? You, sleep inside. S.A.E. Jean. She was so shocked, she couldn't even properly finish her sentence, but the orc spoke as if it was nothing much. I, sleep here. S.A.E. Jean. This time, he poured mana to the ground. The solid stone floor rose up in a squarish shape and then changed into a stone bed. Um, that thank you. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin muttered as she stroked the pillar of the rather adorable little stone hut. However, she unhurriedly pitter-pattered right next to him and smiled instead. But well, I'm not feeling sleepy, though. The ends of her eyes curved upwards coquettishly. The tips of her hair slightly brushed against his arm. What the hell is up with this Egeo, all of a sudden? S.A.E. Jean did his very best to calm down his trembling heart. About half a day's stay in the underground prison later. Kim Yurin had been fiddling with the unresponsive mobile phone and a communication crystal for a while, before a loud grumble came out from her stomach. Hot. It was an embarrassing slip-up. She stopped doing everything and stole another quick glance at the orc. She felt like hiding in a hole. The sound should have been loud enough to surprise him, 
yet the orc didn't even seem perturbed as he just yanked a big chunk of meat out of his expanding pocket. Kim Yurin's rounded eyes began sparkling dangerously. The orc increased the strength of the bonfire and began an impromptu barbecue right there. After nicely sharing the tasty meat, the look of pure satisfaction was writ large on her face as she rubbed down her filled up belly. However, not too long after that, she began smacking her lips noisily. The orc dumbfoundedly looked at her, as if to ask if there was a group of homeless beggars living inside her stomach or something. She quickly waved her hands in denial, and said that this time, it was actually her thirst acting up. Without a word, the orc went in search of the underground stream. He only needed ten minutes as it was nearby. When he poked a hole on the wall where it seemed just about right, a small but steady stream of underground water began leaking out. He quickly fashioned a container out of stone and filled it with water, taking it back to Kim Yurin. She was definitely embarrassed by her powerless self that was only good for annoying the orc, but still, drank the water with an ecstatic expression. Kayahat. It was so, so refreshing. The orc chuckled after seeing her reaction, and Kim Yurin also smiled faintly after seeing his expression. Now that he was done with all the side work related to her, S.A.E. Jean the orc sat down on the ground and started the maintenance on his mace. While listening to the rhythmic sound of metal being sheared off and smoothed out, Kim Yurin slowly closed her eyes. Unfortunately a new problem arose after about one hour had passed by. It was to be expected, really. After all, she had eaten and drank, so the next natural action of the human digestive system would be. You, yuk. She searched for a good spot while desperately holding it in. It seemed that, this nature's call was for both numbers but no, she told herself that she could handle something like this. The patience and endurance of a knight was nothing to scoff about, after all. But her face continued to get redder and redder. Her thighs began rubbing against each other all by themselves, and her body was shivering uncontrollably. Only then, she realized something quite important. A knight without the support of mana was not a knight and that those who had it but lost it, were weaker than those who originally never had it. Um, excuse me I, ah, uh, need to go somewhere, real quick Kim Yurin. Finally unable to hold it in anymore, she began to shuffle towards some unknown destination in uneasy steps. Too bad, this was a wide open area with no place to hide. Inside the hut. I made a small place. S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin's body froze still after hearing the orc's words that sounded like a divine oracle from the heavenly savior. No, no, it's, it's not like that. I just want to wash my hands, you see. I am, a little bit a clean freak you see Kim Yurin. While uttering something, she ever so slowly and painfully inched closer to the hut. Fut. She then heard the orc's low chuckle. Kim Yurin bit down on her lips while tears formed on the corners of her eyes. However. While the two of them were enjoying a bit of an event that could have happened in everyday lives. An egg lying not too far from where they were began trembling slightly. And this thing was an egg the giant swan spat out before it went kaboom. A powerful explosion occurred during the giant swan raid, causing Knight Kim Yurin to go missing in action. The Raven Knight's order has dispatched an emergency rescue team to the site, but it is now understood that. Due to the giant swan's unique parasitic and harmful mana acting like a nuclear fallout, it has proven to be exceptionally difficult to descend to where she might be. A breaking news broadcast could be seen on the TV screen located within the office of the mercenary company's director of operations. Yes, Miss S.A.E. Young. Ah, uh, the guild master is currently Kim Sun-ho. At the same time, the knights witnessed the hero orc appearing in the middle of the raid. Acting as a temporary director, the sweating Kim Sun-ho found himself busy conversing with the boss madam while keeping an eye on the news broadcast at the same time. I believe that, he might not be able to return home for a few days due to a difficult assignment. But you don't have to worry. Since Miss S.A.E. Young was in the middle of training, he told me personally that he will contact you as soon as he finds the right time Kim Sun-ho. Is that true? Of course. Why would I ever lie to you? Well, then. Do you know where Hazeline Uni is right now? She's probably at the Yosian Alchemy House at this very moment. You could call her and find out. 
Humph. I understand. USAE Young ended the call. Kim Sun Ho put his phone down and groaned out. Just why did you go and interfere in that raid, boss? Kim Sun Ho. He bitterly murmured to himself. At that moment, the news broadcast was showing the footage of the hero orc riding on top of a giant wolf rushing towards the white bird, while Kim Yurin was hurriedly chasing after him. Chapter 129 After spending a rough estimate of 18 hours within this dark and gloomy place, Kim Yurin was inside the stone hut, while Sae Jean the orc was lying on the stone bed, both of them trying hard to fall asleep however. Their heads were full of own complicated thoughts and so, it proved to be a difficult task to get the much-needed shut-eye. In Kim Yurin's case, the moment she laid down to sleep, curiosity and questions regarding the orc, as well as worries over her subordinates who might have somehow gotten mixed up in that explosion continuously popped up in her head. Surely, they should be okay since they are all quick on their feet. They better be okay, Kim Yurin. Unlike her, though, the orc's thoughts were a bit more related to the current issue and perhaps, just as urgent as well. It might get really dicey if I stay near her for too long. Gotta get out of this place soon, or I need to stay away from her, S.A.E. Jean. First of all, the basic instincts of the orc was the problem. Of course, he was carrying around a special potion in the spiritualized form inside him that could suppress all of the orc's baser instincts. As this orc form was getting more powerful with each passing day, there had been a few times already when he almost lost all his reasoning and went berserk after some stupid monsters tried to get on his nerves. Of course, there were no stupid monsters in this dark, gloomy cavern to test his patience, but still, there was an even more threatening existence right next to him. The orc turned his head and took a slight glance at the hut. He made sure it was as sturdy as it could get, and also added in a function that, once the door was closed from inside, it'd be locked automatically. However, as it was made out of nothing but stone, it was true that he could destroy it in seconds if he went berserk once more. Enough for four days this should be fine, if it's this much. S.A.E. Jean. After checking the amount of potion left, he let out a long sigh. The two people wrestling with their own thoughts began slowly drifting into the calm embrace of sleep as the hours ticked by. And so the next day had come, and inside this dark space where it was difficult to tell whether it was morning or not. Kim Yurin woke up from her slumber thanks to several loud pfung. Pfung. Coming from outside the hut and to some extent, from the sound of her own stomach grumbling as well. Slowly opening her eyes, she got up from the soft stone bed rather contradictory, but true in this case and looked outside from the hut's window. Kwahang. Kwahang. The orc was busy pounding on the poor, innocent ground. What on earth is he doing? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin exited the hut, her head full of questions. SFX for the door creaking open. The orc turned his head towards her direction after hearing the door opening. What are you doing? She asked him while rubbing her eyes. I make vibration. To tell the people coming for us, where we are. S.A.E. Jean. Ah. Finally understanding what was happening, she then sat down on a stone chair that seemed to have materialized out of nowhere just now. Kim Yurin decided to stay and watch the orc's construction efforts in order to wake her sleepy head up completely. Watching those rippling muscles and hearing the crystal clear sound of the mace, sweat drops dancing in the air, and his hair, wet from the proof of his labor. As she was happily taking this sight in, all of a sudden, she heard the sounds of something powerfully running towards her direction from some distance away. Surprised out of her mind, Kim Yurin quickly jumped right to the orc's side. It's a monster. Get ready for battle. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin shouted out so, and reached down to her waist to grab her weapon, Gungnir. A force of habit built over the years on the job, it was. Not too long after, a monster did appear for real. She bravely pulled out her sword and pointed the stunningly sharp edge towards a huge wolf. Please, pick up your weapon. Kim Yurin. No need. The completely tense Kim Yurin took on the battle stance. But the orc simply chuckled and approached the wolf in unhurried steps. What? Be careful. I can sense it's dangerous or Kim Yurin. Even before her scared words could continue, 
the orc began stroking the head of the wolf in a display of utter composure. And the wolf received the patting in a posture full of adorable charm, as if it had reverted back to being a puppy or something. Its eyes arched like a pair of new moons, its ears folded back and its tail swayed from side to side in quiet contentment. Without a doubt, this was a bona fide monster, judging from its large, threatening size which was easily twice that of a regular full-grown man. It's my pet. S.A.E. Jean. She nearly dropped her sword then. Pardon. Name is Cornlack. You saw me riding it. S.A.E. Jean. Ah. Aha. Although it was hard to believe those words, she had to believe them regardless, after witnessing the situation for herself. Kim Yurin sheathed her sword back into its scabbard and sat down on the stone chair. Then, she carefully observed the wolf which was busy making a strange whimpering noise while showing off lots of Ejio. As an aside, she liked small, adorable and fluffy dolls. Well, they were cute, so there. Of course, this wolf wasn't small at all. However, seeing it full of Ejio as if it was a fox cub and not some menacing wolf, it was way too. E, excuse me, Mr. Orc. Unable to endure it anymore, Kim Yurin stutteringly opened her mouth. Her cheeks were somewhat dyed in red without her knowledge. Mm. -hmm. Can, can I also, uh, touch your corn salad, too? Kim Yurin. Cornlac. Oh, Cornlac. Sorry. Kim Yurin. The orc nodded his head and lightly drummed Cornlac's back. Kim Yurin stealthily got up from the chair and approached the huge wolf. Although it growled a bit towards her, when S.A.E. Jean the orc signaled it to behave itself, the wolf quietly laid down on the ground. She carefully reached out and ran her palm against Cornlac's back. Then, her eyes popped open extra round. If she was to describe the sensation in two words, it was soft and fluffy. The fur of regular wolves were stiff and hard, yet this guy was in another dimension altogether. It was as if she was touching the skin of a newborn, so soft and malleable. Her moods improved simply by touching it this, this was a brand new world she had never ever experienced before. Wow! Kim Yurin. Her eyes sparkled dangerously as she continued stroking Cornlac's back. At first, it was her hand only, but now, not only her cheeks, but she was using her entire body to rub against the wolf. That was how out of this world addictive this feeling was. Whimper, whimper. Suddenly getting violated by Kim Yurin, Cornlac sent gazes full of helplessness, but its owner simply sent back a gaze of his own that commanded it to endure for now. TL, well, the author used a pun-based joke here, but regrettably, it's untranslatable, as usual. See, the thing is, Yurin in Hanja form can also mean violation, or invading another space. So the author wrote that the wolf was getting urined by Kim Yurin. Within this dark and gloomy space where there was literally nothing but two people and a giant wolf, all they could was to talk to while away the time. While being inside the warm embrace of Cornlac, Kim Yurin asked the orc a fair few number of questions while carefully studying his reactions. She asked, how had he been living so far, why did he chase her out back then where did he learn to speak Korean, where did he find such a huge wolf as a pet, and just where he was until now, before making this sudden reappearance. All the answers the orc provided was short he chased her out because he didn't like her, and the rest, they were not something she should know. And so, thanks to his short and curt replies, she was quite angry right now. With deeply pouting lips, she was glaring at the bonfire, while she roughly rubbed the poor and blameless Cornlax back. S.A.E. Jean thought Dandruff might fall like snow at that rate. By the way, Kim Yurin opened her mouth again, just as Cornlack was getting fatigued. Do you know a human named Kim S.A.E. Jean? Kim Yurin. She asked while glaring at the orc with a pair of blunt eyes. Stiffening up slightly, S.A.E. Jean fell into a slight dilemma here. This woman was definitely suspecting something. Although he had no idea what she was thinking of, without a doubt, he had to be very mindful of where he stepped here. I know him. S.A.E. Jean. And how do you know him? Kim Yurin. None of your business. Immediately, she snatched a handful of cornlax fur. When the wolf got surprised and raised its head, she apologized profusely to it and gently patted its body. 
Sure, it may not be any of my business, but I ask, since I've never seen that person enter your village not even once until now. Kim Yurin. The orc didn't say anything. He was currently too busy thinking of how to respond at the moment, actually. However, Kim Yurin misinterpreted his silence as yet another none of your business, and her brows furrowed in dissatisfaction. And so, she ended up spitting out loud the suspicions that had been brewing inside her head until now. Are you making weapons for that person? Kim Yurin. At this completely unexpected dog's barkings, the orc turned to look at Kim Yurin. She then displayed quite a skillful body movement technique to steal away the mace resting next to the orc. What the? S.A.E. Jean. Take a good look. See this? This mark over here, and Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin pointed at a certain faint mark on the metal handle of the mace, and then reached down to her gungnir. My swear huh? What the? Where did it go? Kim Yurin. She was going to unsheath gungnir, but it wasn't there anymore. She hurriedly padded and searched all over her body in sheer panic. But, 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 why I couldn't have lost it, have I? No, it was with me until just now Kim Yurin. As Kim Yurin's face slowly turned purple while she sputtered words out in confusion, the orc silently pointed towards Kornlak's direction. She then quickly shifted her gaze towards the wolf. And sure enough, there was a hilt of a sword sticking out from the corner of its maws. She immediately spat out a lengthy sigh of relief. A few. Since its owner's weapon was stolen, the ever-so-loyal Kornlak had stolen the weapon of the thief, instead. E.I., you really surprised me there, you know, little baby. Please give it back. Kim Yurin. Finally, some of the lost color returned to her face. Kim Yurin grasped the hilt and tried to extricate the sword, but Kornlak didn't want to let it go. Kornlak could be called the avatar of the Lakhorn of India, and its jaw strength was as much as ten tons, maybe even more. Didn't matter how hard she may have trained herself as a knight, without the aid of mana, she was not going to win against such jaw strength. H, hey, come on now, stop fooling around in you. You. No, wait. Hey. What's the matter with you? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin wrestled with the hilt for a considerable length of time, before suddenly realizing the situation then, she tossed the mace back towards the orc's thigh. SFX for an item being smoothly sliding out. Only then, Kornlak immediately let go of the sword. And now, take a look over here. Kim Yurin. After getting her treasured sword back, Kim Yurin flicked Kornlak's forehead, and then showed the small mark inscribed at the bottom of the hilt. Even the orc was stunned by this revelation. Well, most people would never be aware of small, unconscious habits of theirs. You can also clearly see that, right? Kim Yurin. The orc looked straight into her eyes. Thankfully, it didn't seem like she had thought of the possibility that the orc could be Kim Sae Jean, yet. That was par for the course, really. Just who on earth could dream up a scenario where an orc and a human were the exact same person? Yeah, so. Sae Jean. And so the orc decided to maintain his very thick skin for now. He was planning to not say anything unnecessary, and let her continue on with misunderstandings and suspicions for the rest of her life. TL, really now? Pardon? Kim Yurin. So. So what? No, hang on did you make this Kim Yurin? Maybe, Kim Sae Jean make this. Maybe, I borrow from him and use mace. Sae Jean. The orc deliberately hardened his facial expression and frowned deeply. But, still. No matter. Kim Sae Jean, I trust much more than you. And, none of your business. Stop crossing the line. Sae Jean. Of course, he'd trust himself more than anyone else, really. As if she still had something else to say, Kim Yurin's lips moved up and down, but in the end, she returned to her seat while sighing out grandly. Then, she hugged Kornlak with a depressed face and whispered meekly to the wolf. Hey, would you like to come to my place instead of that orc's? Kim Yurin. Humph. The orc smirked and secured the mace on his hips. Afterwards, the two of them didn't say anything else for a while. 
10 minutes, 20, then an hour later the time continued to flow without restraint and resulted in the poor O.L. Cornlack getting much unwanted forceful coat shedding. SFX for winds suddenly picking up. Winds began blowing suddenly in this dark arena. Could it be the rescue party? Both of them turned to look at the direction where the wind came from. However, instead of rescue personnel, they spotted a bird-like creature over there. SFX for a chick's cries. Tweeting like a little chick, it was a white bird that kind of resembled a long-tailed tit or maybe even the Korean crow tit, complete with a pair of round and shining eyes, as well as a small and narrow beak. Its body was on the big side for a real bird, but it was about as big as a regular puppy dog and thus, rather intensely adorable. What is that thing? S.A.E. Jean. As the orc was trying to figure out the source of this strange aura hidden below that cute countenance, suddenly, Kim Yurin stood up as if she was in a trance. She then began walking dazedly towards the tweeting. Bird. It was at this very moment when the orc's alarm bells rang around like crazy. The flow of that dangerous mana pooling around its beak, that was a type of a breath attack. Fhikik. The tweeting BD. Suddenly spat out a stream of white flames. It was the lethal white flames, the most powerful of all hellish flames out there. Pahang. White flames of the breath displayed mighty destructive power as the attack spread out in a half-moon shape. It was the moment when the dark, gloomy cavern was lit up with a blinding white light. Chapter, 130. The breath fired out well before the orc could even react. However, it still collapsed into nothingness when a flash of golden sword light swept by. As expected, even without the support of mana, the power of Kim Yurin's Gungnir was something else entirely. What the heck is going on? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin panicked somewhat as she stared at this strange bird. Fayak. Fayak. As if it got pissed off by the failure of its attack, the bird angrily tweeted out while flapping its wings all over the place. The orc firmly grasped his mace and pulled Kim Yurin back behind him. Dangerous. S.A.E. Jean. The bird chirped like a little chick again, its bright and intelligent eyes staring at both of them. The orc took a glance at Kim Yurin. For some weird reason, she was busy licking her lips. Doesn't matter. Still dangerous. S.A.E. Jean. I'm aware of that already. I also witnessed it spew out a breath just now, you know. Kim Yurin. If you know, then concentrate properly. S.A.E. Jean the orc activated the eyes of the wolf. Unfortunately, even with the eyes that could easily suss out everything about the opponent, he couldn't spot that bird's weakness at all. In other words, that monstrosity of a bird didn't have a weak point. Of course, that didn't mean it was the most powerful being in the world. And it sure looked plenty weak, enough to make him think that it would be squashed into a fine meat paste no matter where he lands a hit. But, but, isn't it still a youngling? I mean, isn't there a way to tame that creature? Kim Yurin. Although she was currently in the state of being charmed, what she said did have some merit to it. If it was possible, then that bird would become an enormously powerful ally. The orc fell into a slight dilemma. In that short gap, the monster spat out yet another breath with a loud feek. This time, the orc stepped up and blocked it. The attribute imbued to the mace called destruction, a level could even render magic attacks completely useless when the breath met the mace, it dispersed like blowing dust. At the same time, the thoughts of taming the darn thing dispersed as well. You, want to tame that? That thing, very bad. Ugly attitude. S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin wordlessly scratched the back of her neck. Must kill it. Now. S.A.E. Jean. Maybe because it was nothing more than a newborn, although it did possess abnormal strength, it was still way too early to fight against the orc and Kim Yurin. However, considering its young age, no doubt the DN monster would evolve into something far more dangerous in the future. Oh well, if it's for the best, then I guess there's no choice. Kim Yurin. After agreeing with the orc's assessment, Kim Yurin grasped her sword tightly while her expression darkened. As if it had sensed the oozing killing intent, the bird opened its beak wide. The orc and Kim Yurin tensed up, wondering just what type of breath this thing might spew out next. 
SFX for an empty stomach rumbling. A sound that easily shattered the seriousness of the situation resounded out. The orc shot Kim Yurin a glare automatically. She quickly shook her head vehemently, her face reddening. Honestly? S.A.E. Jean. Why, yes, it wasn't me. Really? Kim Yurin. The orc didn't retract his accusing stares, but shifted it towards Kornlak who was busy growling at the bird. However, there was no way a specially summoned creature like his wolf would feel hunger. That left only one other possibility. That chick, don't you think maybe it's just hungry? Kim Yurin. We might be able to lure it with food, you know. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin's voice was full of mirth. However, the orc quickly saw through the ominous gathering of mana within the bird's innards. No. Step back. S.A.E. Jean. The orc left Kim Yurin in the care of Kornlak and dashed towards the bird. Too bad, the creature flapped its wings and hurriedly ran off into the air. And so, the bird circled around the two's head for a bit, before opening wide its beak once more. The orc quickly threw the mace at the bird. But before it could hit, an inconceivably powerful storm winds rushed out from that tiny beak of the monster. No, more correctly, rather than rushing out, it was more like the monster was sucking everything in with that small mouth. If one was to compare this to the previous breath attacks, it wasn't all that threatening. But still, there was one big problem it wasn't just a threat only to the orc. Plop. Suddenly, Kim Yurin collapsed. The orc hurriedly looked back. Riding on the swirling air, her mana was being drained out and sucked into the monster's mouth. Initially, the color of escaping mana was the usual blue, but soon, its hue darkened gradually, until it became the hue of blood as it left her. She was going to die at this rate. The orc threw the mace again, but the DN monster easily evaded the thrown weapon by floating this way and that. In the end, he chose to use mana crafting. He remotely manipulated mana found in the air and formed a spear out of it, then fired it at the belly of the monster. Kwajiek. It seemed that the monster couldn't dodge the spear that shot out from literally the thin air. One of its wings were badly maimed, which finally prompted the creature to stop sucking out Kim Yurin's mana, and then, in panic, it flew higher and higher until it disappeared into the darkened ceiling. Of course, he couldn't chase after it, even if he wanted to. The orc's instincts were busy telling him to climb up the cavern walls just to smash that deceptively cute face into a mush, but there was someone else who needed his attention far more urgently. With shaking hands, S.A.E. Jean quickly drank the potion designed to suppress the orc's instincts. Finally regaining his senses, S.A.E. Jean walked back towards Kim Yurin. If there were blood mixed in with mana, that meant the forceful absorption had nearly pushed her over the death's doorway. He could easily see that her face was wanner compared to before. Oh I I. The orc shouted out as he shook her. At his thunderous shout, she broke free from the grips of unconsciousness and slowly opened her eyes. You, still alive. S.A.E. Jean. Within her blurry sight, Kim Yurin could see the panicking face of the orc. Didn't he say that he chased her away, because he didn't like her anymore so why was he showing such panicked face, she wondered. But then, she no longer had the leisure to worry about such a thing. As she silently closed her eyes once more, something slipped inside her mouth. It was a weird feeling thing, this rock hard, yet soft and malleable. There was no taste to it, and equally, no scent either. But her body reacted first and she began swallowing down this strange foreign substance. At the same time, a mysterious effect took hold of her body, but this was as far as her memories could record, as her consciousness fell deep into darkness. The emergency treatment proved to be successful. If he didn't make an artificial mana stone on the spot and feed it to her, she would have drawn her last breath right here. Although she had received a life-threatening injury, as her body was in the most tip-top shape imaginable, it didn't take too long for her to open her eyes again. She looked gaunt and haggard as too much of her mana got sucked out, but he actually preferred this appearance. The thing was, the orc's original nature made them hate the sickly and the dying. The medicine had run out already now, so this was better, compared to being healthy and full of life. TL, I've no idea what the author is trying to write here. I've TL'd it literally, 
but he just makes no darn sense at all. You, can't use mana yet. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, unfortunately. The nameless bird that stole away even the last drop of Kim Yurin's mana was long gone by now. And there was not one sign of the rescue party coming for them. The only fortunate thing was that, there was more than enough food collected inside his expanding pocket. That was it. You, feel bad somewhere. S.A.E. Jean. I'm more or less okay for now. But I should have realized that there is parasitic mana flowing inside me. I'm a knight, so I should have been prepared even for the unexpected. The parasitic mana. Normally, there were a few special monsters that possessed completely different anatomy and type of mana compared to that of humans. And the parasitic mana was one of the most bizarre and difficult to deal with, among the unique types of monster mana out there. This flow of mana came with some form of sentience, and it would voluntarily enter another lifeform's body. Then, it would start blocking the natural flow of the host's mana, forcibly stockpiling it. And when the owner of that parasitic mana showed up again, the stockpiled mana, along with the parasitic one, would be absorbed into the monster. So, when viewed from that point, the white bird was an exceptional specimen, indeed. The host was not just anyone but the Kim Yurin, and it didn't even take 20 seconds before she was driven nearly to death by its ferocious appetite. I've survived thanks to you. Mr. Ork, thank you very much. Kim Yurin. Call, if you need something. S.A.E. Jean. Chuckling slightly, S.A.E. Jean the Ork tried to exit the stone hut, but. Excuse me. Kim Yurin. She stopped the Ork from leaving, and with her head peeking out from below the improvised bed sheet, cutely added a couple more things. I, uh, am feeling hungry Kim Yurin. Wait here. The orc didn't take long to cook up some gruel and brought it to her. I can't move my hands well. Kim Yurin. He ended up feeding her. Thank you. Kim Yurin. Finally, Kim Yurin was satisfied and gradually fell asleep. Pretty soon, the orc became a butler or maybe, a servant. When she got hungry, he cooked more gruel for her when she tried to get in some exercise with that still recovering body of hers. He pushed her back into bed when she was bored, he sat there and listened to her, and even helped her fall asleep when she couldn't do it alone. However, there was one upshot to all this, she didn't come outside the hut anymore, so when she was resting inside, S.A.E. Jean could revert back to human form to catch his breath. Meanwhile, all these foreign happenings became a refreshing experience and a wonderful memory for Kim Yurin. She enjoyed the gentle happiness rising from this feeling of being someone precious. Well, although she had looked after many of her subordinates, not once had she received such one-sided care before until now. Yes, she was stuck in this darkness, and yes, there was that parasitic mana still squirming inside her, yet she felt good every day. Of course, she was still human, so before she went to bed, brand new fears and even bouts of depression rose up one after the other. But thanks to the orc coming to visit her bedside, she could endure it. As a result, her smiles occurred far more frequently than ever before. And so, while relying on each other, or more correctly, the orc becoming the unconditional anchor for her to rely on, a week went by. While her mana wouldn't circulate until she received proper medical care outside, still, she had regained most of her vigor back. Rescue party, here very soon. S.A.E. Jean. The orc spoke as he patted Cornlack. He found this out after using the eyes of the wolf to thoroughly observe the sky-high ceiling. Countless knights and rescue personnel had seemingly completed all the necessary preparations to begin the rescue operation. Is that so? Kim Yurin. However, Kim Yurin showed a strange reaction that was neither happiness nor sadness. While pouting, she began clicking her tongue. Cornlack stealthily left the orc's side and trotted over to her. When the orc glared at the huge wolf with dumbfounded eyes, Yurin stuck her tongue slightly out. Merong. When we get up there, we won't run into each other again, right? Kim Yurin wordlessly brushed Cornlack's fur for a little while, before asking him as if she was talking about the passing weather. The orc replied coldly. Yep. She buried her head in Cornlack's luxurious fur with a depressed expression. Her mind was getting messy once more. A monster not running into humans well, 
that was par for the course, really. No, it was simply stating the obvious. But why did the corner of her heart feel like? Kim Yurin silently swam within her thoughts. Several useless and messy thoughts about the orc and herself filled her head up. The two of them spent what could be their last day of staying down here in unbreakable silence. Next day. Kim Yurin slowly opened her eyes, prompted by faint noise of chatter and equally faint light beams coming from above. She then heard conversations. Realizing that the rescue party had finally come, she lifted her fatigued body up from the stone bed. Her throat was parched and every muscle in her body was aching. She was about to be rescued, yet she didn't really feel all that good. No, she felt somewhat lonely and disappointed, instead. I see a stone house down there. And then, an orc. Hey, someone up there, quickly pass me my sword. Seeing that something bad might happen at this rate, she pushed her body and exited the stone hut. As soon as she stepped out, she saw the orc sitting on the stone bed, his face impassive as usual as he opened his mouth. You woke up. S.A.E. Jean. This time, Kim Yurin didn't say anything. Her emotion was in a mess. To be perfectly honest, she didn't want to part ways with him. This emotion where she wanted to stay next to someone through thick and thin, this emotion where she would feel happy and conflicted all at the same time, she didn't expect to feel it towards the orc but it happened. The time they spent together within this darkness was just long enough, and the orc's wholehearted caring was also enough to powerfully move the weakened Kim Yurin's heart. Me, say nothing from now on. You, speak for me when we go up. S.A.E. Jean. I'll leave you behind alone. Kim Yurin. What? You're a monster, that's why. Kim Yurin. The orc glared at Kim Yurin dumbfoundedly. She didn't avoid his eyes and squarely met them with her own. Then, she began to feel disappointed again. Why was he being so indifferent like this? Couldn't he be just a bit nicer towards her? A certain emotion inside her suddenly welled up uncontrollably. To me, it won't matter whether you're outside or inside this hole, if you are not planning to meet me anyways Kim Yurin. Even while on the verge of tears, she didn't shed a single teardrop. Can't be helped. Then, you, go up alone. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, seriously? Even her final triumph card didn't work against the determined orc. Meanwhile, several knights wielding swords shouted at them while being lowered by the magically operated lift system. Knight Kim Yurin. Is that you, ma'am? Yes. Over here. Kim Yurin. Although she hesitated, she still answered them in the end. Please, stand aside. We will take care of the orc and the wolf. At this declaration, she shifted her gaze to the orc, to Kornlak, and back to the descending knights above. She stifled a sniffle and wiped the droplets of water pooling on the corners of her eyes. And then, opened her mouth. No, there is no need for that. This here is the hero, orc, you see. Chapter, 131 S.A.E. Jean the orc beseeched Kim Yurin with alerting the rest of the world about that white bird, then climbed aboard the pulley-operated platform. We, uh, we are going up. The two knights charged with the rescue operation began operating the platform while stealing glances at the orc. Or, more correctly, at his defensive and offensive armaments. Even a single, casual glance could tell them those were all first-rate items that easily aroused their desires, even if they didn't want to. The orc wordlessly tossed pairs of wrist guards and gauntlets at them. The knights studied each other's expressions and then, the one carrying the spear took the wrist guards, while the dude with fists as weapons took the gauntlets. Using his fists one of these knights used his hands as weapons. There was a golden emblem Jean, etched on his chest armor, so it was safe to assume this guy was one of the inheritors of Jean Sehan's ideals. T, thank you very much. Both knights expressed their gratitude after receiving these sudden gifts. And at roughly the same time, warm sunlight could be seen above their heads. We'll return to the surface in around ten minutes. Please be patient for a little while longer. I understand. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin faced the rescuers with an officious and dignified attitude. The orc snorted at a just loud enough decibel that others might hear him. 
She frowned slightly after hearing his ridicule and promptly turned all of her attention towards the two knights. It was the breakout of her jealous streak that wasn't even a real breakout. By the way, it seems like you are from the Jean Mudo school. Kim Yurin. Oh. Yes, I converted around nine months ago, although I lack in many areas. But, you're a upper mid tier already only nine months after the conversion your talent must be exceptional. Kim Yurin. Haha <laughs> thank you for your kind words, but that isn't the case. I simply studied and copied a handful of instructors, that's all. And as luck would have it, this style really suited my tastes and talent level well. My trait also helped out a great deal. Jean Sehan a man who became a high tier posthumously, acknowledged as the highest tier as far as his fame was concerned, and already a part of the greatest honor known to knights, the Hall of Fame. And now, over a hundred thousand disciples around the globe were busy pursuing the path of the martial arts Jean Sehan had gifted this world, and over a thousand among them had chosen to wield fists after putting their weapons down. All these people fervently studied, reviewed, tempered themselves and trained hard while watching the films containing Jean Sehan's movements. To them, Jean Sehan would remain forever their true instructor. Because he was so generous with shooting lots of footages for educational purposes, his invaluable martial arts style, such as his battle sense, punching and movement technique, etc., could be preserved in full, becoming the guiding light for all the future generations. In other words, the traces of a hero had been deeply engraved into the world's psyche. Is that how it was? Your teacher was truly a praiseworthy man. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin nodded her head respectfully. The orc silently scratched his nose. He was inwardly feeling a bit embarrassed by the fact that the existence of Jean Sehan, an identity he created in order to achieve one of his goals, was able to influence the world far more greatly than he'd ever anticipated. Before long, the platform finally arrived at the surface. As this was a high-tier hunting ground, there weren't many onlookers and not one reporter present with the obvious exception of thirty-odd knights and wizards. They all gulped nervously after seeing the orc and his huge wolf. Are you going now? Kim Yurin. As soon as the orc climbed on the back of Kornlak, Kim Yurin asked in a miserable voice. The orc lightly nodded his head, then signaled to his ride. Quack. Kornlak jumped off the platform and into the sky, disappearing from the view almost immediately. And Kim Yurin watched the back of departing orc with a pair of lonely eyes. As soon as he returned home, Kim Sae Jean had to hear an earful from USA Young. After angrily declaring I'm also not coming home for a whole month. She promptly left the house. That night, Sae Jean forgot about sleeping and crafted a necklace. And on the following day, he went to where she was staying and gave it to her as a gift, accompanied with an apology. She was waiting for him at the guild's dormitory, and when he came, she feigned dissatisfaction but still forgave him. Oh. Later that day, after he had successfully received her forgiveness. Kim Sae Jean used his notebook PC to check some stuff out about Jean Sehan online, before running into a particularly interesting website. It was actually the website for the official Jean Mudo martial arts school established after Jean Sehan's death, but what caught his eyes were the words plastered on top of the screen EU Jean, 23 years old, director. Seeing her title description that said former, Knight of Eden, it seemed that she had left Eden after Jean Sehan's death, and then established the official association as well as the school to carry on with his legacy. While smiling brightly, Sae Jean checked the site out, before remembering a certain part of the will, written for him by Kim Yu Son, all of a sudden. Excluding my financial assets, everything else will be handed over to my valued and trusted colleague, E. Eugene. Ah. That clause ended up changing a person's life, hasn't it? Should he feel proud about this, or feel apologetic? For now, Sae Jean carefully searched through the site. Thankfully, he found a page link for sponsorship. Thinking that he should help out a bit, Sae Jean reached out and touched the link as it appeared on the hologram. SFX for a hologram changing. E. Eugene's face projected in the air became extra large. It was actually a pre-recorded video. Hello, my name is E. Eugene, the current serving director of the school of Jean Mudo. A brave face, the one Sae Jean sort of missed a little, greeted him. Fu. 
At the same time, E. Eugene spat out a really long sigh of lamentation while holding her head full of complicated thoughts. There was a ledger full of messy swarm of numbers right in front of her. Revenues were written with a blue pen, while losses were remarked with a red one. Nowadays, no person alive would keep the books manually like this, but since she was one of those computer illiterate members of the humanity, she had no other choice in the matter. And just how do I fill up this hole in the budget? However, one could only spy red letters on the pages of the ledger. It was filled with expenses for maintenance cost, management cost, as well as labor costs, rather than profit. If she wanted to generate profit forcibly, she probably could. After all, if she hiked the fee for lessons dramatically, as well as strictly enforce the copyright claims on all of Jean Sehan's footages, and then charge royalties on them, then she'd earn a pretty penny for sure. If she did all these, then the public might accuse her of selling out Jean Sehan's legacy, but there should be a steady stream of hopeful knights who would still pay up. The martial arts Jean Sehan had created all on his own were more than good enough for that. But, E. Eugene didn't want to do this. She could not do it. Because, she believed that she knew the reason better than anyone why Jean Sehan had entrusted her with carrying out his legacy. Jean Sehan used to tell her that she was a lot like him almost all the time. He also added often that she should stop using weapons and rely on her fist, instead. Back then, she balked at the idea, saying that he was trying to ruin her career and stuff like that. But after he died, she did put her weapon down and used her fists instead to very surprising results. And that was her unique trait, level mastery, had a shockingly great compatibility with Jean Sehan's martial arts. And so, she used all of the footages of Jean Sehan, which now belonged to her, to rapidly advance her abilities. It only took her two months to master the martial art. Even the way Eden treated her changed after that. But it was as if Eden had become addicted to the taste of sweet exposure that the hero Jean Sehan brought. They requested E. Eugene to become his clone and appear in front of the cameras for publicity stunts. Disillusioned by this development, she quit Eden and all by herself, opened the Jean Mudo Dojo. There were already several classes taking place in other night academies across the country, but since this was the only dojo that truly inherited his legacy, her school ended up causing quite a bit of stir. E. Eugene's reputation as one of Eden's knights also greatly helped, to the moment the dojo opened its doors, over 200 hopeful students rushed in to apply. But that was it. The fee for lessons was unbelievably low. And the monthly wages for the instructors were unbelievably high. Within three months of opening, all the funds she had accumulated, as well as every dime she had borrowed, ran out. But she endured every single day, hoping for donations or sponsors to come through. Jean Sehan's name was associated with this dojo, after all. Unfortunately, both the big businesses and Knight's orders were cold-hearted. They didn't want to sponsor this place. No, they instead blocked other avenues for sponsorships. And then, they politely suggested her to sell the rights to all of Jean Sehan's footages. If she sold the rights, then the Lucky Knight's order or the big business would monopolize the legacy for big profit, and all the related backlash would fall squarely on E. Eugene's laps. This was the so-called no-risk, high-return, every merchant's wet dream come true this point alone made corporations Knight's orders to become uncaring trash in a heartbeat. Hey, Eugene. You feeling okay? Go Yunjong. It was then, Teacher CM employee Go Yunjong asked her out of worry from her side. E. Eugene formed a fake smile and nodded her head. Of course. Have you ever seen me lower my head to stinking bastards like these a-holes before? E. Eugene. We've had an influx of private donations after you uploaded that video. Let's endure it for a little bit longer, okay? Go Yunjong. Right. We must endure. E. Eugene. SFX for a weird and repeated ringing of a phone. Suddenly, the phone began crying out a bizarre ringtone. Oi, Go Yunjong. Didn't I tell you to change that stupid ringtone many times already? Are you treating the order of the dojo master like it's empty air or something? E. Eugene. Sorry. To know how to do it. Go Yunjong. Go Yunjong smiled and picked the receiver up. Hello, 
This is the central dojo of the Jin Mudo Martial Arts School, and this is the vice director Go Yunjong speaking. Leaving Go Yunjong to take care of the phone, Yi Yujin shifted her gaze back to the pages of the ledger. Excuse me. Ah eh. Ah eh. No, hang on eh. Oh, so that is Yi eh. However, Go Yunjong was getting on her nerves. He sounded like he was ordering a bloody takeaway or something with all those s. What the hell are you doing? E. Eugene. No hold on for a moment, please. After lowering the receiver, Go Yunjang stared at E. Eugene with a dumbfounded face. He wants to become a sponsor. Go Yunjang. Oh, really? That's a good news. I should jot it down on the ledger. How much is it? E. Eugene. E. Eugene asked without thinking too much about it. Unfortunately Go Yunjong's reply was slightly beyond her expectations. 10 million. Go Yunjong. Confused by what she just heard, she tilted her head a bit, before her face crumpled in irritation. This sounded like yet another DN prank call. Who the hell is on the line? E. Eugene. Hold on. Go Yunjong picked the receiver up again. Excuse me may I ask where you are calling from? The name of the corporation is Ah Y, Yi, yes. R, really? Ah, uh, please, wait for one more moment. Go Yunjong. Lowering the receiver, Go Yunjong stared at Yi Yujin with a shocked face. He says he's Kim Sae Jin, the guild master of the monster. Go Yunjong. Ha. Hey, Yunjong. How many phone calls from Mr. Kim Sae did we get in the last couple of months? E. Eugene. Ah well, probably around 20 times. Exactly. Just talk to the guy nicely and hang up the phone already. E. Eugene. R. Right ah, uh, excuse me. My apologies, but I understand your intentions we don't have any room at the moment to entertain pranks. Seeing Go Yunjong literally talk nicely on the phone, E. Eugene became frustrated and so, she snatched the phone away. Hello. I don't know who you are, but stop calling us with these stupid prank calls. If you have time to waste like this, then why don't you go to a school and study something? Seriously, with the world becoming so chaotic lately, must you do something so childish like this? I really don't want to say something like this over the phone, but man, you're pathetic. Pathetic, I tell ya. E. Eugene. Ha 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 ha. E. Eugene ended up rapidly firing some harsh words due to her frayed nerves, but she could only hear a leisurely laughter coming out from the phone speaker instead. My apologies for being pathetic, miss. By the way, even if you don't want, please take the money anyways. It's just 10 million. Although I'd like to help you out more, that's all the readily available liquid cash I have on me at the moment. So, tell me your bank account number. Ha! You can find the account number at the website. If you want to pull a prank, then at least do some research beforehand, eh? Whatever you set out to do, you should try to do your best. Do you even get what I'm saying over here? E. Eugene. Oh is that so? Please wait for a sec. E. Eugene shook her head and was about to hang up the phone. Tiring. It was then, a short alarm rang from her mobile phone and its screen lit up suddenly. She took a look at the screen out of habit, and then froze up on the spot like a statue. The content of the words on the screen was way too shocking to be believed. Ten million has been deposited to Miss E. Eugene's account. 260,483 to 38. Ah. Uh. Veruang. At the same time, exhaust notes of several cars could be heard from outside the office window. Employees of the monster should be arriving there shortly. Please, have a chat with them about signing a more permanent sponsorship or a partnership deal. As soon as those words ended, E. Eugene hurriedly ran towards the window to take a look outside. There were four or five ultra-luxurious saloon cars parked on the street, and when their doors opened simultaneously, men in black suits carrying briefcases exited and began walking towards the dojo. E. Eugene lost all capacity to speak in that moment. Well, there was the logo of T.M. Boso clearly etched on their briefcases the logo of the monster. She then recalled the things she uttered out to that man over the phone. 
If that guy was indeed Kim Sae Jin, then. Her heart began palpitating madly as if it wanted to blow up, and her consciousness suddenly became very dim. Knock, knock. Soon enough, the sounds of people knocking on the doors of the dojo came to her, and. Plop. E. Eugene collapsed on the floor while showing the whites of her eyes. We are on our way to a hospital. A hospital? But why? S.A.E. Jean. The director of the dojo collapsed seemingly due to some kind of shock, so it must have been psychological, as even taking a recovery potion didn't help her. Fut. Kim S.A.E. Jean chuckled. She was unexpectedly weak-minded, it seemed. Okay. For now, delay the meeting until tomorrow. Since she's sturdier than she looks, she should be fine by then. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, sir. I understand. S.A.E. Jean ended the call. He then pulled out a brand new sheet to cover the sleeping U.S.A.E. Young's naked body, lying over the torn and messed up bed spreads before heading downstairs to the underground basement. The unexpected accident caused some delays to his plans, but before the situation could get worse, it was now the time to start the hunt, properly. There was no more time to waste. First, I should make an armor for the leviathan form. He produced two ingots of the greatest metal known to men, Mithril. Summoned into the open before anyone had noticed it, Kornlak panted as it approached him. I'll make an armor for you to wear as well. Wait for it. Soon, he'd be on his way to catch the Bathory. Chapter 132. Shall I get started? S.A.E. Jean pulled out and drank a potion he made that was designed to boost a person's mental concentration, sensitivity towards mana, the magic strength stat, as well as various other mana-related stats for a short period of time. He then changed into the orc form and activated the smithing technique on the mithril ingots. With a gentle wong, mithril ingots melted into thick liquid form. Next, he changed into the goblin form and began the painstaking process of crafting this composite material made out of mithril and mana into something else. He added various attributes suitable for an armor, and since the body of his leviathan form was getting larger every day, he also didn't forget to add one more attribute, that of elasticity, as well. Even if the work seemed simple from a casual glance, every master craftsman carried the mindset of going all out to achieve the best result they could. Kim Sae Jean too, gave the process all his being and focused 100% on it. Tuck. Two hours later. As the sweat pooling on the end of his chin fell, the crafting finally came to an end. A perfect defensive gear set has been created. Damage Reduction, Level, A. The damage incurred by all forms of physical attacks will be reduced by 50%. Elasticity, Level, S. The material will not tear no matter how big the host grows. Makes the material almost the same as the host's own skin. External mana storage, level, B. 3000 units of mana can be stored within the gear. Units are based on the average amount of mana found in a human adult. An average adult human possesses 10 units of mana. Space distortion, level, C. By consuming mana, space can be manipulated. The maximum distance applicable, 1 km. Time distortion, level, F. By consuming a large amount of mana, the flow of time can be manipulated. The maximum limit for manipulation, 1 second. The armor with many special attributes imbued with, specifically designed for the Leviathan's use although it looked more like a piece of cloth rather than a real metallic armor. It was still an incredible thing nonetheless, as several of its features could be easily referred to as minor miracles all by themselves. Wow, finally, the time manipulation you are oh man, feel like I'm dying from this dizziness. While feeling very much satisfied by the end product, S.A.E. Jean plopped down on the cold, hard floor. The effects of the potion had run out, and he was feeling really dizzy thanks to the backlash from the forcefully increased concentration levels. After wasting another ten minutes doing nothing but recuperating, S.A.E. Jean changed into the Leviathan form in order to put on the new battle gear. Around the two. Five meter body, he draped the bath towel-like silvery defensive gear. As soon as this towel came in contact with his scales, it clung tightly to him like another layer of skin and completely covered his body. 
That caused his original pure blue color to change into the brilliant silver sheen. He felt there was a different type of coolness coming off of him when compared to his original appearance, but he nevertheless also sensed that he had gotten stronger than before. Would there be yet another noisy fuss raised, when the world finds him like this, saying that the Azure Dragon had evolved once more? Hmm, should I add, uh, a cape too? He decided not to, since, at this rate he might truly morph into an action figure for children. He did hear that dolls of the Azure Dragon were flooding the markets of late, after all. Kung Kung Krong. Kyung Tl, what the? While staring at the mirror, Sae Jean the Leviathan began taking various poses looking dignified and serious, then sulky and pouting, and even, a cute face. In the middle of this, he suddenly recalled an order he gave to Joe Hansung about a month ago, so he changed back to human, picked up the phone and called the guy. Turu. Joe Hansung picked the phone up even before the first ring tone could end. Hello, Guild Master. Hello, Mr. Hansung. Do you remember the thing I asked you to do the last time? Ah, uh, aha. You mean that one? Yes sir, I do remember. I did not forget it. Not at all, sir. He did sound like he had completely forgotten about it before Sae Jean made the call, though Sae Jean smirked slightly and continued. Well, then. I called you to find out about the progress on the matter. Ah, uh, the thing is the mana stones of sea monsters are very rare and are also quite expensive. Mana stones of seafaring monsters meaning, Sae Jean wanted an underling for his leviathan form, so he ordered Joe Hansung to locate one. You haven't found one yet? No, sir, actually there is one that hadn't been sold because of its exorbitant asking price, sir. It's been priced way too much compared to what it can be used for, so not even those mad collector types have stepped up to buy it at the moment. Right away, Sae Jean stood right up from the chair. To think, a mana stone belonging to a monster that was so expensive, no one was willing to buy it. His body began to ache from the excitement. W, what is it? The name of this monster. That is. Joe Hansung hesitated slightly. As the CEO of TM, he was burdened with the responsibility of safely handling the financial balance of the company as a whole. However, this mana stone. Please hurry up. Ah, well, it is a kraken, sir. The kraken. One could humorously call it a giant squid, but the truth was, it was an incredible creature that could easily occupy a starring role in many legendary tales of yore. A.K. Kraken, you say? Hearing those brightly glittering name, Sae Jean's heart skipped a beat altogether. At the same time, Joe Hansung's heart also missed a beat as well what if Sae Jean asked him to buy it? B, B, but. The estimated price alone is around 65 million. On top of this, the knight's order is asking for the amount that is nearly 10 million more than that, sir. It's just nonsensically, ridiculously expensive amount. Wow, as you say, that's some price tag, all right. But how did they catch a kraken? Who caught it? This kraken used to be nicknamed Amari, previously found in the Mediterranean Sea, Master. A Rome-based knight's order killed it while losing three of its own knights, so it's more than likely they will not negotiate any terms whatsoever. Zhou Hansung swallowed nervously. No matter how densely packed the mana stone was with the kraken's unique and special mana, it was worth no more than 40 million, when considering the potential financial applications for it. So, 75 million plus was simply too much. Buy it. Sae Jean. SFX for a building collapsing. The heart of Joe Hansung the CEO collapsed into a helpless heap. $75 million would be the equivalent of one full year of combined wages for the employees. However, since we're dealing with a knight's order here, we can probably exchange items with them, am I right? Tell them I will ready up to four armaments and artifacts with attributes they want. Oh, set some limit as well, don't allow them to ask for anything willy-nilly. Ah. Fortunately, Joe Hansung had forgotten about something important. It was the fact that Kim Sae Jean was the proverbial goose laying golden eggs no, rather, he was the Korean silky fowl that laid mithril eggs. At least, there was no way the negotiation with any knight's orders, or even wizard towers, would fail. 
Yes, sir. I understand. I shall send the official request right away. Please. I need it quickly, so give it your all. After ending the call, SAE Jean began whistling out loudly. He thought getting a monster like a Ness at the end of the day would be perfectly fine enough, but then, even bigger fish had entered the net, instead. When he add the Kraken to the list of monsters he could summon, then there would be only one slot left in his heart. But he was planning to leave that one alone for now well, it was currently reserved for that white bird that could spew out breath attacks. Around the same time when Kim Sae Jin was feeling rather chuffed with himself. Kim Yu Rin was staying awake throughout the night in a bout of depression. The night was only growing taller, yet sleep didn't want to visit her. Originally, nights didn't need a whole lot of sleep in the first place, but since she couldn't catch a wink in the last two days, the situation seemed serious this time. She felt so lethargic all the time, and didn't feel like being alone anymore as well. However, although she did feel this way, she also didn't want to leave her house, either. Plainly speaking, she only wanted to be with one specific person. She couldn't understand why depression would attack her like this no, honestly speaking, she knew. She understood the reason plenty well enough. Her colleague said something or rather about her mood being a post-operation trauma experienced after surgically removing the parasitic mana, but. She wanted to see him. The scent that wasn't present in her home, it still lingered within her memories and stung the inside of her nose. She wondered what would the orc be doing right now. She already knew that he probably wasn't thinking about her. He was most likely fighting tooth and nail, or maybe, maintaining his mace or the armor in contemplative silence. She then suddenly thought of Kim Sae Jin. What was his relationship with the orc? Just what did he do that made the orc call him as the most important person? She was curious. Envious. Jealous, even. SFX for a mobile phone ringing. Her phone rang. But since she couldn't be bothered about anything, she just let the phone be. For the first time in a long, long while no, for the first time in thirteen years since she entered the Knight's Order, she thought that she could seriously do with a vacation, right about now. Morning of the following day. The monster officially announced the partnership deal with the Jean Mudo School led by Director E. Eugene. The contents of the announcement were simple enough. The monster honestly admired and believed in E. Eugene who had inherited the true legacy of the hero Jean Sehan. So, not ending at just a simple sponsorship, TM would continuously invest into its future as well, going as far as to purchase the surrounding land near the dojo and expand the size of the association and the school itself. That short but no-nonsense announcement began giving birth to brand new rumors, when combined along with another announcement made by TM exactly three months ago regarding the new guild member selection. The chairperson of the Jean Mudo School of Martial Arts E. Eugene, entering the Monster Guild. Rumors related to the Monster Guild member selection, and candidates receiving attention of the public. The mass media folks were already naming the potential candidates and were in the middle of raising a huge fuss. The funny thing was, the guy supposedly handing out the dough, didn't even know this was happening at the moment. Meanwhile, names of the knights he hadn't even considered before were being placed on the list of potential candidates. Hell, some media companies even interviewed several knights appearing on that dubious list. A potential candidate, high-tier knight Kim Won-jong interviewed. Right now, although we're not supposed to say this, you're acknowledged as one of the most likely candidates. So, various betting houses around the world have placed very low odds behind your name however, what are your thoughts regarding this matter? Haha <laughs> no, it's not like that. I certainly haven't heard of anything from them. And I also happen to believe that I still lack the ability and temperament right now to become a member of the Monster Guild. In that case, even if you're asked to join, you will refuse the invitation. Ahaha. <laughs> of course not. How can I do something like that? If I indeed do receive an invitation, that means the Monster Guild has evaluated me highly. Thus, I must put in more effort to meet their expectations of me. This was an excerpt from the interview done with Kim Won-jong, a high-tier knight from the Daybeak Knights Order. Unfortunately, this man who gave such a cool and humble interview, got busted trying to bribe one of the monster's employees. While both within the borders of Korea and outside of it were getting oh so noisy over the news related to the monster. 
Inside the office of the Vice President of Great Wisdom Corporation, inexplicable roars of anger and a bunch of expletives could be heard. God dn it. Hey, you fking son of a bitch, what nonsense is this sht? After receiving the news much later than everyone else due to spending the day in a drunken orgy, the enraged Kim Jong-hyuk cursed out in anger and tried to destroy his own desk. TL, to all the readers who forgot about this minor character, he first made his appearance in the chapter 73. My sincerest apologies, sir. This event unfolded so suddenly, we couldn't. No, no, but why? Why the FCK did those bitches suddenly do this? The thing is, there is a story that Kim Sae Jin actually called the dojo and just handed over ten million dollars, just like that. What? That no good son of a bitch is doing whatever the hell he likes now, huh? Who the hell does he think he is, a GNNPO? A fking commoner, who just lucked into a SHTTY trait thinks his bloodline has suddenly become a nobility or something? Arg. Kim Jong-hyuk was actually the ringleader who rallied other big businesses and knights orders to pressure E. Eugene. And since those businesses and even the government tacitly agreed with his idea, this matter was something that would have been resolved, very soon. After all, when viewed from the government's perspective, to see the unique martial arts created solely by the born in Korea. Raised in Korea hero Jean Sehan spread around the world without a proper compensation was not something to be too happy about. W. What should we do now, sir? What the, you ditched? What the FCK can we do now when things have become like this? Ah. Uh. Wait, didn't this SHT become such a GN mess, because of your lack of King Daisical fooling around, saying it's all going to happen soon? Kim Jong-hyuk picked up an ashtray off the desk and threw it on the floor. The more violent he got, his coagulating rage only burned hotter and hotter. That, that fking son of a bitch, I want to kill him myself, but I can't arg, fck this all to hell. Kim Sae Jin because of that BD, Kim Jong Hyuk even suffered the indignity of being sent to prison. Even then, Jong Hyuk had to cool his rage and let it go after listening to his father's advice. What choice did he have? That BD had grown too influential to cut off his head now. Get the FCK out. Get out. You fking useless ashole. Get the FCK out of my sight. M, my apologies, sir. Kim Jong-hyuk kicked his personal assistant out of his office. Even this wasn't enough to appease his boiling anger so, he began destroying his office, instead. Only after turning his once dignified office of a vice president into an unrecognizable junkyard, he regained some of his cool and sat down on one of the surviving chairs. Ah. However, he suddenly remembered something. That suspicious-looking wizard, who asked him if he was interested in working together, dot. Kim Jong-hyuk did chase the guy away since he let off that unpleasant aura unique to vampires back then, but now. He opened the locked drawer, and then tapped on the blood color crystal hidden within. During the afternoon of freedom, after USAE Young went off to work. Jo Hansung came to visit Kim Sae Jin while carrying a certain mana stone. Here it is. How did this arrive after only one day? Sae Jin. Sae Jin received the small treasure box that obviously held the mana stone inside and tilted his head in confusion. He remembered giving his order only yesterday no, just over twelve hours ago. Ah, uh, the thing is, when you called me yesterday, it was also morning in Rome, so the knight's order's higher-ups had arrived for work by then, master. That's why I could conclude the talks quickly. When I mentioned the exchange conditions, they just sent the stone over without asking for anything, and then, they called me up afterwards. They said, since the package has been sent, you can't renege on the deal or something similar to that effect, sir. Joe Hansung. Huh, that's a relief. Sae Jean. When Sae Jean cracked open the lid of the box a little, a jet black beam of light exploded out from the small opening. Oh, oh, wow. Sae Jean. He got deeply impressed by the display of the powerful aura, and hurriedly closed the lid. As expected, inside the chest was. There was a huge mana stone fitting for a kraken inside, all wrapped in a dignified silk, while patiently waiting for its new owner, Kim Sae Jean. Chapter, 133 
Kim Sae Jin hurriedly climbed aboard his car so that he could get to a coastline and summon his new pet, the Kraken. Since the East Sea would be too full with tourists and vacationers, his new destination was going to be the South Coast. Vroom! The top end sports car roared out a throaty exhaust note as it scythed past Yozi and Dong. He spotted many robe wearing alchemists on every corner of the streets, making him feel the sort of renaissance Yozi and Dong was going through on his skin, now that this area was being commonly referred to as the mecca of all things alchemy. However, when he thought about the fact that this change was only possible due to the goblin alchemist's actions, he couldn't help but feel excessively proud of himself. Sae Jin's shoulders danced up and down slightly as he gripped the steering wheel tighter. He drove past Yozian Dong slowly while sightseeing. Then, he happened to spot a very familiar back of a certain elf wizard alchemist. She was wearing that snow white robe Sae Jin had made personally, so he could spot her way too easily. But the way she walked seemed a bit strange. She stumbled and faltered about as if she was drunk, and there was a distinct lack of energy to her steps. Sae Jean tilted his head in confusion. From his memory, her strides were the very definition of a queen bee strutting around in pure haughtiness, so. Sae Jean lowered the speed of the car and sidled up next to the person he thought was Hazeline. He could spot the lower half of the face below the hood. The pair of lips were unusually dried up and cracked, but they definitely belonged to Hazeline. A smile bloomed on Sae Jean's lips and he winded the window all the way down. Miss Hazeline. Holy percent. M, mommy. Kayak. His call was way too sudden. Hazeline screamed in panic and fell on the ground face first. Quang. She squarely face planted into a manhole cover on the ground. Shocked, Sae Jean quickly jumped out of the car and rushed to her side. Ha. Huh. Are you alright? Sae Jean. When Sae Jean held her shoulders and helped her to stand, he got glared at by a pair of gloomy eyes peeking out from beneath the hood. And just below them, a reddish, swollen nose with two slender streams of blood drizzling down. Ouch. That looks like it might hurt. Sae Jean. He quickly pulled out a handkerchief and wiped the blood away. She remained still, choosing to feel his hands touching her face this way and that, before mumbling out in a numbed out voice. Arg, seriously. You really surprised me. Why are you screaming out the name of a person so suddenly like that? Hazeline. Oh, my bad. Really, I didn't know you might fall down like this. Sae Jean. Huyup. Come on now, this is just too much Hazeline. Suddenly, tears seemed to well on the corners of her eyes. Even the sobbing whimpers leaked out every now and then, so Sae Jean could feel the chilly stares of the passers-by stabbing him in the back. Ah, uh, wait. F, for now, please get in the car. There are too many people out here who can recognize me. Sae Jean. No thanks. I'm going home. So, let me go Hazeline. In that case, let me take you home. Sae Jean. Sae Jean shoved Hazeline into the passenger seat, then rapidly slid into the drivers. Fortunately enough, most of the passers-by were alchemists, and they seemed to lose their interest quickly, flowing past the duo in the car like a river's water. For by the way, where was your house again? Sae Jean. Hazeline didn't say a word, instead simply sat there with a sullen expression, swallowing the blood from her nose. Would you like some tissue? Sae Jean. I'll use magic so no need. Hazeline. Ah sure. Sae Jean. Sae Jean wanted to ask why she was still swallowing the blood, if that was the case but the current mood didn't allow him to utter this bit out. Um then, should we head off towards the alchemy house, instead? Sae Jean. As a reply to Sae Jean's inquiry, Hazeline turned the topic around to a completely unrelated matter. Why haven't you answered me back? Hazeline. Excuse me. Sae Jean. You didn't even pick up the phone. For the whole month. Hazeline. Ah. His face turned deeply troubled in less than one second. He had no access to his phone during his imprisonment underground, 
and when he was rescued, there were over 2,000 text messages from the employees regarding the administrative matters of TM, so he couldn't even begin to check who sent what. I had this thing going on at the time really swarmed with work, I was. W, well, when you return home, please resend the message to me. I'll make sure to reply back to you in less than five minutes, tops. SAE Jean. Hazeline glared at him dumbfoundedly. Seriously, this terrible guy is. Would this terrible guy even realize that she couldn't get a proper night's sleep for the past month or so because of worry and anxiety? She was in despair during that time, wondering if he had finally figured out her true feelings and decided to stay away, or maybe, even had gotten sick and tired of her. Didn't S.A.E. Young tell you about how busy I was? S.A.E. Jean. And why would she tell me such things? Has a line. Her voice was quite sharp. K. Kiem. Where should we go now? S.A.E. Jean. Where were you off to just now? Has a line. Pardon. Your destination. I mean, S.A. Young must be at work now, and it looks like you were going somewhere alone. I will become your traveling companion. Has a line. S.A.E. Jean and his traveling companion arrived at a location in the south coast where civilians were strictly prohibited from entering. SFX for waves crashing on the rocks. The south coast, with her majestic rolling waves, did indeed feature a different type of charm to her when compared to the East Sea. What is this feeling? S.A.E. Jean. However, this whole place felt weirdly familiar. Was this a case of deja vu? It wasn't that he felt the sense of familiarity with the sea itself but, a certain aura, swimming along with the currents of the ocean was the cause. Hello. Excuse me. Has a line. As S.A.E. Jean stood there utterly mesmerized, staring at the distant horizon of the south coast, a certain person standing next to him tapped on his arms. Of course, it was Hazeline. What are you doing? Hazeline. Oh. Ah well, something feels weirdly familiar to me here. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean finally regained his senses, and then, pulled out the huge mana stone. Have you come to the south coast before? Hazeline. Hazeline asked while taking a casual glance at the mana stone, before shifting her gaze back to S.A.E. Jean's face. No, I have never come here before but, from a far away, somewhere really deep underwater I can feel a sense of belonging. S.A.E. Jean. Hidden within the salty aroma of the ocean, there was a faint but persistent aura. He couldn't tell what it was it felt familiar, comfortable, yet also somewhat discomforting and imparted a sense of uneasiness as well. It may sounded like a contradictory description, but it was the only one he could come up with. Perhaps it could very well be the side effects you mentioned before, your ego assimilating with that of the monsters. That sense of belonging, could it be because of the sea monster? Hazeline. Eh. Hazeline asked him with a worried face. What he was sensing right now, at least to him, did not feel like that, but since there was no other plausible explanation available right now, S.A.E. Jean nodded his head in a somewhat careless manner. Well, it could be that. S.A.E. Jean. Please, be careful. Suddenly, worried Hazeline reached out and hugged his arm tightly. The wonderful and otherworldly pair of volumes previously hidden by the thick robe, transmitted their softness to his arm. Oh, uh, I'll be fine. For now let me show you what I was talking about in the car. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean quickly assumed a smile and extricated his arm. Here we go. S.A.E. Jean. He poured in his mana into the half a football size mana stone. Then, the Kraken stone changed into black gas and rose up like a dark dusty cloud. And with a single breath from him, the fog-like black energy flowed into his heart. The host has absorbed the Kraken, the titanic beast of the legendary tales. The Kraken has been absorbed into the heart of the warrior. The Kraken has been added to the list of monsters that can be summoned. To match the host's current stats, the Kraken's stats will also be increased accordingly. The current combat level of the Kraken is, highest, impossible to measure grade. However, as the host is currently in the human form, the combat level has been lowered to high grade. While the alert windows filled up his view, he released the Kraken into the sea. SFX for sea water exploding. 
As the water parted violently, a massive squid began rising out from beneath the surface. The height that easily blocked out the sun ate legs that were sleek, smooth and fashionably sexy in a pair of rather languid eyes. T.L., seriously, Mr. Author. Sexy squid legs. Give me a break. Truly befitting the title of the worst nightmare of every seafarer out there, this was indeed the frightening kraken. Holy cow what, what the heck is this? Has a line. Two people dazedly stared at the mountain-like creature, while hidden under the immense shade its body had cast. Hazeline was in the midst of swimming within the sea of shock, while S.A.E. Jean was swimming in the sea of satisfaction after realizing that his new ally's combat strength was immeasurable. Dot. Splash! The kraken suddenly slapped the surface of the sea and caused a huge fountain of water spray. E.U. Uh. Hey, stop that! S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean shouted out, but the kraken didn't stop. As a matter of fact, it rebelled even more fiercely than before. Splash! 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 H, hey! I told you to stop! A few! Few! Cough! S.A.E. Jean! Fu, Ms. Tur, S.A.E. Jean! Fu, Wu, Fu, Wu! Arg, I can't breathe! Has a line! It was as if the creature was deliberately targeting Hazeline she was completely soaked from head to toe, and couldn't even keep her eyes open. Hey, you son of a fuhep! S.A.E. Jean. Arg. Hey, just where are you shooting me with W.A.T.E. fuhep? I told you to stop. Hazeline. When a stream of water hit Hazeline's private area, the kraken's eyes began arching in a crescent shape. It was one of those smiles that made others wanted to punch the darn thing in the face. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. This, this mother fucking squid. You. Has a line. Her anguished cries resounded like a lioness's roar. Almost at the same time, the sea water containing the squid suddenly froze up in an instant. The kraken panicked and tried to move its body, but seeing that the entire surface of the ocean had frozen stiff, there was no way it would be able to escape from her wrath. I'm going to educate you properly now. Excuse me, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Has a line. She glared into the kraken's pair of frightened eyes and murmured in a cold, cruel voice. I wonder, do you like cooked squid legs? A short but scary physical punishment later. How about giving it a name? Has a line. A name, you say? S.A.E. Jean. Two people were conversing in front of a squid that was obediently lowering its head. I mean, it's not much different from a pet, so how about sarang? T.L., sarang, means love, in Korean. Not sure what the author is trying to say here nope, no clue whatsoever. You wanna call that big thing sarang? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Yours and my sarang. T.L., oh, so that's why. Pardon. S.A.E. Jean. At her sudden, confession-like declaration, S.A.E. Jean imperceptibly took a step back. Foot. You don't have to be that sensitive, you know. Just call it sarong. Even storms are named like this, you see. The stronger a storm is, the softer its name is, as if asking it to become gentler. Has a line. Ah. Hmm. S.A.E. Jean deliberated for a second or two, before nodding his head in agreement. Well, sure. Let's go with that. S.A.E. Jean. So, we're sticking with Sarang. Great. Hey, sarang -a. Come over here. Why were you so naughty just now? Hazeline. Hazeline smiled as she approached the giant squid. Unfortunately, from the point of this squid's view, it was like seeing the advent of an evil monster Sarang began trembling in despair. Europe. A powerful giant demon called Asmodeus appeared in Italy. Looking as if it walked straight out of the deepest regions of hell, the demon ceaselessly marched on while burning countless people to death and set a flame to the land around it. On the places it swept past, only the traces of destructive hell fire remained. Even the skies were blotted out, and the sun was unable to penetrate the darkness. Okay, fine, but why am I being asked to do something about that thing? S.A.E. Jean. 
Because of this urgent incident, Yu Bexong had requested for a meeting with SAE Jin in quite a bit of hurry. They are asking you to, well, convince the Azure Dragon to act on their behalf. Since the Azure Dragon is rated higher in the pecking order, it should be able to subdue the demon pretty easily. Yu Bexong. Meow. A black cat held in her arms, or some might say imprisoned, through a tantrum. Yu Bexong tried to appease it by clicking her tongues cutely. Quietly studying this scene, Sae Jin momentarily imagined Yu Bexong lying on his lap like a genuine cat. It was terrifyingly cute. Cough, cough. But, why me convincing the Azure Dragon? Sae Jin. Please, stop pretending already. Most people who should know, already know. That Azure Dragon website, we know you're the one operating it. Yu Bexong. Ah. Busted. Obviously. That is why the president has asked me, while saying that I'm the only person who can talk you into it. Yu Bexong. Yu Bexong's shoulders swaggered in delight. What if I refuse? Uh. Um oh, Italy said they will give you the japtum from the Asmodeus raid as well as 100 million euros, though. TL, the author originally wrote Germany here. Changed back to Italy under the advice of my editor. Hmm. Sae Jean thought about this. Although the loot from the Asmodeus raid tempted him somewhat, now that he was only mere days away from fighting that Bathory woman, he didn't want to leave the country if he could help it. However, now, he had in possession someone else he could send in his stead. The Kraken. Meow. It was then the black cat struggling in her arms bit Yu Bexong's finger and broke free, immediately jumping towards Sae Jean's direction. A do you like me more than your owner? S.A.E. Jean. Naya. The cat rubbed its body against S.A.E. Jean, displaying a vastly higher EGO compared to before. What the, seriously now? Yu Song. What's its name? S.A.E. Jean. King of Siberia, Savage Black Leopold Tiger Kaiser II. S.A.E. Jean wordlessly stroked the cat. And it repaid his attention by licking his hand. There, there, Blackie. I'm here. Sae Jean. Call it by its proper name. Yu Song. Kaiser II. Full name should be much better. Yu Song. Yu Song stealthily approached his side. But still, I've never seen it show so much Egeo before like this. Definitely, it's that scent of yours, Yu Song. To Yu Song, it was her first time seeing her King of Siberia, Savage Black Leopold Tiger Kaiser the second foot display this much Egeo, and so. She stared at the cat busy rubbing its face against Sae Jean's belly with a pair of dangerously shining eyes, as if she had found the most adorable thing in the whole world. In the meantime, Sae Jean carefully reached out and then, began patting Yubexong's stiff ears and her hair, as her attention was completely stolen by the cat. There, there. Here, Cutie, cutie Sae Jean. The more he patted, the more actively responded her ears and her tail to his touches. Want to climb on top of my lap? Sae Jean TL, oh, dangerous. Ing. Did you say something? Cough. No, uh, I, Adu Italy, sending Azure Dragon instead of the Kraken no, wait, I mean, ask them if it's alright for me to send a Kraken instead of the Azure Dragon. Yu Bexong grasped the scruff of Kaiser, which clearly didn't want to leave Sae Jean's lap, and sat back down on her seat. A Kraken? You can even control something like that? Yu Bexong. Ah, well, technically, it's not controlling no, you could say that. It's my servant. Chapter, 134 On the front lines near the west of Italy where a fierce battle against the demon, Asmodeus, raged on. Knight's orders worked together with the regular army personnel and succeeded in drawing the giant demon towards the coast of the famed Mediterranean Sea. Has the reinforcement arrived yet? Asmodeus was as tall as the leaning tower of Pisa, and the muscles on its body easily trumped that of an ogre. However, the nimbleness of this creature belied its humongous physical girth and it could escape and scathe most of the joint attacks performed by countless knights. Wait for a little bit longer. The Rome Knight's orders master, Brifone shouted out desperately. 
The deal with Kim Sae Jin stated that, he would dispatch a kraken to the Mediterranean, so the knights should cooperate with the sea monster to kill Asmodeus. Since it was a kraken and not an azure dragon, the fee they had to pony up wasn't as much, but. Just when is that DN thing arriving here? Just as the Rome Knights Order's master was about to form a big grudge in his heart against Kim Sae Jin. The waters of the Mediterranean Sea rippled violently. Kugu. Thick white foams bubbled up on the ocean's surface, and the kraken finally rose up high from the depth, blocking out the harsh glare of the Mediterranean sun. The entrance of the kraken was as noisy and awesome as if a part of the ocean floor was lifting up to the surface. And sure enough, the incredible size of the kraken easily overwhelmed the demon, Asmodeus. SFX for a low-pitched growl. The kraken glared at Asmodeus for a bit, before wrapping up the fiery demon with its long tentacles. Of course, the demon resisted and spat out hellfire all around it in an instant. Asmodeus's hellish flames could not be weakened. Still, heat could be stolen away. From the suction pads of the kraken's tentacles, bitterly cold energy rushed out, and these cold winds quickly dissipated the high temperature of the demon's hellfire. Only then did the demon fall into a state of panic, and began retreating hastily. D. Do not miss this opening. Attack. Attack. With this call, knights, who had been pushed back time and time again throughout the encounter, rushed in towards Asmodeus. That kraken is our reinforcement. Attack the demon. These are the payments we received from Italy, the horns of the demon Asmodeus and its mana stone. Kim Sunho. Kim Sunho handed over the loot from the boss raid. Sae Jin checked them out while he carefully probed Sunho with a question. So, how useful was Sarong out there? Sae Jin. During the battle, Sae Jin was in the Leviathan form in order to boost Sarong's the Kraken stats as for the amount of exposure gained through the Asmodeus raid. That was still unknown as Italy was still going through the post-battle recovery phase. According to the Rome Knights order it was utter domination. They can't stop praising the Kraken's ability to freeze the demon's fire with its ejected ink, boss. Kim Sunho. That's a relief. Sae Jin. Sae Jin nodded his head in satisfaction. There was indeed a merit to giving the Kraken a mana tattoo that strengthened its innate water-based abilities. As well as attaching a specially crafted weapon of sorts that could freeze anything at a lightning quick speed to its suction pads. So, that is why, it may be not a bad thing to continue utilizing the Kraken like this, Director Kim Yusone said no, my father said as much, Guild Master. Kim Sun Ho. He did. Hearing Kim Yusone's name out of the blue, Sae Jin couldn't help but nod his head in a bitter, downbeat mood. How is he doing nowadays? Sae Jin. Currently confined to a hospital bed, the time Kim Yusone stayed unconscious was getting increasingly longer than compared to when he was awake. Not too long ago, Sae Jin went to see the veteran mercenary, holding in one hand a potion he made with all his focus and effort, a medicine that had a near miraculous elixir like effect. However Kim Yusone didn't want to drink it. And Sae Jin couldn't force the older man to drink it either. With both his mind and body in steep decline, Kim Yusone said that his trait had stopped working now. Judging from the bright smile etched on his lips, Sae Jin thought that he looked happy with not one ounce of regret. His dreamscape was now freed from the torturous visions of the incoming future, and it seemed that he was finally given the chance to dive into the memories of his happier past. Doctor said dad has around three months left. Kim Sunho. Kim Sunho clenched his fist tightly as he spoke. His voice was trembling. Feeling the tip of his nose sting with sad emotions, Sae Jin let off a fake cough and tried to change the subject. Kyum. I understand. Oh, by the way what's happening with the Wizard of Bangbei Dong currently? Sae Jin. The overwhelming, unparalleled genius who had corrected 23 grimoires in less than a year the wizard of Bangbaidong fell like a meteor into the stale world of wizards and magic, becoming its hottest celebrity in no time. The funny thing was, grimoires fixed by the wizard of Bangbaidong was priced around 500k, which was considered really cheap but. The number of corrected grimoires published was quite low only 100 were printed and were sold, so when one grimoire did come out, 
books were sold out in the blink of an eye and led to chronic shortage of stocks. The impassioned requests from the Wizard Towers to reprint more stock went unheard and unanswered, and in the end, they had to bet their very livelihood on getting there first when a new grimoire was about to surface. It would have been better if these guys learned to share, but unfortunately, Wizard Towers, small-minded and closed off from the outside scrutiny, ruled by jealousy and pettiness, would never do something like that. And so, time had flowed steadily by and the number of corrected grimoires published by the Wizard of Bangbaidong now reached 23. Thanks to the peculiar arrangement described above, not one wizard tower around the world possessed every single edition of these valuable books in their collections. If they happened to have the first book from the series within their Wizard of Bangbaidong's grimoires collection, dot. Then they wouldn't have the second or the third book, and if they had the fourth, then they would be missing fifth and the sixth. It was like those annoying missing pieces of puzzle, really. Haha <laughs> thanks to him, the stock of our guild has increased by another notch, boss. They are saying, the Monster Guild's members only library has all the volumes of the Wizard of Bangbaidong's grimoires, something no other wizard tower has. Kim Sunho pulled his phone out and showed off the current situation to SAE Jean personally. Breaking news The Wizard of Bangbaidong's corrected grimoire number 24, scheduled to go on sale during sometime in August. Wizard Towers understood to be in a fierce competition already. Holy moly! How can anyone write a grimoire this quickly? He must be a real super genius. You will find more wizards in Bangbaidong thanks to the Wizard of Bangbaidong. My uncle in law who runs a pub there is loving it. He says they spend money like there's no tomorrow. By the way, because all the grimoires are written in Korean, wizards are tripping over each other to learn the language. The reason for all those language cram schools popping up in Bangbaidong is because of all the foreign wizards found there. One of my friends is an instructor. Says that the foreign wizards list reading the original versions in Korean as their reason for applying. SAE Jean chuckled as he read the comments, before handing the phone back. I guess it's par for the course, really. This wizard of Bangbaidong has done the same work other wizards might take 10 years to do in less than one. Kim Sunho. Haha <laughs> is that so? Oh, right. Mr. Sunho, there is this thing ah, uh, never mind, don't worry about it. Well, shall we end the meeting here? I should return to my other work right about now. SAE Jean. The plans to get rid of the Bathory woman was, for now, a secret even from Kim Sunho. Yes, boss. Understood. See you later. Kim Sunho didn't think about it too much and vacated his seat. As soon as he left, SAE Jean headed off towards the underground private training facility with the loot from the Asmodeus raid. After absorbing the Mana Stone of Asmodeus, SAE Jean was able to gain one more skill. Hellish Flames of Retribution. Skill Proficiency Level, D. Damage from fire-based attacks will be negated, and when performing attacks based on fire, Flames of Retribution will be added. These flames will not go out unless the caster wills it. TL, ha. Huh. Is this a version of Amaterasu, from the Sharingan? It sure was a wonderful skill, indeed since, he could now use flame-based breath attacks whether he was in the leviathan form or in the human's appearance. And not only that, his flames would be upgraded to flames of retribution, even. Hell, even the name breath, the flames of retribution sounded really, utterly domineering, didn't it? As for the demon's horns, SAE Jean grinded it down to make potions. This potion would enter not only the heart and the muscles, but even mana flowing in one's body and increase the overall power of its drinker by two times or more. With this much, SAE Jean felt this should be enough preparation for the upcoming hunt, so he pulled out the communication crystal connected directly to the Nisferatus. Can you hear me? There was a moment of static, before he could hear Lilia's voice coming from the crystal. Yes, I can hear you. I'm more or less done with my preparations. What about your side? There was a gap of silence. We are also ready, but I must express my concern in regards to the way this matter being rushed a great deal. I must reiterate that our target, the leader of the Bathory House, is not someone you can think lightly of. No, you could become one of her victims, instead. However, we do have the scale of an adult leviathan, don't we? The fully grown leviathan, 
the monster of the sea that could give a real dragon a run for its money. If S.A.E. Jean in his leviathan form could eat that scale, then he'd be able to understand mana and all its majestic glory contained within, and use that to evolve rapidly. Then, someone like that Bathory woman wouldn't even be a threat anymore. If this is your wish we understand. We will deploy our agents and try to lead our target towards the East Sea when there aren't that many people there during the December period. Isn't that too far away? Not at all. We need to set up an isolation barrier as well as other preparations there in the meantime. Hmm. Okay, then. Got it. As S.A.E. Jean was about to end the communication, he heard Lilia's voice continuing on from the crystal. Oh, before you go, is it possible to hire a wizard with excellent abilities as a backup? A wizard? Why? We will be needing a wizard that you can trust. S.A.E. Jean thought about this for a second, before recalling a certain woman that fitted the description a trustworthy and skilled wizard rather perfectly, and nodded his head. A week later, within the Monsters Guild HQ building. Inside the members-only library, Hazeline was busy poring through the pages of grimoires authored by the famed wizard of Bangbaidong. Oh. So, moving it over here makes it easier. Finally understanding why other wizards were singing Bangbaidong, Bangbaidong, all the time, Hazeline's lips formed a O shape, showing how impressed she was. And so, while completely oblivious to the fact of S.A.E. Jean being the wizard of Bangbaidong, Hazeline let out her exclamation of admiration at the grimoire's user-friendliness and improvements that could be felt almost immediately. But then. Uni. What are you doing here? Before she had the chance to react, U.S.A.E. Young approached her. U.S.A.E. Young took a glance at the front cover and her eyes went extra round. The Wizard of Bangbaidong is this the grimoire published by that famous wizard? U.S.A.E. Young. Ah. Uh. Oh. Ah uh, yes, it is. I already know all these spells, but since I heard that they were corrected for better efficiency, so Hazeline. Hazeline stealthily closed the grimoire. She felt oddly embarrassed all of a sudden well, she was someone who had left the world of wizardry and magic a long time ago, yet here she was, busy studying the works of a junior who had only made his official debut less than a year ago. But why a sudden interest in grimoires? USAE Young. The instincts of woman possessed by USAE Young floated a question mark. She even took a seat next to Hazeline. Well, I, uh, I was a wizard before, you know. Hazeline. Hazeline became extremely awkward, and felt apologetic too, while facing USAE Young. The emotions she had for SAE Jean might be love from her perspective, but from USAE Young's point of view, it could only be seen as malicious emotions instead. Hmm isn't this grimoire supposed to be very rare? USAE Young. Why, yeah. I suppose it is. I got curious, you see. Whenever this wizard publishes something, it goes out of stock almost immediately, right? So, how could our guild has a line? Well, this is within my oppa's abilities, of course. USAE Young spoke with an obviously pleased smile on her face. Meanwhile, Hazeline tasted a somewhat bitter than bitter aftertaste while nodding her head powerlessly. Well then, I should start studying, to USAE Young. Slightly lost within the sense of victory, USAE Young didn't leave Hazeline's side. Instead, she pulled out her notebook PC, several textbooks, and even donned a pair of very intellectual-looking glasses. SFX for doors suddenly opening. Suddenly, the doors to the library were pushed open very hard. Arg, what the? USAE Young hurriedly took off her glasses and turned her head around to look. At the same time, a huge shouting exploded out like a clap of thunder. My name is E. Eugene, a new member of the guild. What the? Who the heck is she? Hazeline. Hazeline blocked her ears and frowned deeply. That girl ah, uh, right. We did pick her as the new member of the guild USAE Young. The guild held a new member selection, which ended up causing much consternation in the country not too long ago. It was such a hot topic of news that, the monster and around 13 knights orders even held a joint contest among the populace to vote for who could be a good fit for the monster guild. E. Eugene ah, so she got selected. Hazeline. 
Although an official announcement hadn't been made yet, SAE Jean did inform them of the selection already. USAE Young got up from her chair and walked towards you Eugene. Congratulations. USAE Young. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you very much. E. Eugene. Let's get along well together, you and I. USAE Young. And behind E. Eugene, SAE Jean was walking in through the door as well. His body trembled imperceptibly when he spotted USAE Young just now. Uh, Appa? What you're doing here? USAE Young. Oh, uh, I was Sei Jean. He came here to discuss some very serious matters with Hazeline, actually. He told her over the phone, help me, but hadn't told her all the details yet. Here to introduce E. Eugene to you all. S.A.E. Jean. But since he didn't expect to spot you S.A.E. Young to be with her, he hastily used E. Eugene as a suitable excuse. Well then, you should break the ice among yourselves. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, Appa, wait. U.S.A.E. Young. What? Why? S.A.E. Jean. When S.A.E. Jean tilted his head, U.S.A.E. Young walked closer right up to his face. She stood on the tip of her toes, wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him full on the lips. And it wasn't just a little peck, either. It was so intimate that E. Eugene, who was standing next to them and witnessing the tongue wrangling going on in its full glory, couldn't help but have her face dyed in crimson red. What was that all about, out of the blue? S.A.E. Jean. The kiss ended after one full minute and S.A.E. Jean awkwardly asked. Just. I wanted to do it, is all. USAE Young giggled and tapped on his shoulder. He scratched his cheek and left the library. Meanwhile, all Hazeline could do was to bite down hard on her teeth while staring at that torturous sight. She was so envious. Her heart ached, too as if a blunt knife stabbed it and was twisting this way and that. On top of that, she even unconsciously imagined something she shouldn't have SAE Jean and her kissing. If it was her instead of USAE Young, then she wouldn't have to stand on tiptoes, either. She held her fountain pen real tightly, until it was this close from breaking into pieces. She even felt hints of tears welling up. So, so jealous, envious, and the mere fact that she couldn't say anything made it doubly more difficult. H.M., hmm. USAE Young hummed as she sat back down next to Hazeline. Hazeline did her very best to hold everything back in and concentrated on the grimoire. Meanwhile, USAE Young took a sneaky and quick glance at her, and a hint of smile formed on her lips. Chapter, 135 Breath A type of magic where mana in its most elementary form was fired out. The mighty dragons apparently loved using it in the distant past, and thus this attack became a romantic ideal of sorts, but still, the level of destructive power each breath attack possessed was definitely horrifying to behold. S.A.E. Jean came to the monster field to train his own breath that would no doubt become one of his main attacks whether he was in the human's appearance or as a leviathan all the while suddenly choosing to wear a robe usually worn by other wizards while carrying a single elegant wooden stick thingy and accompanied by a drone fitted with a camera. It was shaped like a lengthy, slick pole, and the tip was rounded off indeed, this was a magic staff crafted with Kim S.A.E. Jean's own hands. From afar, it kinda looked as if he made it out from a broken branch of a tree, but when inspected close by, there was this vintage charm to its overall shape. On top of this, S.A.E. Jean also attached a ruby-like jewel on it that featured the attributes of mana amplification and increased spell's power, in terms of market value, this staff would easily cost nearly 30 million. Well, wizards tended to have a rather large spending habit, so. Mm. He was making his way towards the upper mid-tier hunting grounds, dressed up as the wizard of Bang Dong. He even checked to make sure the drone was working fine, since the footage captured would be uploaded to the blog, too. He deliberately came here during the sunset, and sure enough, there weren't all that many people around who were still out hunting. Still, S.A.E. Jean covered his face even more with the thick hood and roamed around the hunting ground. K. Kiek. When he walked around for 30 minutes or so, he finally ran into a fairly substantial monster that dominated the skies, the wyvern. If he found something like a griffin, fine, but a wyvern, a high-tier monster, in the upper mid-tier hunting ground? 
It was probably a typical example of how chaotic the activities of monsters have become lately. Well, this is good. S.A.E. Jean pointed the staff at the wyvern and focused his mana flowing inside the body onto his new baby. Reddish mana focused on the ruby, and this crimson flow gradually morphed into flames while boiling hotly, and then. Quahahaha. It twisted and distorted as it pounced upon the airborne wyvern. The breath, hell's flame of retribution fired by S.A.E. Jean on the ground only needed less than one second to reach the wyvern. Kikiek. The flames of hell engulfed the poor wyvern in one go. The creature let out a tragic scream of suffering as it flapped its wings. Too bad, the devilish flames didn't want to go out, no matter what. Woom. S.A.E. Jean gathered mana around his staff again. This time, rather than red color, the flow of mana emitted a pure white hue, like the surface of ice. The chilling mana pooling around the staff rapidly froze the world. The molecules of air froze into tiny frost particles and scattered away, settling on the surface of his robe as a thin layer of ice. SFX for solid ice blocks cracking open. As the land SAE Jean stood on froze up in white, a breath of freezing storm rushed out from the staff this time around. This cold breath even managed to freeze the sky as it reached the hapless wyvern. And when it was combined with the hell's flames, they caused a massive explosion. Quahahang. The big and powerful wyvern was reduced to ashes and bits of frost from the combined might of flames and bitter chill, and the remains drifted down to the ground. Ho oh! -oh. As its body had been completely annihilated, there was no loot to recover, but still, this show of power had truly impressed him. Even with the human form it was this amazing, so how powerful would it be in the leviathan's form? His confidence was soaring higher. I wonder how good was the footage. He turned his attention towards the hovering drone and muttered to himself. What types of reactions would they show? Nowadays, S.A.E. Jean was deriving much pleasure at watching the surprised faces of those overly proud wizards. As well as at those two-faced people who publicly tried to cut down the wizard of Bang Dong out of jealousy but inwardly coveted what he possessed. What would their reactions be like, after he uploads this video on the blog? Would they deny the truth right in front of their eyes and claim that it was the might of the staff? Or would they accept the gap in their abilities and his, and kneel down in defeat? Of course, judging from the prior haughty actions of many wizards so far, most of them would choose the former option. While he stood there feeling rather pleased with himself, a text message from Hazeline arrived. S.A. Young just left. We can talk now. S.A.E. Jean sent back his own short reply and headed back to the exit. After meeting up with Hazeline, S.A.E. Jean told her everything in detail. The horrifying future that Kim Yusone's visions revealed as well as cooperating with an offshoot of vampires called Nisferatus in order to stop that future from happening. This information was a sensitive top secret that should never be told to anyone, but the person hearing it was Hazeline, and S.A.E. Jean felt less of a pressure precisely because of that. That was how trustworthy and reliable a person she was. After hearing all of this, Hazeline's eyes opened up extra round and all she could do was to open and close her mouth repeatedly like a goldfish, completely speechless. Actually, she couldn't say anything. From her point of view, what S.A.E. Jean told her just now sounded like a surrealistic fantasy. Would you like to help me? S.A.E. Jean. Eh. W. Wait. Hold on. S. So, if I try to unpack everything Mr. S.A.E. Jean has told me Hazeline. Hazeline swept her wet hair back, seemingly soaked through because of all the cold sweat pouring out of her forehead. In the future, our world will head towards apocalypse, because of the vampires and in order to stop these vampires, we need to ally ourselves with other vampires and kill their leader am I right? Hazeline. Hmm more or less. But, please, do try to separate Nisferatu's and vampires apart during our conversations. It might get confusing. S.A.E. Jean Of course, S.A.E. Jean still found this group of Nisferatu's not that easy to fully trust. But, he couldn't forget the fact that they handed a leviathan scale over to him. By taking into consideration this scale being the real deal, somehow, they didn't seem like totally evil beings that were impossible to work with. That Lilia woman even allowed S.A.E. Jean to dispatch his agents to the hidden sanctuary while saying, if we show even an inkling of betrayal, 
you can wipe us all out with your strengthened leviathan form after ingesting the scale. S. So, these Nisferatu's Hazeline. To Hazeline, who was unaware of these events, all vampires were exactly the same, regardless of what they were called. Us elves are enemies with vampires, you know Hazeline. She looked somewhat in agony as she covered her face. The Mafia, the Triads, the Yakuza, rebels and revolutionaries, government forces, etc., etc. She might have received lots of commissions from many different clients in the past. But an operation of this scale, and working together with vampires no less, was a first even for her. If you don't feel up to it, you can always decline. But, you must keep everything you've heard today as a secret, said S.A.E. Jean. Suddenly, Hazeline lowered the hands covering her face, rested her chin on one, and with a strange look in her eyes, stared at S.A.E. Jean. As a secret? Hazeline. Yes, of course. With the exception of you, Miss Hazeline, there isn't anyone else I can talk to about this. You're the first person to hear this secret among all my acquaintances. Although the famous elven trait of never betraying others' trust played a part in his decision, S.A.E. Jean also implicitly believed in Hazeline as well. Even if he didn't use the eyes of the wolf and see into her heart, she was still a person he knew the longest after all. Even S.A. Young doesn't know. Hazeline. Eh. Oh yes. T, that's right. Before he could answer, though, he did become a bit conscious of this decision. The reason why he didn't tell you S.A.E. Young was because this operation was going to be very dangerous. Depending on how it was interpreted, it could be seen as a sort of discrimination. Is that so? Has a line. But it was a weird thing her eyes regained her calm demeanor, her lips arched in a slight grin, and even her nostrils flared just a little. Her complexion puzzlingly showed how pleased she was. S.A.E. Jean scratched his head while asking her. Have you come to a decision? S.A.E. Jean. By the way, if I decide to participate, then doesn't that mean we will have to see each other more often from now on? You did say we need to come up with a plan. Hazeline. While twisting the ends of her hair, Hazeline feigned disinterest as she asked on the sly. Yes, probably we will. But, if you want, we could communicate using those communication crystals S.A.E. Jean. Nope. If I do this, then I should do it properly. In this world, I hate doing things in half measures the most, you know. Hazeline. Hazeline suddenly stood up from her seat with a serious face. I will do it. Not only are you the one asking me, I also want to do something this big and crazy, too. Saving the world doesn't that sound just cool? Being born as an elf woman, I should do at least something this grand once before I die. Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean gazed at her and formed a smile. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean. Then, he pulled out a crystal from the drawer. Lilia. The wizard agreed to do it. S.A.E. Jean. Ha. Huh. We, we are doing this right now. Hazeline. Please take a seat. We'll explain the plan. S.A.E. Jean. Sure. As soon as Hazeline sat back down, Lilia's voice came out from the crystal. Thank you very much, Wizard Nim. We have all climbed aboard a ship that will cross a very dangerous sea. And the first obstacle we must cross is, to kill a certain woman who will become the future ruler of all vampires. Okay, I know that Mr. S.A.E. Jean has explained to me in detail already. That is a relief. Then, allow me to explain the plan in greater detail. The plan was thus. Firstly, Nisferatus would set up an isolation barrier that separated a small area of the East Sea from the rest of the world then inside it, they would ready countless magic traps and mana stones. And when S.A.E. Jean played his part well and lure Bathory into this barrier, those traps would activate then, Hazeline's turn would come next. What she needed to activate was the artificial heart S.A.E. Jean got from defeating the doll of the vampire some time ago. By activating the spell contained within the heart, the one that disabled the flow of mana temporarily, and using it against Bathory, then in that moment, she should become incredibly weak. Pour countless magic attacks on her and with them, kill her. In theory, it would only take a blink from the beginning of the operation to its conclusion probably less than three seconds. However, Lilia was of an opinion that, 
if they failed to kill the Bathory woman within that time frame, the odds of their plan failing was over 70%, so she added something else. It is regrettable that most of us, Miss Faradus, are wizards I feel that it could be to our advantage if we have one more person, a knight, that can delay Bathory physically. Lilia began mumbling as she found it unfortunate. A knight, you say? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean's eyes brightened. If they were talking about a knight then he could think of someone. Someone who went on a vacation during these monster incident-laden turbulent times, saying that she couldn't work due to the post-op depression from the Operation Kim Yurin. Yes. Even with a lot of people, a disorganized rabble will only end up getting in our way so, I believe a talented knight would be better for us. Hmm. S.A.E. Jean fell into a dilemma. Meanwhile, Hazeline was next to him, unable to compose herself. He definitely said he wouldn't get USAE Young involved in this. That meant, the most powerful person of the remaining knights could only be. At his follow-up words, Hazeline's heart sank to the bottom. I could float the idea past the knight Kim Yurin. SAE Jean. The relationship between human SAE Jean and Kim Yurin wasn't all that deep, unless he was in the hero orc form. However, she was someone with a great sense of righteousness as well as holding unshakable ideals of a knight. If he explained to her that, by killing Bathory, they would put an end to the monster incidents, she might agree to do it without much resistance with that line of persuasion. It was then, Hazeline grabbed the arm of deliberating S.A.E. Jean. Excuse me, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Hazeline. Yes. She could only contort her body with an uncomfortable face, unable to say a single word. Not only did she feel ashamed of the past incident with Kim Yurin, but also, she didn't want to discuss her past love life in front of Kim S.A.E. Jean either. What's the matter? Are you perhaps uncomfortable with Miss Kim Yurin? S.A.E. Jean. Nod, nod. Well, in that case. There is someone else who isn't a knight but probably stronger than regular knight anyway will that be fine? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. What we are looking for is a person who can physically delay Bathory, even for a brief second. In gaming terms what they were looking for was a tanker. While grinning to himself, S.A.E. Jean recalled the silhouette of someone who'd never be taken to be a tanker a small white cat, Yu Song. What about knight Ju Ji Hyuk? I hear he got promoted to the high tier. Has a line. Hazeline asked him cautiously. Oh you're right. We also have Mr. Ji Hyuk, don't we? If you're talking about Ju Ji Hyuk, do you mean the master of great swords? Yes, that's him. S.A.E. Jean. He should be a good fit, in that case. Satisfied by the amazing quality of his personal connections, S.A.E. Jean smiled and wrote down several names on the memo pad. Of course, it was unknown whether any one of these people might participate in something this dangerous. Phew Wu. Leaving Hazeline to breathe a sigh of relief, S.A.E. Jean was about to make a call to Ju Ji Hyuk on the phone. Ah, right, there's something I should do first. Nearly forgot about it. Then, he suddenly remembered something, and pulled out a magic staff stored in his body via spiritualization. This staff looked a bit similar to his own, but it was refined and beautified further to better suit Hazeline. He also went with a diamond instead of a ruby for the decorative jewel, even. Here, take this. S.A.E. Jean. What is this? It's a present. For deciding to work with us. It's got a really powerful amplification attribute added in. S.A.E. Jean. Ah but, it looks so expensive Hazeline. She dazedly studied this beautiful staff for a while, before swallowing down her nervous saliva and gently embraced it. Haha <laughs> get friendly with that fella soon. Since it's one of the best I've made yet, it'll listen to you very well. S.A.E. Jean Hazeline found S.A.E. Jean busy emphasizing his best, quite attractive, and she felt this powerful urge to hug him right this moment. Ha! Huh. No, she ended up doing it for real. Her body acted before her mind could. She embraced S.A.E. Jean tightly, while slowly whispering to him. Thank you. Chapter, 136 Miss Hazeline S.A.E. Jean's voice slowly settled down in the office where there were only two people present. But, Hazeline didn't release her embrace. 
Instead, she proceeded to rub her face all over his chest, and fully savored this sudden bout of happiness her impulsive actions had brought along. S.A.E. Jean blankly stared Hazeline as she hugged him. Her faintly trembling shoulders seemed to indicate her fears of the consequences, yet the strength of her two arms squeezing his waist said otherwise. Is there something the matter? Lilia's voice came out of the communication crystal, right then. Judging from the way the tone of her words climbing up towards the end, it seemed that she was tilting her head on the other side of the line. Um ah, uh, what was today's date again I, well, I should get going. Lilia said some weird stuff before ending the communication. Today was Saturday, but still, did she have something to do? S.A.E. Jean did his best to think of inane and unrelated things in order to calm down both his shocked mind and the body. But that much-needed calmness continued to evade him, so he even took several deep breaths. Fuwu. In all honesty, it wasn't as if he hadn't foreseen just what kind of feelings she had for him. The reality was he just didn't want to think about it too deeply. It sure was a cowardly way of dealing with the matter, but he couldn't help it. Even though they could not be in a romantic relationship, she was still a very precious person to him. So, no matter what, he didn't want to lose her. In the end, he maintained his denial that her feelings towards him were not that serious, that it was just an intense form of friendship, instead. But didn't someone say this before? That there could never be a simple, platonic friendship between men and women? Miss Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean called out her name again. But she didn't want to listen to him. Miss Hazeline. When his voice hardened ever so slightly, Hazeline's shoulders shook visibly. Only then, she released the hug and hung her head. Then, while sniffling a reddened nose, she spoke with a trembling voice. I'm sorry. I acted without thinking, because I loved this staff so much I'm so grateful. Something inside me just wanted to burst out so suddenly, you know. I couldn't hold it back you know already, yes. That elves are like this. That was why I. She blamed the innate personality of her race for her impulsive actions. And while seeing her like this, S.A.E. Jean gritted his teeth. Hazeline was an important person to him, someone he cherished greatly. No matter how selfish he sounded, he didn't want to lose her. And so he had to undo the hardened expression, and had to forcibly squeeze out a smile. He needed to pretend that he wasn't any wiser and talk to her. He knew that he was truly a rotten son of a bitch, but in this very moment, this was the only thing he could do or say to her. Ha, ha. You like this staff that much? S.A.E. Jean. With a calm voice, he gently placed the staff back in the hands of Hazeline who didn't seem to know what to do next. It's a really expensive and a great staff, so please don't lose it. S.A.E. Jean. Hearing his words, Hazeline bit her lower lip and her grip on the staff tightened as if she was trying to crush it. She could faintly tell the hidden meanings of his words. She could understand. But she hated it. She didn't want to acknowledge it, either. That's why she didn't answer him, but instead, continued to stare at the floor while thinking about the future at the same time. Looking at him from afar, or to stay right by his side. Under the condition of can't have him, which of the two options would prove to be more torturous? A puzzle seemingly impossible to decipher. If both propositions were placed on a scale, they would most likely maintain equilibrium for all eternity. But, right now, she had to give her answer to him. And being born as an elf, perhaps this was an unavoidable inevitability for her. To hold a conversation with him in the same room, and at minimum, still get to see him she wasn't sure if these were enough to satisfy herself, but still it would be better than looking at him from afar. Looking at him only now that would be the worst form of torture to endure. That was why, she had to forcibly squeeze out something past her totally blocked up throat. Yes. Of course. I'll never lose it. Has a line. Unexpectedly, her desperately squeezed out voice didn't shake. But Hazeline didn't raise her head. Although she did want to look into his eyes, she also didn't want to show her tearful expression as she was still fighting hard to hold back her tears. And S.A.E. Jean gently grasped her hands, as gently and considerate as possible. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean. Hazeline nearly burst out into tears, then. Yes. 
let's be satisfied with only this. Take it as a punishment, and be happy with the fact that I can stay by his side. Be grateful rather than greedy. Be satisfied rather than sad. Let me not repeat the mistake of the past by becoming too greedy Hazeline. No, not at all. Hazeline. Hazeline wiped the corners of her eyes and raised her head. Although her reddened eyes and nose must have looked pretty pathetic, she still smiled. Instead. I should be the one thanking you. Hazeline. After Sae Jean managed to pacify Hazeline and sent her home, he returned to his own place late at night. Usae Young was already asleep, while holding a long pillow that must have been a substitute for him. It was a sight adorable enough to bring a grin to his tired face. Sae Jean sat on the corner of the bed and gently stroked her hair. He sat there and did this for the next five minutes, before leaving a light kiss on her forehead and he got back up. The next destination he headed to was a small desk in the corner of the bedroom. As soon as he sat down, he pulled out his diary from the drawer. Writing a diary was a habit he formed a long while ago. He didn't write on it every day, but he made sure to write on it at least once or twice a week so he could potentially stop his humanity from disappearing, buried away by the instincts of the monsters within him. He remembered starting this habit the day after he lost his self-control and murdered that vampire a couple of years ago. Of course, he applied a special magic treatment on the diary so no one else could read it by accident. Fuwu. He picked up the pen, and began committing each and every letter on the page as if he was spitting out a long sigh. It hadn't been long, before the sound of rustling came from the bed. Sae Jean quickly finished writing on the diary and put it back inside the drawer. Appa, you were writing on the diary again? Hearing the sleepy voice, Sae Jean turned around to look, and saw you Sae Young with her messy bed hair gazing at him with half-closed eyes. Yeah. But I'm done now. He smiled thinly, and slowly approached her side. Her still sleepy eyes followed him in a daze. He then lightly grasped the back of her neck and gave a light kiss. But soon enough, she placed her hands against his chest and pushed hard, stopping him. When he tilted his head in confusion, she abashedly murmured her reasons out in the open. I've got bad breaths I just woke up now, you idiot. U.S.A.E. Young. Fut. You know I'm fine with that. S.A.E. Jean. But I'm not fine with it, though. She cutely glared at him and blew into her palm, then smelled the resulting odor. It must not have been that bad, since she let out a sigh of relief. Arg, you are so dn adorable. This really was the unendurable cuteness. That was why S.A.E. Jean jumped right into her arms. Wait. I told you I just woke up. Ah, a hat. That tickles, tickles. She initially put some resistance, but she couldn't win against his mischievous and wicked ways that concentrated on conquering all her erogenous zones. Her silk pajamas powerlessly got ripped off, and as it turned out, she wasn't wearing any undergarments. That night, S.A.E. Jean gave it his all. And on the following day, Usae Young had to ask for a temporary leave of absence from work. The wizard of Bangbaedong has uploaded the new magic he has developed, Breath, to his blog. Possessing the unprecedented attack power that can kill a wyvern in two hits, the world of magic has experienced yet another great shock to the system. The world's top-ranked wizard tower, La Grande, of the USA, questioned whether this spell was actually a hybrid of other existing spells or not. As usual, as soon as Sae Jean uploaded the drone footage to his blog, all hell broke loose. And just as he expected, they initially questioned him for being a fraud or for combining pre-existing spells and claimed it as his own. However, the opinions of experts and the data captured from within the monster field proved that this spell was indeed the real deal. The high-ranked wizard from the Soul Wizard Tower, the Elf Remelin. When you take a look at his staff, you can see mana being amplified by an incredible amount on that ruby the moment the spell activates. This amplification is great enough to allow a low-level wizard to display fearsome might equal to upper-mid-level wizards. That's why, I posit that the wizard of Bangbaedong was borrowing the power of this staff. The next avenue of attack was, again as predicted, the staff. How could they be so predictably on the mark all the time? 
S.A.E. Jean chuckled out a bitter laughter as he continued to watch the news broadcast on the TV. Despite all the controversy, today's most actively working wizard, the Wizard of Bang Bei Dong, has entered the top 1,000 of worldwide rankings and is continuing on with his unstoppable march forward. The grimoires he corrected and released for sale have now become true treasures that many wizard towers around the world can't even get their hands on due to their scarcity. And the soon-to-be-published Bang Bei Dong grimoire number 24 has caused a great deal of excitement and anticipation as the rumors and guesses on what it might contain boils over around the world. However, even after being the target of all this petty jealousy, the fame and the influence of the wizard of Bang Bei Dong's name was still spreading further every day. I really didn't expect the wizard of Bang Bei Dong to be our guild master. Ju Ji Hyuk muttered audibly, his voice full of admiration and awe. The place was the top secret conference room built in the underground of the Monster Guild HQ without anyone's knowledge. Inside this conference room decorated with many top-ranked artifacts, equipment, potions as well as entertainment facilities, there were seven people present at the moment. Unlike the seriousness of the overall atmosphere, these people were sitting freely on couches while busy watching the TV, S.A.E. Jean, Yu Bek Song, Ju Ji Hyuk, Hazeline, Yi Hai Rin, Kim Sun Ho, and the Su In, region. So, uh, that Bang Bei Dong dude is really you? Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song asked after Ju Ji Hyuk's utterances ended. S.A.E. Jean wordlessly nodded his head. Humph. I heard that one of those grimoires written by Bang Bei Dong guy can cause stock prices of wizard towers to go up and down what a shock you Bek Song. The stock price of a wizard tower named Parium Tower rose up from 19 per share to over 30 in less than a week, after it emerged that this tower had successfully acquired Bang Bei Dong grimoires numbers 18 to 23. Actually, S.A.E. Jean helped out with that, since this tower was unusually humble in their attitude. Mm -hmm. The head of the SID didn't know. S.A.E. Jean. The information protected by our intelligence agents won't leak out that easily, boss. Kim Sun Ho. Kim Sun Ho replied instead. There were thick traces of pride in his speech. Seriously you're too much. Why too much just why did I study magic for 20 years all I needed was a nice trait Hazeline. These powerless words were uttered out by Hazeline, whose soul had left her around 20 minutes ago when S.A.E. Jean confessed to her that he was the wizard of Bang Bei Dong. Dot. A crystal placed next to the TV screen suddenly lit up in red color. When Ju Ji Hyuk hurriedly turned the TV off, Lilia's voice leaked out from the crystal. Everyone, I'd like to convey my gratitude for your decisions to participate in this very dangerous operation. However, the leader of the Bathories is a woman possessing the most destructive power. Please, take this last opportunity where you can quit, to think your choice is over. Since S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline had explained the plan in detail to the rest of the group using hand gestures and even pantomime, all Lilia had to do was to reaffirm their resolve and determination. I know all about that Bathory woman's power after hearing so much about it. That's why, I agree with the opinion on getting rid of her before the situation gets worse than now. Yu Bek Song Yu Bek Song said out aloud as she stroked the back of Kaiser II. Too bad, Kaiser only wanted to be on S.A.E. Jean's lap, though. Of course. But, you know what? I also find your stories hard to believe. Yu Bek Song Yu Bek Song's eyes narrowed like a predator. Vampires are an untrustworthy bunch to begin with, so at minimum, shouldn't you reveal yourselves to show how sincere you are? Yu Bek Song. Her ears stood up straight and stiff. And S.A.E. Jean promptly reached out pinched both of them tightly. Ouch. H. Hey. What are you doing? While looking at the small white tiger jumping up in pure shock after the unexpected touching, S.A.E. Jean clicked his tongue and spoke. I'll guarantee their credibility. Besides, now that the Lord of Vampires has awakened, how do you expect them to come out in the open? T.L., just for the record, it has been mentioned in passing that the Vampire Lord possesses an ability that can control all vampires. That includes Nisferatu's as well. I, I can still inquire about this matter, no. Still, why did you go and pinch my ears? Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song rubbed her small ears and pouted. At that adorable appearance, everyone in the room broke out in laughter. In any case, 
have you all come to a decision? To participate in this dangerous mission, where you might lose your lives. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean asked with a hardened face. And they answered energetically in their own preferred way. All right. Then, please, head over to the tattooing area. One tattoo per month let's get stronger by tattooing ourselves until there's no room left. S.A.E. Young. The time remaining was five months. S.A.E. Jean decided to give each person participating in this mission one mana tattoo per month. Doesn't doesn't it hurt? You beck song. It doesn't hurt during the process, so be still, please. S.A.E. Jean. During. Then, what happens afterwards? You beck song. Everyone else got their tattoos no problem, but strangely you beck song kept on evading S.A.E. Jean's hands. Un, unhand me at once. Growl. Growl. You beck song. Just be still. I'll buy you something really tasty when we are all finished here. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean finally succeeded in catching her by using tasty treats as bait. It seemed that, with her lips resolutely closed shut, she was getting ready to receive her tattoo. But, just as the needle tip gleamed under the light, she jumped up into the air like a scalded cat, and shouted out in a really loud voice. Nope. Now that I think about it, I don't need it since I'm already super strong. You beck song. S.A.E. Jean shook his head, and then spread out a white-colored potion in front of her face. Eek. What are you doy? She tried to spit out the liquid that entered her mouth and shouted angrily, but less than three seconds later, she figuratively melted into a puddle. That was a potion with the effect of inducing a deep sleep. Of course, since she was Yubek Song, she would regain her consciousness in less than five minutes, but that was more than enough time. Phew. S.A.E. Jean sighed out and resumed the tattooing operation. Shudder, shudder. As the tattooing needle came in contact with her, Yubek Song's small body trembled intermittently. Chapter, 137. Inside the underground conference room beneath the monster HQ, the members of the raid party were steadily strengthening their bodies. Knights trained tirelessly to get used to various mana tattoo enhancements, while Hazeline was getting to know more and more about the artificial heart and how it operated. Wow, so you can enter a complete divine beast, mode. Ju Ji Hyuk. HM, hmm. That's right. It's only for a short while, but when I'm in the full great white tiger form, I fear no one. It's not for nothing a Su in with a divine beast bloodline like me gets all the attention in the world. I mean, in the past, nations were fighting over each other to take me home first, you know. You beck song. Currently, the time was during a small break between the all out training sessions. When Ju Ji Hyuk started praising You beck song, she crossed her arms and the hot air, filled with excessive pride, bellowed out from her flaring nostrils. Seeing her show off like this, S.A.E. Jean felt the need to bully her for a bit, so he stealthily sneaked near her gently swaying tail and then, tightly grabbed it. U.H.A.H.T. Yubek Song jumped up high into the air then began kicking towards her back. Unfortunately, her short legs weren't going to reach S.A.E. Jean's arm. Un, unhand me. She screamed out in unbridled rage, yet every time S.A.E. Jean brushed her tail, her hostility weakened bit by bit. Having her tail stroked by a person with a nice scent that sensation made her unhappy but at the same time made her feel good as well. Let, let go Yuha. In the end, she went down for good like a fish flapping helplessly outside the water. While carrying an insidious smile, he took her tail that was needlessly longer than her body, and chomped down on it. And well, that roused yet another powerful reaction out of her. No matter how I see it, doesn't it look like Miss Yubeksong enjoys being tormented a bit too much? E. Hai Rin. Just as Yubeksong was about to escape from the grasp of an evil entity known as Kim Sae Jean, E. Hai Rin teasingly spoke up. What nonsense are you talking about? Yubeksong. No, well, it's nothing by the way, Miss Beksong. Do you know, by any chance, what is an S and an M? E. Hai Rin. What the heck are those? You beck song. It's just alphabet so, would you like to choose? Which one do you like more, an S or an M? E. Hai Rin. 
After sensing a somewhat suspicious air coming off of Yi Hai-rin, Yu Bexong's brows furrowed deeply. However, Yi Hai-rin simply smiled thickly and egged her on to make a choice. Please hurry. Yi Hai-rin. The interested gazes of the guild members gathered on her. Yu Bexong deeply wondered about this, thinking whether she needed to do this for real, before finally opening her lips in a cautious manner. An M. At the same time, lots of laughter broke out. Yu Bexong tilted her head with a face full of questions. Sae Jean held back his laughter and stood next to her and then, proceeded to lightly tap on her small head as he spoke in a serious voice. Everyone, please stop. Do you find it fun to tease a little kid? Sae Jean. Who are you calling a little kid? You, stop before I bite you to death. Yu Bexong. Cough. And so, as they were busy chatting and laughing among themselves, the door to their right that led into the isolation barrier chamber opened up. SFX for slow, meandering footsteps. A deeply haggard looking Hazeline weakly walked out while her gaze was fixed to the floor. Miss Hazeline, are you okay? SAE Jean. SAE Jean pushed a prepared mug of coffee that also contained a potion with an effect of recovering energy to her. It might get better if I hug stance. While receiving the mug, she took a glance around her and then, like a machine gun, quickly whispered to him. Ah, uh, oh. Ah, uh, that is. Too bad, since S.A.E. Jean knew her real feelings, he couldn't just brush this aside as a simple joke. Seeing him like this, Hazeline smiled and spoke first. I'm just joking. It's a joke. Hazeline sipped on the mug while walking over to the couch where everyone else was sitting down. Regular dark elves didn't like to hang around other people, but still, she had a good rapport with the members of this team. It was par for the course, really since everyone gathered here were all good-natured and thoughtful people. Oh, right. What is Night Kim Yurin doing right now? Hasn't it been already two months? Ju Ji Hyuk. Ju Ji Hyuk spoke up. Momentarily, Hazeline's hands holding the coffee mug spasmed slightly. She's resting well in some hut on the east coast. I think, all of the fatigue built up over her entire career just flooded out the gates because of that event not too long ago. You see, my team captain, ever since entering the Knight's Order at the age of 17, she has never gone on a holiday until now E. Hai Rin. With a complicated expression, S.A.E. Jean brought his mug of coffee close to his face. That word, hut, got on his conscience just a tad. Did you go and visit her? Ju Ji Hyuk. Of course. I was so shocked when I got there, you know. Was this her going through menopause? Or was the fact that she never got to own a pet until now finally getting to her? Or was she depressed because the hero orc rejected her? E Hai Rin. Shudder. Sae Jean's body shuddered imperceptibly. That last bit really poked his conscience good. But she was like she just smiled this lonely smile, and said nothing back. Didn't deny, didn't even acknowledge it no, you know what she did. She said that she just wanted to rest for a while, then prepared a meal for us to eat together. E. Hai Rin. Sae Jean felt a slight case of guilty conscience washing over him. It can't be lovesickness, right? Sae Jean. Oh, well. Let's talk about that some other time. Guild Master, just when are you going to tell us about your trait? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin quickly changed the subject, then. Uh. Oh, my trait. Sae Jean hadn't told them, other than Kim Sun Ho and Hazeline, what his trait was. But, when the time came, he was thinking of revealing his leviathan form and nothing else. Just as well, he couldn't reveal them in the first place, anyways. His wolf form was the Lycan, and the hero orc form was tangled up in Kim Yurin's mess, so. Maybe two months. I'll let you know then. Sae Jean. Sae Jean replied so and smiled brightly. What? Oh, come on now. We already told you ours, though. E. Hai Rin. Sae Jean ignored E. Hai Rin's fake jeering and entered the isolation barrier chamber where Hazeline had been inside just now. Wow. As expected thanks most likely to Hazeline's magic training, not one spot of the chamber was left undamaged. 
abrasions, deep gouges, things overturned, things crushed to bits, etc., etc. Hmm, hmm. For now, he sat down in the middle of a crater on the floor. And then, while revealing the claws of the wolf on one hand, he brought up the status window for one of his skills. Chain Claws Skill Proficiency Level, B Then, to add to this, he summoned lightning magic on the other hand. Crackle, sparkle. Blindingly white bolts of electricity buzzed around his hand. Sure enough, the status windows got activated by using this midrank spell. Lightning Bolt Skill Proficiency Level, A the status windows were indeed very convenient existences. Even magic spells that were not skills were recorded and helped him utilize them in various other ways. Such as, when combining different skills, or when he was about to inscribe a magic tattoo. And now, he was going to use skill combination. He had used this skill a few times in the past, but the increases in the cooling down period between each use versus the grade of the resulting skill proved to be poor so he stopped using it altogether. Using this skill was very easy. All he had to was think about combining them, and bring the skills together. So, when he combined the boiling hot arcs of electricity with the gleaming claws, then. SFX for very unpleasant screeches. First, a horrifying screeching cry of electricity akin to nails on the blackboard, and then, fur hung. A huge explosion occurred next. Skill combination has been successful. New Combined Skill, Lightning Chain Claw The host can fire a chain of lightning in the shape of claws, or the lightning itself can be imbued on the claws themselves. Depending on the proficiency level of the skill, the host can utilize the electrons in the air to infinitely spam the lightning, or by combining together with the target's blood, cause electrocution of the target. According to the resulting grade mid, the cool down time for the skill is, 99 days, 23 hours, 00, 0 minutes, 59 seconds. Ow, yeah. He was only trying to come up with something new, so he could record it on the 24th grimoire, but this was simply beyond his expectations. Oh well I can just lower the power a bit and then publish the book. He didn't think too much about it and pulled out an empty grimoire. He grabbed a pen and began drawing the anatomy of a person, the most efficient path for the mana circulation, as well as some tips on using this magic the best. Thanks to the skill, Goblin's craftsmanship, he could even draw right down to the most minute detail. To be clear, this wasn't what the Wizard of Bangbei Dong had been doing until now. This was him creating a new spell. The spell lightning may have formed the base, but the new spell displayed a might that far outstripped the original magic. Haha. <laughs> but, as he was writing this, an unknown smile kept creeping up on his lips. A desire to defeat others even began boiling up. Always trying to bring him down by saying he plagiarized, that he only knew how to correct, etc., etc. What would those conceited wizard towers say after seeing this spell? Most likely, they won't even get to enjoy the moral victory this time. Wizards speak not with words, but with actions, indeed. Time was like the endlessly flowing river it didn't stop even for one moment. The boiling hot rays of the sun had cooled down before anyone noticed the change and the autumn visited in full force, dyeing the falling leaves brown. And on the day the falling petals of flowers dancing in the cooling winds were broadcast on the television screens. The grimoire number 24 of the Wizard of Bangbaidong series, Linked Lightning Claws got published. Unlike in the past when he simply corrected, supplemented and or enhanced existing spells, this grimoire featured a completely new spell. A new footage of the magic in action was uploaded to the blog the composition of the grimoire was so perfect, not one fault could be found. Wizard Towers had to experience yet another round of massive shock to the system. This time, though, their level of shock was on another world altogether. Unlike fixing an existing spell, creating a new one outright was something even highly ranked wizards found very difficult to do. Many wizard towers threw their all in finding errors in this grimoire but the Parium Tower had received the book before everyone else. And its tower lord got to study the book for a whole week, before he replicated the spell in full, albeit a lot weaker, glory. Which meant others had to accept the reality of the situation. Now normally, new spells came to light maybe 56 times a year in Korea. 
It depended on countries, but the numbers didn't exceed two digits regardless of the territory. Taking the number of wizards active in Korea around 50,000 it wasn't wrong to say that the creation of a new magic spell was the most prestigious achievement all wizards dreamed of accomplishing one day. However, someone who didn't even work for a wizard tower, someone who hadn't even graduated from a wizard academy, someone with an unprofessional name like the Wizard of Bangbae Dong, had done something this incredibly difficult. Many wizards belonging to wizard towers could only despair at the unbridgeable chasm existing between them and the mysterious wizard. The magic spell created by the Wizard of Bangbae Dong, the Linked Lightning Claws, has been inspected by the Parium Wizard Tower who received the grimoire first and without an issue, the spell has been accepted as a legitimate new creation. To correct 23 grimoires in just over a year, and also, to create a brand new spell, too it can only be described as a truly frightening talent. The Tower Lord of the Soul Wizard Tower, that held quite a pronounced hostile relationship with the Bangbaedong Wizard, the Elf Romain, personally held a press conference. As an aside, the Soul Tower placed high importance on its member's alma mater, as well as his or her bloodline. This announcement sounded like that of a surrender to Kim Sae Jin's ears. And soon after this declaration of surrender, the blog of Bangbaedong Wizard became full with words of congratulations from high-level leaders from various world-famous wizard towers, as well as earnest requests to purchase the new grimoire. Unfortunately, he couldn't get to savor the sense of victory for too long. Because the day of the fated battle was approaching rapidly. Hey, hey, could that be? The place currently was the East Sea. For the first time after a long while, Kim Sae Jin came out to this part of the sea in the Leviathan form. Is that the Azure Dragon? The reporters had come here after getting the heads up from Sae Jin, but now, they were deeply puzzled by the sudden change to the color of the scales of the Azure Dragon. Dot. This was all part of the plan to show off the transformed look of the Azure Dragon, and to fan the flames of Bathory's curiosity and her smallish desire to possess him. Something seems to have changed. The gathered reporters muttered in confusion. But soon enough, just like the professionals that they were, they focused on the reason why they were there in the first place, and Sae Jean too began his part by showing off. He smiled as brightly as adorably as possible toward schools of fish that came to swim around him he raised a bit of a wave to surf on it he even pulled a dignified face and stared at the sun. Cameras didn't miss a single valuable shot and captured them all. Appearing after a lengthy hiatus, the appearance of the Guardian of the East has changed significantly. The hues of its scales has changed from the clear blue to a delicate, but noble silver hue. We do not know whether it's because the Azure Dragon has grown even further, or if it shed its scales like other animals molting. But it certainly instills much trust in the Azure Dragon as we watch it interact with the rest of the ocean's residents. After about an hour of this, Sae Jean could hear the closing comment from one of the reporters. He felt the rush of fatigue from acting overtaking him. We're done here. The reporters wiped the sweat off and ended their work for now, but the cameraman continued to film the Azure Dragon. Because of this Sae Jean had to act for a little bit longer. Chapter 138 The appearance of the Azure Dragon as seen in the video footage was, for a lack of better description, endearing. Smiles automatically found their ways to people's faces. When they saw the dragon caring for the marine lifeforms that had built their homes in the East Sea the sense of admiration and trust in the creature could only soar higher when seeing it survey the distant horizon, in case an unwelcome monster pops out. And its scales changing its hue to faint silver although making it a bit tricky to call it Azure now caused a storm of curiosity and desire to learn the reason from the public as well. Ah. Currently, inside the penthouse suite of a certain luxury hotel. The most likely candidate to inherit the position of power from the current vampire lord, Queen Perlani Bathory was dazedly staring at the image of the Azure Dragon being projected onto a wall. As she looked on at the new Azure Dragon, the powerful emotion she had to suppress for a long time because of her inept and dumb subordinates' dissuasions reared its ugly head once more. That emotion was, of course, the desire to possess the burning curiosity in her throbbing heart, almost a fetish-like avarice. SFX for a cheerful growl. She saw the dragon smile brightly as it surveyed the lifeforms fish it protected. She wanted so badly to corrupt that smile whenever she saw it. To make it more savage, more cruel, more violent. 
to make it only submit to her, and to see it bear its fangs at anyone else that wasn't her. My lady. As Bathory began stomping on the ground while completely unaware of doing it herself, an elder apostle called out to her in worry. What? Bathory. It was just a single word, but her tone of voice possessed enough killing intent within it to send chills down the apostle's backside. He couldn't dare to meet her eye to eye, and kept his gaze fixed to the floor. Just like before there are just too many eyewitnesses in the East Sea, my lady. Apostle. The elder apostles, the only ones possessing enough status to seek an audience with their future queen, tried their utmost to stop her. Although the Bathory girl was someone with a stubborn personality that just had to do what she wanted in order to please herself, by using the excuse of their grand scheme of returning to the homeland, they could tie her up in the meantime. I also know, okay. I mean, why should I pay attention to that thing, when I had a long and nice chat with the Lord? SFX for a cutish yawn of a dragon. As soon as those words left her lips, a unique scene of the azure dragon yawning and stretching its arms came on the screen. Bathory looked at that in a total daze and took a big gulp of her overflowing saliva. W, why would I pay attention to something like that? Bathory. Unlike her words, though, her eyes were firmly glued to the wall where the images were being projected to. That is a relief apostle. If my lady desires to possess the creature, then, isn't it possible to capture it during winter? However. Suddenly, a certain unnamed apostle stepped forward. He was a young apostle whose combat powers had seen an abrupt increase lately and had quickly climbed up into the position within the Bathory's royal guards. Why, you starred, what are why? I'm mm. What do you mean by that? Bathory. The aged elder apostle, almost succeeding in pacifying her, panicked and whispered to the new guy, but those words uttered by him was more than enough to rouse her interest thoroughly. My lady. You mustn't. Right now, we. You, shut your mouth, and you, I'm all ears. Bathory. Bathory slowly stroked her lips with her slender fingers while staring at the young apostle. I'm sure my lady's great insight must have informed you already, but if I was allowed to say it firstly, it is cold and barren during the winter months. That is why, monsters become even more violent during this period. Humans don't like the cold, so they try not to go out, meaning, who would think of heading over to the East Sea? In other words, there will be far less number of eyes by then. The young apostle's name was Rosradel. Caught by SAE Jean in the past and becoming his slave with the power of the Dark Energy Link, this vampire was reciting the information given to him secretly by SAE Jean in full. TL this guy made his first appearance in chapters 89 and 90. And also, I'm of an opinion that the Lady Bathory's plans would greatly benefit our overall scheme as well. Maybe other apostles don't think the same, but isn't it rather blindingly obvious that brainwashing a powerful divine creature like that dragon would bolster our forces even more greatly? That is why, I believe that we shouldn't mind small losses if it means we will be gaining greatly in the end. Ross Riddell you young one who doesn't know anything my lady, please do not listen to him. It may be true to some extent that the number of witnesses might decrease, but there is still no guarantee that brainwashing will be successful. If it's you, my lady, I have no doubts whatsoever. Ross Riddell Ross Riddell did his best to butter up to her, but suspicions grew larger on Bathory's face as her eyes remained on him. During her lifetime, she had met her share of treacherous subordinates. That is why, even she could easily figure out that unending and baseless praising were the hallmarks of those slimy stars. Facing this eerie silence, Ross Riddell's face hardened slightly, but before the suspicion against him could grow larger, he projected the screen of his phone in the air. To be more helpful to you my lady, I have been slowly advancing my membership grade in the Azure Dragon website until now. I participated in their meetings, and even donated a great deal of money as well. And as a result, I am now able to find out the dragon's radius and scope of movement. Ross Riddell It was true that, with his clearance, Ross Riddell could access VVIP level of information from the Azure Dragon website. As an aside, the membership advancement was so strict that not even Bathory, who had secretly joined, could advance past the gold membership even now. Mm. Then, Bathory's expression softened a little. 
Immediately sensing the change, Ross Rebel quickly informed her of the latest development. The Azure Dragon during its growth phase requires a lot of sleep, so the most likely time it will be seen again is around the evening of 25th of December or so they say. This cannot be any more ideal, my lady. Not only is it in the middle of winter, it's also Christmas, so people will choose to spend the day with their families, meaning there should be no one out there by the ocean. Rosredell stopped with his words right there. However, he certainly dared not to look up for he lacked the necessary balls to do so. What kind of facial expressions would she be making right now? Could she be getting ready to drain every drop of blood out from his body at this very moment? Hey you, get lost. Bathory. Rosredell's heart fell to the bottom. He needed to quickly disappear from her sight, yet his body shook so much, he couldn't move. He wondered whether this was how he was going to die, but fortunately for him, her voice wasn't directed towards his direction. Lady Bathory. We have a far bigger plan to execute, rather than that Azure Dragon. That was a desperate cry of the elderly Elder Apostle. Who do you think you are to raise your voice? Bathory. In shock, Rosredell quickly lifted his head. He saw the aged elder deeply kowtowing and apologizing his heart out. Please forgive this foolish old man. I know you are not some treacherous bastard, okay? However, I think this guy over here will be more useful for this job, don't you think? Hey, kid. Bathory. Why, yes. Bathory looked over Rosredell once and licked her lips slowly. Stay here from now on. Bathory. That, that means Rosredell. You're moving up in the world. Congrats. Of course, who knows for how long you can hold on, though. Bathory. She smirked lazily and extended her foot. It was a pale but refined foot. There were faint lines of blood vessels visible on her skin like some kind of pedicure treatment gone wrong. This was the sign of submission and loyalty that Bathory liked to perform. Rosredell very cautiously began licking her toes. November, when the winter was getting steadily closer. There was a strange intense atmosphere circulating among the members present within the secret underground conference room. The day of the operation is 25th of December the Christmas day. Lilia's voice came out from the communication crystal placed on top of a table. That's good. People won't come out to the sea during Christmas. It's fine if it's only us who has to suffer. It's a day that comes around only once in a year, after all. E. Hyrin jokingly complained. But still, I can't hardly believe it even now Guildmaster, your trade is really you transforming into the Azure Dragon, I mean, into the Leviathan. E. Hyrin. S.A.E.G. nodded his head wordlessly. E. Hyrin and Ju Ji Hyuk stared at him dazedly for a while, before cautiously asked him. Um, maybe. Is it possible to show us? No can do. S.A.E. Jean. Of course, he could do it. But he sure as hell didn't feel like it. After all, they would treat him like a plush toy if he did change. Ju Ji Hyuk chomped down hard on the biscuit as if he was upset, while E. Hyrin frowned deeply as she dug in deeper into the backrest of the couch. Tiring. A text message arrived on E. Hyrin's phone at that time. She slowly pulled her phone out and checked the message, before letting out a long sigh. Excuse me. I am not supposed to tell you S.A.E. Young what we are doing no matter what, yes. E. Hai Rin. Was that from S.A.E. Young just now? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. She's asking me if I'm with you right now. E. Hai Rin. Tell her that you are not sure, that I must still be at work, said S.A.E. Jean as he began putting on his jacket to leave. E. Hyrin's mouth went O-shaped and her expression showed her confusion. You're leaving. You're rather unexpectedly well domesticated, aren't you? E. Hyrin. What do you mean by unexpected? S.A.E. Jean. No, well this situation, no matter who sees it, it's kinda lewd, you know? E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin pointed at his thighs. On top of his hardened and muscular thighs that wouldn't lose to slabs of granite, Yu Song was comfortably taking a nap with the softest snoring anyone could imagine. On top of this, up until a few seconds ago, S.A.E. Jean was busy brushing her ears and hair with his right hand, 
while the left was busy stroking her tail. What can I do, when she's so adorable like this? Besides, she came up all on her own, you know. I didn't coax her or anything. S.A.E. Jean. Well, he did leave her a little bit, though. He lightly flicked Yu Song's ear while making his weak sauce excuse. As the ear was sensitive to touch, it straightened up immediately, before falling back down in a cute manner. And when he lightly grasped her tail. SFX for a cute growl of a cat. She let off a cute cat-like groan. Yes, she is really cute, though e high rin. Besides, if we count her age in human terms, she's only 15, 16, right? It's like having a younger sister. S.A.E. Jean. Well, I guess you're right but can I also touch her? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin sneakily reached out with her hand, but S.A.E. Jean was cold as he slapped her hand away. Slap. The white fur might get dirty. S.A.E. Jean. What? Isn't this the tyranny of the guild master, saying my hands are dirty? E. Hai Rin. Nope. She might wake up if it's not a familiar set of hands. S.A.E. Jean. Mm. Right on cue, Yu Song rubbed her face all over his thighs and began to fret in her sleep. S.A.E. Jean busily moved his hands and gently brushed her nose, ears, and tail as well as other parts safe to pat, which helped her fall deeper back into her sleep. You almost woke her up. S.A.E. Jean. Seriously, you really know how to look after a child. I'm sure S.A.E. Young is very happy. E. Hai Rin. S.A.E. Jean smiled in satisfaction and looked down at Yubek Song. Unfortunately, all his efforts in trying not to wake her up were all in vain. A.H.K. A loud scream pierced through the isolation barrier and entered the room. Waking up immediately from her sleep, Yubek Song jumped right out of his thighs and high up in the air, while the members present in the room hurriedly ran towards the door and yanked it open. Miss Hazeline. Are you ALRI? I did it. I did it. Hazeline. However, it wasn't a scream, but a shout of excitement. Everyone looked at her with their mouths wide open, while Hazeline hopped and bounced around as she shouted out again and again. Did my voice leak out just now? Hazeline. Yes oh, did you succeed in controlling the artificial heart? Yes. I wielded it perfectly just now. Hazeline. Hazeline kept on shouting out in joy while she took large strides forward. She then brushed past Ju Ji Hyuk, went past Yu Bek Song and Yi Hai Rin, and proceeded to embrace to Kim Sae Jean who was right at the back. Perfect. A perfection. I definitely know what to do now. Hazeline. Um, Miss Hazeline. Sae Jean. Well, really, doesn't this seem like such an undeniably immoral thing no matter who sees it? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin shot him a pointed stare full of questions. S.A.E. Jean cautiously pushed Hazeline back into her credit, she too took three steps back in embarrassment. Kume. Ah, I'm so sorry. I was just too excited just now Hazeline. But it was a bit too late by then there was a somewhat complicated silence descending on the conference room. Hey, give me something to eat. That was, excluding Yu Song who was busy tugging at S.A.E. Jean's sleeve. And the time was now 30th of November. While standing by the edge of the East Sea, S.A.E. Jean took a long look at the Leviathan scale in his hand. As long as he eats this, the growth percentage of his Leviathan form would increase greatly, and his overall might would also explode higher, far beyond comparison. However, his worries were just as big. He was worried about his ego being swept away this time around with the sudden increase of power in this monster form. Lilia said there was nothing to worry about. She was definitely sure of it. It was anyone's guess where her confidence came from, but for now, he had no choice but to believe her, and eat this thing. Well, he needed lots of time to get used to the newly strengthened leviathan form, after all. Fool. He breathed in deeply to chase away his fears. S.A.E. Jean transformed into the Leviathan form and swallowed the scale right away. Kuyuk. As countless alert windows popped up in his view, S.A.E. Jean was assaulted by the unbearable pain that felt like all of his bones were contracting and then stretching relentlessly. 
you have ingested an adult leviathan scale. The growth rate will rapidly rise up to 25%. The bottleneck, first level growth limit has been reached. With the aid of the adult leviathan scale, this bottleneck has been overcome. The growth rate has increased past 25% and has reached 33%. A pair of small wings will grow on the back of the Leviathan. Skills Leviathan's comprehension and mana body will increase in level by one. The skill, God of the Sea, has been unlocked. Chapter, 139 It felt like his entire body was forcibly being stretched. This was a kind of pain where he was sure of something yanking on his head and limbs from all directions. Did the torturous pain from the dismemberment execution of the medieval times feel this bad? the one where the head and limbs were tied to ends of horses and then pulled apart. It also felt like his throat had clammed up and as a result, he couldn't even voice out his suffering. He could only shut his eyes tightly and endure. In the meantime, a wondrous change took place with the Leviathan's body. In human terms, this was a moment when a child transformed into a teenager. His tail extended out even more gracefully than before the body's length increased and became bulkier, and a horn on his forehead shone with beautiful radiance that easily exceeded most famous jewelry ever known to men. There was still some cherubic hints left within the facial features, but now it was far more sculpted and perfect with not one glaring flaw visible to the naked eye. It was the type of a countenance that sort of resembled an ocean-bound life form, a reptilian, and a mammal-like, a shark, a lizard and a wolf combined together. It indeed resembled a dragon from all those legendary mythical tales of the past. However, the leviathan in question was unable to sense this earth-shaking change taking place he could only float helplessly on the surface of the ocean, completely lost within the sea of pain wrecking his entire body. The sight of a seven-meter-long dragon-like monster floating like a corpse was indeed a marvelously strange thing, enough to cause any enterprising hunters passing by to think they must have won the lottery or something. But thankfully, there was no other soul to be found under the darkened navy blue sky. And thus, the Leviathan was afforded enough to time to overcome the growing pains. Time passed by and eventually, the dawn's faint lights shimmered off the ocean's surface. S.A.E. Jean finally opened his eyes after six straight hours of pain-induced unconsciousness. Boa Puyuyu. He didn't die, and had survived the ordeal. He no longer felt any pain either. He breathed out a long sigh of relief. Too bad, that sigh became a horrifying tsunami that seemed to overturn the heavens, and began rushing towards the East Sea's coastline. Ah! For a wave created by a simple sigh, it being over twenty meters tall seemed horrifyingly unbalanced. S.A.E. Jean the Leviathan's face crumpled in unsightly manner as he wondered how he should stop this calamity from hitting the shore. It was then. He only thought about it, yet the vigorous tsunami wave began sprouting many little water bubbles, before dissolving into a cute little puddle and it soon disappeared completely from the view. But, uh, I didn't do anything, though. Kim S.A.E. Jean tilted his head this way and that, but the alert windows cleared up his confusion. The proficiency level for the skill god of the sea has increased. God of the sea. Proficiency level, 35%. The host can control the ocean with his will only. Mana will be consumed, of course, but would there be a limit to mana supply for a leviathan when he's in the ocean? Oh. S.A.E. Jean stayed in the water and played around for a while longer. Whenever he moved his body, he could rouse up tsunami waves, destructive storm winds and other natural ocean-bound calamities. After fooling around unchecked for a bit like that, S.A.E. Jean quietly transformed back into the human form and stepped back on the dry land. At the same time, his mobile phone rang a short alarm. Emergency broadcast. An earthquake tsunami detected on the East Sea, time 4.53 a.m. Looks like I should act in moderation. He smirked slightly and headed back towards his home. Afterwards, S.A.E. Jean devoted most of his time in getting familiar with the newly developed powers of the Leviathan. Meanwhile, the members of the raid team continued to grow every day by training and sharpening their abilities. That's how the days continued to rapidly flow by one day, two days, three, four. Dispatching the Kraken again. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, sir. This time, it's in England. Joe Hansung. Fifteen days before the fated day of the operation, 
when everyone was feeling tense. Joe Hansung personally came to see SAE Jean in his office. It was because the British Foreign Office had made the urgent request to dispatch the Kraken. Okay, so what's going on over there now? SAE Jean. Apparently, a boss-level snake monster called Mengsasa has built a nest within the Pennines mountain range, sir. Since the geographical location isn't ideal for battle, the British are in a bind as they also can't leave it alone, but it seems that they thought of the Italian incident from a while back. Zhou Hansung TL, Mengsasa is a set of hanja that the author seemed to have invented by himself. Individual words translates to ruinous destroyed mang heinous evil saw snake saw. I couldn't really find a snake-type monster with a name similar to this so I thought I'd leave it in Romanist form. Hopefully you're fine with that. Hmm. If this was any other time period, he would agree to send the Kraken, but he had to give it a serious thought right now. After all, the Kraken would play a big role when fighting the Bathory woman soon. How much are they willing to fork out? SAE Jean. Just like then, they are putting up the important loot from the raid. Zhou Hansung. Important loot probably meant the monster's mana stone, as well as parts of its carcass in a snake's case, its fangs. Hmm what is your opinion on this, Mr. Hansung? SAE Jean. I don't have anything particular to add, sir. After all, the compensation proposed by them are not for the benefit of the company as a whole, but it lines up more closely to the guild master's hobbies. Zhou Hansung. SAE Jean narrowed his eyes and glared at him. From some time ago, the company took center stage in this guy's eyes. Quickly deciphering the meaning behind SAE Jean's unhappy glare, Zhou Hansung hurriedly added more. Kwem. However, if it was up to me, I would agree to do it, sir. A kraken isn't going to wear out anyways from the repeated use, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to let an opportunity to make profit slip away. Plus, it seems that they are quite desperate now, seeing how the British Foreign Secretary came to speak to me here in the guild, sir. Zhou Hansung. That happened? Fine. But how long will it take, according to the Brits? SAE Jean. It was fine to send the Kraken, but since the creature would play a part in the Bathory hunting, at a minimum, he had to recall it before the 25th. Since it's only one day's travel from here to Britain, they are suggesting four days, tops. And them all right, cool. Agree to a set of dates and let me know. Finishing his words up to here, SAE Jean was about to hand over the documents containing his permission to Zhou Hansung. Ah, uh, actually the thing is, sir, they are waiting outside the office right now. Zhou Hansung. Eh. Please come in, everyone. Zhou Hansung. As soon as Zhou Hansung's shout ended, foreigners wearing clean-cut formal suits poured into SAE Jean's office. And there were fifteen of them. The spacious office became half full in no time. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. A man who could be the foreign secretary of the United Kingdom shouted out in broken Korean and bent his waist forward ninety degrees. His colleagues echoed his movement and did the same. SAE Jean faltered from his seat, quickly got up and asked them to sit down first. Ah, uh, uh, yes, well, uh, please, take a seat. I'm not sure what is the meaning of this sudden visit, though. Firstly, excuse my rude behavior and allow me get to the main topic. These are the all the information compiled for the boss monster, Mengsasa. From the suitcases they carried, documents after documents were pulled out in sequential order. Since it was fifteen people producing documents, the seemingly wide conference table soon became a grave of papers in no time. SAE Jean's expression naturally crumpled as well. The details of our proposed compensation can be found on this document, here. On top of this, our government guarantees an one-off payment of ten million for the dispatch itself. This fee is yours, even if the monster Mengsasa is not defeated. The foreign secretary rapidly fired his words out. SAE Jean searched for Zhou Hansung, but he had already evacuated from the office, and that left SAE Jean to sit there and listen to the briefing related to the boss monster for the next thirty minutes or so. And that is all we have Guild Master Kim SAE Jean Nim, please lend us your aid. Please help us. At the end of the briefing, all the officers from the UK Foreign Office lowered their heads with sincere facial expressions. 
seeing 15 high-ranking group of men from a foreign country doing this sure made SAE Jean feel quite odd at that moment. Embarrassed yet content, burdened yet feeling boastful, that was how he felt. However, I thought there were many outstanding people in the UK. So why? SAE Jean. At the moment, within the United Kingdom's borders, we have two boss-level monsters to deal with the Mangsasa and the Previn. Our forces are currently focused on combating the Previn which has been active near the city of Oxford. However, if the Mangsasa decides to aim for the gap in our forces and leave its nest during this time, and head south, then. The rays of hope shining out from the blue eyes of the foreign secretary were quite burdensome to behold. S.A.E. Jean massaged his forehead for the next ten minutes, looking as if he was in a serious thinking process, before slowly opening his mouth. The Boss Monster-Related Incident Special Squad, based in London. A massive screen to the front projected the image of the Boss Monster, while on the lengthy desk shaped like an unfolded fan, countless documents were piled on top. Equally many team members were silently holding their breaths, waiting for the answer from their foreign secretary who had flown over to Korea. The negotiation has been completed. A small commotion erupted as soon as the secretary's voice came out of the speakers. What are the results? The Prime Minister of United Kingdom, Ray Den, cautiously asked. He was still uneasy about this whole thing. Should he have gone there instead of the Foreign Affairs Secretary? Did the deal collapse because he chose the national pride over its success? Ha! A long and drawn-out sigh came from the other side of the line. Since it sounded like the sound of defeat, the listeners also let out long sighs as well. However, the foreign secretary was simply pulling a prank. He shouted out in a very excited voice. We did it. Sir Kim S.A.E. Jean agreed to dispatch the Kraken right this minute. T.L. L.O.L. What? He's a sir now. Silence invaded the room for a short moment. The listeners hadn't had the chance yet to fully understand the secretary's words. R, really? The first to react was Prime Minister Ray Den. He adjusted his glasses and asked again. Yes, of course. Right away, cries of cheers exploded out and documents flew up in the air. It was a scene straight out of a Hollywood movie. However, the Prime Minister understood full well this wasn't some cliched scene from a disaster movie, that this was really happening. Kim S.A.E. Jean's Kraken showed off yet another incredible display of power. This time, it was in the United Kingdom. The Kraken was even more powerful compared to when it fought off against the demon Asmodeus. This report is compiled by the reporter, Kim Young-ho. S.A.E. Jean might have overlooked this fact, but the Kraken's stats also improved when the Leviathan form powered up. That was why the Kraken was able to fight against Mangsasa almost one-on-one -on -one and win if the final attack from the knight affiliated with the London-based Knight's Order. Romulo was excluded, then it was not wrong to say the fight was purely one-on-one. -on -one. That guy is also being included in our plan, right? E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin asked as she appreciated the Kraken's absolute might shown on the TV screen. But seriously why is a squid shooting out electricity? How mysterious. E. Hai Rin. That was because S.A.E. Jean tattooed the lightning chain claws to the suction pads of the Kraken. Yes, the Kraken is also taking part. S.A.E. Jean. No, Sarong, it's Sarong taking part. Hazeline. Hazeline interjected and corrected S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Sarong is taking part in the battle. S.A.E. Jean. Its name is Sarong. Yubek Song. Yubek Song tilted her head and asked back. It was right then when some more words came out from the TV. This trustworthy Kraken's name is now known to be Sarang, and also the personal pet of the Monster Guild's master, Kim Sae Jean. Breathing a sigh of relief with the Kraken's dispatch, the UK government sent words of gratitude to Kim Sae Jean, and also, to the Korean government who facilitated the negotiations. You see, the name Sarang. For now, let's turn off the TV. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean turned the TV off. Since this was the last chance to watch it, everyone gathered here showed some regret, but it couldn't be helped. Today's date was 22nd of December. With only three days to go before the day of the operation, 
and so little time left, they had to be ready to react at a moment's notice. Has everyone finished with their preparations? These words belonged to Lilia, coming from the communication crystal. We have SAE Jean. In that case, everyone except Mr. Kim SAE Jean, please enter the isolation barrier chamber. We've prepared a special mechanism that will transport you to where we are. What about Mr. SAE Jean? Hazeline. Hazeline asked in suspicion. Mr. SAE Jean will act as a lure for Bathory. Isn't that too dangerous? Hazeline. No, it won't be. Certainly, he will be in a lot less danger than us. After all, Bathory's ultimate aim is to capture the Azure Dragon alive. Oh. You're right. Hazeline. Hazeline lightly clapped her hands and got up. Following her, Ju Ji Hyuk, Yi Hai Rin, Kim Sun Ho and Regin also got up from their seats. Miss Yu Bek Song. Aren't you coming? That was, with the notable exception of Yubek Song. While twisting her body this way and that, she showed no signs of leaving Sae Jin's side. What are you doing? Hurry up. Hazeline. Hazeline called out to her in a somewhat uncomfortable voice. The surprising thing was, Hazeline and Yubek Song were the same age. It's going to be fine. We are going to see each other again so you don't have to be like this, you know. S.A.E. Jean. Thinking that maybe she didn't want to part from him, S.A.E. Jean tried to speak to Yubek Song while patting her head. Almost immediately, flames lit up in Hazeline's eyes, but unaware of this development, Yubek Song slightly shook her head and shyly spoke up. No, that's not it. Yubek Song. Eh. Please say what you need. S.A.E. Jean. You said, that, you'll, give it to me, that thing. Yu Bek Song. However, Yu Bek Song couldn't finish what she wanted to say and simply overloaded herself. Just what was she trying to say to him? Looking at her crimson red blushing face, Sae Jean smiled in deep happiness. X, see you, Se, me. I asked you what you are doing. Hazeline. Hazeline's voice were full of thorns now. Yu Bek Song got pressured by this and finally spat out what she wanted to say. Your smell. You said you'll let me smell it even when you're not around you said you'll give me a handkerchief you Bek Song. Ah. S.A.E. Jean understood only then. For sure, he did say something similar to that a few weeks ago. Well, he did prepare a handkerchief but hadn't yet given to her, since he didn't want to be an afterthought from that point onwards. Of course, I've got it. S.A.E. Jean. Reluctantly, S.A.E. Jean extracted a handkerchief out from his back pocket. Created with the aid of the magic tattoo skill, it was a piece of cloth where the smell of the wolf was deeply embedded in. Thanks. Yu Bek Song quickly snatched that off his hands and left S.A.E. Jean's side in a hurry, and ran towards Hazeline in acute little bouncy steps. That kinda felt slightly dejecting. It seemed that, this body of Kim S.A.E. Jean was simply an ancillary existence to Yu Bek Song. Only his body odor mattered. What is that? Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean's smell is on it. Yubek Song. Give that here. Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean overheard their conversation and smirked slightly. Don't wanna. Yubek Song. Why not? Friends are supposed to share, you know. So, let me hold it at least once. Hazeline. Get lost. Yu Bek Song. W, what? What did you just say? Hazeline. Not too long after, the door to the isolation barrier chamber slammed shut. Only thing remaining was silence. Sitting alone on a couch that possessed the faint aroma of people, Sae Jean was overcome with a certain sense of loneliness, but he still managed to stand up from his spot. Chapter 140 USAE Young was waiting for him when Kim SAE Jean returned home. Although her face was awash with discontentment, SAE Jean felt this was rather fortunate. He was worried that she might be still stuck at the knight's order. Appa, just what's going on with you right now? USAE Young. With her arms crossed, she bluntly spat out her words as soon as she saw his face. He simply smiled and replied. Just this and that. But today was the last day. 
I'm all done with it. From now on, I'm going to spend the holidays with you. S.A.E. Jean. Really? It seemed that her anger had cooled down a bit. A sigh of relief automatically escaped from his lips. Too bad, that ill-timed sigh ended up reigniting her fuse once more. I'm still angry at you, you know. Appa, do you have any idea how many times this month alone you spent the night outside without telling me? USAE Young. My bad. Muttering his apology, SAE Jean hugged USAE Young tightly. She shouted don't you even think about glossing over this with only this much. And continued to throw a tantrum, but he didn't let go. Three minutes or so later, she grew much more quieter. Appa? USAE Young's voice tickling his ears was thick with worries. Was this the so-called woman's intuition? He did his best to maintain a calm face and answered her, but the worries in her trembling voice still remained palpable. You're not cheating on me, right? USAE Young. Yes, it was called an intuition since it could indeed get stuff very wrong. When he looked at her with a somewhat dazed face, she quickly added something else with even more worries in her voice. If, if you're seeing someone else just, just don't get found out, okay? What on earth was she even saying? S.A.E. Jean groaned out deeply and lightly stomped on her forehead with his fist. You ought. A cute cry resounded out. You see, there are lots of women who seem to like me out there. S.A.E. Jean. He jokingly bragged while pulling her close back into his arms. You should be oh so proud of yourself, then. U.S.A.E. Young. Her grumpy voice leaked out from within his embrace. What's the matter? Why aren't you saying anything? Lots of women like Appa, so what next? U.S.A.E. Young. That's just it. The only one I like is you. S.A.E. Jean. He had spent a long time in the same space with her. He had grown so accustomed to U.S.A. Young she had become someone he just could not imagine not having in his life anymore. What the heck? Is that all? USAE Young. USAE Young playfully narrowed her eyes and began pinching both of his cheeks. Less as good more wide. His words became garbled because of that, but he could still transmit what he wanted to say to her. She stopped pinching his cheeks and lowered her hands, her face completely dumbstruck. Maybe not right now, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but definitely. When we can marry without any worries then S.A.E. Jean. Slap. One of his cheek experienced a stinging pain right then. Eek. Hey, what was that for? S.A.E. Jean. Ho, oh, how can you say something like that in this kind of a situation? You, you idiot. U.S.A.E. Young. She began shouting at him while tears formed in her eyes. Seriously, just what kind of proposal is this U.S.A.E. Young? Uh. Ah, uh, oh, uh, yeah, um, this isn't a proposal, you see? No, hang on, yeah, it is a proposal, in a way. It's like, I'm proposing to you that I'll make a proper proposal, SAE Jean. You're noisy. Out of my way. USAE Young. USAE Young pushed him aside and stomped her way into the kitchen. It seemed that she was royally pissed off right now, but thankfully, her voice coming out from the kitchen seemed to indicate otherwise. Appa, you hungry? There's some leftover cake, would you like some? Late at night, on the day of the Christmas. As soon as the shortish meeting with USAE Young was over, Kim S.A.E. Jean headed off to the East Sea. After transforming into the Leviathan, he began swimming in the ocean with only his head peeking out of the ocean's surface. This was in order to ensure that Bathory wouldn't lose interest or run away after seeing his new body that had grown three times the previous size. Eerie winds blew, and even the calm sounds of the waves felt rather ominous, yet S.A.E. Jean wasn't worried. This was in the middle of the ocean. He didn't have anything to fear here. And as he sliced through the waters, he sensed the cold presence of a certain someone. He knew who it could be without using his eyes to confirm. However, S.A.E. Jean maintained his poker face and continued to swim, towards where Lilia's isolation barrier was located at. He picked up the faint movement following him from behind. S.A.E. Jean swam leisurely and swam towards the trap set for the target. 
The location of the isolation barrier trap was set in a triangular formation with three small, uninhabited rocky islands acting as the three vertices. While eagerly waiting for the Bathory woman to follow him, S.A.E. Jean faithfully moved towards the center of the formation. And then, just as he arrived at the destination, a red whirlwind broke out in the air. The whirlwind grew in ferocity and size, violently whipping the water around before it all came to a sudden halt. The crimson winds died down and the ocean's turbulent waves also calmed down. And when the crimson winds blocking the view dissipated, a stunningly beautiful woman carrying a seductive smile revealed her graceful self. It was none other than Perlani von Bathory. Hi. Bathory greeted the Azure Dragon, and behind her, Rosradel could be seen, smiling deeply in satisfaction. S.A.E. Jean the Leviathan too assumed a thick smile as well. Oh, my. Oh my. Is he smiling at me right now? Bathory. Bathory raised a fuss after spotting the curved lips of the Azure Dragon. Yes, my lady. I think you're right. Right? Doesn't it look like it likes me? Bathory. Rosradel enthusiastically agreed with her. Unfortunately, Bathory couldn't maintain her happy mood for long. Immediately, from the bottom of the ocean, mana began boiling like crazy, then it rose up along with the water and encased all three of them in a dome-shaped barrier. Mm -hmm. Hey, kid, what is this? Bathory. I'm not sure either could it be, one of the Azure Dragon's abilities. Is that so? By the way, why are you going over to that side? Bathory. Bathory tried her best to maintain a smile as she looked at Rosradel. He had already taken refuge behind the Azure Dragon by then. SFX for things popping out from magic circles. I think. Soon afterwards, teleportation magic circles hidden within the barrier activated and many silhouettes emerged from there. These were wizards wearing jet black robes, already finished with their chantings to fire off high level magic spells at any time. Bathory panicked for a brief moment, before breaking out in another smile as she opened her mouth. Nesferatus. So, it was Upstards. I guessed as much. Inferior breeds are unable to coexist in harmony with the pure bloods, after all. Bathory sneered in contempt and wielded mana stored in every part of her body. No, she tried to. However, mana didn't move an inch. It was as if her blood vessels had all been blocked up. Finally realizing the urgency of the situation, she hurriedly searched for the one responsible for this strange magic. But every one of them were wearing the identical black robe and it was impossible to tell them apart. You know good sons of bitches. Thoroughly enraged by now, Bathory unconsciously rushed forward. She didn't need things like mana. No, with the constitution of Bathory, that unbelievably powerful physical body alone would be enough to sweep away these uncouth rabble of inferior breeds. Clang. However, a weighty greatsword appeared seemingly out of nowhere and blocked her progress. It was Ju Ji Hyuk's doing. He did succeed in delaying her for around two seconds, but. Get lost. But, he was unable to completely withstand her angry attacks. Kwa Hong. The greatsword was powerlessly shoved away and Ju Ji Hyuk was flung away to the corner of the barrier like a ragdoll. But, Ju Ji Hyuk wasn't the only knight here. Past the head of the flying Ju Ji Hyuk, a sharp sword aura slithered forward like a snake and sliced a couple strands of Bathory's hair. SFX for falling hair. Red strands of hair fell to the bottom of the isolation barrier. Unconsciously stepping back a couple of times, Bathory confirmed her faintly damaged hair, and roared out to the high heavens in pure rage. Kobak grow hack. Bathory shouted out some undecipherable words and was about to rush towards E. Hyrin's direction. But then, countless magic spells rained down on her position. Dark red flashes of light beams, spheres of condensed destructive power, curses filled to the brim with resentment at this hailstorm of approaching spells, even Bathory had no choice but to stop what she was trying to do. SFX for a loud sweeping sound. The combined might of the spells were incredible enough to scar the isolation barrier semi-permanently, and the shock wave coming off from the resulting explosion was harsh enough to make all the listeners bleed from their ears. 
However, there was one more attack that could easily be described as a sure kill still left to be unleashed. And that was the mana cannon busy gathering in the Azure Dragon's maws. This was the finishing move that SAE Jean learned after ingesting the adult Leviathan scale. It was the true one-hit kill skill where he gathered every bit of mana from both his body as well as from the ocean around him, to fire out and annihilate the enemy in front. No matter who or what the target was, all things would disappear without a trace when struck by this mana cannon. Didn't matter the shape or form of the physical body, elemental preference, traits, whatever. Even light was not spared. Within the path where the mana cannon swept past, darkness dyed the world black. That was why, not even Bathory herself could survive this devastating attack. However less than ten seconds after the battle broke out. One of the wizards wearing the black robe suddenly collapsed. And at the same time, at the location where the magic spells from the wizards were raining down, a powerful mana rose up like an ascending dragon. Bathory was in the middle of emitting the dense, red-colored mana to her surroundings, while her melted-down skin and maimed limbs were rapidly recovering by themselves. Stop her. Someone shouted out, prompting Yi Hai Rin, Yu Bek Song and Regent to step forward at the same time. But, Yi Hai Rin's mana dissipated powerlessly the moment it came in contact with Bathory, and instead, a blood-red whip slammed into Hai Rin's chest. She got squarely hit and spat out a mouthful of blood, before collapsing helplessly. Roar! Yu Bek Song transformed into the Divine Beast and rushed in. The giant white tiger swung its front paw hard. Bathory simply blocked it with only an arm and fired off a light beam at the side of the tiger. At the same time, Regen emerged from under the body of the white tiger and her blade pierced deep into Bathory's heart. Yuk! Bathory quickly reorganized her mana and slashed at Regen's arms, but then. Kang! The front paw of the white tiger slammed into her head, hard. That hurts, you know. Bathory. Unfortunately, Bathory didn't die. No, she instead carried a leisurely smile as she grabbed the neck of the tiger. Gugh. The white tiger was clearly in distress, yet it continued to punch Bathory's head. But the future vampire queen showed no adverse reaction, only her grip on the tiger's throat was getting tighter and tighter. It was then. Get out of the way. Twenty seconds had passed in total. A time way too long in the context of this battle flew past, but by then, the mana cannon was fully charged. Lilia loudly shouted out at the same time. Yubeksong quickly cancelled the transformation and retreated to a safe distance. Almost immediately, a huge and massive white ray of light engulfed Bathory. Afterwards. One might have gotten confused that even the sound was eradicated within the isolation barrier. The sounds of breathing, sounds of swallowing saliva, none of them could be heard. Everyone stared dumbfoundedly at the space where the mana cannon swept by. Would the world look like this if it was burnt black? They all stood there and appreciatively gazed at the unnatural darkness etched onto the world until an urgent cry shattered this silence. Wait! The finger! Lilia hurriedly fired a mana spear at a stump of a finger rolling around on the bottom of the barrier. But alas, it was too late. That small finger violently expelled the red mana and blocked the enemy's attack, and then, rapidly regenerated into. Well, I died four times because of a strange magic. Bathory. The finger fully regenerated into Bathory. While cracking her joints, she took a look around at her opponents. You guys, I guess you have a close relationship with my Yong Yong, huh? Bathory. Bathory spoke as she stared down at her enemies. She died a total of five times today. She so wanted to rip apart every single one of these mongrels here, but if she got killed one more time, then that would be the end for her. Considering that she also needed to tear apart this stupid barrier, quite regrettably she no longer had the spare capacity to handle the additional danger. Also Yong Yong was busy sucking up endless mana from the ocean right at this moment. If she dallied any longer, it might fire off that outrageous beam attack again. Oh well. It doesn't matter, really. I really enjoy taking away things from others, you see. Bathory. While holding her side that hadn't fully regenerated yet, Bathory fired off a magic bullet that was comprised of condensed and uber-intense flames at the isolation barrier's wall. 
What with the mana reserve of the wizards maintaining the barrier falling quite low, a magic bullet the size of a baseball could easily pierce a gap in the barrier. The complexions of the wizards turned ashen. Bathory didn't have time to waste here. She immediately rushed towards the leviathan, and grabbed its neck tightly. Puff. She disappeared, along with her catch. That was a spell where chanting Nora magic circle was needed. This was way past the boundaries of normal magic the so-called instant transmission, dot. TL, LOL. DBZ reference FTW. Ha. Huh. The thought processes of everyone present stopped dead in their tracks. What happened just now? They even found this hard to figure out. Even after the isolation barrier shattered into nothingness, not one of them could say a single word for a long, long while. Chapter, 141 It was an incredibly unpleasant and uncomfortable sensation when S.A.E. Jean's body went through changes during the instant transmission. After experiencing the unpleasantness of his entire body breaking down to molecular level, and then getting rebuilt in a flash, S.A.E. Jean staggered as he opened his eyes. He found himself trapped inside this oppressively dark space, and right away, spotted Bathory keeled over on the ground not too far, busy vomiting out mouthful of blood. The first thing he thought of was is this another chance? Unfortunately though the mana cannon was a one-hit kill attack that sucked up every drop of mana from inside his body as well as from the outside. Regrettably, he didn't have much mana left within him. SFX for vomit. Yuck. Bathory made uncool noises as she continued to vomit out blood. However, S.A.E. Jean already understood that her actions were actually a part of the recovery process, where she expelled dead blood out of her body to replace it with fresh one instead. It was one of the bits of knowledge he gained after ingesting the scale of the adult leviathan. However, he had no idea why the knowledge about vampires were recorded within the scale, though. Whatever the case may have been, he couldn't help but worry about the near future when her pain would be replaced by her fury. Since he heard that Bathory liked torturing people, there were more reasons now to spin his brain faster than ever before. It was then, he recalled a certain skill called the Dark Energy Link. This skill received a few additional upgrades when he evolved, so its usefulness had increased by a great deal. And among these new additions, the bits of text gleaming quite nicely within S.A.E. Jean's recollection were as thus, dot. Dark energy link. Not only emotions such as fear and terror, but even physical sensations such as pain and pleasure, can be used to form the link. However, when the link is formed with sensation as the medium, while the experienced sensation will be shared, no other functions will manifest. Obviously, a link of submission formed with fear and terror would not work against a big shot like Bathory. On the flip side, though the link formed with sensation, could be a possibility. Plus, she was currently experiencing acute pain right now. However, no matter how strong the Leviathan form was compared to his other forms, the Dark Energy Link was a skill he needed to use in the Lycanthrope form to bring about the best results. But, for now, he maintained the Leviathan form and sneaked in closer to Bathory's position. You shouldn't waste your time, darling. You can't hurt me. We are not in the ocean enemo blurg. While listening to her chilly declaration and the follow-up noise of retching, S.A.E. Jean cautiously activated the eyes of the wolf. He could sort of see a shadow of pain hovering near her back. But he found out that, as a leviathan, he couldn't pull that energy towards him and form a link. He closed his eyes. He told himself that he only needed to succeed once. Now normally, those who enjoyed being cruel towards others would not be able to adjust to being treated cruelly in return most of the time. The body of the leviathan began to shrink before anyone could notice it. The head of the dragon changed to a shape of a person's, while the shrinking body morphed into one with four limbs. Shoulders broad enough to seemingly carry five grown men's heads without a problem, and slick, tightly packed muscles rippling in his arms and, the wild, macho silvery fur that warmly covered that rock-hard body. He changed into the lycanthrope. Now that he looked through this beast's eyes, the dark energy hovering on top of the woman was far more distinct and clearer. The only strand of energy he could touch right now was pain. So, S.A.E. Jean extended his finger and beckoned the link for pain to come closer. That energy strand tightly wound around his finger. S.A.E. Jean cautiously studied this, before. 
Koak. He grabbed the energy and shoved it down his throat. Immediately, Bathory's eyes shifted towards his direction, and at the same time, several alert windows popped up into his view. The dark energy link has been established against an overwhelmingly powerful existence. Condition complete, swallow the heavens 12. All stats for the lycanthrope form will increase by a large margin. The lycanthrope form's unique skill, senses of a wolf, has been acquired. When the last condition is met, the lycanthrope form will evolve into the final stage. His muscles and bones issued cracking noises as the body of the lycanthrope began rapidly increasing in its size. Bathory completely turned around after sensing the disturbing presence, and when she saw him, she completely lost her SHT. What the hell? Who the FCK are you, you disgusting scum? She violently swung her arms around. SAE Jean belatedly raised his arms to block her, but the power behind her wild swings totally transcended his imagination. Bones in his arms shattered into smithereens, and the shock wave slammed into his innards, blowing up several internal organs. It was such a nonsensically powerful attack, had he been a normal person, he would have died instantly. Fortunately enough, that pain was shared with her, too. And no, it wasn't some sympathetic sharing of pain instead, she would feel the full brunt of the physical pain SAE Jean experienced in that moment. That was why it should be considered normal to see her screaming her lungs out in a high-pitched tone. Kayak. Bathory screamed and collapsed on the ground. From now on, it was a battle of recuperative powers and endurance between the two. Who could recover faster, and who could endure more pain? SAE Jean was feeling confident of his odds. After all, the lycanthropes of the legends were often called the race of immortal youth, thanks to the vitality and regenerative powers that far outstripped other races. And on top of this, he had over 100 healing and recovery potions spiritualized and stored within his body right at this moment, as well. Some people might call all the preparations he did simply excessive, but the very notion of that being bad was utter garbage. The more, the better. Anytime. Kobhak. Completely recovering in the blink of an eye, Bathory spat out a word that kind of sounded like a curse word while reaching out towards SAE Jean's direction. And so, the chain of one-sided beating and mutual sharing of resulting pain, began in earnest. The secret conference room was shrouded in a heavy atmosphere. Everyone present carried somber expressions and spoke not a word. Without a doubt, their plan failed. Of course, it was still somewhat more palatable result than being wiped out. But, no one dared to raise this point. The importance of the person kidnapped was just too high for that. SFX for the second hand of the clock ticking away. The heavy silence, where only the ticking of the second hand could be heard, finally got broken by the alarm tone coming off from someone's mobile phone. Kim Sunho hesitatingly pulled out his phone, and after checking out the message on the screen, let out a long sigh. Well, it's from Miss USA Young. What should I do? At the same time, several sighs also leaked out. And as everyone here were wondering how to reply to USA Young, Yu Song stepped up with a serious face. We keep everything as a secret from USA Young. Yu Song. After hiding the truth, and then what? Hazeline. Hazeline asked, her voice trembling heavily. She cried her eyes out so much, they were all puffed up beyond recognition. As long as Kim Sae Jean remains as a leviathan, he won't die. All we have to do is rescue him. Yu Bek Song. With us alone. Has a line. With other people, too. Yu Bek Song. No, wait. You, listen here has a line. Has a line wanted to say something to counter her, but in the end, she became overcome with emotions and buried her face on the table once more. The sound of her soft sobbing seemed to blanket the silent conference room. Stop crying, you idiot. The news of the Azure Dragon being kidnapped will be enough. Koreans love the Azure Dragon, after all. When we break the news that the vampires have kidnapped the Azure Dragon, they will help us. Yup, I'm sure of it. Said you Beck Song, as she gently stroked Hazeline's head. It was a somewhat funny scene where a shorty that looked like a middle schooler was busy consoling a full-grown adult, but not one person here laughed at that. What do you think, Lilia? 
about my plan. Yu Bek Song. If all the highest tier knights in the country volunteer to help, then we might have a chance, but under the current circumstance, the odds of it happening are quite slim. Boss monsters were still raising a ruckus all over the world even now. The frequency of their appearances had increased by so much, one popped up almost every other week. Thanks to this, there were more than a few front lines set up to confront the monsters. However, to snatch away the services of highest tier knights under this kind of situation? It would be akin to setting the storehouse on fire just to catch a lice. And also, seeing that Bathory hadn't returned to the hotel, it is likely that she has settled down elsewhere. Another heavy silence descended on the room. They tried their best to come up with something, but couldn't think of anything useful. The only thing still flowing freely within this silence was the ceaseless sobbing coming from Hazeline. Inside the jet black interior. It was impossible to tell whether this was inside some kind of a closed off space, or the luxury hotel Bathory was staying. But it really didn't matter either way. Because of all the blood coating pretty much everywhere, this whole place looked too gruesome to look, anyway. Gaim Krashak. S.A.E. Jean heard a queer speech coming from somewhere. When he turned to look, he spotted Bathory lying on the floor, just like him, busy glaring at him with bloodshot eyes. So, so much crazy killing intent contained within her glare. Speak in Korean. I can't understand you. S.A.E. Jean. He leisurely laughed and replied to her. The coincidental level up meant that, the only way to break the now more powerful dark energy link was for the owner him to personally severe the connection. No matter how many times she hit him, nothing would change. My Yong Yong you dirty, scummy canine starred, you dare to trick me? Bathory. And just what did I trick you with? S.A.E. Jean. Bathory grit her teeth in anger. But she didn't do anything else besides. She was probably exhausted as well. Well, it doesn't matter. In any case, as soon as I fully recover, you're a dead meat. Bathory. Bathory spoke with a manufactured smile on her face. Fut. You think I'll let you? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean sneered and slashed at her face with his claws. Thanks to his lucky level up, his claws were much stronger now. Their hardness could exceed that of the Earth's greatest metal, Mithril. So, at a bare minimum, they should be able to inflict some sort of damage to the clearly weakened Bathory. SFX for wounds inflicted. I think. For claw lines slashed out at an oblique angle. Kayak. She screamed out at this unexpected attack and rolled around the floor in pain. However, he didn't feel a thing. Well, the thing was, this dark energy link came with a certain convenient feature that benefited the owner, somewhat. In a way, it was like, what's yours is yours, and what's mine is mine, that kind of thing. That's why, he needed to continuously torment her. To make sure that she would never recover her vitality, and that she wouldn't be able to endure any longer and let him go. You son of a bitch. Bathory screamed out a couple of choice words and kicked S.A.E. Jean in the side. His ribs shattered from the impact, but that also meant Bathory's were also shattered, too. Ah, uh, arg, you arm Bathory. Stop doing things that will be painful for both of us. S.A.E. Jean quickly recovered thanks to the effects of potions, and began taunting her. Her eyes snapped wide open and shouted at him. You shut up. Bathory. Humph. I should pay you back for your rude words. Strictly speaking, he didn't learn this attack to use in moments like this, but whatever he decided to use the lightning chain claw. Immediately, purple-colored arcs of electricity buzzed and circulated around his extended claws. Bathory saw this and her entire body trembled imperceptibly. You. You better stop. I said, stop. I'm warning you. A warny bzz. He ignored her and slashed at her entire torso. Even though her body was shaking from the pain of the electricity, she didn't submit to it and thrust forward her hand into S.A.E. Jean's heart. Without the regenerative potions, he'd have probably died three times over by now. His sight blurred and his consciousness darkened. When he reopened his eyes after losing his consciousness for a brief second or two, he spotted Bathory next to him, weaving in and out of slumber herself. 
Ha, ha Bathory. He stealthily approached her and stabbed his claw into her neck. Ei, Yufkin Bathory. Her eyes snapped open, and with an expression that said she had enough of this SHT, she shoved her fingers into SAE Jean's eye sockets. Just die already, you scummy son of a bitch. Bathory. You first. SAE Jean. In the end, a ceasefire occurred between him and Bathory. He told her to release him, but she resolutely refused to do so. She said that, she would keep him around until she found a way to exterminate him. And so, a curious cohabitation begun. The place was an empty, isolated space probably maintained by Bathory herself. Trapped within, both of them didn't eat anything nor did anything. Except, for the childish tauntings thrown at each other's way. You hungry now? You moron. You see, I'm the perfect vampire, so I only need to eat something once a year and that's all, you know? Bathory. I can rip off your arm and snack on that, so it's fine. S.A.E. Jean. Who says I'll let you snack on me? Bathory. Thanks to the dark energy link, Bathory couldn't kill him. If she wounded him fatally, then that damage would transmit in full towards her as well. However, in case of something going wrong, he had to prevent her from using a magic spell that might exceed his skill, so he needed to constantly hurt her. Fool. Bathory groaned out a lengthy sigh and got up. He extended his claws and slashed at her back and her waist. Deep, horrendous wounds opened up, and she fell back down on the ground once more. Ayuk. Hey, you crazy bastard. Bathory. I'm telling you, it'll be better for you to release me now. What do you think will happen when my friends show up? Will you be able to fight them off in your current condition? S.A.E. Jean. Shut up. Instead of a proper answer, Bathory fed him a knuckle sandwich to his face. Chapter, 142. E. Hai Rin and Ju Ji Hyuk went to the East Sea or, more specifically, to a small hut located inside a forest near the East Sea. The salty scent blowing inland by the calm waves was gently permeating the land, and the rays of the sun high up in the sky shining down got broken into a beautiful cascade by the gaps of leaves on trees. Within this brilliant verdant landscape, her hut silently stood still. If we're to value the land according to the view, this place should easily fetch over 90 million, don't you think? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin glanced at Ju Ji Hyuk and asked him. Probably. Ju Ji Hyuk. Just like how he was during the last 30 minutes of hiking, his answer proved to be no fun at all. It was so dry and indifferent. E. Hai Rin clicked her tongue in dissatisfaction, and increased her walking pace towards the hut. Ju Ji Hyuk silently followed her. Should I knock? E. Hai Rin. Ju Ji Hyuk nodded wordlessly. Seeing his especially stone-hard expressions of today, she was getting more and more annoyed but right now, the circumstances meant that she couldn't express her disappointment. So, E. Hyrin glared at him fiercely once instead, and then cautiously knocked on the door. Knock, knock. Winds rustled past the silent forest, causing the branches to issue a slightly sorrowful wail. Did she not hear the knocking, because of the cries of the trees? E. Hyrin knocked on the door again. Only then, she could sense a faint sense of movement behind the door. Soon after, click. A lock that wouldn't have mattered if it wasn't there, unlatched. Who is Oh, Hyrin? Even Night Ju Ji Hyuk, too. Was it because of the blinding sunshine? A woman so beautiful, that even the fellow woman E. Hyrin couldn't help but blush, revealed herself. Underneath her hair cascading like a curtain of silk, her intricate facial features seemed to shine brightly. Elegantly carved lips, eyes that seemed to have somewhat mellowed greatly, straight and perfectly defined nose. Plus the pure and pale smooth skin her beauty was enough to cause a serious confusion on figuring out whether she was an elf or a human being. What brings you guys here? Kim Yurin. E. Hyrin Ju Ji Hyuk. A clean and pure echo, created by a masterpiece of a neck even her voice sounded stunningly beautiful. E. Hyrin stared at Kim Yurin dazedly for a long while, before her head snapped to her side, out of the blue. And as she suspected, Ju Ji Hyuk was standing there, his mouth agape. 
pretending to be serious and all that, and now, you. E. Hai Rin. Anger rushed up and took over E. Hai Rin slammed her fist right in the middle of Ju Ji Hyuk's solar plexus. From the gaping mouth of Ju Ji Hyuk, an unidentifiable liquid that could either be his spit or blood dribbled out. E. Hai Rin and Ju Ji Hyuk moved on from that small commotion and entered the hut. It wasn't spacious inside, but there was this sense of cozy snugness and a certain affection present to this place. E. Hai Rin smiled gently and surveyed the interior for a bit, before finding a bunch of stuff that weren't there before taking up space here and there. And they were cute stuffed dolls. There was a doll of Athony, a doll of a certain white bird resembling the Korean crotit, a doll of the azure dragon and finally, even a doll that kinda, sorta looked like an orc. And the doll that was suspected to be replica of the orc took up the best location of them all, right above Kim Yurin's bed. Wah, what are you doing? Please, hurry and come in and don't look at the weird stuff. Kim Yurin. Becoming embarrassed all of a sudden, Kim Yurin dragged the two of them towards a small coffee table. There were only two chairs here Yurin settled down on the corner of the bed, while Ju Ji Hyuk and Yi Hai Rin took up the available chairs. Have you guys eaten yet? Kim Yurin. No, not Yi Ju Ji Hyuk. Yeah, we ate before coming here. Yi Hai Rin. Yi Hai Rin hastily covered the tactless Ju Ji Hyuk's mouth and replied in his stead. Oh, really? Then, what about a cup of tea? Kim Yurin. We don't need tea either, Captain. E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin placed an emphasis on the word Captain as she replied. Kim Yu Rin assumed a faint smile. When are you coming back? It's been too long a break for a post op trauma, you know. E. Hai Rin. The very first vacation Kim Yu Rin went on in ten years of her career was already almost half a year long now. And, what with the justification of recovering from the after-effects of a medical procedure, added on top, all the higher-ups of the Raven Knight's order could do was to impatiently stomp on their feet and wait. No, it wasn't just the Raven Order, but the entire country was stomping on their feet as well. Sorry. Please wait for a little bit longer. I'd like to enjoy it for a while longer, this vacation I've never had before. Kim Yurin. Her will was gentle, yet unyielding. E. Hai Rin spat out a long sigh and took a look around the interior of the hut once more. Just what exactly are you doing here all alone? Sure, the view looks great, but it's not like you can stare at the nature all the time, right? E. Hai Rin. Foot, does it look like that? However, there are more things to do here than you think. Kim Yu Rin. Kim Yu Rin's eyes gently arched. E. Hai Rin complained in her heart that such enticingly smiling eyes were an infringement of rules, and took a quick glance at Ju Ji Hyuk. Instead of his mouth, his eyes were wide open this time. I can go out fishing, read a book in comfort, and even meditate to gain clarity on things I failed to realize before. Probably, my trait could have gone up a level like this. Kim Yu Rin. E. Hai Rin wordlessly glared at Kim Yu Rin then her gaze drifted towards a small stuffed doll of a wolf lying on top of the coffee table. It was a seriously adorable little thing. But besides that fatally attractive cuteness, a faint aura coming off it caused a slight desire to possess it to settle on a small corner of her mind. Hugh, hmm. Kim Yurin. As if she got worried about E. Hyrin asking for it, Kim Yurin stealthily hugged the doll and bashfully came up with excuses for her action. All the dolls in here, the guild master Kim Sae Jean brought along as presents, you know. He said that it's because I might get bored vacationing alone. I definitely didn't buy them, you see. T, that is why, I can't give them to anyone else. If I do, it'd be like I'm not taking his good intentions seriously Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin spoke these words since, in actuality, she didn't want to give them away anyways. However, at the same time those words left her mouth, both of her guests froze up stiff. After all, Kim Sae Jean had been kidnapped. By a nonsensically powerful being no less, and his current whereabouts were completely unknown. Kim Yu Rin's eyes widened at this sudden change in the atmosphere and she quickly looked at both of them. What? What's the matter can it be? Kim Yu Rin. 
With tears forming in her eyes, Yi Hai Rin dropped her head, Ju Ji Hyuk gritted his teeth and stared off into the distance instead. Did something happen to him? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin stood up from her spot with a surprised face. Two of them was unable to say anything for a while. After all, Sae Jin's trait was a big secret. However, in order to persuade Kim Yurin, the secret had to come out in the open. What, what happened? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin hurriedly asked again. E Hai Rin sighed out softly and studied Ju Ji Hyuk's mood for a bit. He nodded his head once. Fu okay, please listen closely, Captain. Actually, the Guild Master's trait is he can transform into a monster. E Hai Rin. What? Kim Yurin. Immediately, Kim Yurin's expression blanked out. But before long, the shock of this revelation quickly reassembled all the information percolating in her brain. And well, a look of shock even greater than before lit up on her face. A trait where a person could turn into a monster. And then, the hero orc and Kim Sae Jin. In that case, could it be? And as her mouth continued to open and shut like a goldfish, unable to swim out from the enormous shock. What do you mean, a monster? It's the Azure Dragon. Ju Ji Hyuk. Ju Ji Hyuk's words brought a temporary relief to Kim Yurin's mind currently being ravaged by the shock waves. Ah, uh, you're right. The Azure Dragon isn't a monster. E Hai Rin. The A, Azure Dragon. Not an orc. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin dazedly asked back. That's correct. Mr. Sae Jin can transform into the Azure Dragon. But what do you mean by the orc? You're still thinking about that guy. E Hai Rin. Ah no, no. It's, it's nothing. Kim Yurin. E Hai Rin replied while carrying a bitter smile. And Kim Yurin dazedly nodded her head, while feeling a conflicting emotion that she couldn't distinguish whether it was relief or frustration. The monster. We'd like to cordially extend our invitation towards you for the greatest party to be held by the monster. The Vice President of the Great Wisdom Investments, Kim jong hyuk Nim, we sincerely hope that you can attend and brighten the party with your presence. I think this should be enough, right? Oi, I sent out the invitation to all the celebs as you told me to. Is that cool? Yu Bek Song When Yu Bek Song asked while studying the invitation card, Ross Riddell nodded his head. As an aside, as he was working as a double agent until now, he no longer had a place to return to anymore, so he decided to completely to stick to this group of people. Yes. Currently, there is an elder assigned to Kim Jong-hyuk, so the odds of that elder accompanying Jong-hyuk to the party is very good. After all, there will be plenty of juicy, fat prey to be taken under the mind control spells in a high society party held by the monster. Ross Riddell so, then, we catch that elder and make him sing where Bathory Woman is hiding, is that it? Yu Bek Song. That's correct. Elders are proficient in hiding their identities so not even the best security equipment can find them, but it should be fine since I'll be present there as well. Ross Riddell. Humph. Good. I'll leave it to you. Yu Bek Song. As soon as Yu Bek Song finished declaring like a boss, the doors to the underground secret conference room got abruptly pushed open. It was the pair of Yi Hyrin and Ju Ji Hyuk, who went out earlier while saying they were going to fetch someone. And it seemed that they have succeeded in their quest there was one more person following the duo. We've brought along the best reinforcement ever. Yi Hyrin. Hearing Yi Hyrin's energetic voice, Hazeline took a glance towards her direction. And, at the same time, when her eyes met that person's, Hazeline's body went rigid in an instant. It was the same for Kim Yurin as well. It was only the first day where the inside of the isolation barrier was full of sliced off flesh bits and coated with mountains of blood now, this place looked complete opposite of that. It was most likely that Bathory was the so-called clean and neat freak although this closed off space was on the small side. As she could modify it to suit her tastes and better reflect her state of mind, now it more or less resembled a high-class hotel suite instead. A lycanthrope yeah, I've heard about your kind before. Seriously, your recovery speed is really annoying. Bathory. Bathory spoke so, 
her body deeply cocooned within a luxurious sofa. She was wearing a red dress that must have had an issue with the amount of materials available during the manufacturing process as it was dangerously small, and it also happened to be quite revealing in all the critical areas. Whatever. But you what are you? You also have a trait. How can you still survive only with a single finger left? S.A.E. Jean. Hmm. Are you curious? Bathory. Bathory slowly traced her lips with her fingers. It was a needlessly seductive gesture. You'll tell me if I say I am curious. S.A.E. Jean. Well, it's not like I can't tell you. You're going to die by my hands soon anyway. Killing you after resolving your curiosity could be seen as me being benevolent, am I right? Bathory. While speaking some confident words, she formed a bright and innocent, childlike smile. It seemed that she was greatly enjoying this situation for some reason. Now, pay attention. Bathory. Bathory opened her hand. Red-colored mana buzzed on her palm like electricity. The mana of vampires is red in color. Because, we tend to use mana and blood at the same. Lower lifeforms can't do this, of course. To mongrels such as yourself, blood is nothing more than just blood, after all. Bathory. Mana buzzing atop her palm like violent arcs of electricity suddenly coalesced and formed a spike-like shape. Vampires pass on their strength via bloodlines. And my bloodline is the most special and excellent among every other bloodline out there. That is why I can use dozens and dozens of sorcery spells those cheap elf wizards could never perform, and my flesh and bones are several dozen times stronger than even the most powerful Suin warriors in the world. Bathory. In a split second, the reddish spike dancing in her palm increased in length and shot towards S.A.E. Jean's neck. He ended up swallowing down his saliva unconsciously the deadly spike had stopped just short of pressing against his Adam's apple. But, the thing that is even more impressive than that, is Bathory. Cugagug. A deafening noise exploded out and at the same time, mana began boiling all over Bathory's body. It was like seeing steam rise from the boiling water her entire body changed into that of pure mana. The reddish mana became a dense fog and slowly drifted towards S.A.E. Jean, before gradually changing back into the shape of Bathory once more. You see, my blood it's mana itself. Bathory. With an elegant smile on her lips, she sensuously stroked S.A.E. Jean's cheek and spoke. Seeing how dazed S.A.E. Jean was after witnessing that dreamlike scene, Bathory didn't stop there and her hand inched further south. From his face, to his neck from his neck, to his collarbone and from his collarbone, to his lower abdomen. Oi. S.A.E. Jean. Just as her hand had lowered enough. The baritone voice of the wolf heavily descended to her ears. What's the matter? Are you perhaps getting excited? Bathory. Bathory sneered in contempt as she looked at S.A.E. Jean's face. Augie Jack. And at the same time, still in the lycanthrope form, S.A.E. Jean bit into her neck. Kayak. Seriously? This stupid son of a bitch. Bathory. Suffering from the unexpected sneak attack, Bathory powerfully punched his upper torso, and as he flew away from the impact, he inadvertently ended up swallowing bits of her blood and flesh. Arg. Phew, spit. S.A.E. Jean. Groan ouch, that hurts Bathory. Arg, that's some disgusting sure. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean was opening his mouth to swear like a sailor but all of a sudden, an alert window popped up into view. In that moment, his head stopped thinking, and his heart ceased beating altogether. The host has ingested the Bathory blood. The lycanthrope's unique skill, senses of a wolf is activated, and now, the host can gain an understanding of, and acquire, the strength of a Bathory, according to the amount absorbed. Chapter, 143 Ouch seriously, this son of a bitch. Bathory was rolling around the floor, tears forming on the corners of her eyes. Obviously, she wasn't wounded heavily. She was simply faking it. I'll definitely, without a doubt, kill you with my own hands, so you better look forward to it. I'm gonna so rip apart your bones, your muscles, your organs and, and Bathory. Ignoring Bathory's venomous curses, S.A.E. Jean quickly looked through his skill windows. 
Unlike every other skill he possessed, this new one didn't have a proficiency level indicator, just a whole bunch of explanations instead. Senses of a wolf. A unique set of senses possessed by only the excellent individuals of lycanthrope species. A lycanthrope who has awakened this ability will see his or her five senses, as well as the sixth sense, become extremely perceptive when transformed into the wolf physique. Can be referred to as the transcendental senses, and when certain conditions are met, performing a faint premonition of the future becomes possible. Also, by absorbing blood of certain specific targets, it also becomes possible to understand and accept a part of the target's powers. This is the result of the instincts of the wolf perfectly aligning with the transcendental senses, and the more blood the host absorbs, the deeper his understanding will become. The current target, Bathory. Degree of progression, 0. 35%. Items possible to absorb understand currently unique structure of the muscles, unbelievably high bone density degree of advancement, 3%. Although the two terms with rather similar definition, degree of progression and degree of advancement, were separated into different categories, it wasn't all that hard to figure out what was going on. The former indicated the percentage left until he could absorb every bit of Bathory's powers, while the latter most likely indicated the percentage left until the parts of her power in this case, her endurance and strength were fully absorbed. And, to increase both the degrees of progression and advancement in other words, to become stronger he had to drink Bathory's blood. Hey, you. You think you can escape from this place alive or something? Bathory. While he was deeply immersed in his thoughts, Bathory sneered at him. Obviously. S.A.E. Jean. He replied full of spirit, but thanks to this new development, thoughts of escaping had vanished, at least for now. There was a mountain of experience points that would never run out right in front him, after all. Truly, what a pitiful idiot. Bathory. Bathory smirked. S.A.E. Jean glared at her for a while, before throwing a question at her. He was trying to piss her off, and thereby create a situation where he would be able to drink her blood. Oh, really? So, you really think you're all going back to your original homeworld? S.A.E. Jean. Her brows furrowed slightly. However, the answer he heard afterwards was way too resolute and at the same time, quite easygoing as well, as if to deny that faint possibility of uncertainty. Of course we are. Bathory. You two are also a pitiful idiot. S.A.E. Jean. Tweak. In the blink of an eye, Bathory's mana flew out in the shape of a spike and stabbed him right in the shoulder. While suffering from this immense pain, a strange scene that could either be the past or the future brushed past his mind. Watch Kihuk. You better watch your mouth. Bathory. At the same time, the pain S.A.E. Jean was going through was shared in full with Bathory as well, but still, while shedding sweat drops, she coldly warned him. S.A.E. Jean wordlessly stared at her for a bit, before. Yeah, you're right. Maybe, you can go back. S.A.E. Jean. He spoke while recalling the images that had faintly etched within his minds. Kim Yurin gritted her teeth as she glared at Hazeline. Unfortunately, Hazeline lacked the spare willpower to receive such a gaze, so she lowered her head at an oblique angle. Between the two, a sharp atmosphere as keen as a prized sword hung about. And the rest of the members present who didn't know the full story could only tilt their heads in confusion. Wah, what are you doing, Captain? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin hurriedly shook the shoulders of Kim Yu Rin, who was standing stiff in cold anger as if she was ready to draw her weapon out in the open. However, Kim Yu Rin didn't even react to that call, simply glaring at Hazeline and spitting out words filled with rage. Oi. Kim Yu Rin. Everyone present shivered at her tone, filled to the brim with killing intent. Look at me. Kim Yurin. Hazeline weakly lifted her head up. At the very moment her face was revealed, Kim Yurin couldn't hold her anger back anymore. She knew this wasn't the time nor the place. However, how could she hold back her rage when the very enemy who nearly ended her career as a knight after destroying the paths of her mana circulation, was right in front of her eyes? Back then, Kim Yurin definitely gave her a warning after chopping her arm off. If she appeared once more before Kim Yurin's eyes, then Yurin wouldn't hesitate at all and cut off Hazeline's mana as well. 
I definitely told you back then, didn't I? Kim Yurin. I know, but now isn't the right time for us to fight. We need your help so Mr. Sae Jean can be Hazeline. Even Hazeline's powerless answers sounded like fking excuses to Kim Yurin's ears. Your dog's not right to fight, you Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin shouted out in anger and reached down towards her waist. However, the quick on the uptake Yi Hyrin had already absconded with Gungnir and escaped far, far away by then. Still not giving up, Kim Yurin pounced at Hazeline with her bare hands. No, don't you come here. We shouldn't be doing Yuhak. Hazeline. Kim Yurin struck Hazeline's jaw with her fist, and swiftly climbed on top of the fallen elf. Then, began raining down her fists on the helpless Hazeline's cheeks, nose, throat, collarbones, chest, pit of her stomach, and lower abdomen. Suffering from earth-shaking pain that seemed to break her body into pieces, Hazeline reached out and reflexively grabbed Kim Yurin's hair in a desperate attempt to save herself. You. Let go, now. Kim Yurin. We, we shouldn't be doing this. Right now, Mr. Sae Jean is Hazeline. Hazeline looked deep into Kim Yurin's eyes and pleaded with her. Unfortunately, Kim Yurin's anger soared even higher. Those eyes of Hazeline's that showed her worries were exactly the same as the eyes looking at that guy in the past. Again. You, you, you crazy bitch. Kim Yurin. Completely losing her SHT now, Kim Yurin screamed out the second ever curse word she spat out in her entire life, and grasped Hazeline's hair. And soon enough, a sorry excuse of a tug of war unfolded in earnest. Ahahahak. Kayahak. It was a fierce tug of war where no one could predict who might end up as a baldy first. Stop it, please. What is the matter with you two? What are you all doing? Break them up. Members of the raiding team rushed in towards the two bickering females, but completely enraged Kim Yurin shoved everyone away and grabbed another handful of Hazeline's hair. Hair, my hair's gonna fall out. My hair. Yurin ah. Uni's hair is gonna fall off. Hazeline. Yurin ah. Who does this crazy bitch think is talking to? Kim Yurin TL, just in case you don't know, Ah is a suffix in Korean that's attached at the end of a person's name. It usually means someone younger or a child, but can also be used between friends. It's similar to chan or kuin in Japanese. Tuck. Suddenly, with a short sound of something being pulled out, Kim Yurin and Hazeline got finally separated. There was a heavy silence permeating in the room. Finally freed from Kim Yurin's death-like grips, Hazeline felt around her head while moaning out in pain. And having felt something was off, she quickly turned her head to look, and... Within the hands of Kim Yurin, who had fallen on the floor due to the momentum, she could see two clumps of blonde hair being tightly held. One second, two, then three before long, thick teardrops began forming in the eyes of the totally dumbfounded Hazeline. My, my hair, my hair I told you, it might come loose, didn't I SFX for a serious bout of uncontrolled sobbing. The guild the monster was currently showing remarkable results in the fields of defense industry, monster subjugation, artifacts, as well as pension investment schemes. Many people predicted that the guild's sister company, TM, would enter the top 10 in the rankings of the worldwide corporations. And, after becoming a landmark of sorts in Korean Peninsula, the piece of land in Kangwon province where the guilds and the company's buildings were located on, began generating millions in tourist revenue alone. On top of this, they even succeeded in penetrating into the closed-off, secretive and snobbish world of wizards. It was all due to the wizard of Bangbaedong, who showed much favoritism towards the monster. And the members only library of the monster where every grimoire published by the Bangbaedong wizard was stored, even got voted as the number one library wizards wished to visit. Whatever the case may have been, an enormous guild that had surpassed its supposed rival trilogy a long time ago, was holding a party aboard a cruise liner. The invitation card of this particular party, were the top performers of the monster entertainment, as well as famous knights and the current members of the guild were supposed to attend. Had somehow became a barometer to determine the level of fame and influence a person of high standing possessed. Those who didn't receive the invitation raged out in regret, 
while those who did, proudly readied their attires for the party. So, the plan is, we apprehend the vampire elder who will attend this party stealthily, yes? Kim Yurin. There was a certain calmness present within the conference room where the proverbial storm had swept past. Yes, that's correct E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin answered while continuously studying the mood. She couldn't help but think about the sobbing Hazeline, busy isolating herself in the corner of the room while trying to concoct a certain potion. It was probably to mend the bald spots on her head. Its possible name, hair growth potion if she succeeds in inventing it, she may end up making a profit of ten billion dollars, easy. With that, we can find where Mr. S.A.E. Jean is being held. Kim Yurin. There's no guarantee, but still, we should try everything we can E. Hai Rin. Suddenly, Kim Yurin stood up. A small stuffed doll of an orc hanging on the scabbard of her sword dangled along. Wah, what? What are you going to do now? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin, as well as other members, hastily got up as well. They were worried about her pouncing on Hazeline once more. Thankfully, other than shooting a sharp glare at the back of Hazeline, Kim Yurin didn't act out as others had feared. I'm done doing that, for now. I need to go back to my order and report that I'm returning to active duty first. I got the okay for my vacation because of the post-op trauma, so if I attend a party like this, I will end up with a disciplinary action, you know. Kim Yurin. Aha. In that case, let me go with you. E. Hai Rin. By the way, Hazeline. Did you bring the potion to regenerate Regen's arms already? Just how long must she remain without arms? Yu Bek Song. It was then, the slightly tactless Yu Bek Song asked the back of spotted head belonging to Hazeline. No, it's okay, White Tiger Nim. I'll be fine even if it's later region. The Suin region lifted her upper torso from Yu Bek Song's lap where she had been laying down until now, and tried to take care of the divine beast's lack of respect towards good timing. Aha. Uh -huh. I'll take care of this so you keep resting. Yu Bek Song. However, the desires of Yu Bek Song to take good care of her fellow Suin was a truly touching thing, and also. In my pouch. Hazeline. Also, Hazeline muttered without even glancing back once. The party above the cruise liner was scheduled to start at 8 in the evening, but the members had a need to prepare this and that beforehand, so they arrived three hours early. They then performed the final inspection of the torture chamber. Hidden at the depths of the cruise ship. By the way, how did you explain this to USA Young? Kim Yurin. We sort of told her that he went on a business trip E. Hyrin. At E. Hyrin's reply, Kim Yurin's brows narrowed. Seriously, you guys few. When S. A. E. Young arrives later today, you tell her the truth. Kim Yurin. Eh. But, then she might end up worrying E. Hyrin. Of course she must worry. How can she be his girlfriend? if she doesn't even know anything at all. Kim Yurin. E. Hai Rin shut her mouth. Her lips itched to be opened, but she endured. If she could say this one thing, but you're a mote solo, then she would not have anything more to wish for, but it was prudent to keep her mouth shut. Definitely. TL, mote solo the literal translation is mother's womb, solo. It's a slang term for someone who's never been in a romantic relationship in his or her entire life. And, also. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin took a glance at Hazeline's direction. Still stuck in some random corner, she was busy with creating the elusive hair growth potion. The sounds of mortar and pestle tong 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 seemed rather sad and forlorn, for some reason. Kim Yurin returned her gaze back to E. Hai Rin. Famed for her quick wits, E. Hai Rin got her drift soon enough, and asked Hazeline instead of Kim Yurin. Miss Hazeline, do you by any chance know a mental manipulation magic? E. Hai Rin. A little bit. Hazeline. Hazeline's voice lacked energy, but that was fine. The effects of such magic was wholly dependent on the target's mental resistance. And something like that would be taken care of Kim Yurin's fist, laden with her unique trait. That's all solved, then. Kim Yurin. Miss S. A. E. Young has arrived. Kim Sun Ho. The door was shoved open abruptly, and Kim Sun Ho entered while shouting out. 
the complexions of everyone present became rather clouded. Should I go? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin made a suggestion. I'll go with you. Let me come with you. Ju Ji Hyuk and Yi Hai Rin spoke up at the same time. Kim Yurin assumed a wry smile. Tong 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 tong. With the somewhat sad background noise of the mortar and pestle pounding away, three of them left the torture chamber. Entering the deck of the cruise liner, USA Yi Young smiled and greeted the trio of Kim Yurin, Yi Hai Rin, and Ju Ji Hyuk. Initially, she complimented on the layout of the party itself, but then, after glossing over the pleasantries, got down to business and began asking for SAE Jean's real whereabouts. With a serious face, Kim Yurin answered as truthfully as she could. And every time her lips moved, USAE Young's complexion paled further and further. In the middle of the explanation, she even shouted out what are you talking about? Is there a candid camera thing going on here or something? But when Kim Yurin finally got to the part Mr. S.A.E. Jean has been kidnapped. Plop. U.S.A.E. Young lost her consciousness and crumpled to the floor like a blow-up doll that lost all its air. Chapter, 144. She fainted as soon as she heard the explanations. Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song asked as she took a look at U.S.A.E. Young, currently lying on a bed and totally unconscious. Yes. I think the shock must have been too heavy but none of us expected her to collapse like this, at all. E Hai Rin. E Hai Rin replied while touching USA E Young's forehead. As if she was suffering from a nightmare, her forehead was soaked with cold sweat. What should we do now? E Hai Rin. The very person who should have played the role of the host for the party in the missing Kim SAE Jean stead had now fainted. That was why they wanted to keep his kidnapping as a secret in the first place. Thankfully, there was still an hour or so left until the start of the party, but then, would she wake up in time? And, even if she did wake up, could she be able to maintain a lucid state of mind? There's nothing we can do, but to get Mr. S.A.E. Jean back as soon as possible. Oi, Mr. Vampire. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin's eyes gleamed sharply as she looked at Ross Riddell. Why? Yes. Ross Riddell. You sure your plan is going to work? Kim Yurin. Oh, of course. Judging by the fact that the vampires under the Bathory's influence haven't yet issued a kill on sight order towards the Nisferatus. She must have not informed her subordinates yet, and thus I suspect that she is still stuck together with Mr. S.A.E. Jean at this point in time. The plan will work 100%. Ross Riddell. Wait. Isn't that strange? If she hasn't informed her lackeys yet, then how can an elder know Bathory's location? Kim Yurin. When someone gets to the level of an elder, he must sign an oath of blood with Bathory, which means they can track her aura quite accurately. The reason why they aren't doing anything at the moment is because she gave them a strict order to stay put until she returns on her own volition. Ross Riddell. Kim Yurin rubbed her chin and fell into a train of thought. In that case, you can definitely tell the face of the elder, right? Kim Yurin. Of course. I've had plenty of experience, and also Ross Riddell. Suddenly, Ross Riddell rolled up his sleeve and pushed forward his arm. His skin was the typical vampire pale, seemingly bloodless one but when he concentrated, a rather pretty blue emblem rose up from it. It was the magic tattoo, the trademark belonging only to Kim S.A.E. Jean and what the world referred to as truly revolutionary. Thanks to this, my senses have been greatly enhanced. No matter how well that elder disguises his aura, I'll be able to detect him. Ross Riddell. Good. Kim Yurin. It sure didn't feel right to have a vampire as a comrade, but it couldn't be helped under the current circumstances. Kim Yurin sent Ross Riddell back up to the deck and approached USAE Young. When she sat near the head of the bed, Hazeline who was sitting nearby trembled hard and, Pababot, hurriedly retreated far away. Sighing out grandly, Kim Yurin glared at her and spat out a couple of hostile words. Are you truly worried about her? Kim Yurin. Wah, what are you talking about? Hazeline. Can't you figure out what I'm talking about? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin gritted her teeth. Hazeline returned the sharp glare for a bit of time, but then, backed off and powerlessly replied. 
It's true I am worried for her Hazeline. And then, she picked up the mortar and pestle again. Tong 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 tong. That was indeed a sad but desperate attempt to regrow hair back on the two spots on the crown of her head where it had been ripped out. E Hai Rin sent out gazes of pity towards Hazeline's direction, while Kim Yu Rin didn't even spare a second of her time. Another hour went by in this stifling silence. USAE Young didn't wake up. And the deck was getting noisier and noisier now. We need to go upstairs now. But to leave her alone here, is just E Hai Rin. E Hai Rin worriedly spoke. Then Hazeline, you guard her. After all, you can't go outside with your hair all falling out and stuff. Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song spoke innocently enough, but Kim Yu Rin shook her head while forming a grave expression. We can't do that. That'll be like letting a cat guard fish. Kim Yu Rin. And what's wrong with letting a cat do that? Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song quickly glanced over at Kaiser II, lying inside a paper box. Seeing it yawn out in comfort, it seemed that the careless remarks didn't hurt the feline's feelings after all. Kim Yu Rin looked at Yu Bek Song with a somewhat flustered expression. No, well, it's not Kim Yu Rin. I won't do something like that again. Hazeline. Hazeline, her back still turned towards them, spoke in a stiff but resolute voice as if to cut into the conversation. I've been regretting that for a long time. Hazeline. What? Kim Yurin. I'm sorry. This Uni did something terribly wrong back then. Hazeline. Although it was a sudden apology, one could still sense her true feelings contained within. And so, Kim Yurin found herself unable to say anything. As she kept her mouth shut and fell into a deep dilemma on how to respond. Tong, Tong, Tong. Tong. The fireworks indicating the start of the party could be heard. Using that as the suitable excuse, Kim Yu Rin and Yu Bek Song as well as the others hurriedly went upstairs. Only the most outstanding individuals came to attend this grand party. Korean superstars that transcended past the Korean Chinese Japanese borders, career politicians who have stepped into the centers of governing circles. Many order masters and vice masters from overseas knights' orders, and even several tower lords from those wizard towers famed for their snobbishness were here. The main character of this party hadn't arrived yet, but still, decked out in expensive and sophisticated party dresses, these people were already participating neck deep in this unmissable networking opportunity. Ju Ji Hyuk was the first to enter the party. As if the emblem of the monster mounted on his chest possessed the power to capture all the attention of the partygoers, people began gravitating towards him. Ahaha! Isn't this the representative of the Dawn Knight's Order? A middle-aged politician named Yun Young Ho, who was able to climb up to a position of importance within the fifty-something age of his, engaged Ju Ji Hyuk in conversation. Now normally, this Yun Young Ho character wouldn't even spare a second of his time with the likes of a knight, unless he was facing a master or a vice master of an order. But, that golden badge on Ju Ji Hyuk's chest was not something that could be seen commonly. As a matter of fact, if he could swap his ID card for the National Assembly with that golden emblem, he'd count out hundreds of times in a heartbeat. Ah, how have you been, Mr. Assemblyman? Ju Ji Hyuk. Ha ha ha. I've been very well, all thanks to your guild. Pardon? Ju Ji Hyuk. Ju Ji Hyuk tilted his head. Did the monster even enter the world of politics lately as well? Ho ho. Actually, it was I who actively pursued for the export of TM's potions worldwide, see. Thanks to that, even the local potion market has revived for good, and many flattering remarks from our international counterparts landed on our doorsteps as well. Which allowed me to get re-elected quite successfully. Now that Ju Ji Hyuk heard the man's words, he seemed to be yet another one filled with self-praise. Ju Ji Hyuk let the politician's words flow through one ear and leave through the other one while he carefully surveyed the faces of the crowd. By the way, there is something I'm curious about. Does the monster only pick its new members from the ranks of knights and wizards? Ah. Well, I don't think so. After all, isn't instructor E. Eugene seeing a tremendous growth after becoming the guild's member? Ju Ji Hyuk. Oh ho, that is true. Ha ha ha, I've completely forgotten about that. 
I've heard that she has built ten odd dojos for Jean Sehan's martial arts in the States already well, that is something, all right. Ha ha ha. Yun Young Ho's eyes were shining brightly. They were the eyes of avarice, belonging to a person who had uncovered a possibility. Whatever the case may have been, as the conversation continued, more and more people began crowding around Ju Ji Hyuk. Ah, I've heard that the guild master, Mr. Kim Sae Jean, isn't going to attend this party, is that true? Eh. Oh, yes. I said he won't be able to come due to feeling a bit under the weather. Instead, we've arranged so you can enjoy the party still Ju Ji Hyuk. It was then, the voice of a bodyguard manning the entrance to the party venue entered Ju Ji Hyuk's ear. Mr. Kim Jong Hyuk from the Great Wisdom Investments and his acquaintance, confirmed. Ju Ji Hyuk hurriedly shifted the direction of his gaze. Thankfully, both Kim Yurin and Ross Riddell were moving towards the entrance already. By seeing the various changes to his surroundings, Sae Jin could estimate that he didn't have much time left. First of all, the interior of this isolated space had definitely increased in size compared to two days ago. Initially, it was nothing more than a pitch-black empty space, it soon grew into a size of a hotel room and now, the entire area grew to a size of about half the floor of the said hotel. Secondly, the frequency of Bathory using magic spells which she hadn't been using before, increased by a huge deal. Magic that cast restraints on targets, magic that cast shields on the caster, magic that even cast mirrors within the space itself, etc., etc. Of course, he could break them apart using the claws of the wolf, but he couldn't help but get worried by the gradual increase in the sophistication of the spells being used here. HNG 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 He could hear the humming of Bathory as she lay on a bed. Feeling annoyed all of a sudden, Sae Jean slashed out with his claws. Bathory quickly performed a shield magic, but the incoming claws easily shattered the shield and poked a hole in her stomach. Eek! That hurts. Unfortunately, Bathory issued a short cry only. As if she was controlling her emotions well, she didn't even lash out, either. And that was the most glaring evidence of them all that said her body had recovered to a certain degree. Hey you! So, like, how come your attacks can slice through magic? It's so mystifying, you know. Bathory. Hell, she was even throwing him a question. While pulling his claws out in the most relaxed manner he could muster, Sae Jean replied. My claws are special. Sae Jean. The claws of the lycanthrope had almost reached the A level, so they were not constrained by the form or nature of the target, and could cut into pretty much anything in this world. Although it wouldn't be easy, if Bathory wasn't here, Sae Jean could break open this isolation barrier as well. Hmm Bathory. Bathory formed a grin filled with meanings as she nodded her head. Well, that's nice. It's a nice little ability by the way, isn't it smart to give up round about now? If you do, I'll even spare your life and let you become my eternal slave Bathory. Appearing right before Sae Jean's eyes before he could even react, Bathory pompously asked him. The flawless beauty of Bathory didn't even have a single speck of embarrassment at this sudden close-up. I'm really interested in you, you know. Besides, keeping a being that was called our natural enemy around like a pet dog might be fun, too and also, you agreed before, right? That our plans will succeed. Bathory. Bathory was in the midst of recovering all her powers. And, if no relief pitcher showed up within the next couple of innings, then this game was as good as over. So, under that kind of situation, her suggestion of not killing the wolf that repeatedly injured her, could be seen as rather benevolent of her. Too bad, the wolf's instincts much preferred freedom over servitude, and self-indulgence, way over even freedom itself. Yeah, that's right. I think you'll succeed in your plans. I got this hazy feeling about that however, isn't that going to be an even bigger problem for you? Sae Jean. And what the hell are you talking about? Bathory. Bathory's brows furrowed. Kim Sae Jean smirked and continued with his words. You are trying to twist the fabric of space and time to return to the past version of your homeworld, am I right? Sae Jean. Right. However, by any chance, what happens if only one of that succeeds? To be more precise, what if there is no change in the timeline, but you still jump between the dimensions? 
SAE Jean. Almost immediately, Bathory's face became terrifying. However, since she had such a needlessly beautiful face to begin with, her expression wasn't that scary no matter how angry she appeared so. And your original world, the situation there is so bad that every living thing in that place just had to move to another world, am I right? SAE Jean. Reddish mana filled with hostility oozed out from her, and veins in her forehead bulged and wiggled. So, what happens when you fail to return to the past and end up in the original world of present? Just what would be waiting for you back there? I don't know much, but I'm sure you know the answer very well already. SAE Jean. Most likely, a being countless times more dangerous than the most dangerous beings found on this planet would be waiting for the vampire's arrival. If that happens, then it's mutual destruction, isn't it? When the fissure completely opens up, the earth will be destroyed, and you who went back home will all die too, you morons. SAE Jean SAE Jean sneered at the scene that brushed past his consciousness back then before sensing a pressure around his neck that was on another level altogether. When he looked down, both hands of Bathory were busy clasping his throat tightly in anger. Foot. Stop with your unlucky ramblings, okay? You're making me rescind my final bit of benevolence, you know you shtty piece of mongrel. Bathory. Bathory smiled as she spoke. SAE Jean followed her and also formed a thick smile. Fangs of these two people glistened under the light. SAE Jean then savagely grabbed the back of her neck, and viciously bit into that smooth and fine neck with vengeance. Meanwhile, Bathory shoved her hand to his side and began destroying his bones. And so, while blood overflowed everywhere, the bodies of two people piled up on top of the bed together. TL, WTF. That is. Uh, weirdly romantic. Don't tell me. Bathory's blood has been absorbed. Both the degrees of progression and advancement increases. Bathory's blood has been absorbed. Both the degrees of progression and advancement increases. The pain was indescribable, but he was still feeling rather good regardless. His provocation was a success, which meant her recovery would be delayed by a few more days, while several satisfactory alert windows continued to pop up as well. But he had to be careful here. After all, vampires would be the most sensitive beings in this world when it came to sucking on another's blood. Carefully, carefully slowly, slowly he should cautiously suck on this juicy pile of experience points. Chapter, 145 Kim Jong-hyuk entered the party venue with a handsome and tall foreigner in tow. Humph. It's not too shabby, I suppose. Kim Jong-hyuk sneered as he took in the surroundings. Beautiful actresses and female knights were everywhere. Although he didn't come here for that, it did seem a bit like a wasted opportunity to not have his ways with all these women. No, actually, the feeling of righteous anger was stronger than that of regret over missed chances. The bastards who snorted in disdain when he called out to them, were now busy wagging their tails right now. Mr. Trudeau. Kim Jong-hyuk turned around to look at Trudeau with courteous eyes. The foreigner narrowed his brows a little, but he still nodded his head once. Freeze the limit. And knights with strong resistance are a no. Ha ha ha. That's going to be enough. Kim Jong-hyuk. As soon as Trudeau's permission was given, Kim Jong-hyuk extracted a ring from his inner pocket. There was a strange and blood-colored gem stuck in the middle. He he he. Just as Kim Jong-hyuk grinned an evil grin and was about to jump into the middle of the attractive actresses. Ha! Huh. Aren't you Mr. Kim Jong-hyuk? This is a pleasant surprise. The high-tier knight affiliated with the Raven Order and the member of the Monster Guild, Yi Hai-rin approached him. And Kim Yu-rin was following her as well. Two of them kicked out in eye-catching dresses were as beautiful as elves, so the overtly licentious Kim Jong-hyuk had to stop everything he was doing and take a large gulp of saliva instead. Ah ha ha Well, look who it is. I just ran into the real VIPs here. It's my pleasure. Kim Jong-hyuk. Foot, we are not VIPs at all. Isn't that what we are supposed to say? By the way, who is this gentleman next to you? E. Hai Rin. The moment E. Hai Rin smiled and spoke, a voice seemingly seeped into her mind. It's the elder. It was a telepathy from Rosradel. 
He is the current vice president of the firm Rolena Intrude. They are an international investment firm, so I'm not sure if Lady Knights have heard of them. Kim Jong-hyuk TL, well, this author in his terrible naming sense strikes again. I did my best to Romanis but man, it sounds like a variant of some exotic milkshake, doesn't it? Of course, we've heard of them. This must be some type of a fated encounter, so how about we share a drink or two? E. Hai Rin. While smiling with her eyes, E. Hai Rin checked for Kim Yu Rin's reaction. Oh ho. Captain acting out in that bashful expression is really amazing. Looks like Captain here is okay with that as well. E. Hai Rin. Well, if you guys want it, then. Ha ha ha. Kim Jong Hyuk. Kim Jong Hyuk guffawed and I Trudeau. His eyes arrogantly said, See? I'm a man of this much status. Hmm. Trudeau thought about this for a moment. Even if it was the elder level charm magic, against high tiered knights, there was a big possibility of it failing to stick. However, hidden within the trouser pockets of Kim Jong hyuk was the highest grade aphrodisiac. Concocted with the utmost care by the vampires, this aphrodisiac should prove effective even against high tiered knights, and when alcohol was added in the mix as well, then the odds wouldn't be bad at all. I'm fine with that. Trudeau. Trudeau assumed a thick smile and looked at T. He two knights. In that case, should we head to a guest room below deck? I don't enjoy all this hustle and bustle, actually. E. Hai Rin. Well, that's great. Lead the way. Kim Jong Hyuk. Four of them formed a group and climbed down the stairs of the ship, and at the same time, another vampire trailed them from behind, his presence nearly undetectable. SFX for footsteps. And as he walked down the steps, Trudeau suddenly had a strange yet foreboding feeling coming over him. It wasn't solely because no matter how much he walked, the bottom of the stairs couldn't be seen. There was also a faint but familiar presence coming from behind him. When Trudeau turned around to look, the world seemed to darken all of a sudden. W. What? As Kim Jong Hyuk panicked grandly and looked around, a blunt scabbard of a sword was swung his way. Kong. A completely useless third wheel was soon knocked out with a well placed smack to the middle of his forehead. It's a trap. Trudeau hurriedly tried to activate teleportation, but the golden sword light pouring out from Kim Yurin sliced off his right arm before that. Kekwahahak. With the arm needed to complete the technique gone, the teleportation got cancelled immediately. Trudeau panicked and tried to form Venom Spear with his remaining arm instead. Almost right away, from his back, dozens, hundreds of black spears materialized in the air. Each of these spears were manifestations of a powerful venom, so these human scums would be grievously wounded even with the slightest touch. It was definitely a high-grade spell, but unfortunately for him, the compatibility was poor E. Hyrin's sword could distort the space itself and slice apart magic, after all. SFX for air being split. The sword swung by E. Hyrin deflected one spear away, and then, began bending in a weird way to rapidly destroy all the other spears. The pitiful Trudeau didn't even have time to panic at all because, at that moment, Kim Yurin's gungnir had cut off his other arm. Koa. Kim Yurin said about the purpose of her trait as mute, so he couldn't even scream in pain anymore. Losing both of his arms, he ended up kneeling down on the floor. The isolation barrier was cancelled by then, and Trudeau could spot the despicable traitor busy loitering about past the shoulders of the female knights. Do you not fear the wrath of the Lord? Trudeau. He wanted to scream out, but his voice didn't want to come out. However, Trudeau didn't give up and forcefully pushed his vocal cords as hard as he could until he sensed a strange voice buzzing around near his brain. Let's be honest, Mr. Elder, you also have been suspecting it for a while, haven't you? That our plan has a higher chance of failing altogether. I merely chose a path of survival for myself. Ross Riddell. It was a telepathy sent from Ross Riddell. Trudeau hurriedly sent back furious swearings and angry shouts, but by then, the younger vampire had firmly shut the communication off. Now that he was completely trapped, Trudeau's face reddened even more, and as he struggled uselessly, blood poured out like waterfall from where his arms used to be. Although his consciousness got blurred from all that blood loss, 
Trudeau still glared at Rosradel with bloodshot eyes. Too bad for him, all those fury, cursings, and hatred that went unheard now, would remain unheard forever. For how long had she been swimming in the pit of meaningless abyss? Let's get married. She suddenly recalled a man who said the words she wanted to hear so much in a slurred speech. Right away, USA Young's eyes snapped open. Tong 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 tong. The first thing she heard was the sound of a pestle pounding on a mortar, and soon afterwards, her heart began to burn hotly. Even tears began to well up. USA Young tried to get up hastily but her feet got tangled up and, quadang tang, fell flat on the floor. Mommy. Has a line. The sound of mortar and pestle came to a halt, and the woman who had been using them turned to look at her. Uni. USA Young. SAE, SAE Young, you are awake. Hazeline. Hazeline put the pestle down and approached USAE Young to help her stand up. Are you alright? You should still rest. Hazeline. Let me go. USAE Young. However, USAE Young coldly pushed the helping hands away. She suddenly felt wronged and furious. She was Kim SAE Jean's girlfriend. They even promised to get married. So why was she the very last person to be informed about his kidnapping? Sa, S.A. Young ah. Please, calm down first, and. Has a line. How can I calm down in this situation? Appa has been kidnapped. But besides that, where is everyone else? Call them over here right now. U.S.A. Young. She gritted her teeth as mana began boiling above her skin. Definitely a bad sign, that was the first indication of the condition, mana deviation. It was one of the most fatal conditions for either knights and wizards, where mana went out of control, resulting in all the accumulated mana leaking out and their lives being placed in mortal danger. Hazeline's brows narrowed to a slit. S.A.E. Young, you need to calm down. You being like this isn't going to help anyone, you know. Hazeline. Help anyone, my ass. You all knew already, so why? Why didn't you tell me before? USAE Young. Because, we thought you might get too worried. Hazeline. Worries? Of course I would worry. Get out of my way. USAE Young. USAE Young pulled herself up and staggered towards the exit of the room. Hazeline sighed out and in the end, pulled out a bottle of potion from her inner robe pocket. It was the sleeping potion. After popping open the lid, she poured it over USAE Young who couldn't even walk properly but was behaving rather recklessly. Ah ah. Hey. What are you doing? Hazeline was sure of hearing an unpleasant form of informal speech, but whatever USAE Young powerlessly slid down to the floor. And almost right away, the door to the room was pushed open. And it was the members of the rescue team, accompanying a vampire that could be the elder. They were rushing inside but after discovering the situation, stopped in their tracks. USAE Young, who was on the ground after suffering the effects of an unknown potion, while there was Hazeline, holding a potion bottle. Kim Yurin's hand slowly reached down to her hips, towards her sword. I just put her to sleep because she was rampaging around. Please, don't doubt me on this one. Yurin. Please let go of your weapon. Let go. I'll really die with that. Like, really die. Really. Has a line. Persuading the elder was quite easy. After pounding on the elder's face with Kim Yurin's fists loaded with the purpose of shearing away bits of mental resistance with every punch landed, dot. The elder's mind finally became soft as mush, and using that opening, Hazeline's mind manipulation magic dealt the final critical blow. And so, they had succeeded in turning this elder into a puppet, but. So, what should we do about this guy? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin pointed to the additional guest of this mess, Kim Jong Hyuk, and asked. Oi, Bob Ross, can you make so that he will forget about today's matters? Kim Yu Rin. Of course. At Kim Yu Rin's demand, Ross Riddell stepped forward smartly and began pouring his mana into Kim Jong Hyuk's brain. It's all done. He will remember it as having had a blackout after drinking himself into a stupor. Ross Riddell. That's a relief. Well done, Bob Ross. K. 
Kim Yurin. By the way, just who is a Bob Ross? I'm Ross Riddell. She lightly ignored Bob Ross and his complaints and instead, Kim Yurin took a slight glance at USAE Young lying on the bed. What time did the butler from the Dawn household say he'll be here? Kim Yurin. He said soon. Kim Yurin nodded her head with a complicated expression on her face. It was regrettable, but USAE Young's mental state would only be a hindrance to them. On top of that, according to Hazeline's words, she even exhibited signs of mana deviation, too. All right, then. Is everyone ready? If you wish to be forgiven by USAE Young, you need to bring the guild master Kim SAE Jean home no matter what. Kim Yurin. Yes, ma'am. We will. Everyone energetically spat out the same answer. SFX for the engine roaring. Driving on a precipitous mountain road was a wide-bodied SUV packed to the brim with eight people inside. Kim Yurin's driving was top-notch, but at the same time, it was also quite rough as well, so the passengers all looked to be in some serious discomfort. Especially so for Yu Bek Song, who just so happened to possess keener senses than regular humans with a face of someone literally dying. She was in the middle of busy harming herself, such as hitting her head repeatedly against the back of the middle row of passenger seats. It's the East Sea in this direction. Is this place correct? Kim Yurin. Yes. Just a little bit further. Trudeau replied with a dazed face. Straight ahead. Kim Yurin. Yes. Okay. Kim Yurin. Even though they were on the unpaved road, she still stepped hard on the accelerator. And because this, but interior of the car began shaking madly as if an earthquake had broken out or something. Wait, wait, I might. Really throw up. At this rate. Yu Bek Song. Not too long after, Yu Bek Song's powerless voice came from the furthest seats at the back. Huh. No, you can't. You can't, you must not throw up in here. I telling you right now, you must not throw up, got that? Has a line. And the person raving madly was Hazeline, seating right next to her. No, no, I can't hold back anymore, you know. I can't endure it no more. I might really die at this rate. No, I am already dead. Dead. Just treat me like a dead person. You Beck Song. Endure it. Endure it. I'm telling you to endure. Seriously, I'm telling why. Hazeline. Bleerk. Kaya ha 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 ha. Has a line. Chaos was unfolding at the rearmost set of seats, but Kim Yurin didn't stop the car. No, instead of stopping, she actually increased the speed after her urgent need to rescue Kim Sae Jean and the excitement at being given the opportunity to drive off road real fast after long while ended up overlapping. Arg, Mr. Sae Jean gave this robe to me as a present, you know. Your SHT is all over it now. You stupid cat. Has a line. Blurg. SHT. Hop. Stop. Stop the car, Yurin. Yurin. Stop. I'm also gonna throw up. Wooyup. Blurg. Mr. Bob Ross. Please deploy a shield around the rearmost seats. The smell may come over to this side. Kim Yurin. I've already deployed one a while ago, so you don't have to worry, ma'am. And I said, I'm not Bob Ross. Ross Riddell. E. Hai Rin, Kim Sun Ho, and Ju Ji Hyuk let out sighs of relief. They decided to leave the matters of the rearmost seats to the people back there. After 40 minutes of torturous driving later, the group finally arrived at the place the vampire elder had lead them to. And well, it was indeed an area so secluded and lonely, they never could have guessed such a place even existed before. Well, there aren't anyone with problems, right? Asked Kim Yurin. If one thought of Hazeline and Yubek Song who were mired in the sick of each other as problems, they were indeed problematic, but Rosradel's cleaning magic spell managed to completely wash both of them, well, clean. Since you knew a magic like this, you really should have used this spell sooner. Really, I don't like you at all. Hazeline. There it is. Wow, as expected of Bathory. Look how sturdy the isolation barrier is. 
Ross Riddell. Lightly ignoring the grumblings of Hazeline, Ross Riddell pointed at the dome-shaped jet-black barrier at the distance. What should we do now, Captain? E. Hyrin. I should be able to destroy the barrier with my gun near. But the problem is what comes next. How should we deal with Bathory? Kim Yurin. Hmm. How about this method? Kim Sunho. Kim Sunho raised his hand. What is it? Kim Yurin. TM has been in charge of defense against the monster threats, so. They have come up with many innovative items such as unmanned arbalests and gun turrets. Kim Sunho ED, for people who don't know what an arbalest is, just imagine Van Helsing hunting vampires with that crossbow. That crossbow is an arbalest. Ah. Kim Yurin's eyes widened in an instant, but soon, she slowly shook her head. We don't have the time. We need to rescue the guild master before something happens to him. Kim Yurin. We can deploy the mercenaries from the company, so within half a day no, less than one hour will be enough. Kim Sunho. Kim Yurin studied the reactions of her comrades. E. Hai Rin thought this was a good idea, so she readily agreed to it and even added in her own thoughts. Hazelai Nuni, you can still do that thing, right? The magic that eliminates mana. E. Hai Rin. Uh. Uh, uh. But, I think 10 seconds will be the L limit, most likely. Being called Uni out of the blue, Hazeline got bewildered slightly and stuttered with her speech. Phew. Then, we'll call the mercenary company to install those. Mr. Sunho. Kim Yurin. In any case, Bathory's aim was to tame the Azure Dragon. So, at minimum, it was guaranteed that she wouldn't kill him, and even Kim Sae Jean himself wouldn't want to see his fellow guild members sacrificing themselves either. Let's exclude the gun turrets and go with the arbalests. The guild master might end up getting mixed up in the attack. Kim Yurin. Yes ma'am, understood. Kim Sunho. Kim Sunho hurriedly made a call to someone. And less than 30 minutes later. SFX for the rotors of helicopters spinning. Twelve helicopters covered up the entire night sky, and dozens of mercenaries descended from them while carrying all the necessary gears. Wow. What the hell. So fast. Under the admiration of the rescue team, the mercenaries managed to install tens of the unmanned arbalests in less than twenty minutes. What did you tell them? Kim Yurin. I explained that we have trapped a powerful monster within the barrier. Kim Sunho. That's fine. Tell them to leave the area now. Kim Yurin. In the end, unless the real elites were involved, Bathory couldn't be taken down. Of course, the mercenaries from the monster were well known for their competence, but it was the right thing to avoid meaningless death at all times. Understood. Kim Sunho ordered them to return while clapping his hands the mercenaries retreated as swiftly as a fired arrow. Chapter 146 It was unknown how much time had passed by. However, he knew for sure that the inner area of the isolated space had grown as big as an elementary school playground. It indeed seemed like a hopeless situation, but there was also something else to console Sae Jean as well. As he continued to tussle and fight with Bathory, the degree of advancement for structure of the muscles and bone density continued to increase and increase until finally. The alert window that said muscles have been strengthened, and the bones have been fortified accompanied the 100% completion for the advancement. The improvement was quite easy to see for himself. Not only the pain he felt after getting kicked and punched by the annoyed Bathory decreased noticeably, it was now possible to contend against her physically to a certain degree. Of course, he was still helpless against her magic attacks, though. On the other side, Bathory was finding it quite suspicious regarding Sae Jean's sudden increase in his overall sturdiness. But she let go of her suspicions pretty quickly after he came up with an excuse of I've become used to your violent assaults, that's all. Whatever he still got to completely assimilate the physical essence of Bathory for himself, and the next thing he started absorbing was the knowledge of sorcery accumulated for the past 300 years. He initially hoped for the skill where he could morph his entire body into pure vapors of mana, but still, this was none other than the sorcery, something that was commonly believed to be one level superior to regular magic. 
As the Leviathan, a being of mana, he would be able to wield sorcery far more effectively than Bathory ever will. And right now the degree of advancement for sorcery was at 15%. Huhng, it's all done. Bathory. And so, as he was trying to piece together 15% worth of fragmented knowledge of the sorcery in his head, Bathory's rather pleased chuckles could be heard out of the blue. He sent a curious gaze towards her way. There was no need for him to say anything, really she should start grumbling all on her own, anyway. Foot. Bathory. But for this time around, Bathory's explanations weren't strictly necessary. There was a paper castle stacked up with playing cards in front of her. Bathory had built this 50 centimeter tall stack with the method SAE Jean taught her, and it was quite apparent that she was very pleased with herself. Feeling rather cantankerous for some reason, SAE Jean blew with his mouth. The paper castle trembled pitifully before it collapsed, and Bathory's face crumpled along as well. What the hell are you doing? Bathory. Is it fun? Shouldn't have taught you that. S.A.E. Jean. Really now, acting exactly like a man who is about to die, your temper is so rotten but, besides all that, hey you. Don't you want to play a round of cards with me again? Bathory. The card game Bathory was referring to was one card, dot. He played it with her before after seeing how bored she looked but now, she was bothering him over 18 times a day about playing it with her. Of course, when talking about a day, it was in terms of the flow of time within this isolated space. Although, it was not known how many days it would be outside for one day spent inside. TL, one card is a type of card game played mostly in South Korea. I've never heard of it, but there's a page for it in Wikipedia. Don't want to. SAE Jean. How ridiculous. It was you who wanted to play it before. Is it because you lost to me all the time? Bathory. You are welcome to believe that if you want. S.A.E. Jean. In front of the complaining Bathory, the ace that used to occupy the top spot of the now collapsed paper castle floated down quite lazily. He looked at that innocuous occurrence without thinking too much when, quite suddenly, a single wisp of electricity buzzed past his brain cells. A feeling of a chill going down his spine the lycanthrope's intuition was acting up. No, it wasn't as if he had another peek at the future. Just that, a certain suspicion brushed past his brain like a flash of light, that was all. O.I.I. Oh, S.A.E. Jean. What? Bathory. She replied while gathering the deck of cards. Since she sounded grumpy, S.A.E. Jean had to think for a bit. What he was about to say was going to be seen as far greater misconduct than blowing off her paper castle, after all. What is it? Speak up, will you? You're going to die soon anyways, so why are you being hesitant? Bathory. Fought. He ended up chuckling after hearing her words. Although it was her own arrogant desire of not wanting to breathe in same air as humans, she apparently lived all her life stuck in a castle somewhere, and well, she was certainly full of curiosity as a result. And if she was so inquisitive, then that also meant she would be full of questions as well. In that case, she would have no choice but to admit to the words others might think of as nothing more than an attempt to sour the relationship. Well, it's nothing. Just asking because I'm curious. Your plan, did your lord declare it will definitely succeed? S.A.E. Jean. When he cautiously tested the waters, Bathory proudly nodded her head. That's right. Our lord can see everything, you see. Although, he is old now and he has to sleep a lot nowadays. Bathory. Humph. So, that guy must be thinking that both the time and space can be distorted at the same time? S.A.E. Jean. Bathory's brows narrowed. That's right. Both at the same time. Hey, what are you trying to say here? Stop beating around the bush. Bathory. No, see. I'm just curious. That doesn't make sense, though. You ever heard of the term contradiction? Bathory didn't know, but still nodded her head in an oblique angle as if she knew it already. I'll explain that later. Whatever, what you vampires want is to reverse the timeline and jump across space all at once. Time, and space just which one needs to proceed first in order for the plan to succeed. 
What rubbish are you spewing this time? You really a mongrel. You even bark like one when you talk. Bathory. As expected, her expressions were sullen. No, actually, it seemed like she had no idea what he was talking about in the first place. Well now, think about this carefully. If the timeline was reversed first, then there won't be any fissure in your new time period, so how will you jump across the dimensions? And also, if you jump through the dimensions first, then the new dimension won't have the fissure there, so how will you reverse the timeline? SAE Gene Looking at the plan with a critical eye, influencing both the time and space simultaneously was impossible. No matter what, the difference of a single microsecond should always exist. That was why, their plan definitely had a contradiction to it. It wasn't a particularly hard to understand this problem even a layman would realize this issue eventually, given enough time. In other words, vampires would have caught onto this contradiction pretty easily as well only if it wasn't for the presence of someone who could block any and all suspicions the vampire lord. A figure who demanded blind, unquestioning and absolute loyalty from his subjects. Well, to me no matter how hard I think about it, it feels like your lord is using you. S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean said this only one line, but the thick killing intent and heavy pressure were quickly added to the atmosphere. However, after fully assimilating Bathory's constitution, such physical threats were as good as non-existent to him now. Hey, maybe you don't want to die, after all. How about living the rest of your miserable life being ripped to shreds by other monsters? Bathory. Her voice was tinged in pure rage. But still, within her quietly trembling eyes, a type of restlessness that couldn't be hidden away could also be felt. Besides, there is no need for the Lord to something like that. Bathory. So, here's the thing. You all want to return to your original world, right? But your Lord probably doesn't. Most likely, he already knows it's impossible to return to the past version of your home world. S.A.E. Jean. Even I think it's definitely possible to overturn either the timeline or dimensions, sure. But that's only when you choose one or the other the time, or the space. So, in other words, maybe the Lord is planning to drop you off at your home world like a bad habit, while himself alone or maybe. With those goons loyal only to him, return to the past version of the earth, so he can swallow up the defenseless version of this planet for himself. S.A.E. Jean. You shut your DN mouth. Bathory. As soon as he finished speaking, Bathory pounced on him while growling wildly. Unlike the other times, though, her movement was urgent and lacked that certain elegance she possessed. Was that the clear evidence of her being restless? S.A.E. Jean pushed her face away with both of his hands and continued on with his words. I heard Rosradel call you as the future leader of the vampires. But here's something else you think the Lord will accept that. Vampires are a bunch of ambitions and desires rolled into one. I mean, doesn't the ones with nobler than noblest bloodlines have stronger obsession towards power and prestige? S.A.E. Jean. Kobhak. The Lord has already said, he will choose the replacement for his aging self Bathory. Well, that is, who would like it when he says he will rule over you lot for hundreds, maybe thousands of years into the future. Doesn't matter how well the Lord controls vampires' instincts to drink blood by using whatever special artifact, he will get his as assassinated long before that. Besides, after he hands over the position, what would happen if one of you cause a revolt or something? S.A.E. Jean. Calming down his shaking heart, S.A.E. Jean did his best to form a sneer. Oh, by the way, is it really true that the Lord sleeps a lot? From what I've heard, doesn't he have, like, 100 more years left in his lifespan? S.A.E. Jean. It was then, Bathory's mana began rising up like a dragon ascending to heavens. The blood-colored mana boiling spectacularly on her skin showed off how violent her fury was this time around. Our Lord isn't that kind of a person. Bathory. S.A.E. Jean smiled and added the final words, Oh, is he really? Maybe that crossed her bottom line, since she pounced on him as if she was planning to dissect him right there and then. He sank his fangs on her shoulders and desperately held on. Soon after, he was greeted by the type of pain where it felt like his organs were being pulled out one by one and his spine was being smashed into pieces. And after some time had passed by, Bathory abruptly stopped what she was doing. 
SFX for sucking noises. What the? You stupid mosquito. Bathory. She angrily pushed SAE Jean off her as he continued to suck on her blood. As he was lamenting on the fact that the degree of advancement was still only at 30%. Suddenly, the cracks began forming on the walls of the isolation barrier. Oh. Looks like the rescue party has arrived. SAE Jean. A smile automatically formed on his lips. He retracted the fur covering his body he changed back to the human's appearance. Bathory stared at him with an unreadable expression, before her lips twisted upwards. Really? In that case I should kill them all, then. Bathory. When the golden sword light cut into the wall of the barrier, a rift ripped open on the part of the jet black dome that didn't look like it'd break no matter what. And three seconds later, with a loud ripping noise, the rift appearing on one side spread out to the rest of the dome, and the whole thing shattered and fell apart like falling pieces of glass. We did it. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. There were two people within the isolated space. As expected, they were Bathory Woman and Kim S.A.E. Jean. However, their positions were a bit strange. S.A.E. Jean was lying on the ground, while Bathory was straddling him on top. It was somewhat suggestive, and also was a position of dominance. That, that crazy bitch is. Hazeline. Seeing this scene, Hazeline screamed out even before she had the chance to think. What did you say? Bathory. Hearing that uncalled for name calling, Bathory's face crumpled to resemble a demon. Then, mana began to pour out from her body. But, it was right at this moment when Hazeline's mana suppression activated. By sacrificing every single mana stone of monsters taken from the monster's warehouse, they succeeded in suppressing Bathory's mana. These DN mongrels kook. Bathory. After the usage of mana was forcibly taken away from her, hundreds of arbalests fired their load at Bathory. Horrifying noises of flesh being blown away resounded out, and countless sharp bolts fired off from the arbalests turned Bathory into a hedgehog in the blink of an eye. But everyone knew this wasn't going to be enough. E. Hyrin's whip sword, Ju Ji Hyuk's great sword, the front claws of the white tiger, and Kim Yurin's gunnier descended down on Bathory's figure at the same time. SHT Bathory. They had more bodies than her. And she also had only one more life remaining. Bathory had to swallow her humiliation and send a rescue signal to her lackeys. Kwahang. Countless sword auras rushed in like a storm of thunderbolts. Still, Bathory endured and avoided some of them. No need for CP like mana, just with her physical body only. She barely managed to dodge the golden sword aura rushing towards her heart. She then grabbed the curvy sword that drew a strange arc and brushed past her throat, throwing it down to the ground. And the knight holding that whip-like sword, E. Hyrin, accompanied her weapon and slammed into the ground as well. Kyuak. Hyrin. Are you ALRI? Kim Yurin. Next, Bathory dashed towards the female knight relaxedly worrying about her comrade and punched her gut. The female knight commendably endured against Bathory's physical power, but still, a fair amount of blood gushed out from her mouth. Bathory pounced on Kim Yurin in order to finish her off, while Ju Ji Hyuk and Yu Song stepped forward to block her. Seeing this battle unfold, SAE Jean intuitively knew they would lose. Hazeline's efforts in mana suppression was at its limit, and her mana reserve was simply too empty to fire off any sort of offensive magic spells. On top of this, Bathory's reinforcements should be arriving any time now. In other words, retreat was the correct answer here. But, what about the method? Using speed to evade Bathory and escape was simply a crazy wish. She was fully capable of a crazy turn of speed where she could easily exceed the speed of sound and travel over a kilometer in one second. So, he need to think of a means to escape. Think. He abruptly recalled the part of a certain sorcery, so he hurriedly began to dive into the accumulated knowledge he stole and stored deep within his mind. When he searched, he found one. The instant transmission. It was the sorcery Bathory used to kidnap him back then. Kwahang. At the same time, Kim Yurin's gunnier collided with Bathory's bare fist and a huge wall of dust cloud exploded upwards. And within this cloud where one's view was obscured, 
SAE Jean identified the locations of his comrades and summoned forth his mana in order to compose the sorcery. As expected the Leviathan's ability to integrate and wield mana was simply beyond the capabilities of other species. What? Bathory. Bathory sensed something was amiss, and quickly began to get rid of the dust cloud. But, as she did so, blue mana mushroomed up and surrounded Kim Sae Jean's comrades, and... Poof! They all vanished into thin air. Where? Wah, what the hell? Bathory. Bathory ended up punching the empty air quite unexpectedly, and as a result, she was left utterly confused initially, at least. What the hell is this? Where did you run off to? Where the hell are you, you scummy mongrel sons of bitches? Ahahahaha. Bathory. Then, she exploded in pure rage. Did Kim Yurin succeed in landing a blow to her face? Bathory's swollen cheek seemed to further enhance the awful and ugly atmosphere. My, my queen. Ha, ha, hey, you stards, why are you so bloody late? Bathory. My, my apologies. Should we chase after them? We have detected the flow of their mana. Elders and apostles hurriedly appeared and knelt down before her. Bathory wiped away the blood from her lips and tidied up her messy hair while cold words of fury exploded out from her mouth. No. I'm more or less calm now. And what if we chase after them? They'll just run away using the same method again, anyway Bathory. In, in that case. Bathory fell into a dilemma, before she abruptly recalled what S.A.E. Jean had said, that one about the vampire lord deceiving the vampires. That was definitely a disrespectful statement that even the most horrifying death wouldn't be enough of a punishment. However. I'm gonna meet with the lord. Bathory. Eh. Pardon me, my queen. We definitely understand your majesty's fury. However, the lord hasn't woken up yet, so. Hearing that pathetically weak voice, her blood seemed to well up in the reverse direction. Why did she not possess a single fun lackey amongst all her underlings? Why did every one of them know only to grovel so pathetically? While she glared at these failures of male kind whose knees and even their heads were firmly glued to the ground, she couldn't help but recall the man who had been next to her only until a few moments ago. And at the same time, countless flames of anger spiked up, each of them carrying diverse feelings within. Shut up, you stinking insects. I'm going to see the Lord, so just make the God way already. Bathory. Her super loud yell seemed to shake the quiet mountainside. Chapter, 147. The sorcery activated by the Leviathan, the instant transmission, was indeed a success. The place they arrived at was the underground conference room they'd been using until now. However, since S.A.E. Jean activated it in a hurry, he couldn't have waited for all eight people's feet to be on the ground before he activated the spell. Meaning, a few of them were transferred while their heads or some other body parts were rammed to the ground. Kayak. Eek. Ah ah. As a result, there was a bit of chaos filled with painful cries, but still, S.A.E. Jean breathed a sigh of relief after confirming that he didn't leave anyone behind. At the same time, a stinging dizziness from abusing his mana reserve swept over him. Are you alright? Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean in his leviathan form staggered about, and Kim Yurin helped him to stand still. The weird scene where a human was helping out a dragon became somewhat normalized quickly after S.A.E. Jean reverted back to the human's appearance. Ah, uh, yes. I'm okay. My head's a bit dizzy, that's all. Kim S.A.E. Jean. He massaged his temples as he spoke. Kim Yurin helped him to a sofa nearby. To think your trait is to transform into the Azure Dragon, seriously ah, uh, by the way, did you perform that magic spell? Kim Yurin. Well, yes, more or less. S.A.E. Jean. What do you mean, more or less? What, are you adding more or subtracting less? T.L., ah, uh, well, here in this line, the author tried another one of his infamous pun-based jokes. I thought I could give a direct TL of it a shot, but well, I tried. Kim Yurin's lips formed a thin smile as she threw him a joke an old man might say. Thinking that it was just impossible to disguise one's real age, S.A.E. Jean turned to look at her, and 
His eyes widened extra large. Around her mouth and jaw area, huge amount of dried blood could be found there. M. Miss Urin. You are hurt. S.A.E. Jean. Eh. But, I'm not in much pain, though. Kim Urin. But it looks painful from here S.A.E. Jean. When he asked her in fluster, she waved her hands around in front of her as if it was nothing to worry about. However, as if bones had been smashed into fine powder, a part of her arm shook around this way and that in a shape of a tree branch snapped in the middle. S.A.E. Jean's jaw dropped to the floor after seeing this grotesque scene Kim Yurin belatedly noticed her own conditions, and got shocked out of her skull as well. Ah! What the hell? Kim Yurin. Fut. A chuckle automatically crept up on his face as he witnessed her energetic reaction. No, wah, wait this, this type of wound can be healed with a potion. Thankfully, there is a potion over th Kim Yurin. No, let me take a look first. It's no good to rely on potions if it's broken to this extent. What would you do if the bone heals in a weird way? S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean shook his head in disapproval and grabbed her arm. And after adjusting his mana appropriately, he poured it under her skin. No, I'll be fine. When I get to a hospita. Ha. Huh. Kim Yurin. The shattered bone pieces began shuffling towards their rightful positions, and then, fused together all on their own to revert back to the original shape. This was different from a potion that simply mended external wounds. This was complete restoration, nearing the boundaries of the long extinct recovery magic. Dot. It's finished. Try moving your arm. S.A.E. Jean. This, this is what is going on. Kim Yurin. The confused Kim Yurin moved her arm this way and that and became quite astonished by the result. Just what exactly did you do? Kim Yurin. I learned it. Just a bit, from that Bathory woman. S.A.E. Jean. A dumbfounded expression formed on Kim Yurin's face. But, what could she do? The truth was right in front of her eyes, after all. In actuality, the meaning of the phrase understand all knowledge of sorcery possessed by Bathory wasn't as simple as he could use sorcery from now on. Its meaning was far more comprehensive than that. He would be able to replicate, in full, all the experience and confidence the Bathory bloodline had accumulated over its countless generations in order to become proficient in performing sorcery. That was why, S.A.E. Jean could use at least around 33% degree of advancement of all those magic spells that were lost either due to incompetence of modern-day wizards or through lack of careful management. And luckily enough, healing-type magic was included in those magic spells he could perform. That, that crazy woman taught you, just like that? Kim Yurin. We negotiated a bit. S.A.E. Jean. You say negotiations but how did you negotiate with someone as crazy as her? Kim Yurin. It was then. E. Hai Rin hesitantly approached S.A.E. Jean, seemingly having witnessed the earlier recovery process. No, it was more correct to say, she crawled, with her hands on the floor and all. Guild Master, I think my spine is broken. I can't, I can't feel my lower torso at all E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin was all tears as she looked up at S.A.E. Jean. He told her not to worry, and then, lifted her clothes just a wee bit. Well, a piece of fabric on the area of contact would be a hindrance, after all. Too bad, E. Hai Rin wasn't aware of this. Yujiak. What are you doing? Especially to a girl who can't even move. Captain. Save me, Captain. E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin struggled with her two still moving arms, but her captain just so happened to be in cahoots with him. Kim Yurin tightly held on to E. Hai Rin's upper torso. Please do it. Kim Yurin. Ha. Huh. What, do what? Stop. E. Hai Rin. Your treatment, you idiot. Your treatment. Kim Yurin. Eh. Ah, aha. When Kim Yurin replied, E. Hyrin's struggling subsided. Kim S.A.E. Jean lifted her top a little bit more. Her waist shuddered slightly, but there was no other reaction beside that. However, Kim Yurin suddenly formed a mischievous expression, and rather fiercely, loudly slapped E. Hyrin's B.T. cheek. 
Ah. What the hell? Who did that? E. Hai Rin. Hai Rin, you really do have a nice body, don't ya? Kim Yu Rin. Eh, eh. Ah, don't, don't do that. E. Hai Rin. Slap, slap. That clear sound continuously rang out. S. Stop it. Ouch. Ha, Han. E. Hai Rin. I'll start with the treatment right away. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean felt that if he delayed any longer, he might end up getting implicated in a situation that might prove to be a bit embarrassing for a hot-blooded male like himself. So he quickly brushed Kim Yurin away and placed his hands on the white skin of his patient. Dot. Just like he did with Kim Yurin, S.A.E. Jean poured in his mana. Flash. Not too long after that, around the waist area where his mana had permeated into, the bright blue light flashed suddenly. And that was the end of the treatment. It's finished. Try standing up, please. Kim S.A.E. Jean. E. Hai Rin quickly tidied up her messy clothes and slowly moved her legs. Oh. It's working. It's working. E. Hai Rin. With a deeply moved face, E. Hai Rin slowly got up. And after her treatment had concluded, this time it was Hazeline who hesitantly approached him. Seeing her with that trademark hood pulled over her head, she didn't seem injured, so S.A.E. Jean got confused. Miss Hazeline. Are you injured somewhere? S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, well, yo, you see, the thing is, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. However, she could only open and close her mouth like a goldfish and couldn't continue with what she wanted to say. Actually, she was scared of S.A.E. Jean finding her spotty head disgusting. She required various preparations before she could brave it, such as taking in deep breaths, taking Chong Simwen tablets, etc., etc. TL, a Chong Simwen, literally meaning clear mind pill, is a traditional Korean medicine that does what its name says. Apparently. Wikipedia has a page dedicated to it if you're curious. As she hesitated, though, E. Hyren's hands shot out and pulled down Hazeline's hood. Eek. Hey. You crazy bitch. Hazeline. Suddenly, the conference room fell into heavy silence. It was as if a ravenous something swallowed up all the noise. Within this lethal stillness, Hazeline stood there as stiff as a stone statue, cold sweat falling off her face. Ah, um, I'm sorry, Uni. E. Hai Rin. Uh, N, no, no, it's fine. I just got so surprised it's me who should apologize. I actually, you know, I don't curse, like, a lot. I, uh, I got really spooked I'm sorry. While the two of them were busy making up, Kim S.A.E. Jean was able to figure out the reason for Hazeline approaching him her rather bald head. He smirked a little and placed his hand on her head. And then, pat, pat. He gently patted her head. Ah. From Hazeline's dazedly hanging mouth, a short exclamation was fired out. I'm not sure about the length, but I've restored it to a certain degree. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled and spoke to her. Hazeline's two cheeks reddened deeply as she shyly nodded her head. However, Kim Yurin's knife-like glare stabbed into Hazeline's back, so her body shook greatly before she retreated to the back in a hurry. T. Thank you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Hazeline. No, I should thank you instead. By the way, Mr. Ju Ji Hyuk, are you feeling okay? S.A.E. Jean. Yes, I'm alright. Ju Ji Hyuk. Ju Ji Hyuk replied like a real man and took a big swig from a potion bottle. It's just internal injuries. Ho ho ho. Ju Ji Hyuk. What about you, Yu Bek Song? S.A.E. Jean. Why no honorifics when calling me? I'm also fine. Yu Bek Song. Yu Song stretched her body languidly and walked to her Kaiser II. After agreeing to hold meetings regularly once every week in order to counter the sudden counterattack from Bathory and her goons, the unexpected kidnapping incident had somehow been resolved. Of course, he couldn't avoid being struck in the face, chest, chin, stomach and his head by the sobbing USA Young. But since he received some accidental level up all of a sudden, one could say it got smoothed over all nice and easy in the end. It is regrettable, though. 
Current place was S.A.E. Jean's home, the one he hadn't been back to in a long while. Kim S.A.E. Jean brushed Yu S.A.E. Young's head lying on his lap while swallowing his frustration. Even with only 33% of knowledge, not only could he perform the instant transmission, he was also able to completely understand both the composition and the concept of the spells that formed the basis of this advanced sorcery. It was definitely correct to feel satisfied by this alone, yet, the thoughts of the degree of advancement reaching 50% if he had more time kept on popping up his head. Yu Yu. No way, nope. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean roughly shook his head and got rid of those thoughts. If he had more time, then he might have gotten utterly murdered by Bathory who would have recovered completely by then. So, there was no reason to get frustrated at all. It was then. The scheduled TV drama suddenly stopped and a breaking news filled up the screen instead. This is an emergency broadcast. A boss-level monster called Three-Headed Troll Ogre has made its appearance. It's a monster possessing two heads of an ogre and one head of a troll, and it is currently traversing the Kangwon province's monster field towards the residential area. Definitely, it was an extraordinary and quite a grave situation, but such an occurrence was seen as a common thing now. The notion of spotting a boss monster in a year being one too many had been long since forgotten. Currently, one appeared every three weeks or so like a clockwork. So, besides the monster's rather lengthy and convoluted name, there wasn't anything special about it. However, the next words of the anchor were more than enough to steal S.A.E. Jean's attention completely. Integrating other ogres found in the monster field and having formed an army, it is now understood that the three-headed troll ogre and its troops are currently marching towards the village of the hero orcs. Ha! Huh. Kim S.A.E. Jean opened his eyes widely. The village of the hero orcs. When he woke up from the daze, he realized that he had stood up abruptly. Quadang. Qu ouch. Thanks to that, USA Young ended up on the floor. SA Young. Seriously, what is it now, Appa? USA Young. No, uh, well, don't you need to go to work? SAE Jean. USA Young replied with a frown while rubbing her aching waist. I got some off days after finishing the Kararat raid yesterday, but why are you asking me that? TL, no idea what this Kararat is. Here's the original Korean word, a quick googling took me to curry recipes and stuff, which wasn't really helpful. Uh. Ah. Uh. No, it's nothing. S.A.E. Jean. What the? Don't tell me, you thinking of doing something dangerous again, aren't you? U.S.A.E. Young. She glared at him with questioning eyes. Although she was more or less on the mark, S.A.E. Jean shook his head in both hands in denial. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Where would I go when I have you come over here? Come, come. S.A.E. Jean. Do you take me for a puppy or something? Even though she spoke as much, U.S.A.E. Young still fell into S.A.E. Jean's arms without much trouble. S.A.E. Jean gently patted her back while he waited for her to fall asleep once more. Thankfully, she did catch her Z.S. pretty quickly due to being pooped out from the previous day's boss raid. S.A.E. Jean carefully laid her down on the couch and slowly got up. He wrote on a memo, something's come up by the guild. Be back soon, put on some appropriate clothing, and left the house. Seems that, for the first time in a long while, I'll get to act out as the orc. Since he might end up abusing his muscles a bit this time, he might as well stretch properly. As the hero orc, S.A.E. Jean walked the monster field while frowning in dilemma, wondering whether he should order the orcs to retreat or not. The mood of the monster field was same as always. Within this suffocating stillness, where the only sounds heard were winds brushing by the tree branches, a certain dangerous air of monsters popping out without a warning could be felt. However, this place was only the mid-tier hunting ground. For the hero or chieftain, there was no need for him to tense up at all. Before long, as he walked proudly like an emperor, he saw the entrance to the village over yonder. But, in front of the tightly shut gate, someone who was definitely not an orc a human woman, was standing there. Wearing an artifact-type coat that doubled as an armor on top of the Knight's Order's rather neat official attire, while a golden-colored weapon was tied to her hips. The sixth strongest knight in Korea, Kim Yurin. Surprised, Kim Sae Jin took a couple of steps back. 
She then sensed a presence nearby and with her hand reaching down to her hips, she turned around to look. Ah. Kume. A pair of short sound effects, denoting the fact that they had recognized each other. And so, a lady knight and an orc got to stare at each other one more time. Chapter, 148 The orc and the knight stared at each other for a long time. The winter winds blew and issued a chilly wail as they brushed past the barren branches. From the dim and grey sky, tiny snowflakes fell and melted even before they could meet the ground. And standing within the mother nature's deafening silence, just how long did their stillness continue? Dung. A nearly imperceptible vibration shook the ground. Ah. X, excuse me. The first one to show a reaction was Kim Yurin. She trotted towards the front of the orc and stood there. Probably because of these cold months making her face paler than usual, her slightly reddened cheeks seemed to stand out even more. An enemy will be arriving soon. It's an ogre so, it's like, two heads are ogres, and one head is a troll, so, uh, Kim Yurin. However, it seemed like she was at her wit's end trying to explain. Well, it was true that the boss's name was a bit on the cumbersome side. The three-headed ogre, or to be more precise, two ogre heads one troll head blackskin ogre that was its full title. And her troubles came from her trying to explain while excluding the English words that formed all the important nouns in its name. TL, okay, so, the author here wrote the boss's name in Korean as Romanist English words. When read, it still sounds like English words. Kim Yurin is trying to say the English word head and numbers with their corresponding Korean counterparts, but well, since I'm TLing it back to English, the tongue twisting she has to go through has been lost in the translation, so to speak. My bad. Ah woo. Why, yeah, so, I'm trying to say do you by any chance know what an ogre is? Kim Yurin. She gestured with her hands this way and that in sheer frustration, before deciding to explain the background information first. I know. S.A.E. Jean. Then, what about ogres being stronger with more heads and with darker skin tone? Kim Yurin. Phew oh oh. What a relief. Right now, an ogre with three heads, two heads out of three being that of ogres and the other one being a troll's, and on top of that, its skin completely black, an ogre with all these features, is heading this way. Kim Yurin. He already knew all these facts, but still, Kim Sae Jean took a look around anyway. He could only see the barren and eerie wintry scape as if all life had abandoned this place. Not one trace of humanity could be spotted at all. It's you only. Sae Jean. Eh. Ah, that's right. It is only me here. Kim Yurin. Humph. Humans, no fight the boss. Sae Jean. Ah, the thing is. Seeing how Kim Yurin was avoiding his gaze out of embarrassment, Sae Jean could roughly guess what had happened. The situation in Korea was rather difficult at the moment. After all, there were a total of three different boss monsters roaming around in the Korean peninsula right now the demon Minotauros near Pyongyang, a boss monster called Biharitbel near Busan, and this ogre in the monster field. If one were to calculate the threat level posed by these bosses, then the two near the residential areas of Pyongyang and Busan were a lot more urgent, indeed. No matter how much praise was heaped on the hero orcs, the Korean orcs, whatever at the end of the day, orcs were still orcs. The Korean government couldn't care any less on whether these orcs could survive or not rather, they were hoping that the orcs would delay the gigantic ogre and its army for as long as possible. Only human fighting, is you. Right? Sae Jean. Yes. That's correct. Kim Yurin. It was true that, when in the orc form, the tendencies and emotions of the orc were stronger, but still, he could understand their reasoning. More than likely, it was Kim Yurin who couldn't accept it, thus abandoning her orders and ended up coming all the way here. I suggest retreating from this place for now. We're currently building a trap between the border of the monster field and the city limits, so if you were to cooperate with us there Kim Yurin. No. Kim Sae Jin shook his head. Even if only death awaited them, no such thing as retreat existed for orcs. Besides, they wouldn't die from the likes of some measly ogres, too. We fight. Sae Jin. 
His voice was thick, charming and yet quite aloof as well. Kim Yurin could only gulp down her saliva and say nothing. The words she finally spat out after a lengthy and silent deliberation were something S.A.E. Jean fully expected from her. In that case, please allow me to aid you. Kim Yurin. She sounded tense, perhaps worried about being rejected. However, Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't say anything and walked towards the interior of the village. Realizing that this was him giving her the permission, Kim Yurin followed him in with a huge grin on her face. Entering the village after such a long time, they could see how greatly it had developed compared to before. Seeing the areas strictly separated into training facilities, food storage, residential areas, smithies, etc., etc., was a rather impressive sight. Even to the point where it was difficult to believe the orcs were solely responsible for all these advancements. Wow really, everything has advanced by so much. Genuinely impressed by what she could see, Kim Yurin took in the sights of the village with her eyes extra round. Kim Sae Jean walked in and called for the orcs to gather. Approaching with practiced discipline and a certain discernible dignity, the gathered orcs easily numbered past 1,000. Sae Jean swept his gaze over the orcs once, and shifted his gaze towards Kim Yurin. Receiving his intense gaze, her face reddened deeply, but she pretended to not notice it and simply twirled her poor hair around her fingers. S.A.E. Jean smirked and spoke. You, take command. See, I told you. No one's here. Bathory. Around the same time. Bathory surveyed the dark space she was in and spoke as if she was lamenting about something. The underground city that took so much effort and care to set up was no longer here, and the only thing left was completely, utterly desolate empty cavern. In other words, the Nisferatus had all fled to somewhere. As if they had planned for this in advance, not one trace of them remained here. So much so, it was difficult to believe that a city had existed in this cavern, even. My sincerest apologies, my lady. We should have suspected something, the moment they built a village underground to evade our lord's eyes. The voice of an elder tickled Bathory's earbuds. Yes, it was an elder. On the account of the purity of the bloodlines, placed above that of an apostle and just below her who just so happened to be the ruling class these were the elders. However, the voice of such a man was weak and pathetic. It wasn't because of the advanced age, either. If that was the case, then when admonishing the lackeys below him, his attitude should remain timid and weak as well. Your sincerest apologies. Bathory. Yes, yes, my lady. We are truly sorry. About what? Bathory. That is, that we fail to suspect. But why are you sorry? It's Nisferatu's who's at fault here. Bathory. Ah. Uh. Wait Evs. All you lot are just old and decrepit like a flock of beasts, aren't you? You lack backbone, you don't have pride no, wait. Maybe it's par for the course, since you don't have the necessary strength? Bathory. The day before, Bathory went to meet the vampire lord even if her actions could be seen as disrespectful. But he wasn't even there. Instead, one of the lord's faithful servants gave her an advice, better stop with the unnecessary questions. However, it was not easy to calm the ripples once it began to spread in her mind. At least, she would never be satisfied unless she dug the truth out with both her hands and feet, and confirm with her two eyes the truth that it's not true. Hey, everyone. Bathory. Bathory spoke to dozens of elders and apostles who had followed her into this cavern with the most beautiful voice imaginable. Utterly charmed by her, they couldn't even meet her gaze and bowed deeply. Unfortunately for them, Bathory was planning to force them into making the most difficult decision in their lives. Decide. Bathory. With the voice so beguiling that it could even charm a nightingale and make it swallow its own tongue, she carried on with some seriously shocking words. Decide, whether you will follow the Lord, or me. Bathory. This was tantamount to her declaring a rebellion. They were in this deep underground where the vampire lord's eyes couldn't reach, otherwise if they were in some wide open field somewhere, they might have died of thirst after losing control of their desire to drink blood. Well, the lord did possess the power to somehow control that particular instinct of all vampires, after all. B, but, Lady Bathory, that is. 
Everyone. It is regretful, but I well, I don't think I can wait until the fissure is fully opened up. Bathory. Suddenly, around the radius of 500 meters, a dark-colored mana spread out and rose up in a dome shape. It was a barrier preventing the vampires from escaping. So, here's the thing. I feel like I should at least let you in on a couple of things that might help you with making your choices. So, take a seat. Listen well to what I'm about to say, and make a wise decision afterwards, M.K. Bathory. Before anyone noticed it, a throne had appeared before her feet. Elders and apostles listened to her as they continued to grovel on the ground. Kim Yurin began her impassioned mission briefing in front of the gathered orcs. However, she was simply far too energetic for a knight about to face a huge scale battle. Most importantly, though, the subjects listening to her wholehearted explanations were orcs. Although these guys weren't really normal, orcs were only acknowledged to be slightly smarter than a killer whale, so. Ogres are the personification of destruction that will fight and kill even among themselves. But the sole reason why these ogres are uniting, is simply because of the boss ogre. Kim Yurin. She even resorted to drawing on the wall of the cave to illustrate her point a life form that might be the three-headed ogre, and smaller life forms resembling other ogres following the big one. When we kill the ogre leader, the rest will lose the bond that holds them together and will start fighting each other. Kim Yurin. The contents of the plan she was briefing the orcs on were rather simple. Ignore other ogres, and just defeat the boss. The big problem, though, was the fact that this boss ogre was an existence that exceeded common sense. The results arising from the detailed scientific analysis performed by monster researchers showed that, an ogre's strength would increase by four times with an addition of one more head. And this boss ogre had two more heads, so it was at least sixteen times more powerful than a regular ogre. And on top of this, another variable in the form of skin was added to the mix. An ogre was stronger the more achromatic its skin tone was. And the standard theory was that, the ogres with the colors on either end of the achromatic spectrum, white or black, were twice as strong as regular ogres with brown color. In other words, even with the most simplest calculations, this boss ogre was at least 32 times more powerful than a regular ogre. And to add further fuel to this unfortunate situation, one of the heads just so happened to belong to a troll. A troll, well known for its incredibly tenacious vitality that even made knights grit their teeth in frustration. Of course, it will be difficult. This boss ogre is unimaginably strong. However. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin shifted her gaze towards Sae Jean in his hero orc form and smiled deeply. However, it will be possible when everyone's powers, the prowess of your chief, and Kornlak is combined into one. Kim Yurin. An ogre ate twice a day. After the meal, for almost half a day, it would not budge from its spot. Meaning, there was at least one or two days of time left before the ogre army arrived near the village. Kim Yurin utilized this time to train the orcs as soon as the briefing came to an end. As if her training was harsh to the extreme, pitiful screams of orcs continued to ring out through the day. I should have come later. And right now, Sae Jean the orc was sitting in the chieftain's room while deeply regretting his decision. His fault was that, he didn't know of the ogre's living habits in detail until now. He really thought that these monsters would flood in crazily as exactly as their appearances suggested, but hell, who knew they liked taking so many breaks in between. Of course, thanks to that, he was afforded enough time to prepare. Also, it was really smart of him to bring along his mobile phone via spiritualization. USA Young, Appa, isn't this just too much? And why can't you answer your phone? You think a single memo is going to be enough? You think I'll stay here forever even after you treat me so poorly? I'm not trying to break up with you, so don't misunderstand me, okay? USA Young, no wait a minute. I take back what I said just now. I'm gonna stay right next to you like, forever. Even if Appa tells me to take a hike, I'll stay. Like a leech. S.A.E. Jean found it hard to type with his extra thick fingers. Unfortunately, he still needed to send his reply. I couldn't tell you, you were still asleep. Besides, why are you complaining so much when I said I got things to take care of? I should be back in two days time so stop annoying me with this. 
one more complaint, and I won't come back for a whole month. S.A.E. Jean. As he was still in his orc form, the reply was bit more brusque and sharper than usual. He thought her feelings might be hurt from this, but her reply arrived less than ten minutes later. And well, her attitude seemed a lot softer than previously. Sorry. It's just that, I got really surprised because you left without saying anything. By the way, are you angry at me for something I've done, Appa? USAE Young. No, I'm not. I really want to see you like crazy right now, so stop stimulating my thoughts, okay? SAE Jean. His words were rather rough in so many respects. An emoji of a hamster holding a heart eyeing, what the? E he. Got it, so hurry home. USAE Young. I'll be back as soon as I can. A heart emoji TL, LOL, an orc busy sending a heart emoji on his phone. Just picturing this scene cracks me up. As he finished up his reply, he could hear the gentle footsteps outside his room. SAE Jean quickly absorbed the phone back into his body. It was seriously lightning quick. Knock, knock. There was no need to knock, though since there was no door to begin with. What is it? SAE Jean. Kim Yurin's head peeked out from the edge when he spoke up. As if she just came out from a shower, her glistening, wet hair cascaded down. Where is Kornlak? Hearing her cautious questioning, SAE Jean lightly tapped the ground. Having been summoned earlier, Kornlak violently rushed into his cavern chamber. As soon as it entered, Kornlak jumped on top of Kim Yurin and began the attack of affection on her for a while. Dust rose up and dirt thickly permeated the air. S.A.E. Jean's brows narrowed deeply, and was about to shout out, when. Aha hot. Wait, wait. I got it, I got it, Kornlak. I said, I got it. He couldn't, after seeing Kim Yurin's bright smile and her happy expression. Chapter, 149 Eh. What do you mean? What contest? S.A.E. Jean. Nominally, it's an exhibition to see who has contributed to the society more, but is structured like a contest, sir. The government has made the official request just now. Apparently, they wish to comfort the citizens during this time of great unrest. Zhou Hansung. Kim Sae Jin used an excuse of him becoming restless when being idle to leave the village for a short while. Kim Yurin did annoy him by reminding him that they needed to install various traps soon, but when he asked for just one hour, she had no choice but to reluctantly let him go. Well, if the intentions are good, I won't say no, but. But, how will a contest like that help with comforting the masses? Sae Jin. He found a spot within the forest that had no people whatsoever, changed back to his human form. And the very first thing he did was to have a sort of reunion with USA Young over a period of 50 minutes over the phone now, the person on the line was Joe Hansung, who said he had business-related matters to discuss. And the main topic was hosting the monster's so-called exhibition for contributions to the society at large. Borrowing the name of exhibition, this contest's main aim was to take a closer look at the people within the five categories of magic, knights, art, alchemy, and society, and by sousing out who had contributed to the world at large the most, admit them in as the newest members of the Monster Guild. And if five categories proved to be a bit too much, then only the two of magic and knights. I thought the same initially, but after hearing them out, I believe it's plausible after all, sir. During this troubled times, this contest has the potential to become something that the citizens, even if it's only by a little bit, could become passionate about and be involved in. Zhou Hansung Well, if it turns out like that, then that will be wonderful, but will the citizens really focus on this contest? S.A.E. Jean No, it was dead certain they would focus on it. First of all, the process would be televised in full. However, to say they were going to rouse the depressed masses or some such when they were simply trying to find a new member for the guild, well, that kind of was embarrassing and not to mention, made him a bit hesitant as well. Yes, of course. Not just the country, I'm sure the world will focus on us, sir. Back then, when we picked director E. Eugene, fanbases were formed around those so-called strong favorites and they started fighting amongst each other, you see. 
As we will be officially announcing the candidates, I believe it will get far more heated this time around, sir. Zhou Hansung. Really? But still, wouldn't it be troublesome if this thing becomes too successful? I fear, we might end up receiving criticism about lowering the vigilance of the public or something. SAE Jean. The current climate is certainly quite depressing, but I believe being overly fearful is even worse, sir. Even the government thinks that, rather than the problem of vigilance, it is better to lower the excess amount of fear among the public. Zhou Hansung. Kim Sae Jean tilted his head. But, just by hosting an exhibition like this one, people's fears will lessen. Sae Jean. If we choose a few candidates as the new guild members, then we would be able to advertise nationwide that there are more than enough talented and hardworking knights or wizards in our country that are good enough to enter the monster. That should be good enough, sir. Zhou Han S. Ang. Aha. Hmm. In that case, all right, please go ahead. Sae Jean. Yes, sir. Will do. Ending the call there, Sae Jean spiritualized the phone into his body. And if he were to add in something slightly unnecessary here, the spiritualized mobile phone granted a rather peculiar ability to the person performing the technique. The words on the alert window was thus. A smartphone has been absorbed via spiritualization. By using the eyes of the host, photos and even video footage can be captured. Although it did sound kind of fun and slightly interesting, there was no other usage beside that. You're ten minutes late. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin's mouth pouted as if to pierce Sae Jean with them. He scratched the back of his neck and offered up an excuse that wasn't really an excuse. I can also be late. Sae Jean. Hmm. Fine. Let's get going already. To set the traps. Kim Yurin. Thankfully, she didn't complain unnecessarily. Kim Yurin simply grabbed his wrist tightly and moved her feet towards the area where the traps were to be installed. That's right, she was holding his wrist. Although this much skinship should be nothing, the person doing it being who she was, Sae Jean ended up feeling rather weirded out. Oh I I. Your plan, it will work. Sae Jean. So, he asked an unnecessary question deliberately, so he could pull his hand out at the same time. However, she held his wrist with an unexpectedly strong grip and he couldn't free himself. Yes. You don't have to worry. The odds of our victory are far greater than our defeat, actually. And since foot soldiers are fighting foot soldiers, and leaders are fighting the leaders, the casualties should be minimized greatly as well. Kim Yurin. The contents of the plan Kim Yurin was talking about with a healthy smile went something like this. According to the detection radar of TM, it was suspected that the Ogre army consisted of 5,060 individuals that formed marching columns of 10. And the three-headed ogre was accompanied by four two-headed ogres that acted like its royal guards, supposedly showing off the majesty of the commander in the middle of these marching columns. However, ogres were known for their low intelligence. That was why, Kim Yurin decided to go with the most basic tactic of them all traps and ambushes. Firstly, traps. Using the labor skills of the orcs, pits would be dug out, and then, a portion of the ogre army would be drawn there. Even though an ogre with two heads wouldn't fall into an obvious trap since it was marginally smarter, an ogre was still an ogre at the end of the day. Beat it up good and make it taste more pain than it could handle, then the rage would cause that intelligence to drop to the rock bottom, and the ogre would follow the bait nice and easy. No other things to do, beside that one. Sae Jean. Yes. We'll build only build traps for today and return. Kim Yurin. Twenty minutes of walking later, Kim Yurin and the orc army arrived near the vicinity of a river. Creation of pitfall traps, where the ground was dug out and sharp spikes installed at the bottom, was done in a jiffy. As expected of the outstanding labor skills of the orcs that even made monster researchers astonished. It's finished. Kim Yurin. The final step, covering up the pitfalls with grass also came to an end really quickly. Kim Yurin declared leisurely while wiping away sweat drops on her forehead. Satisfaction and happiness were quite evident on her beaming face, but Sae Jean's feelings were a bit different from hers. 
No matter what, this whole place screamed this here is a trap, so this was kinda. Kinda shabby. S.A.E. Jean. It's going to be fine. Because of their big bodies, ogres don't pay attention to what's underneath their feet, anyway. Kim Yurin. Hmm. When S.A.E. Jean the orc surveyed the covered up traps with unsure face, Kim Yurin told him not to worry and slapped his back. It's going to be fine, so let's go back. I'm tired. Kim Yurin. After that, she again grabbed S.A.E. Jean's wrist and began leading him away. As if to prevent him from yanking his hand away, her grip was really tight. Seeing this, her action was definitely not subconscious, but deliberate. S.A.E. Jean chuckled and rather than pulling away, grabbed her hand instead. Ah. Uh. Her face reddened in a blink of an eye, at least initially, but soon enough, it was dyed in the colors of agony next. Ah uh, ah. Uh. Ah, uh, wa, what are you doing? Hey, it hurts. I said, this hurts. Kayak. It's gonna break, break. The orc, the orc caught me. Kim Yurin. Obvious. Orcs catch people. TL, sigh. Yet another pun based joke that doesn't work when TL'd into English. Well, I tried and failed again. Here, catch, in Korean is supposed to imply to kill. Ee, -e eek. The sight of her calling out for other orcs and even Cornlack's help was quite pitiful. Orcs returned to their village completely fatigued from the installation of pitfall traps. They pulled out unidentified meat from the food storage, grilled it and consumed it. Then, some sparred for a while, before retiring to their sleeping quarters. However, Kim Yurin, who was definitely not an orc, didn't have her own place. So, she found a suitably quiet spot on the cavern's floor and lied down while using Cornlack's belly as her pillow. Even if she was a trained knight, it still was a cold place to get a shut eye. Hmm. S.A.E. Jean. As he was exiting his own dwelling in a bit of hurry to make an urgent phone call, S.A.E. Jean discovered her like sleeping this, so he brought along a thick blanket from somewhere and covered her with it. But the senses of a knight were always alert as soon as the blanket covered her, Kim Yurin's eyes opened up halfway. The sight of a flustered orc filled up those pair of jewel like eyes. Kim Yurin quietly studied him for a bit of time, before smiling lazily and spoke in a sleepy voice. I was feeling really cold just now, so. Thank you. Kim Yurin. Her gentle smile and drowsy eyes caused his heart to skip a beat, but Sae Jean the orc did his best to indifferently nod his head and returned to the chieftain's quarters. No, he tried to, before something caught his eye. And that was a stuffed doll of an orc, peeking out from a leather bag by Cornlack's tail. Unaware of the situation, the grinning Kim Yurin followed his gaze and looked towards where he was staring at. Then, with a short but loud scream of awk. She jumped up in the air and hurriedly took away the doll. I, I, I didn't bring it here, you know. One of the orcs made it for me, you see. Kim Yurin. One of my orcs. S.A.E. Jean. Ye, yes. His skill was really great, especially for an orc. Kim Yurin. That, looks like me. S.A.E. Jean. The appearances of Kim S.A.E. Jean's orc form and other orcs had distinct differences. It was to the point where a dumbass monkey would end up thinking, oh, he must be their leader, or even, why is he more handsome than the others? Just as E. Hyrin alluded to in the past, his appearance was indeed better than certain sections of humanity. Completely, definitely, it's not you. Seriously, you must be suffering from the Prince Syndrome. T.L., the author wrote which is a slang term that doesn't have any direct translation. The closest I can think of is Princess Syndrome but since the MC isn't a girl, I changed it Prince instead. She stealthily hid the leather bag behind her. Okay. Then. S.A.E. Jean. He smirked and returned to the chieftain's quarters. She must have thought she made a good excuse, since he could hear her sighs of relief coming from behind him. And after S.A.E. Jean returned to his quarters, it took a considerable amount of time before he realized that he was actually trying to go outside in order to make a phone call. They come. S.A.E. Jean. In the far off distance, even if one didn't open their eyes wide, the gigantic silhouettes could still be spotted. 
a casual glance was enough to determine that their numbers easily exceeded 60. Although it was only 60 in number, ogres were powerful high-level monsters that lived in the upper mid-tier hunting grounds and above. It was not easy to fight against a single roaming ogre, so seeing that many of them in one spot, even if they weren't all that well organized, was enough to make Kim Yurin tense up. Have you gotten familiarized with the plan? Kim Yurin. Yes. S.A.E. Jean. Right in the middle of the somewhat sloppy ten-man marching columns of the ogres, an ogre with a specially humongous body stood tall. Three heads and jet black skin it was extremely rare to see ogres possessing either one of those features, yet this greedy bastard had them all. Once that ogre army arrives at the predetermined location, 950 hero orcs would appear from both flanks and distract them, which should cause around 40 ogres to break the formation. When that number broke loose from the formation, then it would be the turn of Kim Yurin, riding on top of Kornlak. She would gift enormous amount of pain on the boss ogre and its lackeys, thereby luring them into the ambush location where S.A.E. Jean and his company were waiting. Afterwards, they would kill off those annoying small fries first, and when the boss ogre was the only one left, Kim Yurin would use her trait to knock it out for around one minute. Then, everyone would attack it. Knocking it out, you confident? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Although it was just a summon, I did knock out a leviathan for five minutes in the past. To be precise, it wasn't knocking it out but making it fall asleep, though. Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean the orc nodded his head. Since he personally witnessed that scene, there was no need to question her. Then, I should be on my way. You should also get to the ambush location as well. Kim Yurin. Wait. S.A.E. Jean. Just as Kim Yurin grasped the reins of Kornlak. Before you go, take. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean handed over a pennant featuring the insignia of the hero orcs to her. It was one of those super expensive passive artifacts that boosted the performance of the person simply by having it on the body. A sign, you, our comrade. S.A.E. Jean. Ah. Kim Yurin dazedly looked at the pennant, before gently receiving it with both her hands and she brought it to her chest. Thank you. Kim Yurin. SFX for a loud calling of a horn. It was at this very moment when the horn of an orc great warrior blew. With that as the signal, orcs moved towards their assigned positions in a swift, disciplined manner. 950 warriors divided into two equal halves and went to left and right, while the remaining 50 orcs carefully made their way towards the location where Kim Yurin was to lure in the boss ogre. Please go ahead and wait for me. Kim Yurin. As her eyes got wet by the depths of her emotions, she climbed aboard Kornlak and headed off towards the battlefield. There was virtually no change to the low intelligence of the ogres the battle unfolded exactly as Kim Yurin had planned. Around 40 or so ogres got split up and fell into the pitfall traps, while the boss ogre got struck real hard by Kim Yurin, and unable to calm its overwhelming rage, it crazily chased after her. They come. Get ready. S.A.E. Jean. Twenty paces. Twenty paces later, and twenty-odd ogres would arrive where S.A.E. Jean was. He spoke to other orcs and took in a deep breath. Kong, 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 Kong. Numerous and chaotic footsteps no doubt, the two-headed ogres and the three-headed boss ogre were mixed up in there. S.A.E. Jean closed his eyes and left his body to the five senses, with the notable exception of his sight. Well, to be perfectly clear, the gigantic bodies of ogres were too big for his eyes to fully capture, anyways. So, the closer he got to these monsters, the greater hindrance his vision would become. T.L., hmm, I'm not so sure about that. Sensing the incoming enemies with his entire being, S.A.E. Jean grasped his mace tightly. He drank the spiritualized goblin's rage potion and activated the warrior of reversal, as well. Kong, Kong, Kong. As his senses expanded, their footsteps became slower and slower. Kong, Kong, Kong. And so, when he heard the third footstep. Pouring all his soaring might and overflowing rage, he swung his mace as hard as he could at the ankle of the ogre that was about to go past him. Kwahahang. The destructive strike possessing the terrifying might utterly smashed apart the ankle of a two-headed ogre in one swing. 
Losing one of its legs, this ogre collapsed on the ground, and many orcs descended upon the fallen creature. However, Kim Sae Jin's eyes remained closed. The hero orc's body was glowing in bright red, and his mace swung out in search for yet another victim. Kwahang. A huge shock wave shook the entire mountainside. Chapter 150 Although the orc chieftain's body was far smaller than an ogre's, his battle prowess was, simply put, overwhelming. Whenever his mace came in contact with the flesh of ogres, their limbs and bits of the body would be ripped asunder. When the mace hit the ground, a deep crater was formed. And even when swung in the empty air, the mace created powerful ripples of shock waves that danced like crashing waves. Since the most powerful combat force of the ogre army, the boss ogre, was tied up by Kim Yurin riding on the back of Kornlak, the overall battle situation was greatly favoring the orcs. Right now, 51 orcs were busy beating down on 20-odd ogres, and more importantly, these orcs were not just ordinary monsters either. It's going well. S.A.E. Jean. From just about everywhere, grotesque sounds of maces hitting flesh and the said flesh being ripped off resounded out, non-stop. And as the time continued to flow on, sounds of giant things crashing down to the ground intermittently shook the world. That was the countless ogres falling down while leveling the trees of the forest. As more and more ogres fell, fifty-one orcs became progressively more drunk by the sweet taste of victory and moved even more energetically. Thirty minutes later. They only required thirty minutes to kill off all the other ogres besides the boss. To kill twenty ogres, only nineteen orcs lost their lives in the process. Only then, Kim Yurin stopped circling around the boss ogre to infuriate it, and climbed off Kornlak's back. Kong, 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 Kong. In front, the boss ogre was rushing towards her direction while blowing his top off with boiling rage, and behind her, orcs covered in ogre blood were getting ready for the final showdown. Everyone, block the boss ogre, please. Kim Yurin. The initial battle had ended only about a second ago, yet, with a single word from her, the orcs madly dashed towards the boss ogre. And as they delayed the boss, she readied her gungnir. The pure white blade shined in brilliant golden light as it morphed into a spear-like shape. The purpose of this attack was simple. One minute of unconsciousness. Normally, a minute was a really short amount of time, but it was a different story during a battle. No one would dare to assign a value to one minute of time during an intense battle like this one. However, unexpectedly, mana contained within her entire body got sucked out into her weapon. This meant that it was not possible to carry out her purpose, so Kim Yurin had no choice but to withdraw her mana back from Gungnir. But, why? Mana she couldn't withdraw in time left her body for good, and her remaining reserve was only 50%. She didn't do anything, yet ended up losing half of her fighting strength, in other words. Obviously, she couldn't comprehend this situation. Her trade allowed her to put a summoned leviathan to sleep for five minutes, yet why couldn't she do the same to an ogre? Kuak. The screams of orc warriors floated into the stupefied Kim Yurin's ears. While she remained dazed, time marched on and orcs were getting killed. If I no longer have teeth, then I will use my gums. Just as she resolved herself and gritted her teeth. From behind the giant ogre, a cute life form flapped its wings and flew up into the air. It was a familiar enough shape to instantly rouse her anger simply by looking at it. And it was none other than the same bastard that stole away her mana when she was trapped. Underground with the orc. The Korean crow tit, that white bird. That fker. Kim Yurin. They said enemies would encounter each other in the middle of a narrow bridge. She so badly wanted to pluck out every single feather off that thing and barbecue it right there and then. But Kim Yurin did her best to calm her trembling hands and her madly pounding heart. For now, she really needed to take care of the boss ogre first. She poured mana back into Gungnir once more. She didn't bother with placing a purpose this time around. No, all she wanted to do was to pour every drop of remaining mana into her weapon and pierce the heart of the boss, that was all. Woo woo woo. Gungnir resonated with her mana and glistened brightly in golden light. Emitting a divine aura and causing tremors to break out on the ground, the Gungnir fired off a single white line of blinding energy beam. Kijitsch. 
the firing and hitting the target happened almost simultaneously. The heart of the three-headed ogre was penetrated in an instant, and S.A.E. Jean the Orc, who had timed his jump to perfection, poured all his strength into the mace and fiercely struck the back of one of its heads. Without a doubt, Kim Yurin's lethal attack on the boss's chest wasn't going to be enough. However, it was now combined with the terrifyingly fierce strike from S.A.E. Jean as well, so the ogre didn't even have the chance to show off its infamously tenacious vitality. SFX for a pathetic roar of a dying monster. In the end, the boss ogre issued a low cry as it slowly collapsed on the ground. Following that, excited roars of the orc spread throughout the mountainside. No, wait. It's not over. Kook. Kim Yurin. However, it was still early for the victory celebration. She needed to let the orcs know. Unfortunately, Kim Yurin could only grasp near her heart and fall to her knees. It was an adverse side effect of extracting too much mana all at once. Thankfully, though, the words she wanted to say, S.A.E. Jean shouted out loudly instead. It's not over yet. Oi, you okay? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean approached Kim Yurin while maintaining the orc's vigilance. Yes, I'm Finn. Kim Yurin. At that moment, Kim Yurin dazedly froze up. Soon afterwards, a huge shadow was cast over his head and to the ground. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly turned around, and found the boss ogre with its eyes shooting out chillingly dangerous light throwing a punch that burned with intense jet black energy. S.A.E. Jean pulled Kim Yurin into an embrace and immediately retreated from there. Kwahang. Fortunately, the boss's attack was one step late. Unfortunately, right in that moment, towards the direction he had retreated, a breath attack rushed in. Kya. Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean quickly chucked Kim Yurin away to a far-off distance with a strength that could easily throw her several mountains over, and evaded the breath. However, this breath attack curved around the corner and followed his path of retreat. At the same time, the swift punch of the three-headed ogre flew in as well. Funnily enough, the boss's punch should have been a lot slower than this. But it was not so. Even the monster's eyes gleamed differently. They were far more violent and oppressive than ever before. Only then did he remember. One or two fortunate trolls, when somehow surviving the near-death experience, would go on a rampage akin to going through the terminal lucidity. SHT. The destructive fist came flying in along with the breath attack. If S.A.E. Jean evaded the fist, then he'd be struck by the breath, and if he evaded the breath, then it would be the fist, instead. However, there was one other option left to choose. And the instincts of the orc pulled S.A.E. Jean towards this choice. Firstly, he increased the flow of blood within his body. Then, at the same time, he used the skill warrior of reversal and overlapped it with the increased blood flow. And finally, he added in the increased physical strength and defense he gained from the Bathory woman. This was the essence of purely chasing after the most powerful physical body attainable. And this feeling gave the most profound sense of enhancement ever felt in his entire life, to the slave creature born only to fight the orc. Firmly standing on the ground, he began to endure the breath attack that came washing over him. Because he was rescuing Kim Yurin, he had to discard his mace some time ago. But that didn't matter anymore. Just his bare fist was enough. Kwahahang. The fists of the ogre and the orc collided in the air. A huge explosion blew up like a blinding lightning where the two fists met and dyed the world in pure white, while the ground below disintegrated without a trace. Nothing could be seen. But still, Kim S.A.E. Jean felt the ogre's arm in contact with his fist slowly disintegrate as well, and he closed his eyes. Condition cleared, commitment and sacrifice. The monster form, the orc chieftain will be upgraded to the great orc chieftain. Acquired the orc's unique skill, the essence of the orc. The essence of the orc resonates with Bathory's muscle composition bone density, as well as the mana body. Special property, the most pure divine body, will be. Kim S.A.E. Jean's eyes slowly opened within the blurry darkness. That goddamn white bird. Seeing that the first thing he did was to get angry, it looked like he was still in his orc form. But there were lots of problems he could blink just fine, but his body wouldn't budge an inch. 
Perhaps this was the expected result, after having been hit by the boss ogre as well as taking a breath bath all over his body. Hmm. His voice still managed to leak out, somehow. Suddenly, he got curious. He did fight to the death with the boss ogre, but what happened to that white bird? That bastard's body seemed to have gotten a little bit bigger than before, too. Yawn. He felt sleepy and a yawn came out all on its own. He rolled his eyes somehow and took a look at his own body that resembled a charcoal. This was on the level of a miracle, him surviving all of that. It seemed that he had unconsciously used up as much as thirty healing potions in one go, judging by the alert window for the spiritualization that said 90100. And just how much time passed by since then. Suddenly, he thought of something else. This might be the good time to retire the orc chief, isn't it? Currently, the most useful monster forms had been set in stone already. Even though this form had evolved into the great chieftain, this was the limit for the orc as a species. So, it made sense to utilize the limitless leviathan form as well as the lycanthrope that had near endless potential all of the time from now on. As an aside, he had given up on his goblin form a long time ago. But, before he could do that, there was one sticking point to consider. Kim Yurin. She had this special, feeling towards the orc. And he couldn't tell exactly what type of feeling this was. He could only suspect that it was a bit deeper than friendship or loyalty felt towards one's comrades. Beside all of that, though the one thing he had to do first, was. For now, I should really go home. S.A.E. Jean. He had no idea how many days had passed since the battle. And there was someone waiting for him back home. S.A.E. Jean changed into the Leviathan form and summoned up what little mana he had left to activate the sorcery. Dot. The destination for his instant transmission was the underground secret conference room. He came here, since USAE Young might get shocked by his sudden intrusion although she knew that he could change into the Leviathan already. Other forms were still a secret from her, though. It was only a day. SAE Jean. As soon as he arrived, he checked the calendar first, yet it only had been a day. What a relief that was. Breathing out a sigh of relief, S.A.E. Jean fell back down on the couch, and as sleep slowly encroached on him, he thought about calling you S.A.E. Young on the phone. You've returned. Mommy. S.A.E. Jean. He got shocked out of his slumber by a foreign voice greeting from somewhere and hurriedly shot up from the couch. The voice belonged to Lilia. Wah, what the hell? What are you doing in here? S.A.E. Jean. We ran away. Our plan failed, after all. Lilia. Ah, uh, aha. And also, Mr. S.A.E. Jean personally told us this as well to re-establish our sanctuary below the monster's grounds and continue living in the meantime. Lilia. She came closer while talking to him, and handed over a bottle of potion. You shouldn't sleep like that. Please, drink a potion before falling into a slumber. Lilia. Oh, uh. Thanks. S.A.E. Jean. Gulp, gulp. Since he drank a potion, he thought might as well, and switched on the TV. During the short news broadcast informing the viewers about the chaos near Pyongyang being taken care of, the incident related to the orc came on and took up the top billing. In short, Kim Yurin had survived, thankfully. Apparently, Kornlak had rescued her amidst the explosion that resembled a nuclear warhead going off, caused by the breath attack and two fists violently colliding. The end result was that a radius of 10 kilometers around the blast area had become nothing but ash and collapsed into utter ruin. In other words, the fate of the remaining orcs were unknown. Did they all perish? S.A.E. Jean felt his chest tighten after hearing the news. That's causing quite a bit of chaos at the moment. I hear that the orc sacrificed himself to kill a dangerous boss monster. Lilia. Ha, ha. Miss Hazeline was really stunned when she heard the news, saying what if you really died there? All the media outlets are reporting that the orc chieftain and the boss ogre engaged in a bitter battle to the death and both died in the end. Lilia. Kim S.A.E. Jean stared at Lilia and smirked. Tell them to alter chieftain to great chieftain instead. S.A.E. Jean. Foot. Lilia's eyes slightly arched up. 
SAE Jean's brows narrowed instead, seeing her relaxed reaction. Hang on. Why are you smiling like that as if you knew already? SAE Jean. Did I do that? Lilia. What the? So you really knew about it already? SAE Jean. You can think of it any way you like. Well, please excuse me. I have too many matters to attend to. Lilia. She got up from her seat after handing over a mobile phone to him. Also, you should not forget to call the madam of the house. Lilia. On a particularly clear afternoon, SAE Jean paid a visit to Kim Yurin's hospital room. As soon as he cracked open the door, he spotted Cornlack, its body much smaller now. He sent a mental order to the wolf, telling it to act like it hadn't recognized him. Cornlack loyally carried out his order and remained lying down on the floor. Oh, hello Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Nice to see you again. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin greeted him with a bright smile that was completely out of his expectations. Flustered slightly, S.A.E. Jean sat down on a nearby sofa while feeling rather disappointed for some reason. How are you feeling? S.A.E. Jean. I'm feeling fine, thank you. Kim Yurin. That's a relief. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean replied in confusion and shifted his gaze to the LED TV screen. Contents regarding the hero orc were on at the moment. And probably because of the program, not much of a conversation happened between the two of them. S.A.E. Jean was cautiously observing the situation, while Kim Yu Rin was looking at the TV with a healthy smile on her face. The chieftain of the hero orcs is believed to have lost his life during the Great Explosion. Countless citizens, saddened by the loss, have formed lengthy queues to pay respects, and while listening to the anchor's voice, S.A.E. Jean mustered up enough courage and asked Kim Yurin. That orc, did he really die? S.A.E. Jean. Nope. Her swift and assured answer surprised Kim S.A.E. Jean. While clutching her right fist tightly, she continued. Definitely, he's alive somewhere. Kim Yurin. Then, she looked at him and smiled brightly. He belatedly discovered the orc's pennant clutched within her right hand. He, too, smiled along with her. Oh, that's right. Guildmaster. Kim Yurin. Yes. Winds gently blew in from the open windows and scattered her hair like the falling and dancing petals of a cherry blossom tree. As he was thinking, how beautiful, she spoke to him in a resolute voice. Maybe, just maybe, I'm asking you, but. Do you still wish to seduce me? Kim Yurin. I beg your pardon. Chapter, 151. Do you still wish to seduce me? Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean needed full five minutes before he finally deciphered that her fleeting words were actually concerning the guild. And that only came about thanks to the brightly smiling Kim Yurin clearing up the air after she saw S.A.E. Jean completely freezing up. About the guild, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. The guild. Just what were you thinking about? Kim Yurin. Aha. He cleared his throat with a couple of fake coughs. He got quite embarrassed by the thoughts that were swimming in his mind just now and cold sweat drops trickled down the back of his neck. But, why so suddenly? Didn't you refuse resolutely back then, since you were to become the next order master of the Raven? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean asked her, and Kim Yurin replied in a whisper, her expression slightly bitter. I've received disciplinary action. For disobeying the orders. One can't become an order master for a government-run knight's order if he or she has a disciplinary record. No, even holding on to the position of the highest tier knight will become uncertain as well. Kim Yurin. That was probably the result of the incident related to the orc. Although she did successfully defeat the boss ogre, that didn't mean she had the right to disobey the orders from the higher-ups and disregard the rules and regulations of the knight's order. He didn't dig in deeply, choosing to simply smile and nod his head. Yes, we'll be delighted, for sure. And it's a good timing too, since we're in the middle of picking new members as well. S.A.E. Jean. Ha. Huh. E, excuse me. Wait a minute, are you saying I must participate in that contest, too? Kim Yurin. Slightly flustered, Kim Yurin tilted her head while her eyes opened up extra round. 
He dazedly wondered what this woman was on about, before assuming a relaxed smile. But, of course. The thing about the guild master personally recommending someone, that has ended a long time ago, so I wonder what Miss Yurin wants from me now. Besides, didn't you say that your rank as the highest tier knight is in a precarious position? If you drop from your tier, then well, do I even have a reason to accept you in the first place? S.A.E. Jean. Eh. No, wait. What are you even? Saying Kim Yurin. She pouted to show her slight dissatisfaction. However, since it was quite clear who the person handing out the dough was, all she could do at that moment was to complain softly to herself. But I even helped you out and back then, you were the one begging me Kim Yurin. Well, the circumstances have changed a great deal since then. Our guild, the monster, isn't an organization you can just waltz into, just because you want to. Oh, you heard of the overseas order called Veritas. Did you know that the Order Master of the Veritas even asked us about joining the guild recently? S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin narrowed her eyes as thinly as a flatfish, her cheeks puffing up greatly. Her facial expression seemed to say I'm really unhappy right now. Although it was very cute and all that. So, are you planning to enter the contest? Or are you not going to? Ah, that's right. If I were to explain all the benefits the guild members receive as an aside you receive a basket of highest grade potions every month with the guild membership card. You can rent out up to three artifacts from TM's artifact shop free of charge and once a year, you're given the first refusal on the orc blacksmith's wares SAE Jean. Kim SAE Jean continued to mutter out a list of benefits that would prove fatally attractive for either a knight or a wizard no, a person living in the troubled current times. Kim Yurin's face started off pouting, but the more she heard, the wider her eyes and mouth became. Honestly speaking, that was an amazing amount of stuff being offered. Only now had she finally realized why all those knights kept on singing on and on about the monster, all the bloody time. And finally, if you want one, the magic tattoo SAE gene. Even before he could finish his words, Kim Yurin hurriedly grasped both of his hands. I'll, I will participate. Kim Yurin. Her voice was clear, confident, and most importantly, deeply determined. With many corporations, knights' orders, and even wizard towers participating, the exhibition held by the monster was able to draw out an explosive amount of attention from the public, as expected. And probably because the three boss monsters causing chaos in the country had been subjugated right before it started, the whole country talked about nothing else other than the exhibition. All the internet portal sites, TV networks, newspapers, and even SNS the categories were only knights and wizards, but in the country of Korea at the moment, these two were the most important professions there could be. For now, it was the middle of the public voting cast by the citizens of the entire country. This was the popular vote chosen by the public after the professional judges narrowed the potential list of candidates down to top 200. 198 candidates agreed to participate in the exhibition, and from there, a total of 60 people 30 per category were chosen as the final candidates. TL, Few, Boy. This whole paragraph was a nightmare to TL. Had to rejig quite a few bits to make it all fit sensibly in English. Sure enough, the fights between several fan bases of popular candidates became truly intense, and most SNS and community chat rooms soon morphed into arenas of fierce verbal warfare by the ardent fans. However, the clear favorite would always emerge even from under such situations. I am not really good with things like this, but I ask you for your generous support. Please, vote for me. Kim Yurin. With the support of her pure and beautiful face, it was none other than Kim Yurin, doing her own PR work while looking rather bashful by the occasion. On the other hand, SAE Jean ended up getting busier and busier as the interest towards the exhibition exploded crazily upwards. Well, it was only right that he worked hard and saw the thing to the end, since he did start this whole affair, after all. He performed several interviews, broadcasts, speeches in public stages, etc., etc. He poured over eight hours every day on matters related to the contest exhibition. Ah, and this will be the final question. Well, let us take a look at Miss Kim Yurin's promo footage. Inside a certain cafe that was completely rented out by a TV station, 
dozens of cameras were focused on one particular man, and just outside the cafe, a huge crowd of people were looking inside through the thick windows. Of course, this was all because of Kim Sae Jean, the interviewee. I am not really good with things like this, but I ask you for your generous support. Please, vote for me. What do you think about Knight Kim Yoo Rin, who is deeply entrenched in the first spot within the Knight category at the moment? Odd, looks like Guild Master has been already won over, after seeing your reactions. The reporter asked him while playing the clip of Kim Yoo Rin's promotional video. This was the final question of the final scheduled interview for the day. Feeling like the liberation he craved for was just around the corner, SAE Jean replied as lightheartedly as possible. I haven't focused on the candidate Kim Yurin specifically. In all honesty, Miss Yurin isn't really my type, you see, ha ha ha. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. I simply think that all the candidates participating are equally amazing individuals, that's all. SAE Jean. Oh, oh. Do you mean, you won't fall for a honey trap, is that it? Well, that is true, but the truth is, it isn't me who gets to choose the new members of the guild this time, but it's up to the public to decide, isn't it? SAE Jean. As expected of the guild master. Ah, there is also something else. Honestly, I'd like to ask you one last final question. By any chance. SAE Jean was about to get up from his seat as soon as the final question was answered, but the darn reporter fired off his next question like a machine gun. Just where on earth could anyone find the so-called last, in the final, question but he was being surrounded by cameras right now? SAE Jean did his best to soften the rapidly hardening face and replied as sincerely as he could. SAE Jean finally returned home after clearing up his schedules. But unfortunately, what waited for him there was, rather coldly enough, yet more work. The Kraken again. SAE Jean. Yes, sir. This time, it's Japan. The so-called it item, and going through a huge explosion in popularity currently, was the services of Sarong, that any nation who cared for its citizens must purchase at least once landlocked countries excluded, of course. Sarong was the name of SAE Jean's Kraken weirdly enough, countless citizens in many countries readily accepted this somewhat romantic name. That name ended up having an unexpected PR benefit, somehow. Right away. Yes sir. They say the situation is quite urgent there. So, they promise to pay twice the regular compensation. Seriously, do they think this is some sort of nighttime discount or something? Well, it doesn't matter to me either way, but I wonder if Sarang can endure any more of this SAE gene. He was speaking nonsense, of course. He could simply summon it and send the darn kraken on its way, just like that. But there was a reason why SAE Jean was deliberately hesitating the guilty party was a set of very seductive lingerie USAE Young was wearing in front of him at that very moment. If he were to summon Sarang, then until the kraken's job was finished, SAE Jean had to change and remain in the leviathan form. Obviously, he would have to give up on enjoying the pleasures of his human form in the meantime. It's all right. Actually, I want to see the Azure Dragon more than Opera right now. It's so cute, you know. USAE Young. What? SAE Jean. Suddenly, she pushed for the dispatch of the Kraken quite inexplicably. Hey, whose side are you on? SAE Jean. Haha, <laughs> kidding, just kidding. But still, the safety of the Japanese citizens is hanging in the balance, right? It's definitely correct to take care of that first. I mean, when Appa starts our thing, you last two to three hours at minimum, after all. USAE Young. She tightly hugged his back and whispered to his ear. But what made him feel pretty good wasn't that hug, but her words lasting two to three hours at minimum, dot. Those words easily stroked his pride as a man and of course, the flames of his ego. He, Hyung. Right can't be helped. It'll last for over two hours, after all. Right, right. Within the darkened ruins that once served as Nisferatu's sanctuary, restoration work was being performed under the orders of Bathory. She decided to utilize this place as her new headquarters. And so, vampires were busy using magic to restore the fallen buildings, build brand new residential structures, and other construction work at the moment. 
You're saying that Squid also belongs to Kim Sae Jin. Bathory. Of course, the person responsible for ordering the massive construction project was comfortably lying on a couch while watching the TV. She was watching the news broadcast concerning the activities of a kraken with a somewhat embarrassing name called Saran. Yes, that is correct, my lady. It's like he has everything I want to own, you know. Maybe his hobby is similar to mine or something. Heck, I also wanted to possess that white tiger he was with, too Bathory. The news regarding the kraken ended fairly quickly. And it was so adorable, too Bathory licked her lips and expressed emotions of wanting to see more, but was unable to. However, the next piece of footage then showed off a news that inflamed her interest far more greatly than the previous article could ever do. Currently, the total number of votes cast by the public in the monster's exhibition now exceeds 10 million. This is the monster the world-renowned guild that even the word guild wasn't a good enough fit to describe it. And the head of that guild was Kim Sae Jin. Bathory recalled the acute recollection of the fine past. Quite unexpectedly, back when she tore into him and he tore into her. Those days when they were vicious and so beast-like. Hey, wait a sec. Didn't you say something about one of my wizards being undercover there as a candidate? Isn't she a bit famous or something? Bathory. Ma'am. Ah, uh, oh, yes, that is correct. She's called Emil Riru of the Great Wisdom and it's the cover identity of the Apostle Riyahimail, my lady. According to human's grading system, she's A class, in other words, a high tier wizard. She disguised herself as an elf. Bathory. Yes, my lady. Hmm. Bathory rubbed her chin and fell into a deep chain of thought. Nowadays, something was weird about the way the vampire lord moved around. No, instead of calling it weird well, he hadn't shown up at all lately. Bathory trusted her instincts greatly, and right now, she could smell something very rotten coming from the lord's camp. It was even more smellier than a clogged up sewer. And more importantly, Kim Sae Jean's eyes that were filled with unshakable confidence when he said, The Lord will betray you. That weighed on her mind the most. Okay, let's do this. I'll enter the exhibition disguised as her. It's easier than drinking cold soup for me to change my face with magic, see? Bathory. Yes. Yes. Wah, what do you mean by that, my lady? The apostle couldn't even speak properly after he got stunned from her sudden declaration. In this critical time, as the fissure was nearing the complete unsealing, just how many times did she have to act out of control? I've got things to talk about with that conceited BD, Kim Sae Jean, you see. And besides if all goes well, we can even cooperate together, too. Bathory. The fissure opening in full and becoming the gate was already an unavoidable fact. There was not one existence alive in this world that could close the fissure that was about to open up, after all. However, if the vampire lord did indeed plan to betray her, then she needed to hit him first before that happened. Just from this point alone, the possibility of cooperating together with that stinking human rose up. She was thinking of outwardly allying herself with that BD and getting rid of the lord, then kill Kim Sae Jean at a later date, and finally possess the rich orchard called the Fisher all for herself. Co, cooperation, with measly humans? But how? You chose to serve me, not the Lord, no. That's why you built your little nest in here, too. If the Lord is really thinking of funny things right now, shouldn't we get him first and set the plan on the correct path? The apostle questioned, but the smile on Bathory's lips grew thicker the more he asked. And confronted by that beautiful yet lethal smile, the only thing this apostle could do was to nod his head quietly. Chapter, 152 Exactly two weeks had passed by since the exhibition got underway. And, as if to completely mock Sae Jean's initial worries of will the public shake off their fear and unite for something as unimportant as picking new members for his guild. The whole thing continued on, while proving to be a roaring success in the process. Now, the new worries were of people shaking off too much fear, and the excessively united solidarity of the citizens was rapidly changing into a problem instead. Why didn't the fans stop at praising the candidates they liked, and found a need to irritate and attack others, too? Sae Jean just couldn't understand it. 
but whatever the case may have been, fifteen knights and fifteen wizards, for a total of thirty participants were finalized. And here on out, these people were to engage in things like physical battles between knights, and magic competition between wizards, and steal points from other contestants. This is beyond the level of simple chaos, you know. Even in the dawn, everyone is talking about this only. USAE Young. While a refreshing smile was pasted on her face, USAE Young's eyes were watching the TV, her right hand moved the mouse connected to the notebook PC, and finally, with her left hand, she was busy sending text messages via her smartphone. It was a near miraculous multitasking. By the way, SAE Young, why are you so busy? SAE Jean. Uh. Ah, uh, well, I'm quite busy lately just as much as you, Appa. See, since Appa doesn't want to hang out with me no more, I was forced into discovering the importance as well as the joy of socializing. So, I went to lots of gatherings and stuff, and well, it's like, people are really curious right now just what will be the next test, internally whom we are rooting for, that sort of stuff. USAE Young. Oh, really? SAE Jean sneakily shifted his eyes and looked at her phone's display. Really, endless stream of messages were popping up on a group chat room she was participating in. However, the name of the chat room was the Dawn Knights Order First Team Super Elites Meet. Dot. Although it was a rather childish title, First Team was usually made up of the core fighting force of the Knights Order, so it wasn't a baseless boasting at all. It was then, the eyes of the wolf sharply gleamed. It was not because of the group chat, though no, it was because of a private messaging box floating on the middle of the phone's display that popped up just as he sneaked a glance while USAE Young's attention was turned towards him. Kim Young Ho, Miss S.A. Young, whatcha doing? Even with a quick glance, that was a guy's name on the profile pic, even an image of a guy prominently on display, and to cap it off, those words that would be interpreted as that guy having interest in her, regardless of who read it. That's a man. S.A.E. Jean. A cold voice leaked out of S.A.E. Jean before he noticed it. U.S.A.E. Young tilted her head in a slight bafflement. Eh. That. That guy, on the phone. That's a man, isn't it? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean pointed at the phone. But, by then, the alert for receiving a PM had come and gone. Her eyes followed his pointing finger, then her brows narrowed slightly. What the? You were sneaking a look at my phone. USAE Young. What do you mean, sneaking? I can see it plainly in the open. SAE Jean. Oh, man. You don't let me see your phone no matter what, yet you look at mine without permission. USAE Young. She puffed her cheeks in a show of annoyance. However, he didn't have the leeway to mind that right now. Still, she did look quite adorable while doing that, so he patted her head anyways. No, wait. You just received a text from a guy, see. And he was definitely flirting with you. S.A.E. Jean. This is a group chat, so no idea what you're talking about wait, Appa doesn't know what a group chat is. You know, group chat rooms that's where a group of people converse by sending text messages t.l., well. Some of you might think there's something a bit strange here, but that's because USAE Young is using the abbreviated form for group chat room, in Korean. The last one, she says it in full. Group chat room, in Korean is. And I tried to TL as literally as possible. This is the result. Kim SAE Jean's forehead creased up deeply. Was she treating him like an 80-year-old or something? I know what a group chat is, okay? But that message wasn't part of the group chat, but a private message. I saw it. S.A.E. Jean. Her face wavered in dazement. S.A.E. Jean didn't miss this chance and extended his hand out quickly. His purpose was to forcibly kidnap, the aim being her phone. However, she swiftly hid the phone behind her back. Her reaction speed was really fast. But that only fanned the flames of suspicion, instead. S.A.E. Jean's brows quivered in dissatisfaction. Give me that. Why aren't you giving it to me? S.A.E. Jean. Wait, just wait for a second, okay? This, this isn't what Appa thinks you S.A.E. Young. That is why I'm telling you to hand it over. Hey, why did that guy call you Miss S.A.E. Young? 
SAE Jean. He's the son of Jason Group's VP. Because he's the last born, he can't inherit the family business. So he focused on being a knight, and now, he's a high tier with the Raven Order, and his future prospects are really promising USAE Young. USAE Young began spouting gibberish with a reddened face. No, you don't have to read out his resume. Just give me the phone. SAE Jean. R, really, it's nothing important, really. Appa also sometimes message Hazeline Uni, right? It's like that. USAE Young. What? Suddenly, he got really furious. The messages he sent to Hazeline now and then were. DN it, this is what they call double standard, isn't it? TL, the author used a popular Korean abbreviation slang word which can be literally TL'd into, when I do it, it's romance, but when others do it, it's cheating. You probably can see why I omitted that and used double standard instead. SAE Jean held his breath back and calmed himself down, before slowly continuing on with his words. You're right. It could also be like that. However, here's the thing. Does that guy know you and I are in a relationship? SAE Jean. Hazeline was acting in that way even though she knew this fact. However, she had the sort of suitable excuse of elves being hopeless in love, so what did this guy, Kim Yung Ho, has for one? Hearing his question, USAE Young rolled her eyes over and over as if she was trying to think of something, but eventually, spat out a lengthy sigh and murmured her reply. No. He doesn't know. USAE Young. She utilized the moment of SAE Jean freezing up in shock and poured out the rest of the story. Well, within our knight's order, not many people know of us living together. USAE Young. But, how come? That's because we haven't officially announced it. USAE Young. But, anyone with even half a brain should know by now. We've been living together for so long now. No, wait. Fine, some people might not know, that's true, but didn't you say he's the last born from a big Chable family? So how can he not know? SAE Jean. USAE Young smirked slightly. Of course, within certain circles of reporters, her living together with SAE Jean was already an open secret. But since almost all of them kept their mouths shut real tight, not even those commonly seen office memos circulated. After all, being frowned upon by the monster in the dawn was buying a one-way ticket straight to career suicide. Ing. He doesn't know. It's like he's been abandoned by his family, you know. He's a really pitiable guy in that regard. People within the Knight's Order think the same, too it's like, we're close siblings, an older brother and a younger sister. Except for Mr. Ju Ji Hyuk, though. USAE Young. Really? No, there is no way that's the case. That guy most likely knows of our relationship already. No matter how abandoned he is by his family, the big corporation SAE Jean. Here. Here, why don't you take a look? Look first before you judge. USAE Young. As if she thought SAE Jean had softened enough now, USAE Young handed over her phone quite easily. Look, look. It's really nothing like I told you. USAE Young. If SAE Jean was a man possessing generosity that was as wide as open seas and endless rivers, then he might have returned the phone back to her while saying, No, I believe in you, with a firm, dignified, yet considerate voice. But, well, open seas and rivers are just too small to contain a leviathan, though. SAE Jean. What are you even talking about? USAE Young. He muttered some incomprehensible excuse and checked the contents on the smartphone. Miss S.A.E. Young, you coming to today's business conference? 13 th February, 10.03 a.m. Nope. Why should I go there? 13 th February, 9.43 p.m. Huh, is that so? I can't go there, even though I want to 13 th February, 9.45 p.m. Similar types of messages continue. Omitted by the author. No, really. Kim Young Ho, Miss S. A. Young, what you're doing? For th March, 6.33 p.m. S. A. E. Jean found you S. A. E. Young's defenses quite satisfactory. However, why on earth was this fool, Kim Young Ho, being so persistent? 
While he was concentrating on the phone, USAE Young moved her agile, cat-like hands swiftly and snatched away his phone instead. I'm gonna look at Appa's phone, too. USAE Young. In that moment, SAE Jean froze up like a statute. Thankfully, though, he hadn't had much contact with women of late. Even Hazeline stayed away, too. As if she became conscious of her actions, other than leaving comments such as photo came out nicely on images he uploaded on his Instagram account every now and then, she did not make one single attempt to call him up for personal matters. Hmm, hmm. Yep. Good. USAE Young. Finishing her inspection in less than three minutes, USAE Young put his phone down, quite pleased by the result. Then, she slid into SAE Jean's embrace quite comfortably. Ah, that's right. Appa, why didn't that wizard from Bangbei Dong become a candidate? USAE Young. No, I mean, doesn't he have a good relationship with us? He did give us all of his grimoires and stuff, too. I hear that the reason for the participating wizards being so hands-on during the contest is because they want to enter the monster's members-only library. The only one in the world where the full set of his grimoires are being kept in one place. Also, didn't he release the grimoire number 25 not too long ago? Two days ago, the wizard of Bangbei Dong published the grimoire number 25. It did incite the predictably explosive reaction, but unfortunately for everyone, the only place this book was displayed, was the monster's members only library. The reason why it hadn't found a home in other wizard towers yet, was because of the truly intense behind the scenes battle going on at the moment. Besides the excessive attempts at suppression, simple threats of exposing one's corrupt dealings if one did not give up trying to purchase the grimoire were thrown around. And even some local wizard towers lobbied the government to expel the members of overseas wizard tower representatives from the country. And SAE Jean wasn't aware of such vulgar, disgusting, and desperate warfare happening beneath the surface. Ah, the wizard of Bangbei Dong? SAE Jean. Ing. I'd like to meet him at least once. USAE Young. USAE Young spoke to him with a bright smile on her face. Seeing her totally oblivious and quite adorable smile, SAE Jean made up his mind, his lips quivering a little. It seemed that, the time to tell her the truth about this wizard persona had arrived. She knew that his trait was him transforming into the Leviathan. She also knew that he could borrow the Leviathan's powers while he was human, as well. The wizard of Bangbei Dong, is me. S.A.E. Jean. Ing. After a lengthy silence, U.S.A.E. Young asked back with a dazed face. What? What do you mean by that? The name of the Bangbei Dong wizard is Meh. U.S.A.E. Young. He thought she was joking, but her expression and the tone of voice were serious. S.A.E. Jean broke out in a hearty laughter and shook his head. Ha ha ha. No, I am the wizard of Bangbei Dong. You haven't noticed at all. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. What did you say? But, but how? You're lying. U.S.A.E. Young. Utterly shocked out of her mind, U.S.A.E. Young jumped around wildly, then she grabbed his shoulders and shook him hard. Think about it carefully, now. The Leviathan is a creature of magic. And why would the wizard of Bangbei Dong, who had no contact with us, give us the grimoires? S.A.E. Jean. O.M.G. T.L. L.O.L., the raw doesn't say that, but I inserted that in. The raw is literally one word, hull. It has no meaning other than to express one's shock. Within you S.A.E. Young's eyes and mouth that couldn't get any wider, astonishment filled up. Although this was quite similar to when he confessed to being the orc blacksmith, the shock she received seemed to be far greater this time around. However, she recovered not too long after, and then began calculating potential profit and losses. Oh, Appa, in that case, can you let the Dawn keep the grimoires of Bangbei Dong wizard? You know, right? That we've been working hard to establish a wizard tower for a while now. USAE Young. What the heck, that's all. You aren't gonna be shocked anymore. S.A.E. Jean. Huh. Ah. No, I'm really, stupefyingly stunned right now. Woo-wah. Wowzers. Appa, you're so amazing. Really. U.S.A.E. Young. 
Seeing her like this, using hands and feet to express how stunned she was, she seemed definitely a lot more vibrant and cheerful than in the past. Comparing the first time he met her to her of now, it was to the point of him feeling a huge sense of change from her. Appa is so handsome, and his body is so buff, and he can make such nice weapons, and now, he can even use magic so nicely, to USA Young. USA Young dug deeper into his arms while whispering in a pity me, pleased type of voice. SAE Jean stared at her dumbfoundedly, before a slight smirk crept up on his lips. Let's do it this way. Divide the shares of the wizard tower between the dawn and the monster. With that, not only the grimoires will be furnished in their entirety, but even the wizard's name will be associated with the tower. SAE Jean. The negotiation began in earnest. USAE Young's eyes shook imperceptibly. Ha. Huh. But, but why? Why? That doesn't make sense at all the monster didn't even help out when the Dawn's been trying to set up a wizard tower until now. USAE Young. But I'll be helping out with this, right? And it'll also be a huge help, too. The grimoires of the famed wizard, plus his name on top. With that, as soon as the tower gets off the ground, I'm pretty sure it'll become a recognized tower right away. SAE Jean. Around three seconds of silence later, she sneakily slipped out from his embrace, took her phone, and made a call to someone. SAE Jean leisurely waited for the other side's opinion. The middle of March. The martial contest between knights and the magic competition between wizards, that drew in over 40,000 live audience per match, finally came to a conclusion. Kim Yurin recorded an overwhelming 14 victories and zero defeats within the knight category, while on the magic category, an unknown elf wizard named Emil Riro recorded the same overwhelming record as well. Through various other tests such as defeating monsters, contribution to the good of public interest, game show like Battle of Common Knowledge, etc., etc., 20 candidates out of remaining 30 got disqualified. And those who got disqualified, while leaving behind gifts of themselves looking remorseful, discontent or furious one wizard even broke down and cried his eyes out disappeared to where they came from. Kim Sae Jean then decided to have an one-on-one -on -one interview with the ten remaining candidates. He wanted to weed out bad characters, of course, and the broadcaster also wished to capture the process as well. Pleasure to meet you, Wizard Emil Riro. Sae Jean. Me too, it's a nice pleasure. The first interviewee happened to be the wizard, Emil Riro. He sensed a somewhat dangerous and insidious aura coming from her, but SAE Jean decided not to judge too prematurely. The scores for common knowledge is zero. Reading up on the follow-up words of the judges, this is on the level of a primate or a reptile it seems that, you haven't studied a lot until now. SAE Jean. He deliberately threw out the sensitive topic first while activating the eyes of the wolf. He was trying to see into this wizard's heart and her personality. And what crappy thing are you trying to pull here? TL, guess who? She smirked refreshingly, before emitting a bit of mana all around her, destroying every single camera installed in the interview room. What the? SAE Jean. I prefer you stop looking at me with those disgusting eyes. I mean, I came all the way here just to negotiate, yet you're making me want to kill you right now, you know. Along with thick killing intent, the outer skin of the elf Emil Riro melted down like a doe. And the person revealed was Perlani Bathory. SAE Jean couldn't help but admire her perfect disguising technique. Really, did this mean that the queen, in the state of perfection could even fool the senses of the wolf? Hello, kid. Been a while. Bathory. Bathory lightly tapped on his neck as she spoke. Right away, the interior of the room darkened and got separated from the rest of the world. A few. Yeah, it has been a while. Another isolation barrier. SAE Jean. Unlike his relaxed exclamation, his heart was beating like crazy in his chest. Yo. You don't have to tense up so much. I came here to cooperate with you, after all. Bathory. Cooperate. SAE Jean. That's right. Bathory. At Kim S.A.E. Jean's still confused face, Bathory showed a cheeky smile. You see, I'll help you kill the vampire lord. How about it? Bathory. 
What? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean's consciousness shook for a moment after seeing her smile. But that was all. Several alert windows indicating that skills had been activated popped into his view one after the other, instead. The unique skill, the most pure divine body has activated. Bathory's ultra-high-grade seduction magic has been resisted. A part of the seduction magic has been reflected back to the original caster. Immediately, her brows quivered ever so slightly. The alert windows informed him of the reason. However, S.A.E. Jean maintained his poker face and tilted his head. Phew woo, dot. So, this new skill helped him out in this manner. S.A.E. Jean let out a silent sigh of relief while checking out the information window for the most pure divine body, dot. The most pure divine body. The host's body will be purified of all impurities. Depending on the will of the host, the physical strength of the body can be raised up to a maximum of 1000%. However, the higher the percentage, the shorter the duration. The proficiency level of the skill, resistance, will be increased. And as a part of the defense mechanism, certain amount of the resisted magic or physical attack will be reflected back. Will be applied to all forms. Chapter, 153. You sure know some weird tricks, don't you? Bathory. Bathory glared at S.A.E. Jean as she spoke. It was just her looking at him, yet the pressure emanating from her eyes felt like a noose was tightening around his neck. If a normal person faced such a cold pair of eyes, then that person would have kicked the bucket in that instant. What are you on about? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean replied with the most deadpan expression he could muster. Bathory hadn't sensed that he consciously invoked magic, so she did not say anything else. Fine, whatever. Bathory. The weighty man pressing down on his entire body was withdrawn. S.A.E. Jean felt a slight sense of enervation. Woo-wa. S.A.E. Jean. So, you gonna cooperate with me or what? Bathory. Bathory crossed her arms while displaying the unsatisfactory mood. But right now, S.A.E. Jean could not understand this new attitude of hers. Seriously, back then, she wanted to rip his limbs apart just for questioning the vampire lord, yet, here she was. Bathory didn't wait for his answer and continued with what she wanted to say. This one, though, was as far removed from the main topic as humanly possible. Oh, by the way, kid just what is this the monster and why is it causing such a chaos? Seriously, it does something, then fools rush in like a mad mob, and that inconveniences me greatly. Did you know that I so wanted to kill a few stars on my way here but had to endure it so much? Bathory. The elf wizard Emil Riro enjoyed huge fame. Of course, odds were, that was due to the aura of seduction inherent within Bathory's mana, but still, the size of her fanbase was second only to Kim Urin's. And to be brutally honest, it was understandable why Emil Bathory's appearance on TV screens garnered so much popularity. She wielded refreshingly awesome destruction magic to blow everything away and acted like the queen that she was exuding an aura of a tyrant, to boot. Watch the TV, you'll know. It's the world's greatest guild. Offering the best advantages in the world, and the world's best welfare benefits, too. The top guild in the world that every knight and wizard wished to join. S.A.E. Jean. His voice overflowed with pride. Hmm but, don't you think it's funny to talk about the world when you're from this tiny Azaratsaz land? Bathory. Then, just what are you idiots trying to do in that tiny Azaratsaz land in the first place? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean looked straight into Bathory's eyes and retorted. Her expression was rather unreadable, hard to tell whether she was peeved off or happy. But, she hardened her face soon enough and asked him once more. The cooperation. You in, or not? Bathory. You should tell me the contents first. S.A.E. Jean. I told you already. I'll help you to kill the Lord. Bathory. It was such a different attitude compared to the past, when she was still worshipping the Lord. It was questionable how could a person change so quickly, but still, it would be great if one more thorn in his side was removed permanently. But the problem was after Bathory had become the new Lord. And after that? S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean sharply opened his eyes. 
After that, you people should do whatever accordingly. Bathory. Bathory sneered as she continued. Hey, you. I think you're mistaken about something here. The portal opening up, that's like, set in stone, you know. No matter how much you struggle, that'll never change. You should be preparing for the aftermath, instead of thinking about blocking the portal or something. Bathory. In that case, killing the Lord is one of the things to prepare for the aftermath, is that it? S.A.E. Jean. That's right. According to your guess, the Lord wants to return to the Earth's past, no? Bathory. S.A.E. Jean shut his mouth. Initially, he did think that the Lord wanted to return to this planet's past. But after giving it more thought, he became aware that this was not the correct guess as well. The odds of the Lord's plan being not about going to the past, but maintaining the same timeline as the stage called the Earth and moving to another dimension, were very high. So, S.A.E. Jean explained this to Bathory. That's complicated. Make it easier to understand. Bathory. Okay, so if the Lord succeeded in going back in time, then the present should have been affected, right? Like, because of the Lord going back in time, the world should have became the paradise for vampires or some such. But that didn't happen. So, I'm saying, my initial guess is not correct. That starred is trying to jump dimensions only. S.A.E. Jean. And when you say dimensions, you saying there can be many of those existing in the same space. Bathory. Correct. One of the definitions applied to the fissure is that it's a gap between different dimensions and different worlds, so you can get to other dimensions through it. S.A.E. Jean. The reason why S.A.E. Jean said all of this, was to tell her that killing the vampire lord had nothing to do with the preparations for the aftermath, dot. Technically speaking, the earth of another dimension had no relation with the matters of this world, after all. As if Bathory somehow understood the meaning behind his explanations, her face crumpled to resemble a Rakshasi. T.L., a Rakshasi is a female version of Rakshasa. Google one to get the feel for how ugly it looks. Beware of the Bollywood film popping up instead, though. So, you don't want to cooperate? Bathory. S.A.E. Jean didn't reply immediately. And within this silence, Bathory forced out a smile and began emitting mana from her body. You're not gonna answer. Bathory. There was no need for an answer, though. For better or worse, her helping out in killing the vampire lord would be a good thing, after all. However, he simply maintained his silence while transforming into the lycanthrope. Since she came to seek cooperation, that meant, at minimum, she wasn't thinking of killing him here. In that case, he wouldn't miss this chance to drink some more of her blood. You really ain't gonna answer. Bathory. Bathory's face became dumbfounded. But S.A.E. Jean simply pounced on her without a single shred of hesitation, pressed her down with his arms and his jaw descended down on her pale smooth neck. The blood of Bathory has been ingested. Accompanying that feel-good alert window, a huge impact shook his brain. Bathory simply punched the side of his head. However, her strength in 100% condition was truly terrifying. Kayak. One saving grace was that she'd suffer the same amount of damage as S.A.E. Jean received. While borrowing the strength of the potions, he pounced on Bathory once more. After getting beat up by Bathory till he was on the cusp of dying, S.A.E. Jean acted as if he had no choice while accepting her offer. Right next day, he organized a meeting. The participants were Kim Yu Rin, Yi Hai Rin, Hazeline, Yu Bek Song, Ju Ji Hyuk, Lilia, Kim Sun Ho, and even Rosradel. All eight of them gathered in a secret underground conference room. Kim S.A.E. Jean unpacked the rather horrifying prospect of cooperating with Bathory to the gathered members first, and then explained what they had to do next. For now, Ross Riddell will continue to stay beside Bathory. S.A.E. Jean. Ha. Huh. At S.A.E. Jean's orders, Ross Riddell's expression collapsed like that of a person who just lost his country or something. Obviously, we will need someone to spy on her movements. And as for actual gathering of information as well as searching for locations, Miss Yu Song and Mr. Kim Sun Ho, please handle them along with the available intelligence operatives. S.A.E. Jean. Got it. Yes, boss. Understood. 
Yu Bexong and Kim Sun Ho nodded their heads. However, their sights were locked onto Kaiser II acting coquettishly on Sae Jean's thighs. As for the knights, please concentrate on getting stronger. Also, Miss Kim Yurin should be unfamiliar with handling a griffin, so please head over to the nesting area and get to grips on how to control a griffin perfectly. Ah, after the exhibition ends, of course. Sae Jean. Yes, I understand. Kim Yurin replied back energetically. And so, Sae Jean was able to end the meeting quite quickly. Next up, was E. Hyrin's mischievous expressions of her admiration. Oh. Our guild master looks so cool today. E. Hyrin. Please stop joking around. Sae Jean. E. He he. Ah, right, will it be fine with a non guild member taking part here? E. Hyrin. With a guilty face, Kim Yurin's shoulders trembled. It'll be fine, since her admission is almost a sure thing anyway. So, everyone, disperse. We don't have much time. Sae Jean. Bathory said the Fisher Portal should fully open up between October and December, so they indeed didn't have a lot of time left. No, it was more correct to say it was imminent. At Sae Jean's words, the members all replied with lots of spirit and hurriedly went on their own ways. Ten days later, 2nd of April. The exhibition that garnered so much of the public's passionate support finally ended. The successful candidates in the knight category were Kim Yurin and Ju Oh Hyung, both of them highest tier knights. A pretty interesting spectacle of sorts unfolded on the presentation stage during the final broadcast where the successful candidates were announced Kim Yurin's serene speech on her thoughts on entering the guild contrasted rather sharply with the heartfelt dedication read out by the tearful Ju Oh Hyung. On the other side, the two wizard candidates who made it were a male elf named Breton, as well as Emile Riro, as promised to Bathory previously. However, Bathory wanted to look stylish in an old-fashioned kind of way, and quoted a four-word idiom during her acceptance speech. Unfortunately, she used it in such a wrong context, it wasn't even funny anymore. Kim Sae Jean just couldn't understand why she ended up saying the four-word idiom Yuk Chamasak during such a happy occasion. TL, this idiom actually comes from the romance of the three kingdoms this author must have a thing for roti k or something. Basically, it means foregoing personal feelings and upholding the military command structure, or something similar to that effect. Not sure how you can google this one if you're interested in finding out what's what. Oh well. But he heard on the following day, that it was Rosradel who deliberately fed Bathory nonsense in order to publicly embarrass her. And predictably on the day after that, Bathory found the truth out via the internet and invaded the guild HQ in unbridled rage while shouting out that she was going to kill Rosradel. Fortunately, though, the temporary cooperation pact between her and Sae Jean remained intact. The completion ceremony for the Dawn Corporations and TM's Wizard Tower, the collaboration of the Dawn and the Monster. The unrivaled financial muscle and the Monster, combined. According to the Dawn, the time to invest more capital and to diversify its portfolio is when the state of current affairs are at most unstable. And then. Another nuclear bombshell dropped. A wizard tower that the Dawn Corporation and the monster each held five. Five colon four. Five of shares was officially launched. Obviously, that alone lacked the necessary oomph to cause a commotion in the country. Even if it was the Dawn, the number one in the business sector, a modern-day wizard tower was a cradle of wisdom built from dozens upon dozens of years of accumulated experience and knowledge. The consensus of industry experts from other wizard towers were that, even if it was the dawn, one should be ready to endure decades of losses and ridicule. However, a news with an exclusive report tagged on got published soon after, and the whole situation got turned around 180 degrees. A wizard that didn't put down his roots in any wizard towers until now. Not only referred to with the worldwide recognition as the greatest talent in magic, but also being seen as a true iconic genius the wizard of Bangbaidong. He had proudly aligned his name with the Dawn's new wizard tower. As if that wasn't enough, not only he offered up his grimoires number 1 to 25, he also announced on his blog that, all subsequent published grimoires would be donated to the tower, as well. It was, without a doubt, 
a scoop on the level of nuclear explosion, and many wizard towers felt like they had dropped a newborn baby in a mud pit, and realized they had no choice but to give in. And now. The protagonist that had pushed other wizards into a state of confusion and terror was actually enjoying a holiday of sorts, that was a world far removed from the whirlwinds of the wizarding community. So, how is it? How's the media reacting to the news? S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean tightly hugged U.S.A.E. Young, who seemed to be stuck like a glue to her notebook PC, and asked. It's seriously great. The number one liked comment is the Dawn and the Monster and Bang Bay Dawn Wizard come together, and the nature's balance is upset. He he he. USA Young TL, our delightful author tried another weird pun-based joke that I just don't get. Consequently, I couldn't TL it literally, as well. Thus, this is the result. Is that so? Hey, you seem to be really interested in this wizard tower business, though. SAE Jean. Ing. Of course. I pushed for this business venture, after all. USAE Young. Really? Yep. That is why, the tower's operational director is me. USAE Young. USAE Young pecked a little kiss on SAE Jean's cheek and smiled happily. As an aside, a tower director and a tower lord was not the same. If one thought of tower director as a chairman of the board, then the tower lord was like the dean of a school. And sure enough, a tower director's powers were greater than that of a tower lord's. What the? Why didn't you say anything? I'd have negotiated with a bit more leisure, then. S.A.E. Jean. The guy in charge of making this deal work, Joe Hansung, negotiated so tenaciously that even left the representatives of the dawn utterly blown away. According to him, a former superior officer who bullied him in the distant past just so happened to be one of the Dawn's negotiators, so that was why. It's all right. After all, my share is fixed at 35% anyways. The rest belongs to my grandpa and my dad. It'll be better if Appa has the rest, instead. USAE Young. Should he feel proud of her or be sorry for her? SAE Jean formed a slightly apologetic smile, leaned his head on her shoulder, and they looked at the notebook PC together. Oh. Hey, isn't this guy the vice lord of the Soul Wizard Tower? And this person over here, that's the tower lord of Busan Tower, right? S.A.E. Jean. Ing. I thought they would be people that lacked nothing, but the amount of requests for open position coming through is just so much. Someone's purism data was as big as one gigabyte, you know. Ah, that's right. Even foreigners sent in some. Look, look. Here's the Tower Lord for the Veli Wizard Tower, ranked fifth in the world. USAE Young pulled up a photo. And the Tower Lord shown was a female elf with a slick figure that sure fitted the name of the tower. She must be really good at belly dancing TL, oh boy, yet another pun-based joke by the author. I did what I could, but you be the judge. Ha, how ridiculous. Hey Ajusi, where do you think you're looking at? USAE Young. Ah, uh, it's nothing. Cough. Well, it's all good news. Our wizard tower should grow fast at this rate. SAE Jean. Ing. The influence of the Bang Dong wizard was really huge. We only have around 100 grimoires stored in the tower, but over a thousand wizards are applying to enter, you know. USAE Young. A single grimoire was really expensive. And it was also difficult to procure one, too. Most regular mid-grade grimoires fetched upwards of several million dollars. But more importantly, even with enough money, the products themselves were not available to begin with, so it was virtually impossible to buy one. Well, even the Dawn couldn't purchase more than 75 grimoires 25 grimoires of the Wizard of Bang Bay Dong not counted, so there. Many of the grimoires stored in a wizard tower were actually developed and invented through hard work and as well as the investment of a great amount of time by the wizards affiliated with that tower. So, that is why USAE Young. USAE Young formed a content but suspicious looking smile as she sneakily scratched SAE Jean's thighs. If Appa works just a bit harder. We might be able to grow at a tremendous rate, am I right? USAE Young. Her hands became a bit more strange and daring. 
so, SAE Jean smirked a little, and. In that case, I'll decide who gets to become the Tower Lord. And, he reopened the negotiations. USAE Young's eyes trembled like a newborn chick. Chapter, 154. Creator, N.A. Editor, N.A. It's disheartening. When you see more comments on a site that has stolen your work, it tells you those readers spit on you. When they thank thieves for the chapter, have engrossing conversations, and support others. It tells us as creators that you do not care for the work we put in. Out of all the large sites out there, JFB receives probably the least in terms of donations. Doesn't phase us. But the creators that provide you with chapters sometimes 5-10x a week, and you can't even read the chapter on the very platform they put their work on. That is another story. That is you disregarding everything that we are. Some may ask, what is the point of continuing? If you despise us so much. You rather read from thieves. To those I see read on fantasy books, with JFB every day, I thank you. I notice you. Sartre, Gons 555, Mesmerized, Nizam, Chpe, Belker, Light DX, Jodiak, GM Rusaku, Dio here, Shiro, and a few others. I've noticed you. You have supported Fantasy Books JFB for a while just from your comments here and there. And there are a few who have donated. It is you that keep us going. As for those few thousand people yes, thousands that spit on us, reading and thanking those that steal from us. You disgust me. And I'm proud to tell you. Sincerely. The ribbon-cutting ceremony to commemorate the end of the construction work for the Dawn and TM's new wizard tower was taking place at the site of the tower located in Seoul Siachogu. The identities of every single audience member present were who's who of biggest corporations out there. For instance, people like TM CEO, Joe Hansung, and from the Dawn side, the sole grandchild of its chairman, USAE Young. TL, Gu is a district and it's bigger than A, Dong which is a suburb. The night USAE Young's the representative from the dawn, huh? This wizard tower was built in the city of Seoul. This inevitably meant that it would compete against the Seoul wizard tower, widely seen as the Seoul's best, and consequently, Korea's best tower. So, the director of the Seoul tower personally came here to gauge the flow of atmosphere around these parts. The tower director spoke from behind the heavily tinted car window while looking at USAE Young. Joe Hansung from TM. They must be expecting great things, since Kim Sae Jean's right hand man is here in person. Yes. It's quite likely that both TM and the Dawn has poured all their resources into this venture. Within the financial circles, Joe Hansung was well known for his straightforward personality and tenacious drive to succeed, which made him a man others should not mess with. But that wasn't the only reason. Kim Sae Jean's most trusted advisor. The title alone easily sunk all the other qualifications the man named Joe Hansung possessed into insignificance. From the huge scale national defense business supported by the likes of Griffins and the Kraken, to creating artifacts from orcs' miraculous weapons to mana tattoos, etc., etc., all of them, indispensable abilities that the current world could not do without. If one were to call the Wizard of Bangbaedong as the true icon of innovation in the modern wizardry, then Kim Sae Jean should be seen as the symbol of the modern world itself. It was all very strange. Now normally, the public came down hard on those folks who earned a good deal of wealth. And political power through their traits only. However, Kim Sae Jean was the only exception to that strict rule. Maybe, that was due to the special circumstances currently, Boss Monsters appeared several times a month so if there was no Kim Sae Jean, the country of Korea would have ceased to exist in this world a long time ago. Without him, there would not be the orcs' weapons to satisfy the demands for quality armaments by the knights, not to mention those artifacts that could increase the chances of their survival by 90% either. And also, it was the same sort of story for the griffins, responsible for drastically reducing the amount of time required for the dispatched knights to arrive on the scene introduction of griffins that could figuratively arrive virtually as soon as being dispatched. Was referred to as revolution, in policing as well as the worldwide defense service that raised the status of Korea internationally, the Kraken. 
Kim Sae Jin was an existence that burned like the light coming from a lone guiding star within this dangerous and treacherous world. For a man like that to enter the business of wizard towers. Now that was the advent of an unexpected calamity for all potential competitors. I heard the rumors of the vice tower Lord Hemming sending in his resume over that side. The sole tower director creased his forehead. The more he thought about it, the more irritated he got. That bat-like son of a gun. The vice tower Lord Hemming tendered his resignation yesterday. Ha, huh, based on what? Surely, he hadn't heard anything concrete from them yet. According to the tower lord, he said he will bet on him walking away a winner with this move when he resigned from his post. Apparently. Winning. Sounds more like gambling. The tower director's sight clung to the car window's glass and became a sheen of white frost. Although it was definitely spring, the temperature was still on the colder side. Oh well. The projections for the future should be rosy for them, right? Indeed, yes. The only demerit is them only having 100 or so grimoires, but 25 of them happen to be books that not even an entire year's worth of research into a single volume will be enough to determine their true value. The true worth of a grimoire wasn't simply about learning a single magic spell contained within. No, the most prominent meaning of its existence was all to do with creating other types of spells, by applying the logic and composition of the original spell contained within the pages of a grimoire. Considering that point alone, no one could assign any arbitrary value to those grimoires written by the revolutionary genius, the wizard of Bangbaidong. With a single volume of his work, ten grimoires with different spells could be created. However, within the new wizard tower, it held all twenty-five volumes, so it was only a matter of time before the collection grew into 250 books, then to 2,500 books. It was then. The Soul Wizard Tower's director spotted a man watching the ribbon-cutting ceremony from afar. He seemed familiar sculpted physique, sleek and long leg strong jawline and a sharp nose even though he wore a pair of sunglasses and a mask, there was no way his handsome visage could be hidden away. The director had seen that face hundreds, thousands of times before, so he instantly recognized the man. It was a secret no one else had any clue of, but the tower director Joseph Jean just so happened to be one of Kim Sae Jean's most ardent fans out there. Wait for a second. The tower director hurriedly opened the car's door and approached that man. That man tilted his head in confusion when an unknown person came up to him. By any chance, are you Mr. Kim Sae Jean? Just under his sunglasses, signs of panic could be seen. Kim Sae Jean talked about various things with the director of Soul Wizard Tower who had quite unexpectedly managed to spot him. And unlike the popular belief that everyone from a wizard tower were egocentric fools with too much pride, the director was actually quite a principled man. Their conversation went well and Sae Jean even found his dignified attitude likable, even all of that was due to the man's passion clearly imbued within the way he gestured and talked. Here. It's a present. S.A.E. Jean. So, S.A.E. Jean gave away the thing he brought along to use as a PR material today. What is it? The tower director fixed his frameless glasses and took a closer look at the book given to him. There was nothing written on the cover, other than the alphabets and numbers no. 26. Number 26, 26, the number being 26. While saying the same thing over and over again, the tower director belatedly realized what this was and his expression changed into one of pure panic. This, this is. Please, use it well. There are only 17 of this 26th grimoire in the world 18, if you count that one as well. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean spoke as he smiled. The 26th grimoire strided the boundary existing between magic and sorcery it featured meteor. Dot. A spell that would have never been revived in the modern world if it weren't for the Bathory's knowledge on sorcery and the Leviathan's mana body combining their might together. This powerful legendary spell that occupied the top spot in the fire-based element magic, would no doubt leave behind a huge crater in the world of magic very soon. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. But, H, how can I receive something this valuable? The hands of the tower director were shaking like leaves. Please take it. There aren't that many wizards who can learn this spell around the world anyway. S.A.E. Jean. 
Sae Jean deliberately chose an attacking magic for his new grimoire. He hoped that this would help at least a little bit during the Kim Yusong prophesied the great calamity of monsters in the future. Fearing that vampires might get their hands on it and abuse the spell, Sae Jean was planning to select 17 wizard towers that had tower lords capable of learning this meteor spell and personally hand it over to them. However, not one Korean wizard tower was included in his original plan. But well, another copy could be made any time, so it wasn't a problem. Please, take it. Well then, I should get going. Sae Jean. Eh. Ah, uh, T, thank you very much. Actually, I, I'm a big fan of yours. Really? In that case, thank you for your support. Sae Jean. Kim Sae Jean lightly tapped the shoulders of the heavily trembling director, and headed towards the ribbon-cutting ceremony while cutting open a path through the walls of reporters like an unstoppable tank. When a tall man suddenly barged his way through, inevitably reporters began spitting out their dissatisfied remarks. And so, when he arrived around the middle of the way, Kim Sae Jean removed the sunglasses and stared at Yubek Song. Since he didn't tell her he was planning to show up, panic was quickly overtaking her expressions as the countless camera lenses turned towards him. He walked confidently within the path created by the reporters. While thinking about trivial things, such as wondering if this was what Moses was feeling during that famous moment, he walked next to Yusei Young and took his spot there. Then, he gazed at her and formed the brightest smile he had ever worn until now. I'm sure some of them will notice with this much. Sae Jean. Oh woo, really now. You should have told me beforehand, you know. Usae Young. Usae Young spoke in a fake criticizing voice, yet her face was blossoming with a huge smile. Thanks to Kim Sae Jean's unexpected arrival, the ceremony was a roaring success. The vampire lord's whereabouts might be deep underground, said Ross Riddell. His voice lacked energy. Also, both his eyes were blackened, and almost half of his hair had been plucked out. It seemed that he had to pay a heavy price for ruining Bathory's speech during the exhibition's final show. Underground where? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin handed over a boiled egg as she asked. With a practiced hand, Ross Riddell massaged his eyes with the egg. Under the Kongwan province's monster field. Remember the place that got created when two fissures overlapped each other and the earth's crust got distorted? Ross Riddell. Ah. That place where mana couldn't be used at all. E. Hai Rin. As if she had recalled it, E. Hai Rin spoke up while clapping her hands. Hearing this, Kim Yu Rin's face too began drowning in memories. Well, that was the place where she got to meet the orc for the first time, after all. TL, no, Mr. Author, it's not, but I'll just leave you to your own forgetfulness. Right. Apparently, the Lord is performing research underground with his most faithful retainers. Ross Riddell. What kind of a research? E. Hai Rin. I don't know. They are doing something, all right. Ross Riddell. Guildmaster. What should we do now? Kim Yu Rin. Kim Yu Rin asked Sae Jean while looking at him. Sae Jean thought for a while, before shifting his gaze to Kim Sun Ho. Kim Sun Ho passed the baton over to Ju Ji Hyuk. Then, Ju Ji Hyuk passed it on to. Well, the person at the end of the chain of stairs turned out to be Kim Yu Rin after all. She sighed out grandly. Ha! Can't be helped, really. Captain's the only one with enough experience on planning and conducting raids amongst us here. E. Hai Rin. I get it, I get it. Let's take a look at the map first. Kim Yu Rin. Kim Yu Rin took a look at the map of the interior Rosradel brought along. The most eye catching thing on it was the passage displayed, and it was located quite close to the East Sea's coastline. They might be able to utilize the Leviathan's strength at this rate. Two methods immediately came up on Kim Yu Rin's mind once she thought about using this lengthy passage to enter the base. They could bore a hole on the ground and poke their heads in, or quietly infiltrate. Ross Riddell added a few words as she deliberated. Ah, uh, I forgot. Bathory told me to contact her as soon as the planning is complete. She said she will help. Ross Riddell. Really? Then, that's Finn. Wait. 
Didn't you say that the Lord can see everything? He probably has seen you coming here to meet us. Doesn't that mean we are busted already? E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin asked. Ah. That only applies to the vampires that had sworn the oath. Ross Riddell. The oath? It happened really a long time ago. Remember the vampire cleansing that happened in the past? Vampires found out that it was definitely an inside job. So, those who somehow survived the cleansing, wanted to make sure the traders pay the appropriate price, but well, since there weren't a lot of vampires remaining. Someone cooked up the idea of let's not kill our own kins when there's so little number to begin with, and instead, swear an oath of never betraying our kind and entrust our lives to the Lord. However, I am a child born after the racial cleansing had come to an end. So, I am not affected by this blood oath. Ross Riddell. A child. E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin stared at Ross Riddell with eyes that screamed contempt and her failure to understand his claims. Don't be like that, since I'm the youngest of everyone here. Both Knight Kim Yurin and Wizard Hazeline have shot past their thirties already, no. I'm still in my twenties, you know. The two people who got dragged into the conversation unexpectedly began gritting their teeth. A violent desire to murder burned fiercely in their eyes. Ross Riddell whistled nonchalantly and avoided their eyes. But still. Vampires would die from that by getting caught in it if they are unlucky, right? Even Miss Faradu's. Kim Yurin. Nope, that's not it either. I hear that the Lord is way too busy doing his research underground that he has no time to check and stuff. Ross Riddell. So, in other words, there is no problem, is that it? Well, then how about we do it like this? Everyone, please listen to this. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin began explaining the plan she cooked up in this short amount of time. It was quite a bit complex plan, too. And this plan required the presences of excavators, the Leviathan, the Kraken, etc., etc. However, once everyone heard of it, it sounded quite doable, so they ended up nodding their heads in approval. It's good, Captain. E. Hyrin. As expected. It's not for nothing people chant Kim Yurin, Kim Yurin, all the time. Ha, huh, you are overestimating me. Well then, Guildmaster, should we go with this plan? Kim Yurin. Yes, let's. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean gave his permission. Ting. It was then, the elevator door to the conference room opened up, and a woman with white hair that kinda, sorta resembled a middle schooler belatedly arrived. Here I am. What's up? Yubek Song. Oh, Miss Yubek Song. Please take a seat. There's a plan we need to explain to you. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin proceeded to explain the plan once more to Yubek Song. However, the little white tiger suddenly tilted her head in confusion, and then, poured the proverbial cold water on their parade. Why the heck is it so complicated? If you know the coordinates, you can just enter with the sorcery, no? Hey Kim Sae Jean, that sorcery thing you used to teleport us, can't you use that again? You Beck Song. How come they haven't thought of that simple idea? A thick silence mixed with self-mockery descended upon the conference room. Ed, huh, good going, Yubek Song. Chapter, 155. It has been now confirmed that the excerpt from the Grimoire No. 26, written personally by the Wizard of Bangbaidong, does mention balls of flame descending from the distant skies. Opinions of experts in the wizarding community are divided regarding those words that invoke the images of the spell meteor, but even until now, the Wizard of Bangbaidong has not revealed the true name of the spell yet. This new Bangbaidong grimoire that has caused yet another huge stir in the world is planned to be distributed to the Dawn TM Wizard Tower first experts believe this will only serve to increase the number of wizards buttering up to Dawn TM Tower. Things were still chaotic for the media and TV stations. The interest and fervor of the wizards directed towards the new grimoire were just that huge. It was understandable, since the book was rumored to contain the recreation of a certain legendary spell, after all. Whatever the case might have been, thanks to this grimoire alone, the number of applicants for the Dawn TM's Wizard Tower reached 6785, which excluded the applicants from other countries. 
If one considered the fact that the total number of wizards in Korea did not exceed 80,000, it was indeed an enormous figure but even then. That was the figure with the wizards below C class and judged to be lacking in potential and talent were eliminated from the counting process. In other words, the remaining ones were the cream of the crop. And so, USAE Young was spending every day on the proverbial cloud nine after getting the acknowledgement from her grandfather for her business acumen but well, SAE Jean himself wasn't all that interested in it, personally speaking. Still haven't received the coordinates yet. SAE Jean. A meeting was being held in the secret conference room located below the guild's HQ. Please wait for a moment. I have received the coordinates but, as for the mental images of the interior ah, uh, I've received them, master. Rosradel TL, for the record, Rosradel isn't calling SAE Jean master as in guild master, but as his owner. Hence, I didn't use capital M. Rosradel smiled brightly at SAE Jean. However, the title this young vampire used to call SAE Jean got on his nerves a bit, so his forehead creased up quite deeply. How many times do I have to tell you not to call me master? SAE Jean. If it's not that, then how should I address you? Since I'm not a guild member, I can't even call you Guild Master Rosradel. Rosradel complained while revealing a bit of his real intent. However, it was E. Hyrin who suppressed that sly request to join the guild. Slap. That was the sound of a palm smashing into a person's back. Stop muttering nonsense and tell us the coordinates already. E. Hyrin. Ah, you, that hurts. Seriously fine, fine. Ross Riddell. Ross Riddell jotted down the coordinates on a piece of paper, and then transmitted the mental images of the cavern's interior to SAE Jean via their link. SAE Jean closed his eyes and studied the interior for a bit, memorizing good spots where they could hide in. Is that okay, master? Ross Riddell. Yeah, sure. Good enough. SAE Jean. S.A.E. Jean opened his eyes with a long sigh. At the same time, Ross Riddell's face went rigid. It seemed that he had received a new telepathic message from Bathory. What? S.A.E. Jean. Well, Master. Ross Riddell. Stop calling me a master already. S.A.E. Jean. Bathory says to come over to where she is. Ross Riddell. Okay, then. Get going. S.A.E. Jean. No, I mean, not me she wants Master to come over. Ross Riddell. S.A.E. Jean tilted his head. Why so suddenly? S.A.E. Jean. I've no clue. Ross Riddell. After receiving the summons, S.A.E. Jean went to the former underground city of Nisferatus which now belonged to Bathory. May 6th. Cool. I'll help you. Bathory. And how do you plan to do that, exactly? S.A.E. Jean. I'll call out all the retainers working with the Lord on his research or whatever, telling them there's something urgent we need to take care of. Bathory. She gave out a rather insincere answer. And how will you call them out? S.A.E. Jean. I'll take care of that, so you don't have to worry your little mind, okay? Hyum, hmm. Bathory. Her attitude was way too discourteous. S.A.E. Jean's forehead creased up automatically after seeing her busy messing around with her smartphone, considering that she was the one who wanted him here. What are you so busy with? S.A.E. Jean. Oh, I'm just checking out a couple of articles online. These ants are so adorable, you know. Hey, here, this number next to this thumb-up sign, that's telling me the number of ants agreeing with this opinion praising me, right? Bathory. She pointed at the phone screen and asked him. There was a comment section attached to an article praising Emil Riro's martial prowess, and 7,300 were agreeing with it, while 3,400 weren't. Yeah, correct. S.A.E. Jean. So, that means 7,300 likes Emil Riro. Good. But what about these 3,400? Can you find out who they are? Bathory. What will you do if you find them? S.A.E. Jean. Kill them, of course. Bathory. All those anonymous somebodies living somewhere were now in danger of being murderized by the origin of all things evil, just because they touched the wrong spot on the screen of their phones. 
Hey, I am just kidding you. It's a joke. So stop forming such a serious expression, you idiot. Bathory. Bathory smirked and put her phone down, then handed a box over to SAE Jean. It was an ancient and old-fashioned box that wouldn't have been out of place if it were found within the pages of Old Testament. And this is SAE Jean. The Lord's weakness is inside. It's nothing much, just a gift wishing for your success, is all. Bathory. A weakness? S.A.E. Jean. Yup. Even if he is the Lord, because he's so old now, all his senses, including eyesight, hearing, whatever, are in steep decline. Even the might of his eyes that see everything is no longer what it used to be. Well, even if you fail to carry out your plans, I'd love it if you still manage to get rid of that eye for me. It's so annoying, see? Bathory. S.A.E. Jean cautiously opened the lid, trying not to damage the box. A silver knife glistened coldly within the black interior. Silver. S.A.E. Jean. Right. But it's not a regular silver, nope. It's the silver refined by my homeworld's much more powerful sunlight, you know. Now normally, a vampire has two weaknesses sunlight and silver. This here is the thing combining both of those. Bathory. If that's the case S.A.E. Jean. Grasping the knife, S.A.E. Jean glared at Bathory with the unreadable light in his eyes. After sensing his intent, Bathory's eyes arched slightly. But she wasn't angry or anything like that. Even if those are vampires' weaknesses, we can't even feel them when we are young and full of vitality. But the Lord is different. He's really old, you see. If you cut him with that knife, his flesh will start rotting away. And he won't be able to regenerate himself even with a single cut. Bathory. Humph. S.A.E. Jean wielded the silver knife this way and that. It had a really plain exterior. It looked like he should slice steak with it instead of a person's flesh and even then, since rare was too tough, maybe well done instead. T.L., uh, no, Mr. Author, rare, is softer to chew, actually. After watching him for a bit with a satisfied smile on her face, Bathory added some cautionary words as well. Hey kid. You shouldn't take this too lightly. The Lord has achieved the peak of all peaks in Chimera Engineering, you know. And with that, she poured in all her focus back on the smartphone. Seeing her fingers quickly fidgeting away, S.A.E. Jean wondered whether she was trying to manipulate the public sentiment all by herself or not. S.A.E. Jean smirked and spoke. I'm leaving. S.A.E. Jean. Bathory didn't bother to reply only the sounds of that unique SFX of the phone's on-screen keyboard being pressed echoed in the silence. The date was set ten days from now, on 20th of April. T.L., eh. But what happened to May 6th? This author can't even remember what he wrote a couple of pages ago. Although he acted all relaxed and ready, the pressure emanating from the title Vampire Lord, wasn't something S.A.E. Jean could carelessly receive at all. Unable to do anything about the heaviness weighing down on his heart, S.A.E. Jean ended up taking a stroll through the underground village of Nisferatus. Set up next to the Goblin's village, the base for the Nisferatus actually was quite beautiful to look at. An old-school castle, seemingly plucked straight out from medieval times, stood tall enough to pierce the ceilings, and the more normal-looking stone and brick houses surrounded it. A city built within the darkness, a spitting image of their home back in their original world. To vampires that hated sunlight, this might as well be their one true paradise. You will succeed. Lilia. While he was quietly taking it all in, Lilia approached S.A.E. Jean and handed over a mug of coffee. Did he look that troubled? S.A.E. Jean forced out a smile. I should hope so. S.A.E. Jean. No, you will succeed. The Lord will die, and everyone will return safe and sound. Mr. S.A.E. Jean will return home, reminisce and write on his diary it'll be like that sort of a happy ending. Of course, there should be some other complications, though. Lilia. An imperceptible smile spread on S.A.E. Jean's lips. He sipped on the coffee and asked her about something he was curious about. By the way, how's the life down here? S.A.E. Jean. 
It was impossible for vampires to absorb nutrition through any other means except through drinking blood. It was because, besides the mouth and esophagus, a vampire did not possess other digestive organs. They were born with a completely different structure of the body, as well as the methods of survival, compared to regular human beings. Maybe, it was an inevitability that vampires would end up being the enemy of mankind. However, S.A.E. Jean thought that in the modern world, there was no such a thing as inevitability and all that. The current Earth and the world which the level of science hadn't even caught up to Earth's Middle Ages and where the vampires originated from couldn't even be compared at all. No matter how much magic and mana rampaged about, the accumulated pool of scientific knowledge still managed to exist in the modern world. Not only the science didn't get swept aside via the advent of mana, it survived, and even marched further forward thanks to injection of magic and mana as the basis for technology to revolutionize. That was why, there was no impossibility, in the modern world. No, there were only the things that haven't been tried yet, and the things that have been tried before. So, S.A.E. Jean decided to come up with new sources of nutrients for vampires' exclusive consumption. This idea came about after realizing the simple truth about vampires being able to drink potions. And that vague outline of an idea finally bore fruit in the form of a prototype liquid after six months of arduous research. A magical liquid that sent all the necessary nutrients to the entire body as soon as it was drunk. With this much, vampires should no longer feel the disgust towards drinking bovine or swine blood. Of course, wizards capable of handling mana were required during the manufacturing process, but as it was mentioned before, there were 6,785 applicants wishing to join TM's wizard tower, so. And Nisferatus went on a drive to improve their diet with the aid of this drink. There are a few of us who find it difficult to adjust, but it's better than expected. We're moving forward nicely. Lilia. That's a relief to hear. I'm planning to add the flavor of meat, something I hear you have never tasted before until now, so please do look forward to it. S.A.E. Jean. Well, a few wizards might have to slave away like crazy, though. Foot. That's a nice news to hear. Yes, I'll look forward to it. Lilia. Chief Lilia. Over here, please. From somewhere, a man's loud shout came towards them. Lilia smiled after hearing that shout containing that person's scent, and stood up from her seat. T.L., yeah, I also don't get it. But I still T.L.'d the sentence literally. Then, I shall be on my way. Mr. S.A.E. Jean should also return home although, it's fine if you want to stay for a while longer, too. Lilia. Her voice was gentle and kind. He followed suit and got up as well. Sure, take care. I should also get going now. S.A.E. Jean. Lilia left, and S.A.E. Jean headed off to the exit located on the opposite side to the underground village. Then, a certain thought popped up in his head. How did she know that I keep a diary? However, his legs moved again towards the exit after he told himself that her words simply meant those everyday routines, like wash your face before going to bed, etc., etc. The giant called time took hefty strides forward and before long, ten days flew by at the blink of an eye the date today was 20th of April. The day they were waiting for. The members about to participate in this plan gathered in the underground conference room while decked out in expensive artifacts like some kind of Christmas trees. Hang on, wouldn't each one of us reach a value of close to a billion dollars, dressed like this? E. Hyrin. E. Hyrin muttered loudly as she rubbed the belt-style high-class artifact. Most likely, she tried to diffuse the tension with her question. A billion is too much, so maybe five hundred million. You beck song. Combine mana tattoos to that and any one of us shoots past a billion, easy. I mean, the inflation nowadays is so crazy during these uncertain times. Kim Sun-ho. You beck song and Kim Sun-ho replied. S.A.E. Jean chuckled a little bit, before changing into the Leviathan. Let's cut the chit-chat and get going. Please gather around. S.A.E. Jean. Wah. What the? You can speak even in the Leviathan's appearance. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked out aloud after hearing the Leviathan's charmingly baritone voice. Yes, I can. 
but let's talk about that later and gather around me. In order to raise the accuracy, you guys need to stick close to me. SAE Jean. Remembering the first time they moved via instant transmission, where their faces ended up slamming into the ground, the members quickly sneaked up next to SAE Jean's position. And then, they slowly closed their eyes while feeling the surprisingly soft and squishy scales of the Leviathan. SAE Jean also closed his eyes. After recalling the coordinates once more, he also recalled the images of the cavern's interior he memorized earlier, as well. Here we go. SAE Jean. Suddenly, a strong dizziness swept by his brain. But that was only for a short moment. The party staggered while opening their eyes. The thick darkness welcomed them. SAE Jean reverted back to his human appearance while looking at the far end of the lengthy cavern. No matter how powerful the Leviathan was, it was simply far too slow outside the body of water. Phew. Okay, let's go. From now on, Knight Kim Yurin will take the lead. SAE Jean. Right. Everyone, be very quiet and follow me. Remain mindful of how you breathe, even. Kim Yurin. Following right behind Kim Yurin, the party walked forward in the darkness. Not even five minutes had passed by, yet their faces were soaked in sweat from the taut tension gripping them tightly. And another hour passed by like that. SFX for strange vibrations. An ominous tremor spread into their ears. Kim Yurin was hurriedly trying to shout out in alarm, but... But before she could, the darkness bleached out and the space got flipped on her. Kim Yurin had to close her eyes for a moment and reopen them due to the blinding whiteness. The pure white that tormented her eyes had been replaced by a deep navy blue. Worse still, she couldn't spot the rest of the party that should have been there with her in this new space. That was, with the exception of Kim Sae Jean. With a flustered face, Sae Jean spoke while looking at Kim Yurin. Looks like the Lord has caught on to us. Sae Jean. Kim Yurin surveyed the surroundings with a frustrated face. Seems like it. Kim Yurin. It was right then. The Lord's voice reverberated through the cavern. Two people present heard it clearly, the words. An orc, and a human. Welcome. The words uttered out by the Lord. Chapter, 156. The orc and the human, is it? I've enjoyed witnessing the destruction of my creation by your hands. Kim Yurin's head tilted sideways. She heard the Lord's voice just fine, but failed to understand the meaning of his words. The orc and the human the vampire lord had mentioned well, the human was here, so where was the orc? She took a look behind her, but beside the thick darkness, no such thing as an orc existed nearby. While observing the changes in her mood from the side, Sae Jean wiped the cold sweat off from his forehead. And what brings you to my abode? Fortunately for Sae Jean, the lord's dignified voice changed the topic quickly enough. Feeling hurried now, Sae Jean tried to move towards the direction of the voice quickly, but Kim Yurin didn't follow suit. No, she instead reached out and grabbed Sae Jean's wrist firmly in order to stop him, before throwing a question at the Lord. What did you mean by that just now? Kim Yurin. Regarding which matter? Just now, you said the orc and the human. Humans are here, but where is this orc you mentioned? Kim Yurin. Hmm. The Lord's lengthy and low-pitched murmuring seemed to stick to the walls of the cavern like some sticky glue. Answer me. Kim Yurin. Although I did not expect you to address me with honorific still, don't you think your attitude is a little troublesome, human? It seemed that the Lord didn't care for Kim Yurin's attitude at all. Ha. Her face hardened rather coldly. How dare he seek decorum after he drove the world to the brink of destruction. She gritted her teeth and pulled out Gungnir. In that case, allow me to beat you up and make you spit it out. Kim Yurin. As expected, even though the world may be different, humans are still arrogant and conceited. Shut up. Let's go, Guildmaster. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin shouted out confrontationally and took the lead. Sae Jean quietly followed after her. So, the two people walked in the passage while scything through the darkness. The more they walked, the stronger the sensation of the passage widening became. 
For sure, the interior of the cavern was indeed changing. To be more specific, the narrow and lengthy shape of the terrain was gradually opening up. And they must have walked non-stop for the next hour or so. Finally, the two of them were able to step into a huge open space. Ha! Huh. Really now? Just how much further should we keep walking? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck and groaned. Kim Yurin stared at him with a gentle smile, then spoke to him while surveying this huge open area. But still, I am relieved. Kim Yurin. About? S.A.E. Jean. Seeing that the Lord is within this passage, it's most likely our path is the correct one. And out of everyone in the team, we're the strongest, after all. Kim Yurin. As expected of Kim Yurin and her selfless personality, she believed it was a fortunate thing for them to face the strong and difficult opponent instead of others. S.A.E. Jean chuckled and his hand automatically rose up towards her head. Then, he went oops and stopped himself in the middle. The old habit of the hero orc, patting her head every now and then, almost broke out by mistake. Excuse me. Kim Yurin. And the eyes of Kim Yurin staring at him also widened in real time as well. He quickly withdrew his hand and coughed awkwardly. Ah, my apologies for you being a bit of a shorty. S.A.E. Jean. And he tried to turn it around with a bit of humor. I'm 168 centimeters tall. If this is too short for you, then how tall should a woman be? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin narrowed her eyes and complained. But seeing her cheeks redden a bit, he couldn't help but wonder if she liked being treated like a young kid. Of course, he threw away that idea quickly enough, though. He pointed towards the far end of the passage and spoke. I am just kidding with you. Regardless, let's hurry. It's not good to be too tense, but it's also equally bad being too rela sae jean. Kuong. Before he could finish his sentence, the entire terrain shook violently. Kuang. Kuang. Right after that, powerful shock waves spread out as if something was trying to break out from the underground. Get ready for battle. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin's occupational habit reared its head again. She shoved Sae Jean behind her and unsheathed the sword. Kwa Jiek. At the same time, the surface of the floor cracked open, and something massive climbed out from the gap. First to show up were two hands the size of an adult person, and just behind those huge hands, a pair of heads with their own pairs of blood-red eyes attached could be seen. It was an ogre. Of course, it was on a different level compared to a normal ogre. First of all, there was the thing with the number of its heads, and next, the shape of one of the heads it possessed. One head was that of an regular ogre, but the other one just so happened to be that of a Cerberus, the guardian of Hell's Gate. Looks like it received the head from an annoying guard dog. Kim Yurin TL, troll face. Kim Yurin's expression crumpled. The monster really was that disgusting to look at. But still, she couldn't overlook its potential power, now that a Cerberus and an ogre had been combined into one. She gripped her gun near real tightly while glaring at the ogre. Shararuruk. And as she was searching for the monster's weakness, a transparent and light beam-like energy descended on top of her head. She even forgot about her nervousness and exclaimed out. When that spectral light entered her body, her entire being felt much lighter than before, and the flow of mana within her blood vessels received a huge boost. She turned to look at the person responsible for this, Kim Sae Jean. He replied her quizzical look with a warm smile that even made her fluster just a little bit. It's a buff spell. Please go ahead. I'll support you with magic from the rear. S.A.E. Jean. He then morphed into the Leviathan form. Thank you. Kim Yurin. A Leviathan had her back deriving the utmost confidence from that fact alone, Kim Yurin lunged towards the ogre. S.F.X. for the ogre's roar. The ogre roared out and violently swung its jet black club. Kung. A sword emitting the brilliant golden light clashed with an unbreakable blunt instrument made out of black metal. An indescribable explosion resounded out from the contact point. A huge crater caved in on the ground, and from within the thick, choking dust cloud, seeds of flame sparkled threateningly. Only a single strike caused such a memorable scene. 
Soon enough, though, the dust cloud cleared away and the result became also clear for all to see. And that was the ogre in his missing right arm, its black metal club also gone for good. Kim Yurin pounced on the suffering ogre that was in agony after losing its arm. Her whole body felt like it was two, no, three times purer and overflowing with strength, thanks to S.A.E. Jean's incomparable buff magic. This feeling, she wanted to keep feeling it for the rest of her life. The appearance of the two-headed ogre was merely the beginning. But they could defeat other monsters without too much issues. According to Kim Yurin, it was because of their fantastic teamwork, apparently. Nominally it was a teamwork, but all S.A.E. Jean did was to support her with buff magic, actually. Of course, the level of S.A.E. Jean's spell was way too high to label it as a simple support magic, dot. As the sorcery formed the foundation for this difficult buff spell, S.A.E. Jean had to morph into the Leviathan form just in order to maintain it. And its effects were just as excellent, too. Anyways. As they eliminated various chimeras that tried to block their path and continued on forward, they eventually encountered a rather suspicious-looking door. Even with a single, casual look, it was an old-fashioned and dignified door that screamed the final boss is here. Strange figures painted in white color decorated the black door. Shall we? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked, and S.A.E. Jean wordlessly grabbed the door handle. I wanted to open it, though, Kim Yurin lightly complained and nodded her head. S.A.E. Jean chuckled slightly and pushed the door open. S.F.X. for the creaky sound of a door opening. The door issued a worn-out creak as it opened. Past the doorway, the very first thing they spotted was an old man wearing a black robe that seemed tattered and disheveled. Then, they saw his energy-less drooping shoulders and the white eyes that had lost vitality a long time ago. He was blind as well. His eyes S.A.E. Jean. Only then, S.A.E. Jean realized why the Lord failed to show himself even though Nisferatus were openly rebelling, as well as when Bathory showed signs of suspicious behavior. A leader of the organization that couldn't be of any help for the said organization was no longer acknowledged as the leader. There were only two possible endings waiting for such a person one, get eaten by the challenger, or two, retire on his own volition. I heard you possessed eyes that could see everything. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin taunted and pointed the tip of her gungnir at the lord's neck. The lord stared at the two of them with those eyes that couldn't see nor reflect anything. However, although they might have lost their original functions, it sure felt like his eyes could still decipher the truths of all things regardless. As you can see, my eyes have lost their clarity already. The Vampire Lord. The lord's phlegm-laden voice sounded calm and stable, yet the tone indicated he was sternly admonishing the pair of intruders before him. That was quite evident from the smoldering rage hidden in his calm appearance. That means, we can get rid of you quite easily, no? S.A.E. Jean. This time, S.A.E. Jean spoke up. He grasped the Bathory's gift tightly and got ready to pounce on the Lord. However, Kim Yurin stretched her arm out and stopped him. Her face said that she somehow managed to remember just now the question she had nearly forgotten about. There's something I'm curious about. Kim Yurin. And what would that be? The Vampire Lord. In that moment, S.A.E. Jean's face became dyed in panic. The question she wanted to ask the Lord was quite obvious, really. Obviously. You clearly said, the orc and the human when we came here. Are you saying that the orc is here too? And which orc are you referring to, when you said the orc? Kim Yurin. The Lord maintained his silence. Meanwhile, S.A.E. Jean changed back into the Leviathan form. He was thinking of firing off the mana cannon and killing the Lord before he opened his mouth. Unfortunately, though that ended up being the bad move on his part. Indeed, a measly human with a trait that allows you to transform into many other lifeforms seeing it with my own eyes, it is truly interesting. The Vampire Lord The Lord's words seemed to strike home way too accurately for a blind man. Oh, the Lady Knight, what are you even talking about? The orc resides within that man. I have remembered his appearance especially so, because he was in his orc form when he slew my chimera. That is why I have referred to this man as the orc. The Vampire Lord. Instantly, all of Kim Yurin's movement ceased up. 
SFX for the sound of winds blowing. A cold and ominous wind blew in from the wide open doorway. As if that coldness had woken her up, Kim Yurin turned her head towards SAE Jean's direction. Within her enlarged eyes, several emotions, such as confusion, surprise, a sense of betrayal, etc., etc., swirled about crazily. Even though S.A.E. Jean could feel her eyes staring at him, he continued to wordlessly study the Lord. As the silence flowed thickly between the two, the Lord eventually opened his mouth again. Perchance, she did not know. I wonder why. The Vampire Lord. Just, what does this mean? Kim Yurin. She finally opened her mouth, too, and asked. However, the recipient of that question wasn't the Vampire Lord, but Kim Sae Jean. Only then, Sae Jean turned his head towards her and met her eyes. He could see the reflection of the Leviathan within her trembling pupils. Suddenly, he thought he looked disgusting for some reason. So, he reverted back to his human appearance. He gritted his teeth and shifted his glare back at the Lord, and then spoke up. He's attempting to drive a wedge between us. Do not be mislead. S.A.E. Jean. Drive a wedge. What can you possibly mean by that? The Vampire Lord. Unfortunately, the Lord interfered. With an insidious and sly smile on his face, to boot. Oh, the Lady Knight. Truth always leaves crumbs of evidence behind. And you should have been faintly aware of those evidence crumbs by now. The Vampire Lord. Kim Yurin's eyes remained fixed on S.A.E. Jean while the Lord's words entered her ears. And so, she began recalling things one by one. Her prior suspicion regarding the small insignia placed on the orc blacksmith's weapons that S.A.E. Jean had crafted. That could be also found on the hero orc's weapon that strangely firm belief the orc had in Kim S.A.E. Jean those habits S.A.E. Jean unconsciously exhibited that were so, so similar to that of the orc and finally, his trait where he could change into a monster. At the same time, all the questions she held deep inside flooded back out. All those questions she had suppressed with the single thought, it's not possible, bubbled back up to the surface once more. Mr. Guildmaster. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin's face hardened, but she didn't speak any further. She used silence to pressure S.A.E. Jean. Should he tell her the truth? But honestly, he felt hesitant to do so. After all, those actions he performed without giving it much thought as the orc would be seen as him making utter fool out of her from Kim Yurin's perspective. Later. There is more important work we need to finish first. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean called up the excuse of later, in order to overcome this critical moment. Obviously, they did have a mission to complete here he grasped the silver knife tightly and started walking towards the vampire lord. No. Kim Yurin. But Kim Yurin proved to be a stubborn customer. The story will take too long to finish. We have something to S.A.E. Jean. All I want is one simple answer. It's not going to take long. Kim Yurin. Her firmly shut lips and her sharply narrowed eyes with an expression as grave and serious, something S.A.E. Jean had never seen her make before, she continued with her words. You, you are the hero orc, yes. Your trait, you can transform into other forms besides the Leviathan, yes. Chapter, 157 Creator, A Passing Wanderer Editor, Akshathedon Do you have a completed novel just sitting around doing nothing? Do you want to earn money off it instead? Well, log in now and submit a novel on your profile. You will earn revenue based on the amount of users you attract. Only novels with good English will be accepted. Stuck between Kim Yurin busy demanding answers, and the vampire lord who was gazing on expectantly, S.A.E. Jean fell into a dilemma of sorts. One second, then one minute, valuable time was being wasted away in anxiety. During this time, the vampire lord was kind enough not to attack first and he instead waited for them. It seemed that he didn't think too highly of the current situation's seriousness at all. S.A.E. Jean closed his eyes and sighed out grandly. The nervous swallowing from Kim Yurin sounded really loud at that moment. I am. S.A.E. Jean. However, S.A.E. Jean didn't continue. Rather, the chilling sound effect of a blade-piercing flesh cried out, instead. 
the wide-eyed Kim Yurin hurriedly turned her head towards the Lord. A silver knife was buried deeply in his solar plexus. Kyuyu. You dirty scoundrel. The vampire lord. The lord spat out his rage and blood at the same time. I was aiming for the heart, though. You somehow dodged. S.A.E. Jean. The knife's flight time was probably less than zero. One seconds, no more than a blink. But still, fitting for the one holding the title of the vampire lord, he twisted his body just in time to avoid getting struck in his heart. And with this first strike done and dusted now, there was no more room left to hold a conversation. Kim Yurin gritted her teeth and held her gun near tightly. S.A.E. Jean spoke to her in the meantime. Don't forget our real purpose from here onwards, please. I'll tell you everything once this is over. S.A.E. Jean. That promise, I'll hold you to it. Kim Yurin. At the same time, the ground below changed. No, the space itself seemed to warp. The floor they stood on became dyed in blood-red color, and the Lord, once close enough for them to touch by reaching out, was pulled back to a far-off distance, glaring at their direction. Almost right away, the reddened ground began to literally boil, and giant monsters rose up one by one. Even among those, there was one particular creature that caught their attention. A giant snake-like existence seemingly painted in ash, that was both real and at the same time, not. The Twilight Spirit. A demonic creature commonly thought of as the apex of all undead type monsters. That wasn't the only monster to come out, though. A two-headed ogre, a crimson wyvern, death knights, etc., etc. Fifteen monsters that could individually bring an entire city to a standstill appeared and filled up the room. Well, this looks like it might get tricky for only the two of us. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin muttered out with a frustrated voice. S.A.E. Jean shook his head at her declaration, however. We just need to endure for a while. There's a parasitic mana and a powerful poison applied to the blade of that knife. If the Lord is maintaining this space with his mana, he's not going to last long. S.A.E. Jean. In that case, I should help out with the process, then. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin grasped her sword in reverse grip. She was planning to fire off a beam of light in the blink of an eye to kill the Lord. TL, the raw stated in verse grip but Google search returned nothing on that front. So I changed to reverse. Seems a bit wrong, though, so I'm leaving this TL note here. On the other hand, SAE Jean transformed back into the Leviathan and summoned the Kraken to divert the danger away from her. Just as the Kraken's suction pad stretched out on the ground, with a loud quahahaha, Kim Yurin's beam of energy shot forward like a bolt of lightning. The monsters summoned by the Lord got in the path of the beam to block it with their bodies, but the energy beam simply blasted past all flesh and bones to successfully blow away the Vampire Lord's arm. Her trait was set to pierce through everything, that was why. Kuahak. The Lord's pain scream was the signal the fifteen summoned monsters lunged forward. S.A.E. Jean exhausted over half of his mana reserve and fired off the mana cannon, and almost half of the monsters were killed off on the spot. However, the super-annoying Twilight Spirit and the fleet-footed Death Knights were still fine. They bared fangs and swords instead, thick killing intent fully on display. I'll take on that snake-like creature. The Death Knights are yours. S.A.E. Jean. Got it. Kim Yurin. The Twilight Spirit was a monster existing on the boundaries of ambiguity, and was both a physical being and not at the same time. In other words, it could freely alter its nature, and the characteristics of itself at will. So it could become immaterial to evade an attack, then become a physical being again to counter. Such as now. Kyup. The snake's tail materialized out of thin air and struck S.A.E. Jean's stomach. As he was forced back by some considerable distance, he tried to come up with ways to kill that thing. From what he learned from the monster bestiary, this monster couldn't be killed with regular attacks. And the mana cannon with its limited range wouldn't work on that nimble creature, either. However, as the lycanthrope, he could prize out a weakness in it. So, he had to aim for that. He quickly changed into the lycanthrope form. At the same time, a big shadow loomed over his head. 
A death knight's massive sword came down to split his head in half, but Kim Yurin's golden beam of energy deflected it away. A werewolf? That's crazy. So, the plan. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked him while deploying the acrobatic swordsmanship to ward off the death knight's attacks. Let's kill other monsters first. We can then go one on one with the boss monst. Yuhurk. S.A.E. Jean. As he was in the middle of his answer, S.A.E. Jean got hit on the belly by that dang tail again. Kwong Kwong, Kwong Kwong. Even while he was flung away, countless attacks rained down on him. He felt like his entire body was turning into a meat paste. He got hit, so that hurt like hell, and the pain caused him to get angry. He activated the eyes of the wolf. The body of the twilight spirit as seen through his eye was as expected, jet black, no weaknesses whatsoever. But when he focused his glare where the monster's heart should be, a faint red spot gradually developed. And so, one single weakness had emerged. S.A.E. Jean confidently pounced on the monster. Time to die. You hark. S.A.E. Jean. Too bad, he had forgotten that, although there was a weakness now, he still lacked strength to fight it one on one. Kim S.A.E. Jean was flung away to a far off distance with a single flick of the monster's tail. Ayut. At the same time, Kim Yurin's groan could be heard as well. Surprisingly enough, although she was still being buffed with support magic, she used her own strength to defeat three of the five death knights surrounding her. But as a human, it was asking far too much of her martial prowess to contend with five near-boss level monsters like the death knights. The kraken was helping out on the side, but ever since S.A.E. Jean stopped using the leviathan form, its might had decreased significantly. In that moment, the Death Knight's massive sword drew towards the exhausted Kim Yurin's direction. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly ran over there and tried to block that swinging sword. But, it was right then. The space contracted suddenly, and all the summoned monsters disappeared. Just in the nick of time, the Vampire Lord's strength had been exhausted. Two people sighed out in relief and controlled their rough breathing. However, the Twilight Spirit remained for some reason. The monster maintained the physical form and as if to protect the lord, stood in front of him. No matter what petty tricks you come up with, you'll still die, so why don't you quietly give up now? S.A.E. Jean. Hugh. Ho ho. The lord continued to laugh even after hearing S.A.E. Jean's taunts. The twilight spirit moved to the side of the lord at the same time. Then, the lord shoved his hand into the heart of the monster the heart was ripped out while spewing out blood everywhere like a fountain. What the? This is an existence that shares my blood. I've made it by sacrificing my own soul. The vampire lord. While muttering the words they couldn't quite comprehend, the lord began biting into the heart, consuming it bit by bit. It was indeed a grotesque sight to behold, but it wasn't all that difficult to figure out the meaning behind his actions well, his complexion improved greatly, and his body size ballooned up to a huge size, after all. Kohaha. Continuously growing larger and larger until he was as big as an ogre, the lord viciously laughed out and pounced on S.A.E. Jean and Kim Yurin's direction. For a something that big, he moved seriously fast. The lord arrived in the blink of an eye and his fist flew toward their way. The moment they blocked that hit, it felt like every single bone in their bodies were twisting apart and exploding out from their bodies the Lord Strike was that terrifyingly powerful. Even though the two of them shared the burden, the pressure was so immense that their eyeballs were about to pop out from the sockets. One seconds, two, then three. The incredible pressure gradually grew greater along with the Lord's ballooning muscles as the seconds ticked by. If this continued, they would surely be squashed to death. S.A.E. Jean glared at the Lord with his bloodshot eyes. The darn starred was smiling. That evil grin was so disgusting, S.A.E. Jean also wanted to wipe it away really badly. He desperately rolled his brain that was on the brink of being squashed flat, until one possible method popped up in his head. The orc, and that most pure body thingy. That skill allowed him to increase his physical strength by 1000%. If he added the Warrior of Reversal on top of that, then there should be nothing in this world that rivaled him for physical might. Kim Yurin was next to him but, since he had resigned himself to tell her the truth, it was now only the matter of time, 
instead. His thoughts were quick, but his actions were even quicker. The thick fur covering his body disappeared, while his muscles quivered and quaked as his skin started to change. Changing into the orc form, Sae Jean opened his eyes wide, and at the same time as activating the Warrior of Reversal, he explosively forced his strength well past his limit. SFX for the orc's roar. The violently surging strength he could not control exploded out of his mouth. This marvelous power, this sense of overbearing boost bursting out from his insides with that, he shoved the lord's fist away with only one hand. Yuyuk. Freed from the lord's pressure, Kim Yurin crumbled to the ground. And she dazedly turned her gaze sideways. An orc, instead of Kim Sae Jean, was standing there. Ha! Seriously, I can't even. Utterly stunned, she broke out in a bitter chuckle. The person she harbored warm emotions for the first time in her life turned out to be not an orc at all. She didn't know whether to feel relieved, or be very set off at the man who had seemingly made fun of her until now. But she couldn't think too deeply about this. Her entire being felt fatigued. And an unavoidable sense of weakness washed over. She fainted in exhaustion where she sat. Oh, child. You have lost your humanity. The Vampire Lord. The Lord dazedly murmured as he stared at Sae Jean and his brightly burning body. Why don't you take a moment to compose yourself? The Vampire Lord. Stop barking like a dog. Sae Jean. Sae Jean the orc jumped up towards the midriff where the silver knife still remained stuck, and went to town there. The Vampire Lord spat out a mouthful of blood. Then, he muttered strange words. Agrabahak Sobit. What was that? Sae Jean. Hoo hoo. The Vampire Lord. His grin was rather ominous. Soon after, the Lord's body began to shrink back like a deflating balloon. He staggered around before falling on his back, then gazed at the darkened ceiling with sorrowful eyes. I cannot see anything anymore. The Vampire Lord. Really? Sae Jean. Ever since losing my sight. I didn't expect my end to be like this. Oh child, come closer. Now that I've welcomed my fate, there is something I must tell you. Are you not curious, just what research I have been performing in here? The Vampire Lord. The Lord gestured him to come closer. The orc tilted his head and approached the dying vampire. And the Lord whispered several strange words to the orc's ear. Sae Jean the orc's brows narrowed. He just couldn't really understand what he was saying, centered around the words monster, future, and past. Unfortunately, before explaining further, the lord's breathing came to a gradual stop. And so, the vampire lord was dead. And just like the decrepit king he was, his end was wretched and hollow. Meanwhile, Kim Yurin woke up largely in scathe after drinking a potion. The two of them Sae Jean and Kim Yurin set out to locate the rest of the team. But they didn't talk. Trapped within this stubborn silence, they found the missing team members one by one. Yi Hyrin and Ju Jihyuk were this close from being frozen to death Hazeline and Yu Bexong must have had a huge catfight as their faces were crimson red. Their breathing rough and heavy while both the conditions of Rosradel and Kim Sunho were quite critical. Having lost an arm each, if they were found even a minute later, they might have died. In any case, everyone was alive, much to their relief. Sae Jean used the sorcery to teleport everyone back to the underground conference room. While Yi Hyrin and Ju Ji Hyuk warmed their bodies up, Sae Jin begun his treatment on Rosradel and Kim Sun Ho but, during that time, Yu Bek Song and Hazeline broke out in yet another fight. And no, it wasn't some cute war of words either it was more apt to describe it as fierce brawl, instead. Please, calm down, calm down I say. Just what happened back there? Yi Hyrin. Will you two just stop already? Stop. Ju Ji Hyuk. Yi Hyrin grabbed Hazeline's arms, while Ju Ji Hyuk held Yu Bexong back. But, she keeps teasing me and calls me a little kitty. Yu Bexong. Ha, just when did I do that? You started first by saying that I like Sae. Hazeline. Yu Bexong's angry shout resounded to everywhere, but too bad, Hazeline's retort couldn't continue and had to come to a complete stop. 
Hazeline could only shrink away while checking out SAE Jean's reactions. It was then. Kim Yurin remained deep in thought, before she suddenly stood up from the couch. I'm going ahead first. Kim Yurin. She spoke while staring at SAE Jean pointedly. Ah, uh, sure. T, take care. SAE Jean. You're not coming. Kim Yurin. Eh. SAE Jean. SAE Jean panicked at that moment. But, with a great timing, Joe Hansung's phone call arrived at the same time. Please wait for a sec. Let me get this first. Hello. What's the matter? SAE Jean. Hello, Guild Master. Sir, we've got too many artifact orders piled up as we speak. So, I have set down dates for interviews, but... The contents were about the artifacts. The monster lowered the pricing of the artifacts after taking into consideration the current climate of the world, and well, the number of orders coming from around the globe literally exploded. So, perhaps inevitably, they had to hold face-to-face -face interviews, in order to pick the right sort of people to own these artifacts. Oh, that. I'll take care of that later on, so don't worry. For now, give priority to the compiled list and sell accordingly, please. SAE Jean. Yes, sir. I understand. SAE Jean quickly ended the call. But Kim Yurin had long disappeared to elsewhere. Ha. Huh. She went upstairs. Follow her. To know what's going on, but still. E Hai Rin. E Hai Rin answered for him. So, he hurriedly chased after Kim Yurin. Chapter 158. Wrapped up inside the thick darkness of the night, underneath the cold glare of the moon. Kim Yurin was sitting on one of the Monster Park's benches. Her eyes were closed, as if she was in a state of deep contemplation. Sae Jean breathed in deeply and walked towards her position. I'm disappointed. Kim Yurin. Before he could get near her, though, she threw out this one line at him. He scratched the back of his neck while lowering his head. I mean, seriously. Yes, it was somewhat odd, for sure how can an orc resemble a human so closely like that ah, uh, now that I think about it, I do remember seeing several points that are really similar to Mr. S.A.E. Jean's countenance, after all. Kim Yurin. Her reactions were completely out of S.A.E. Jean's expectations. Although not at the level of wanting to mow down everything, he at least thought she might get angry at him. But no, what she displayed wasn't the rage at being deceived, nor sadness at finding out the hero orc wasn't real, but self-mockery that blamed herself instead. And that only made S.A.E. Jean feel even worse than before and far more apologetic as well. S.A.E. Jean sat on the opposite end of the bench Kim Yurin sat on. She gazed at the moon drawn on the night sky and continued with her words. No, from the beginning, an orc with IQ known to be lower than that of a dolphin learning to speak was a nonsensical notion. I should have realized that something was amiss then it's all because of that goblin Kim Yurin. After hearing her sudden change in the topic, S.A.E. Jean's body shook imperceptibly. That goblin. Without a doubt, she must be talking about the tale from a long time ago. Ah, uh, right. Guildmaster, did you know that goblins can learn to speak, too? Kim Yurin. Gee, goblins, you say? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Well, goblins are the smartest among all the monsters, after all. So, among the smart goblins, the one with the most smartest brain can learn how to speak Korean. But that was my mistake, thinking that a mutated orc could definitely learn to talk, too. So, I'm definitely not a fool in that regard, right? Even other people with similar experiences would have been deceived. Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean's complexion froze up along with her words. His gestures became eye-catchingly strange, and his breathing became quite rough as well. Why are you reacting like that? It's the truth. I've experienced it firsthand. Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean didn't reply. He was already feeling so, so apologetic right now, and well, he realized that he just couldn't speak another lie to her again. But, she ended up misinterpreting his current reaction and showed her frustration with a deep frown. You don't believe me huh, fine. Forget about it. 
It'll be more strange to believe me anyway. Kim Yurin. No, I do believe you. Sae Jean. He resolutely replied to her and stared at Kim Yurin with his eyes wide open. Seeing his sudden enthusiasm, Kim Yurin's face reddened ever so slightly. Oh, uh, thank you for believing me, Kim Yurin. The thing is, that goblin, that was also me. Sae Jean. Eh. This time, it was Kim Yurin who ceased all her movements, her mouth half open, and her eyes opened up extra round. Thinking that she might not believe him, Sae Jean hammered the final nail in this particular coffin. Your gift, I received it well. It's an expensive ring, too. Sae Jean. Ah. Uh. She fell into a pool of thought for a brief moment her ring as a gift. A ring given away as a gift was a fact that only she and the goblin knew. No one else. Mm. So that's how it was. Kim Yurin. Plop. She dazedly muttered out something, and then collapsed. The physical strain of fighting against the vampire lord, as well as two mental shocks, caused her to faint. What the? Miss Yurin? Why? Sae Jean. Stunned silly by this new development, Sae Jean quickly used healing magic on her. But when she still didn't regain her consciousness, he quickly carried her off to the nearest hospital. After admitting Kim Yurin to the hospital, Sae Jean went around sorting out the strained relationships of the guild members that soured for one reason or the other. And finally, came back home. The time was five o'clock in the afternoon. Since USAE Young was busy with the matters related to the Wizard Tower and frequently had to be away, the house was left totally empty for the first time in a long while. A few. He dug into the couch while spitting out a long sigh thick with all the accumulated fatigue. Somehow, he felt empty and hollow. The mission was over, and the sense of extreme enervation gripped his entire body. Thinking that he must have been feeling lonely, SAE Jean turned on the TV. With a good timing, USAE Young's face filled up the screen. When are you planning for the IPO of the Dawn TM's Wizard Tower? Listing stocks for the tower. Is there a need for me to do that? After all, our Wizard Tower can fully sustain itself without resorting to such methods, you see. It was an interview on a news program. USAE Young came across as very confident in her speech. Seeing her on the screen, he ended up wanting to see her for real. So, he called her on the phone. Wung, Wung after the ringtone went on for three, four times, the call got through. Hey, Sae Young. Where are you now? Sae Jean. Muong. Me, I'm eating out with people who will work for the Wizard Tower, yep. Her voice was a bit slurred. Did she drink alcohol? Sae Jean's brows narrowed all of a sudden. Where? Sae Jean. Ah, uh, here. A sushi restaurant. As she spoke on the phone, another voice belonging to a man repeatedly saying who are you speaking to? Interfered in the background. Unconsciously, Sae Jean cracked his neck. The sounds of Wow Duk. Wow Duk rang out rather clearly. Which sushi restaurant? Sae Jean. Ah Hyung. Oh, why did you call me, Appa? I was wondering where you went off to. Hey, so where are you right now? Ah, uh, here. Ah, uh, not so sure. You want to get killed. Ahim. Forgive me. It's a meeting for the tower, so if Appa shows up, I'm gonna get shoved aside, you know. Of course, he could understand that much. But right now, that clueless dude next to her asking who is that? Who's calling? Was seriously getting on his nerves. Okay, fine. Then switch the phone to the speaker. I want to say something. Sae Jean. Uh. Uh, oh is there really a need for that now? I'll speak on your behalf. I promise, it'll be real quick. I'm not coming home for a whole week if you don't. Sae Jean. Eii okay, okay. Fine. It's done, you're on speaker. Sae Jean manipulated his vocal cord and changed his voice a little bit. And then, towards all those people relaxedly dining out and building a strong friendship, he threw out the proverbial bombshell. Uem. 
Hello, everyone, this is the Wizard of Bangbaedong speaking. Currently, I'm with Mr. Kim Sae Jin. I'm making this call after having a good chat with him. You see, I'm planning to publish the grimoires number 27 and 28 very soon. And so, I seek two capable persons who will examine and verify the contents of the books. Is there anyone among you who is interested in the role? Sae Jin the Wizard. He spoke up to here and waited for three seconds. By examining the grimoires, one could have his or her name associated with the Wizard of Bangbaedong's grimoire for free. That alone would increase their fame far greatly than ever thought possible. And sure enough, the animalistic heavy breathing of every wizard wishing to seize this enormous opportunity could be heard through the phone. Sae Jean did his very best to hold back his laughter and spoke in a serious tone. If no one is interested, then it can't be helped, I guess. Sae Jean. Instantly, wizards reacted. At first, in order to prove each one of them possessed the right qualifications over the person next to him or her, they began quietly debating their academic abilities. Seeing that the wizard Nim of Bangbaedong has been continuously publishing attack magic spells lately, I, who has steadfastly walked the road of attack magic until now should be the one to examine the new grimoires. No, that's not right. Attacking spells needs to be combined with other types of spells. From that point of view, I should take on the responsibility, as I've arduously walked on the path of application and utilization of various magics. Both of you are wrong. From the onset, something this important should be seen by someone with a deep academic background, instead. Huh, what do you mean by a deep academic background? Are you using that inconsequential reasoning for such an important matter? TL, oh boy. These four paragraphs were an absolute mess to TL. I did what I could, but not sure how close I got to what the author was trying to say. However, the tone of the voice got heated as rebuttal after rebuttal were thrown around. And soon enough, not only angry shouts but even the sounds of plates, tables, and other furniture being destroyed could be heard from the phone. Ho <laughs> ho. They're fighting so nicely. Sae Jean. Sae Jean was enjoying the sound of the chaos, but then, the noise got abruptly cut off. It seemed that Usae Young had left the restaurant in a hurry. Those people lost their dang marbles. Just now, they were even getting ready to use magic, you know. He he he. In that case, why don't you bring along the winner over here? Sae Jean. You're a rotten person, you know that. Seriously now. Although her dinner out was totally ruined, she sounded rather pleased for some reason. By the way, publishing two grimoires at the same time, is that true? If you're lying, I'm going to get mad. And that was why. Sae Jean smirked slightly. Of course, I will. Okay, where are you? I'll pick you up. Sae Jean. Oh yeah. I'm at the Tebudong Sashimi. Hurry up, Appa. On the way. Sae Jean. Sae Jean ended the call and put on the coat. But, as he was about to leave, he overheard the news still left playing on the TV screen. A news just in. It has been now confirmed that a supermassive fissure has opened up in the region of Western Europe. This fissure is the biggest ever recorded in the history to appear in Europe. What's going on? Sae Jean. This was different from the promise with her. So, Sae Jean tried to contact Bathory through the communication crystal hidden in his pocket, but she didn't reply. Was she going back on her promise? Just as the back of his head began developing a strong case of migraine, Bathory's voice got transmitted to him, which was fortunate. Come see me tomorrow. Busy today. Immediately on the following day, Sae Jean went to see Bathory. I'm sure you found out already whether we succeeded or not. Sae Jean. Yep. I know already. Elos and their loyal dogs were throwing a huge tantrum not too long ago. Bathory. Bathory was pretending to be relaxed, but the emotions of sadness couldn't be disguised in her voice. Plus, her eyes staring at Sae Jean weren't even looking at him, either memories of distant past were sorrowfully overflowing from within those eyes that rippled like the surface of a lake. Who's Elos now? Sae Jean. When Sae Jean asked her, Bathory tilted her head in confusion. 
It looked as if she had misplaced a couple of screws in her head. Oh, El Los. They are a clan. The Bathory, the Nisferatu, the El Los only these three remain now. Bathory. She forced out a smile and continued on. And, your prediction was right. What the Lord wanted wasn't going back in time, just a simple travel through to another dimension. Apparently, after deciphering the text from the ancient tome, jumping both the time flow and dimensions at the same time is impossible. Bathory. Is that so? S.A.E. Jean. Because of that, both the El Los and the Lord's retainers are in a state of rage right now. I think the Lord was thinking of running away alone. Bathory. On top of that, the treasure that controlled the vampire's instincts for blood has been lost a long time ago after the Lord lost his sight. How pathetic. Bathory. Bathory stopped talking here. S.A.E. Jean too, didn't say anything. However, when he came to see her, he had lots of things to say. The incident involving the fisher in Western Europe the future for the vampires that have lost the central figure of the Lord Bathory's aim and even, persuading her to assimilate back into the society. S.A.E. Jean couldn't utter any of these out. The reason? Teardrops forming on the corners of Bathory's eyes. Sure, S.A.E. Jean couldn't get her fickle nature that took her from asking him to kill the Lord, and to mourn his passing, but whatever, the sorrow she displayed right now was, without a doubt, genuine. What a coward. Good thing he died. Bathory. Bathory spoke thus, her voice tinged in deep sadness. However, he couldn't return empty-handed after going through the big showdown of the day before. So, S.A.E. Jean cautiously asked her about the giant fisher of Western Europe first. We have nothing to do with that one. Bathory. What? Really? S.A.E. Jean. Yeah. We didn't touch other fishers except the one here in Korea. Bathory. Does that mean there's another force at work here? S.A.E. Jean. Nope. That's just nature playing its part. From the moment the first fissure opened up, the future path for this little planet called Earth became full of thorns, so to speak. Bathory. What do you mean by that? S.A.E. Jean. What I mean is that, this planet Earth will meet the same fate as my old homeworld, that's what. The Lord was trying to escape before that happened, too. But I don't know all the details. I also just heard about it not too long ago, you know. Bathory. From who? S.A.E. Jean. From my subordinates. They are busy trying to decipher the results of the research the Lord has performed, right now. I'm getting updated in real time as we speak. Bathory. Bathory then abruptly stood from her seat. Okay, you should go now. As promised, we won't interfere with you lot or try to extend the fissure forcefully or stuff like that. With that much, you should have about a year's worth of breathing room. Bathory. Just one year. S.A.E. Jean. Yup. So, you should decide and prepare whether you'll act like us and escape to another world, or stay and fight till the bitter end. Bathory. What will you do? S.A.E. Jean. Bathory narrowed her brows as if she was getting frustrated with a little kid. Our object has always been the same to return to our old home world, see. So, get the EFF out, now. Bathory. She suddenly grabbed S.A.E. Jean's collars real tightly. And then, an unpleasant sensation of the entire world twisting apart washed over, causing him to squeeze his eyes shut. When he belatedly opened his eyes again, Bathory was nowhere to be seen, and instead, the sight of Seoul's Gangnam district filled up his vision. Why Gangnam, of all places? S.A.E. Jean. As he looked around dumbfoundedly, whisperings of the passers-by tickled his ears. What the? Isn't he that Kim S.A.E. Jean guy? You might be right. Hey man, go and take a closer look. It hadn't even been a minute yet, but the waves of crowd were gradually building up. S.A.E. Jean let out a groan of exclamation, thinking that celebrities could indeed upset the heavens if needed, and quickly moved his feet. Too bad, his actions only ended up confirming the crowd's suspicions. It is Kim S.A.E. Jean. Appa, please give me your autograph. Appa Ak. Getting scared by that loud cry, 
Sae Jean ran away like his rear was on fire. Chapter 159 All the core posts for the Dawn TM's wizard tower had now been mostly filled up the vice tower lord and seven chief wizards that were similar to executive directors in a regular corporation. Plus the employee level high class, mid class, and low class positions, as well. The name of the vice lord caused a massive stir, however. The wizard appointed to this prestigious position was none other than the High Elf Shahan, former vice lord of the New York based World No. 2 Wizard Tower, Trinity. Dot. After the announcement for her appointment was made, Shahan expressed her sincere gratitude towards the Dawn TM's tower through various interviews she did with the mass media. Hell, she even did that in fluent Korean. No one had any idea when she learned the language, either. Not only that, the identities of the people filling up the chief wizard positions were quite something to behold as well former vice lord for the Seoul Tower. Former lord of Busan Tower, etc., etc. They consisted of famous local and international wizards. However, the most important position remained vacant while other spots were steadily being filled up. Not one person expressed their curiosity regarding that, though. After all, everyone understood that this position could only go to the wizard of Bang Dong and no one else. Even someone like Hazeline, who had once been a part of the wizarding world but left it due to a certain unsavory incident, thought the same as well but, only until the wizard of Bang Dong himself, Kim Sae Jean, personally called for her. Excuse me? Hazeline. Currently, inside Sae Jean's office. Hazeline asked him in a daze while sitting opposite him. Within her extra round eyes, questions and disbelief floated about. So, what do you think? I personally think you're the perfect fit. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean smiled as he spoke. The reason why he summoned her here was simple. It was to appoint her the new tower lord. The media might throw a hissy fit and say what on earth he was thinking, but this wasn't a completely left field hiring at all because, although she was currently the well known alchemist Miss Hazeline, her actual origin lied with magic. She simply stepped away on her own volition after failing to control her emotions properly. But Sae Jean believed she still possessed a massive attachment to the world of magic, even now. If not, then there wouldn't be a reason for her to look up the wizard's online chat rooms and communities periodically no reason to jump around in joy like a little kid after successfully learning a new spell. And of course, no point in her coming up with the fake identity of Shenarin and secretly acting as a wizard, either. Hazeline maintained her silence probably because of Kim Yurin. Unless Hazeline resolved her long-standing conflict and the guilt associated with it, she would never be able to find the necessary courage to return to the world of magic, perhaps for the rest of her life. The thing is Hazeline. Hazeline fixed her stares to the floor and opened her mouth while fidgeting uncomfortably. Her voice was so weak and quiet. Mr. Sae Jean, thank you for your consideration. But, my abilities aren't Hazeline. I'm sure they are better than Miss Shahan's. You perfectly studied all of the Bang Dong wizard's grimoires, after all. Sae Jean. Hazeline had been virtually camping out in the guild's members-only library of late obviously, in order to thoroughly study the grimoires of Bang Dong Wizard. Currently, she had flawlessly memorized the books number 1 to 26, and had reached the stage where she could potentially invent her own unique attack spell as well. So, her qualifications were more than good enough. But, she still lacked confidence. No, it was more like, she lacked courage. That's only because of the mana tattoos, you know. What I lack in technique, I cover it with increased mana reserve, that's all. And also, I has a line. It seemed that she had more things to say, but other than her lips moving a bit, no words came out of them. Sae Jean didn't know the exact words she wanted to say, but he could still roughly estimate what she wanted to say, regardless. Miss Kim Yurin also gave her consent. Sae Jean. Eh. Those words seemed unrealistic, rather than shocking, to her. Because, there was no way Kim Yurin would forgive her. While studying her face frozen in stunned silence, Sae Jean recalled the events from the day before. If you're asking me for my professional opinion, then I'm against it. No. Totally against it. Totally, completely, against it. Kim Yurin. 
Her answer was very resolute for a patient still lying on a hospital bed. And there was even a hint of hostility in Kim Yurin's expressions. But, why? S.A.E. Jean. She's definitely not normal in her head. I mean, where in the world can you find a crazy woman like her who poisons a person's potion? There's no guarantee that she won't do that ever again. Kim Yurin. But you also don't have the guarantee that she will do it again, either. S.A.E. Jean. In any case, I'm still totally against it. It's too risky. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin pouted heavily. At the ends of her hospital bed, stuffed dolls of the orc and Athene stood side by side. S.A.E. Jean reached out and took the orc doll. A sense of unease entered Kim Yurin's eyes, hoping that he wouldn't take the doll away. Just what happened between you two? S.A.E. Jean. He gently patted the top of the orc doll and placed it on top of the bureau next to her bed. It's complicated. By a lot. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin reached out and rescued the doll from the cold, hard wooden surface. And then, hid it securely under the covers. Well, it's not my place to pry into your past however, Miss Hazeline is just about perfect for the position of the Tower Lord. At a bare minimum, I'd like a wizard who is close to me filling up that position. S.A.E. Jean. Surely, there must be lots of other, more suitable wizards you can find, right? No, besides that, why are you asking me about this? I'm not related to this matter at all. If the guild master wishes for it, then you can just hire that crazy bit that person, am I wrong? Kim Yurin. She remained resolute. As befitting a thirty-year-old boyfriendless lifelong loner, she was like an iron wall. That's because, without your consent, I'm pretty certain that Miss Hazeline wouldn't want to do it, either. S.A.E. Jean. No way that's true. Kim Yurin. Yes, way. Kim Yurin looked like she didn't believe him. She even went as far as to change the topic of the conversation when S.A.E. Jean tried to continue his persuasion. Let's talk about that later. More importantly, there's something I'm curious about, Guildmaster. Kim Yurin. Okay, what is it? S.A.E. Jean. I saw at the end there. What did the Lord say to you? Kim Yurin. The whispered words of the dying vampire Lord S.A.E. Jean couldn't understand them back then, and he still couldn't understand even now. But he remembered them all too clearly. It was like he was making a prophecy of some kind, but I have no idea what he was trying to say. On top of that, some of the words must have been in the vampire language, because I couldn't even hear those parts at all. When the Leviathan form evolved he became able to decipher a handful of the native vampire language, but truly, they were just a meager handful. And all of them happened to be swearing, too. But, Kim Yurin didn't lose her interest in this matter. What did he end up saying? Kim Yurin. Hmm. I stole a peek through a certain treasure of the Nisferatus. The worst monster in the history will become the hero. It was something like that. S.A.E. Jean. Hmm. As if she was thinking deeply, Kim Yurin's forehead creased up. Hmm. Mm. Kim Yurin. Foot. Kim S.A.E. Jean burst out laughing after quietly gazing at her trying to look serious and stuff. And then, pulled out the present he brought along. It was a stuffed doll that depicted a cute goblin. The common saying of how cute can a goblin be couldn't be applied to this doll. A roundish, chubby head and short limbs this cuteness was on the level that even S.A.E. Jean felt boastful about. And the evidence of its cuteness was Kim Yurin's face that was slowly melting into a puddle. But she quickly hardened her face and spoke up. A goblin, is it? Thank you for that time. I was able to survive, thanks to you. Kim Yurin. She then extended her hand out matter-of-factly. Her face was full of covetousness, telling him to hand over the doll already. Too bad, S.A.E. Jean had no plans to do that, at least not so soon. Ha 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 thank you for the kind words. But, are you really refusing so quickly to help me on the matter I'm asking you about? S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin's smooth eyebrows twitched after she heard his words. S.A.E. Jean was aiming for this moment. Why don't you guys meet up and talk first? Miss Hazeline is also regretting her actions as well. 
Plus, you receive this doll as a bonus on top. S.A.E. Jean. He playfully shook the doll's BT and seduced her. While looking at Hazeline's stunned face, S.A.E. Jean clapped his hands loudly. Then, the door to his office was yanked open, and the heavy footsteps reverberated against the walls. Hazeline froze up like the Mambasik. She didn't dare to turn her head around to look, only her eyeballs desperately shifted around. T.L., the legend of Mambasik comes from the Korean history folklore. Basically, a government official is sent to Japan back in 5th century AD for some sort of a rescue mission, his wife cries her eyes out by the shore, and allegedly turns into a stone statue, or something like that. Can't find a link in English that describes the lore, so well, take my word for it. Not sure why the author chose to use this reference, though. The unknown person arrived right behind Hazeline and threw out this one line. Hey, you. Look at me. Kim Yurin. Hazeline's shoulders jumped up. Looking as if she might fall off her chair at any moment, she stiffly turned around to look. And as expected, Kim Yurin was standing there. The only difference was, she didn't carry the same old expression of anger. Let's talk for a bit. Kim Yurin. Her voice sounded rather bitter for some reason. Uh, uh, s, sure thing. Hazeline. Hazeline dazedly replied. Kim Yurin then turned to leave, before speaking up once more. Just the two of us. Will that be fine, Guildmaster? Kim Yurin. Of course. S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin left the office first, and with a totally terrified face, Hazeline followed right after. S.A.E. Jean had no idea what the two of them talked about. But, he could guess that the matter between them was heading towards the right direction, after he heard the noises of Hazeline's loud sobbing as well as the much softer sounds of Kim Yurin lightly patting the crying elf's back. August, a month of scorching heatwaves assaulting the public. This should have been the season when all the vacationing spots would be jam-packed with holiday makers, but the current status of the world wasn't nice enough for something so relaxed like that. Boss monsters were popping up everywhere all the time a huge fissure opened up in Western Europe and to top them off, predictions of the so-called experts that said, what the world was experiencing was not a one-off thing at all. And because of all this unprecedented chaos, even the heatwave ended up feeling quite bone-chilling to everyone alive. But, the monster status was shooting up like crazy, totally opposite to the direction of ruination the world was busy walking towards. Showing a gradual rise from the initial boss monster incidents, then with the huge fissure in Europe opening up, boom. The monster's sister company, TM stock prices surged up through the roof, until shooting past the atmosphere, entering the stratosphere and beyond. With this, SAE Gene came to a realization how the USA was able to become the most dominant, wealthiest nation on earth through the First World War. The number of griffins living in the nesting area managed by the monster now totaled almost 600. Many countries in Europe begged to rent out this amazing method of transportation that allowed one to travel from the city of Sinuiju to Busan in less than three minutes, while requiring no prior preparation whatsoever. The amount they proposed for one griffin was 10 million euros, and the duration being only a month. TL, Sinuiju is a city in North Korea that borders Chinese city, Dandong. Basically, it's on the other side of the Korean peninsula from the city of Busan. Plus, the demand for the monster's mercenaries had increased by a great deal as well. There were 2,300 mercenaries working for the monster, and only around 50 of them were currently not out on a mission because, they were injured at the moment. Also, the monster established a control tower, of sorts, which would play the central role in making the important decisions in this fast-changing world. Well, it wasn't exactly establishing, but more like moving all the personnel that acted as the brains of the organization into one spot. And that spot just so happened to be the underground conference room hidden below the Monster Guild's HQ building, where the weekly meetings between the guild members took place. Right now, around 100 knights each from the countries England, Germany, and France are requesting for the license to ride griffins. And the orders for the various artifacts and the orcs' weapons are backed up to the point where we are running out of the numbered waiting tickets. Zhou Hansung. Zhou Hansung spoke while browsing through the documents. S.A.E. Jean could only spit out long sighs, though. 
the time he needed for making an artifact or a weapon depended solely on the grade of the finished item. Although the proficiency levels for several skills, such as dexterity, had increased by a lot, he still required a minimum of two hours to craft a single item that could be rated the best, or the so-called named goods. And to compound the difficulty, he even seemed to have developed the mentality of a true artisan he didn't want to sell those artifacts he wasn't satisfied with. So out of ten he made, S.A.E. Jean ended up throwing away three just because he was unhappy with them. He tried not to do this, but it was now ingrained in his instincts. He'd go crazy and destroy the offending articles, before regaining his senses and regret his actions a bit later. This repeated over and over again. Many things have been delayed like this, sir. Zhou Hansung Zhou Hansung studied S.A.E. Jean's mood before saying some words that indirectly conveyed his message. He was urging S.A.E. Jean for answers. Do one of those interviews or whatever and remove some of them off the list, please. The best I can do is three items a day. S.A.E. Jean But if that happens, we might end up starting a bloody competition between the aforementioned European nations. The current crisis of the planet can only be overcome if all the earthlings band to get Zhou Hansung. What was that? Did you just say something? S.A.E. Jean No, sir. Zhou Hansung I'll do what I can, so for now, let me off the hook with this much. S.A.E. Jean Yes, sir. And with that, the matters related to weapons and artifacts came to an end. Too bad for him. That wasn't the only topic to discuss, however. Next. France's president, as well as prime ministers of Spain and England requested for a face to face meeting with you, sir. They wish to discuss the topics regarding the mercenaries as well as various others. Each of them are asking you to meet them first, and to the Korean government, Jo Hansung. Wow. Our guild master is so busy. It's really, really cool, you know. E. Hyrin let off a soft exclamation of admiration as she continued to interestedly observe the proceedings from the side. However Kim Yurin smacked the back of her head, then. Ouch. That hurts, you know. E. Hyrin. If you're aware of how busy he is, then stop distracting him. Kim Yurin. H. M. Hazeline. Meanwhile, Hazeline cautiously slid in between the bickering duo while carrying a slightly weird expression or, more correctly, with an envious face. Why, Yurina, are you enjoying your lunch? Hazeline. Yeah, it's nice. Kim Yurin. Really? I, I'm feeling full right now, so would you like my portion of meat as well? Hazeline. Hazeline asked with a red face while busy fidgeting around with her fingers. Kim Yurin's cheeks also reddened slightly, and with an unsure face, she too hesitated. But then, like a swift and crafty little cat, Yu Beksong sitting next to them quickly butted in. In that case, gimme. Yu Beksong. A. Ot. Hey, put it down, you idiot. Has a line. You said you're full, though. Yu Beksong. Nyam, Nyam. Before anything could be done, Yu Beksong swallowed the steak in one gulp. Rage filled Hazeline's reddened face this time as she stood up and pointed her angry finger at Yu Beksong. What the heck? This crazy cat burglar. Hazeline. It's fine. Kim Yurin. Oh, really? Hazeline. But with a single hand gesture from Kim Yurin, Hazeline promptly sat back down on her seat. And E. Hyrin on the side interestedly studied this clear display of power dynamics between these two people. Chapter, 160 Well then, I'll be on my way, Guild Master. Zhou Hansung The insufferable meeting with Zhou Hansung that lasted for over two hours finally came to an end. Feels like I might really die at this rate S.A.E. Jean. After Zhou Hansung had left the conference room, S.A.E. Jean lied down on the couch immediately. His vision was blurring, and his head ached. When he looked around the conference room, he found that the guild members hadn't left for home just yet. Some of them even brought along their own duvets and blankets, suggesting that maybe they were planning to camp out here, of all places. 
After researchers uncovered the crucial fact that the martial arts from the Jean Mudo school is particularly effective when combating monster threats, the school has experienced an unprecedented level of boom recently. The dojo master, Miss E. Eugene is. At the same time, the news on the television was delivering a story regarding the Jean Mudo. When S.A.E. Jean turned his attention towards the TV, he saw E. Eugene and her considerably improved complexion, plus her toothy smile, dominating the screen. Jean Mudo Schoolmaster The Monster Guild Member We have over 2,000 dojos operating across the globe at the moment, with nearly 10,000 disciples receiving instructions. E. Eugene It sure is a wonderful trend without a doubt. By the way, what do you, as the leader of this martial arts school, think is the true advantage of this form of martial arts? Interviewer To me, the advantage is that, during the fight against monsters in a standoff situation, you're not hindered by your weapons, instead relying solely on the most natural movements your body can make. Plus, let's take a look at gauntlets they are much easier to manufacture compared to other armaments, so. Although they might be rated as similar in overall quality, you can find more gauntlets in circulation and crucially, they are cheaper to buy as well. And so, I believe that these and other points have combined to give the spotlight to our school of martial arts when it comes to the matter of monster subjugation. TL, gauntlets are easier to make. Seriously? Mr. Author, tell that to the medieval blacksmiths, see how they react. They've grown by that much already. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean got thoroughly impressed by the contents of the interview. Of course, the monster did shower the school with an unrestrained level of support, but still, to grow by that much during the short period of two years was. Did you know that they've gotten really famous lately? The main body of texts and all the movement diagrams are left completely intact, so it's really easy to train in the art, and plus, its effectiveness is quite high, apparently. It's one of those ridiculous low-risk, high-return scenario, you see. I mean, our Knights Order received four Jean Mudo disciples during this year's new recruitment process, out of ten people selected this year. E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin replied to him while watching the TV. Oh, really? S.A.E. Jean. By the way, that dojo master girl is also one of the guild members, right? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked while resting her chin on her hands. Ju Ji Hyuk volunteered an answer this time. Yes, that's correct. I've met her a few times, and she seems to be a nice person. Ju Ji Hyuk. And just why would you meet her in the first place? E. Hai Rin. Suddenly, E. Hai Rin glared at Ju Ji Hyuk with eyes narrowed to a slit like a flatfish. And as the flustered Ju Ji Hyuk began to stammer out an excuse, the interview got abruptly cut off without a warning. Then, the anchor began reading a new information, saying it was the breaking news. Near the province of Kangwon, a Mayan has made an appearance. This Mayan is understood to be an ogre in origin. A footage of a giant male man, rampaging around with bloodshot eyes was transmitted next. Everyone in the conference room held their breaths and watched the TV. Those referred to as Mayans hadn't appeared publicly in the past ten years or so. If one did, then it was terminated almost immediately. The modern world viewed Mayans as even worse enemies of mankind than vampires, after all. Well, vampires had the excuse of their own survival when attacking humans, but Mayans didn't, as they simply enjoyed causing destruction and committing murder. However, such a Mayan had shown up out of the blue. Publicly, too. Should we go and help? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked as she lowered her duvet. But S.A.E. Jean shook his head. No need. It's walking around that exposed, so most likely, it's been subjugated already. S.A.E. Jean. It has been confirmed that this mine was subjugated by the Griffin Rider, Kim in Su, a short while ago. With a great timing, the anchor spoke up. As S.A.E. Jean shrugged his shoulders, Kim Yurin pulled the duvet closer. Oh, right. That Kim in Su, doesn't he have a bit of history with you, Guildmaster? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin suddenly asked S.A.E. Jean as if the thought suddenly popped up in her head now. We did have a little run-in back then, sure. But, how did you find that out? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Young told me. 
she said that you and Kim in Su fought over her and stuff. E Hai Rin. Fighting over her. Sae Jin simply smiled. Although his first encounter with Kim in Su wasn't positive, Sae Jin didn't harbor any ill feelings towards the guy at all. Actually, Sae Jin ran into Kim in Su again about three months ago. He remembered that, as the lycanthrope, he broke Kim in Su's weapon back then, so he ended up gifting an orc's weapon to the poor guy. Kim in Su expressed how grateful he was, with teardrops forming on his eyes and everything, while repenting on how much of a schmuck he was in the past. What? Fighting over her. Isn't it more like Sae Young doing everything she can in order to keep Mr. Sae Jin by her side, instead? I mean, she should be relieved that no one has snatched him away yet, Hazeline. She was probably only joking, though. E Hai Rin. Even if it was a joke, Sae Young's getting a little too conceited lately. Hazeline. Hazeline pouted as if she was unhappy about something. Too bad, Kim Yurin's ultra sharp eyes quickly stabbed into her back. No, wait, why, you know, looking at her objectively, she is really like that nowadays. Has a line. Well, that is true. Kim Yurin. Looking at Kim Yurin suddenly agreeing with Hazeline, Sae Jean simply carried on smiling. But still, you should refrain from saying those things again. Kim Yurin. I understand Hazeline. Hazeline cutely replied back and leaned her head on Kim Yurin's shoulder. But, as if that was annoying, Kim Yurin moved slightly to the side to avoid it. Sae Jean chuckled while looking at the two. A week after that, the appointment of the Tower Lord was announced to the public. As expected, big reverberation and controversy got kicked up at the same time. It was all par for the course, really since, although Hazeline was an A-class wizard approved by the government, the fact remained that she didn't work as one for over eight years. It didn't take long before her status as the Monster Guild's member got revealed, though. That helped turn around the public sentiment towards her favor. Of course, that was only the public's. Isn't there more water? Kim Yurin. Please endure for a bit longer. Sae Jean. Currently, the top floor of the Dawn and TM's Wizard Tower. Sae Jean was standing before Hazeline's office. But he wasn't alone. And the person accompanying him was Kim Yurin. It was her very first time visiting Hazeline's workplace which was stressing her out a lot, causing her to ask constantly for a glass of water for quite some time now. I, I'm going to the bathroom for a moment, so please go ahead and wait for me inside. Kim Yurin. Eh. No, hey, wait a sec Sae Jean. Before Sae Jean could say anything, she ran away like a fired arrow. He could only look on dumbfoundedly at her disappearing back, before knocking on the door to Hazeline's office. Who is it? The initial reply was rather energyless and also sounded annoyed as well. It's Kim Sae Jean. Miss Yurin is accompanying me as well. Almost immediately, there was a change in her reaction. With a hurried shout of just wait for a moment. The sounds of something tumbling around could be heard beyond the door, and he even sensed faint traces of magic being used as well. It seemed that she was busy tidying up the messy interior with magic. Sae Jean relaxedly waited for her to finish. And after five minutes passed by, an officious voice leaked out from beyond the door. Please, enter. She sounded needlessly dignified. Sae Jean smiled thinly and opened the door. Hazeline was sitting with her legs crossed and her back leaning against the back of the chair. Was that how a tower lord should sit? Sae Jean swallowed back down his rising laughter, and sat down on a chair located in front of Hazeline's desk. Meanwhile, she looked beyond Sae Jean, searching for Kim Yurin's shadow. She went off to a restroom. But, besides all that, how is the work treating you after ten days on the job? Sae Jean. Yes. Ah. It's fine, more or less. Hazeline. Her complexion wasn't so good, though. When Sae Jean narrowed his brows questioningly, she quickly added a couple extra words as well. I can't seem to adjust properly, is all. Hazeline. What do you mean, you can't adjust? Sae Jean. To the wizarding world, I mean. 
I'm returning to it after so long, so it's hard accepting their way of doing things. Has a line. Actually, he had some idea of what was going on, after hearing about it before coming here. Thanks to her unexpected and somewhat explosive appointment, factionalism had developed within the tower already. However, the situation was just too one-sided to call it factionalism. Dot. On one side, a faction formed around the high elf Shahan, and on the opposite side, it was Hazeline all by herself. The rest were remaining neutral. And besides that, anything else bothering you? S.A.E. Jean. I'm okay with the rest. Hazeline. Hazeline didn't tell him. She was trying not to worry him. But, if this situation persisted, it was only a matter of time before Hazeline got swallowed up. If that happened, it would get too troubling for S.A.E. Jean. Thankfully, though, she still had one very important ally she could count on. And this one single ally was far more reliable than any other Rotna swipes combined together. Well, in any case, I believe that Miss Hazeline will adopt to the situation accordingly. S.A.E. Jean. Of course. You don't have to worry. Hazeline. For a briefest moment, a hint of anguish brushed past her expressions, but that was all. Oh, that's right. S.A.E. Jean. He figured that he should stop beating around the bush, and nonchalantly pulled out two books. Here. I almost forgot about them. S.A.E. Jean. They were the unpublished Bangbaidong Grimoires No. 27 and 28. As soon as she confirmed them via the covers, panic spread on Hazeline's face. But, but why are you giving me these? Hazeline. I'm planning to publish them soon, so I need people to proofread them. I shall leave the role of finding the right wizards for that to you, Miss Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean. This was the sign of Bangbaidong wizard approving Hazeline, and was akin to handing over a powerful, decisive weapon over to her as well. Take care of the rest, please. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, yes. But, where are you going? Mr. S.A.E. Jean, if you just give me these two out of the blue and escape from here, you're putting me in a difficult position, you know? Has a line. I'm telling you to use them at your discretion. Besides, Miss Yurin should be arriving soon, so why don't you discuss it between you two? S.A.E. Jean. And with a great timing, Kim Yurin pushed open the door and entered. S.A.E. Jean left the office as if he was passing the baton over to her. Kim Yurin called out to him flustered, asking where he was going, but he still resolutely escaped from the office. Ten days later. S.A.E. Jean heard that Hazeline managed to successfully conquer the wizard tower quite thoroughly by utilizing the grimoire's powers. But there was no time for him to feel chuffed about that. Because, he received an urgent text message from Kim Sunho. And the message said that Kim Yusone was on the brink. S.A.E. Jean dropped everything and hurriedly ran over to the hospital. Guild Master. You've arrived. There were other guild members beside Kim Sunho present in the hospital room. S.A.E. Jean had come for a visit less than two weeks ago, yet Kim Yusone's complexion was incomparably worse compared to before. S.A.E. Jean could acutely understand the meaning behind the description nothing but skin and bones. S.A.E. Jean sat down on a chair next to Kim Yusone's hospital bed. Almost at the same time, the dying man slowly opened his eyes. And as if he was waiting for this moment, a thin smile spread on his mouth as he stared at S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean carefully held his skinny, bony hand. His chest tightened. He felt numb. Kim Yusoon. The first person S.A.E. Jean had ever confided his secrets to, and the person he relied on the most. Looking at him, S.A.E. Jean once or twice wondered it would have been nice if he had a father like Kim Yusoon. You're truly one stubborn person. S.A.E. Jean. Hearing S.A.E. Jean's words that contained a myriad of meanings, Kim Yusone simply returned a smile. Then, he blinked slightly. S.A.E. Jean placed his ear closer to Kim Yusone's mouth. You've come. Kim Yusone. Of course. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean tried to smile. But he couldn't do anything about his trembling voice and tears pooling on the edges of his eyes. I had a dream, one after such a long time. Kim Yusone. S.A.E. Jean's eyes widened instantly. 
Kim Yusone didn't lose his smile while he continued on. However it seems that you don't have to worry. Kim Yusone. Why not? In the near future, a hero will emerge and rescue this world. Kim Yusone. Kim Yusone tightly grasped Sae Jin's hand. And that person is probably you, Mr. Sae Jin. It was probably you. That is why I decided not to worry anymore. Kim Yusone. Sae Jin couldn't understand everything he was saying. There were lots of things he wanted to ask, too. To hear what he meant, and to see his healthy face and voice, that's what Sae Jin wanted. But, that wasn't possible anymore. Kim Yusone simply left behind those enigmatic words, and before Sae Jin had the chance to comprehend, closed his eyes forever. Well then. Those were the final words of Kim Yusone. Ha! Sae Jin's long, helpless sigh descended heavily in the room. D, Dad. Kim Sun Ho ran up to the hospital bed. And soon, the sobbing cries of a son who lost his father filled up the room. Kim Sun Ho's daughter, not yet a middle schooler, also began sobbing, seeing her father. On that day, when the sounds of sadness echoed outside the window, the refreshing yet hot rays of the summer sun continued to blaze down. Kim Yu Son's funeral was a simple and small scale affair. Too bad, as if the news of Sae Jin attending it got spread around, the number of people wanting to attend the occasion was incredible. Of course, Sae Jin and Kim Sun Ho refused them all. Trying to soothe his sadness, Kim Sun Ho jokingly said that if he allowed all of them to attend, then he might have made over a million bucks from people donating money as a sign of their condolences. But there was this one person they couldn't refuse. And that was none other than Emil Riro. TL well, the author suddenly switched the name from Emil Riro to Emilia. Thus, I will be switching to the latter version as well from here on. If they refused, she'd murder them all publicly, after all. What brings you here? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean questioned her while wiping away tears around his eyes. Looking rather exhausted for some reason, Bathory didn't even bother with useless banter before diving into the main topic. Hey you. You know a guy called Jean Sehan? Bathory. Sure. Although he got scared there for a second or two, he replied while maintaining a poker face. Did you know that it was Elos vampires that killed that dude? Anyways, those Elos fools are colluding with the Mayans. Looks like there is some kind of secret that even I'm not aware of. Bathory. Sae Jean's face hardened. Okay, so. What do you mean by? Okay, so. I only came here to let you know, so you don't misunderstand about this whole thing, okay? I don't want to be seen as someone who doesn't keep her promises or something. Bathory. Bathory spoke thus and coldly turned around to leave however, Sae Jean still had something left to say. Since you came all the way out here, let's work together. Sae Jean. Her steps came to a dead stop. However, when she turned around, her cramped face was resembling a terrifying demoness. Let's help each other out. Sae Jean. You, have you lost your marbles? Bathory. Well. Wouldn't it be better if we work together? After all, you say the fissure cannot be closed no matter what. In that case, why not we help each other out? Sae Jean. Sae Jean smiled confidently. Bathory stared back at him wordlessly. However, all those ugly, angry creases on her face from a moment ago had vanished, replaced by her dumbfounded expression.